Introduction of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Introduction. Hope went before them, and the world was wide. Such was the spirit in which the exploration of the world was accomplished. It was the inspiration that carried men of old, far beyond the sunrise, into those magic and silent seas, whereon no boat had ever sailed. It is the incentive of those today, with the wonder thirst in their souls, who travel and suffer in the traveling, though there are fewer prizes left to win. But... The reward is in the doing, and the rapture of pursuing is the prize. To travel hopefully, says Stevenson, is a better thing than to arrive. This would explain the fact that this book of discovery has become a record of splendid endurance, of hardships bravely borne, of silent toil, of courage and resolution unequaled in the annals of mankind, of self-sacrifice and revolt, and faithful lives laid ungrudgingly down, of the many who went forth, the few only attained. It is of these few that this book tells. All these, says the poet in Ecclesiastes, all these were honored in their generation, and were the glory of their times. Their name liveth for evermore. But while we read of those master spirits who succeeded, let us never forget those who failed to achieve. Anybody might have found it, but the whisper came to me. Enthusiasm, too, was the secret of their success. Among the best of crews there was always some, one who would have turned back, but the world would have never have been explored had it not been for those finer spirits who resolutely went on, even to the death. This is what carried Alexander the Great to the earth's utmost verge, that drew Columbus across the trackless Atlantic, that nerved Vasco da Gama to double the stormy cape, that induced Magellan to face the dreaded straits now called by his name, that made it possible for men to face without flinching the ice-bound regions of the far north. There is no land uninhabitable, nor sea unnavigable, asserted the men of the sixteenth century, when England set herself to take possession of her heritage in the north. Such an heroic temper could overcome all things. But the cost was great, the sufferings intense. Having eaten our shoes and saddles boiled with a few wild herbs, we set out to reach the kingdom of gold, says Orellana in 1540. We ate biscuit, but in truth it was biscuit no longer, but a powder full of worms. So great was the want of food, that we were forced to eat the hides with which the main yard was covered. But we had also to make use of sawdust for food, and rats became a great delicacy, related Magellan, as he led his little ship across the unknown Pacific. Again, there is Franklin returning from the Arctic coast, and stilling the pangs of hunger with pieces of singed hide mixed with lichen. Varied with the horns and bones of the dead deer fried with some old shoes. The dangers of the way were manifold. For the early explorers had no land map or ocean chart to guide them. There were no lighthouses to warn the strange mariner of dangerous coast and angry surf. No books of travel to relate the weird doings of fierce and inhospitable savages, no tinned foods to prevent the terrible scourge of sailors, scurvy. In their little wooden sailing ships the men of old faced every conceivable danger, and surmounted obstacles unknown to modern civilization. Now strike your sails, ye jolly mariners, for we be come into a quiet road. For the most part we are struck with the light-heartedness of the olden sailor, the shout of gladness with which men went forth on these hazardous undertakings, knowing not how they would arrive, or what might befall them by the way, 
went forth in the smallest of wooden ships, with the most incompetent of crews, to face the dangers of unknown seas and unsuspected lands, to chance the angry storm and the hidden rock, to discover inhospitable shores and savage foes. Founded on bitter experience is the old saying, A passage perilous maketh a port pleasant. For the early navigators knew little of the art of navigation. Pythias, who discovered the British Isles, was a great mathematician. Jigo Kam, who sailed to the mouth of the Congo, was a knight of the king's household. Sir Hugh Willoughby, a most valiant gentleman. Richard Cancellor, a man of great estimation for many good parts of wit in him. Anthony Jenkinson, a resolute and intelligent gentleman, Sir Walter Raleigh, an Elizabethan courtier, and so forth. It has been obviously impossible to include all the famous names that belong to the history of exploration. Most of these explorers have been chosen for some definite new discovery, some addition to the world's geographical knowledge, or some great feat of endurance which may serve to brace us to fresh effort as a nation famous for our seamen. English navigators have been afforded the lion's share in the book, partly because they took the lion's share in exploring, partly because translations of foreign travel are difficult to transcribe. Most of these stories have been taken from original sources, and most of the explorers have been allowed to tell part of their own story in their own words. Perhaps the most graphic of all explorations is that written by a native of West Australia, who accompanied the exploring party searching for an English lad named Smith, who had been starved to death. Away, 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 we reach the water of Junjup, we shoot game. Away, 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 through a forest away, through a forest away, we see no water. Through a forest away, along our tracks away, hills ascending, then pleasantly away, away, through a forest away. We see a water, along the river away. A short distance we go, then away, 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 through a forest away. Then along another river away, across the river away. Still we go onwards, along the sea away, through the bush away, then along the sea away. We sleep near the sea. I see Mr. Smith's footsteps ascending a sand hill. Onwards I go, regarding his footsteps. I see Mr. Smith dead. Two sleeps had he been dead. Greatly did I weep, and much I grieved. In his blanket folding him, we scraped away the earth. The sun had inclined to the westward as we laid him in the ground. The book is illustrated with reproductions from old maps, old primitive maps, with a real Adam and Eve standing in the Garden of Eden, with pillars of Hercules guarding the straits of Gibraltar, with paradise in the east, a realistic Jerusalem in the center, the island of Thule in the north, and St. Brandon's Isles of the Blessed in the west. Beautifully colored were the maps of the Middle Ages, joyous charts all glorious with gold and vermilion, compasses and crests and flying banners with mountains of red and gold. The seas are full of ships, Brave beflagged vessels with swelling sails. The land is ablaze with kings and potentates and golden thrones under canopies of angels. While over all presides the Madonna in her golden chair. The Hereford Mappa Mundi, drawn in the thirteenth century on a fine sheet of vellum, circular in form, is among the most interesting of the medieval maps. It must once have been gorgeous with its gold letters and scarlet towns, its green seas and its blue rivers. The Red Sea is still red, but the Mediterranean is chocolate brown, and all the green has disappeared. The mounted figure in the lower right-hand corner is probably the author, Richard de Haldingham. The map is surmounted by a representation of the Last Judgment, below which is paradise as a circular island, with the four rivers as the figures of Adam and Eve. In the center is Jerusalem. The world is divided into three, Asia, Africa, and Europe. 
Around this earth island flows the ocean. America is, of course, absent. The east is placed at paradise, and the west at the pillars of Hercules. North and south are left to the imagination. And what of the famous map of Juan de la Cosa, once pillared to Columbus, drawn in the 15th century, with St. Christopher carrying the infant Christ across the water, supposed to be a portrait of Christopher Columbus carrying the gospel to America. It is the first map in which a dim outline appears of the new world. The early maps of Africa are filled with camels and unicorns, lions and tigers, veiled figures and the turrets and spires of strange buildings. Geographers in Africa maps with savage pictures fill their gaps. Surely, says a modern writer, surely the old cartographer was less concerned to fill his gaps than to express the poetry of geography. And today there are still gaps in the most modern maps of Africa, where one-eleventh of the whole area remains unexplored. Further, in Asia, the problem of the Brahmaputra Falls is yet unsolved. There are shores untrodden and rivers unsurveyed. God hath given us some things, and not all things, that our successors also might have somewhat to do, wrote barons in the sixteenth century. There may not be much left, but with the words of Kipling's explorer we may fitly conclude, something hidden, go and find it, go and look behind the ranges, something lost behind the ranges, lost and waiting for you, go. Thanks are due to Mr. S. G. Stubbs for valuable assistance in the selection and preparation of the illustrations, which, with few exceptions, have been executed under his directions. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of A Book of Discovery this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 1 A Little Old World No story is complete unless it begins at the very beginning. But where is the beginning? Where is the dawn of geography, the knowledge of our earth? What was it like before the first explorers made their way into distant lands? Every day that passes we are gaining fresh knowledge of the dim and silent past. Every day men are patiently digging in the old heaps that were once the sites of busy cities, and, as a result of their unvarying toil, they are revealing to us the life stories of those who dwelt therein. They are disclosing secrets writ on weather-worn stones and tablets, bricks and cylinders, never before even guessed at. Thus we read the wondrous story of ancient days, and breathlessly wonder what marvelous discovery will thrill us next. For the earliest account of the old world, a world made up apparently of a little land and a little water, we turn to an old papyrus, the oldest in existence, which tells us in familiar words, and surpassed for their exquisite poetry and wondrous simplicity, of that great dateless time so full of mystery and awe. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was waste and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. 
Thus beautifully did the children of men express their earliest idea of the world's distribution of land and water. And where, on our modern maps, was this little earth, and what was it like? Did trees and flowers cover the land? Did rivers flow into the sea? Listen again to the old tradition that still rings down the ages. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became four heats. The name of the first is Pison, and the name of the second river is Gihon, the name of the third river is Hidekel, Tigris, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Now look at the modern map of Asia. Between Arabia and Persia there is a long valley watered by the Tigris and Euphrates, rivers which rise in Armenia and flow into the Persian Gulf. This region was the traditional cradle of the human race. Around and beyond was a great world, a world with great surging seas, with lands of trees and flowers, a world with continents and lakes and bays and capes, with islands and mountains and rivers. There were vast deserts of sand, rolling away to right and to left. There were mountains up which no man had climbed. There were stormy seas over which no ship had ever sailed. But these men of old had never explored far. They believed that their world was just a very little world, with no other occupants than themselves. They believed it to be flat, with mountains at either end on which rested a solid metal dome, known as the firmament. In this shining circle were windows, in and out of which the sun would creep by day and the moon and stars by night. And the whole of this world was, they thought, balanced on the waters. There was water above, the waters that be above the firmament, and water below, and water all around. Long ages pass away. Let us look again at the green valley of the Euphrates and Tigris. It has been called the nursery of nations. Names have been given to various regions round about, and cities have arisen on the banks of the rivers. Babylonia, Mesopotamia, Chaldea, Assyria, all these long names belong to this region, and around each centers some of the most interesting history and legend in the world. Rafts on the river and caravans on the land carried merchandise far and wide. Men made their way to the Sea of the Rising Sun, as they called the Persian Gulf, and to the Sea of the Setting Sun, as they called the Mediterranean. They settled on the shores of the Caspian Sea, on the shores of the Black Sea, on the shores of the Red Sea. They carried on magnificent trade, cedar, pine, and cypress were brought from Lebanon to Chaldea, limestone and marble from Syria, copper and lead from the shores of the Black Sea. And these dwellers about Babylonia built up a wonderful civilization. They had temples and brick-built houses, libraries of tablets revealing knowledge of astronomy and astrology. They had a literature of their own. Suddenly from out the city of Ur, Kerbela, near the ancient mouth of the Euphrates, appears a traveler. There had doubtless been many before, but records are scanty, and hard to piece together, and the detailed account of a traveler with a name is very interesting. Abram went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. He would have traveled by the chief caravan routes of Syria into Egypt. Here, about the fertile mouth of the Nile, he would have found an ancient civilization as wonderful as that to which he was accustomed in Babylonia. It was a grain-growing country, and when there was famine in other lands, there was always corn in Egypt, thanks to the mighty, life-giving Nile. But we must not linger over the old civilization, over the wonderful empire governed by the pharaohs or kings, first from Memphis, Cairo, and then from the hundred-gated Thebes. Must not linger over these old pyramid builders, 
the temple, sphinxes, and statues of ancient Egypt. Before even Abram came into their country, we find the Egyptians famous for their shipping and navigation. Old pictures and tombs recently discovered tells us this. On the coast of the Red Sea they built their long, narrow ships, which were rowed by some twenty paddlers on either side, and steered by three men standing in the stern. With one mast and a large sail they flew before the wind. They had to go far afield for their wood. We find an Egyptian being sent to cut down four forests in the south in order to build three large vessels out of acacia wood. Petri tells us of an Egyptian sailor who was sent to Punt or Somaliland to fetch for Pharaoh sweet-smelling spices. He was shipwrecked on the way, and this is the account of his adventures. I was going, he relates, to the mines of Pharaoh, and I went down on the sea on a ship with a hundred and fifty sailors of the best of Egypt, whose hearts were stronger than lions. They had said that the wind would be contrary, or that there would be none. But as we approached the land, the wind rose and threw up high waves. As for me, I seized a piece of wood, but those who were in the vessel perished, without one remaining. A wave threw me on an island. After that, I had been three days alone without a companion beside my own heart. I laid me in a thicket, and the shadow covered me. I found figs and grapes, all manner of good herbs, berries and grain, melons of all kinds, fishes and birds. I lighted a fire, and I made a burnt offering unto the gods. Suddenly I heard a noise as of thunder, which I thought to be that of a wave of the sea. The trees shook, and the earth was moved. I uncovered my eyes, and I saw that a serpent drew near. His body was as if overlaid with gold, and his color as that of true lazuli. What has brought thee here, little one, to this isle, which is in the sea, and of which the shores are in the midst of the waves? asked the serpent. The sailor told his story, kneeling on his knees, with his face bowed to the ground. "'Fear not, little one, and make not thy face sad,' continued the serpent, "'for it is God who has brought thee to this isle of the blessed, where nothing is lacking, and which is filled with all good things. Thou shalt be four months in this isle, then a ship shall come from thy land with sailors, and thou shalt go to thy country.' As for me, I am a prince of the land of Punt. I am here with my brethren and children around me. We are seventy-five serpents, children and kindred. Then the grateful sailor promised to bring all the treasures of Egypt back to Punt. And I shall tell of thy presence unto Pharaoh. I shall make him to know of thy greatness, said the Egyptian stranger. But the strange prince of Punt only smiled. Thou shalt never more see this isle, he said. It shall be changed into waves. Everything came to pass, as the serpent said. The ship came, gifts were lavished on the sailor from Egypt, perfumes of cassia, of sweet woods, of cypress, incense, ivory tusks, baboons and apes, and thus laden he sailed home to his own people. Long centuries after this we get another glimpse at the land of Punt. This time it is in the reign of Queen Hatshepsut, who sent a great trading expedition into this famous country. Five ships started from Thebes, sailing down the river Nile and probably reaching the Red Sea by means of a canal. Navigating in the Red Sea was difficult. The coast was steep and inhospitable. No rivers ran into it. Only a few fishing villages lay along the coast used by Egyptian merchants as markets for mother-of-pearl, emeralds, gold, and sweet-smelling perfumes. Then the ships continued their way, the whole voyage taking about two months. Arrived at Punt, the Egyptian commander pitched his tents upon the shore, to the great astonishment of the inhabitants. "'Why have ye come hither unto this land, which the people of Egypt know not?' asked the chief of Punt. "'Have ye come through the sky?' Did ye sail upon the waters or upon the sea? 
Presents from the Queen of Egypt were at once laid before the chief of Punt, and soon the seashore was alive with people. The ships were drawn up, gangplanks were very heavily laden with marvels of the country of Punt. There were heaps of myrrh, resin, of fresh myrrh trees, ebony and pure ivory, cinnamon wood, incense, baboons, monkeys, dogs, natives, and children. Never was the like brought to any king of Egypt since the world stands. And the ships voyaged safely back to Thebes, with all their booty and these pleasant recollections of the people of Somaliland. In spite of these little expeditions, the Egyptian world seemed still very small. The Egyptians thought of the earth with its land and sea as a long, oblong sort of box, the center of which was Egypt. The sky stretched over it like an iron ceiling, the port toward the earth being sprinkled with lamps, hung from the strong cables lighted by night, and extinguished by day. Four forked trunks of trees upheld the sky roof, but lest some storm should overthrow these tree trunks, there were four lofty peaks connected by chains of mountains. The southern peak was known as the Horn of the Earth, the eastern, the Mountain of Birth, the western, the region of life, the southern was invisible. And why? Because they, through the great sea, the very green, the Mediterranean, lay between it and Egypt. Beyond these mountain peaks, supporting the world, rolled a great river, an ocean stream, and the sun was as a ball of fire placed on a boat and carried round the ramparts of the world by the all-encircling water. So we realize that the people living in Babylonia about the river Euphrates and those living in Egypt about the river Nile had very strange ideas about the little old world around them. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of a Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. V. Singh. Chapter 2. Early Mariners. The law of the universe is progress and expansion, and this little old world was soon discovered to be larger than men thought. Now in Syria, the highway between Babylonia and Egypt, dwelt a tribe of dusky people known as Phoenicians. Some have thought that they were related to our old friends in Somaliland, and that long years ago they had migrated north to the seacoast of that part of Syria known as Canaan. Living on the seashore, washed by the tideless Mediterranean, they soon became skillful sailors. They built ships and ventured forth on the deep. They made their way to the islands of Cyprus and Crete, and thence to the islands of Greece, bringing back goods from other countries, to barter with their less daring neighbors. They reached Greece itself and cruised along the northern coast of the Great Sea to Italy, along the coast of Spain to the Rock of Gibraltar, and out into the open Atlantic. How their little sailing boats lived through the storms of that great ocean, none may know, for Phoenician records are lost. But we have every reason to believe that they reached the northern coast of France, and brought back tin from the islands known to them as the Tin Islands. In their home markets were found all manner of strange things, from foreign and known lands, discovered by these master mariners. The admiration of the ancient world. The ships of Tarshish, said the old poet, did think of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Thy rowers have brought thee into great waters. The east wind has broken thee in the midst of the seas. All the world knew of the Phoenician seaports Tyre and Sidon. They were as famous as Memphis and Thebes on the Nile, as magnificent as Nineveh on the Tigris, and Babylon on the Euphrates. Men spoke of the renowned city of Tyre, whose merchants were as princes, 
whose traffickers were among the honorable of the earth. O oh, thou that are situate at the entry of the sea, cries the poet again, when the greatness of Tyre was passing away, which art a merchant of the people from many isles. Thy borders are in the midst of the seas. Thy builders have perfected thy beauty. They have made all thy shipboards of fir trees. They have taken cedars of Lebanon to make masts for thee. Of the oaks of Basan have they made thy oars. Fine linen with broidered work from Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail. The inhabitants of Sidon were thy mariners. Thy wise men were thy pilots. As time goes on, early groups round the Euphrates and the Nile continue. But new nations form and grow, new cities arise, new names appear. Centuries of men live and die, ignorant of the great world that lies about them. Lords of the eastern world that knew no west. England was yet unknown, America undreamed of. Australia still a desolate island in an unknown sea. The burning eastern sun shone down on to vast stretches of desert land, uninhabited by man. Great rivers flowed through dreary swamps unrealized. Tempestuous waves beat against their shores, and melancholy winds swept over the face of endless ocean solitudes. And still, according to their untortured minds, the world is flat. The world is very small, and it is surrounded by ever-flowing waters, beyond which all is dark and mysterious. Around the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, revealed by the boundless energy and daring skill of the Phoenicians, there were colonies along the coasts of Africa and Europe, though they were not yet called by their names. They have discovered and explored, but they have kept their information to themselves, and they have specially refused to divulge their voyages to the Greeks. A story is told, at a later date, than this of a Phoenician shipmaster, who was bound for the Tin Islands, when he suddenly discovered that he was being followed by a strange ship, evidently bent on finding out where these unknown islands lay. The Phoenician purposely ran his ship onto a shoal in order to keep the secret of the discovery. When he returned home, his conduct was upheld by the state. But though the Phoenicians have left us no record of their travels and voyages, they had been the carriers of knowledge, and it was from them that the Greeks learned of the extreme regions of the world, and of the dim far west. Indeed, it is highly probable that from the Phoenicians they got material for their famous legend of the Argonauts and their adventures in the Black Sea. Though the story is but legendary, and it has been added to with the growing knowledge of the world, yet it gives an idea of the perils that beset the sailors of those remote ages, and of their limitations. And again we must remind ourselves that both the Phoenicians and early Greeks had, like the Egyptians and Babylonians, childish ideas as to the form of the earth. To them it was a circular plain, encircled by the ocean, which they believed to be a broad, deep-running river, flowing round and round the world. Into this ocean stream ran all the rivers and seas known to them. Over the earth was raised a solid firmament of bronze, in which the stars were set, and this was supported on tall pillars, which kept the heaven and the earth asunder. The whole delightful story of the Argonauts can be read in Kingsley's Heroes. It is the story of brave men who sailed in the ship Argo, named after the great shipbuilder Argos, to bring back the Golden Fleece from Colchis in the Black Sea. Nowhere in all the history of exploration have we a more poetical account of the launching of a ship for distant lands. Then they have stored her well with food and water, and pulled the ladder up on board and settled themselves each man to his oar, and kept time to Orpheus' harp. And away across the bay they rode southward, while the people lined the cliffs, and the woman wept while the man shouted at the starting of that gallant crew. They chose a captain, and the choice fell on Jason. Because he was the wisest of them all, 
and they rode on over the long swell on the sea, past Olympus, past the wooden bays of Athos and the sacred isle, and they came past Lemnos to the Hellespont, and so on into the Propontis, which we call Marmora now. So they came to the Bosphorus, the land then as now of bitter blast, the land of cold and misery, and a great battle of the winds took place. Then the Argonauts came out into the open sea, the Black Sea. No Greek had ever crossed it, and even the heroes, for all their courage, feared the dreadful sea and its rocks and shoals and fogs and bitter freezing storms. And they trembled as they saw it stretching out before them, without a shore, as far as the eye could see. Verily they sailed on past the coast of Asia. They passed Sinop, and the cities of the Amazons, the warlike women of the east, until at last they saw the white snow peaks, hanging glittering sharp and bright above the clouds. And they knew that they were come to Caucasus at the end of all the earth. Caucasus, the highest of all mountains, the father of the rivers of the east. And they rode three days to the eastward, while the Caucasus rose higher hour by hour, till they saw the dark stream of faces, rushing headlong to the sea, and shining above the treetops, the golden roofs of the child of the sun. How they reached home no man knows. Some say they sailed up the Danube River, and so came to the Adriatic, dragging their ship over the snow-clad Alps. Others say they sailed south to the Red Sea, and dragged their ship over the burning desert of North Africa. More than once they gave themselves up for lost, heartbroken with toil and hunger, until the brave houseman cried to them, Raise up the mast and set the sail, and face what comes like men. After days and weeks on the wide, wild western sea, they sailed by the coast of Spain and came to Sicily, the three-cornered island, and after numerous adventures they reached home once more. And they limped ashore weary and worn, with long ragged beards and sunburned cheeks, and garments torn and weather-stained. No strength had they left to haul the ship up the beach. They just crawled out and sat down and wept, till they could weep no more. For the houses and trees were all altered, and all the faces which they saw were strange, and their joy was swallowed up in sorrow, while they thought of their youth and all their labor, and the gallant comrades they had lost. And the people crowded round and asked them, Who are you that sit weeping here? We are the sons of your princess, who sailed away many a year ago. We went to fetch the golden fleece, and we have brought it back. Then there was shouting and laughing and weeping, and all the kings came to the shore, and they led the heroes away to their homes, and bewailed the valiant dead. Old and charming, as is the story of the Argonauts, it is made up of travelers' tales, probably told to the Greeks by the Phoenicians of their adventures on unknown seas. The wanderings of Ulysses by the old Greek poet Homer shows us that, though they seldom ventured beyond the Mediterranean Sea, yet the Greeks were dimly conscious of an outer world beyond the recognized limits. They still dreamed that the earth was flat, and that the ocean stream flowed for ever round and round it. There were no maps or charts to guide the intrepid mariners who embarked on unknown waters. The siege of Troy, famous in legend, was over, and the heroes were anxious to make their way home. Ulysses was one of the heroes, and he sailed forth from Asia Minor into the Aegean Sea, but contrary winds drove him as far south as Cape Malea. Now the gatherer of the clouds, he says, in telling his story, aroused the north wind against our ships with a terrible tempest, and covered land and sea alike with clouds, and down sped night from heaven. Thus the ships were driven headlong, and their sails were torn to shreds by the might of the wind. So we lowered the sails into the hold in fear of death, and rode the ships landward apace. Throughout all ages, Cape Malea has been renowned for sudden and violent storms, 
dreaded by early mariners as well as those of later times. Thence for nine whole days was I borne by ruinous winds over the teeming deep, but on the tenth day we set foot on the land of the lotus eaters who eat a flowery food. Now ten days sailed to the south would have brought Ulysses to the coast of North Africa, and here we imagine the lotus eaters dwelt. But their stay was short, for as soon as the mariners tasted the honey sweet fruit of the lotus, they forgot their homes, forgot their own land, and only wanted to stay with the mild eyed, melancholy lotus eaters. They set them down upon the yellow sand, between the sun and moon upon the shore, and sweet it was to dream of fatherland, of child and wife and slave, but evermore. Most weary seemed the sea, weary the oar, weary at the wandering fields of barren foam. Then someone said, We will return no more. And all at once they sang, Our island home is far beyond the wave, we will no longer roam. Therefore, said Ulysses, I led them back to the ships, weeping and sore against their will, and dragged them beneath the benches. Soon they embarked, and sitting orderly, they smote the grey sea water with their oars. Thence we sailed onward, stricken at heart, and we came to the land of the Kiklops. No one knows exactly where the land of the Kiklops is. Some think it may be Sicily, and the slopes of Mount Etna facing the sea. The famous rock of Scylla and whirlpool of Caribis, known to the ancients as two sea monsters, near the Straits of Messina, and exclaimed his attention. Let us see how Ulysses passed them. We began to sail up the narrow strait, he says lamenting, for on the one side lay Scylla, and on the other mighty Charybdis, sucking down the salt sea water. Like a cauldron on a great fire, she would seethe up through all her troubled deeps, and overheard the spray fell on the top of either cliff, the rock around roared horribly, and pale fear got hold of my men. Toward her, then, we looked, fearing destruction. But Scylla, meanwhile, caught from out my hollow ship six of my company. They cried aloud in their agony, and there she devoured them, shrieking at her gates, they stretching forth their hands to me in their death struggles. And the most pitiful thing was this, that mine eyes have seen of all my travail, in searching out the paths of the sea. Some have thought that the terrifying stories of Scylla, Charybdis, and the Kiklops were stories invented by the Phoenicians to frighten travelers of other nations away from the sea that they wished to keep for themselves for purposes of trade. It would take too long to tell of the great storm that destroyed the ships and drowned the men, leaving Ulysses to make a raft on which he drifted about for nine days. Blown back to Scylla and Charybdis, and from thence to the island of Ogygia, in the centre of the sea. Finally he reached his home in Ithaca, so changed, so aged and weather-worn, that only his dog Argus recognized him. This, very briefly, is Homer's world picture of a bygone age, when those who were seized with a thirst for travel sailed about the Mediterranean in their primitive ships, landing on unnamed coasts, cruising about unknown islands, meeting strange people, encountering strange adventures. It all reads like an old fairy tale to us today, for we have our maps and charts and know the whereabouts of every country and island about the tideless Mediterranean. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 3 Is the World Flat? Still, although the men of ancient time were learning fast about the land and sea, they were woefully ignorant. Hesiod, a Greek poet, 
who lived seven hundred and fifty years before the Christian era, declared that the world was flat, and the ocean stream, or the perfect river, as he called it, flowed round and round, encompassing all things. Still, there was something beyond the water, something dim, mysterious, unknowable. It might be the islands of the blessed, it might be the sacred isle. One thing he asserted firmly, Atlas upholds the broad heaven, standing on earth's verge with head and unwearied hands, while the clear-voiced Hesperides guarded their beautiful golden apples beyond the waters of ocean. Hesperus and his daughters three, that sung about the golden tree. But who thinks now of the weary titan, doomed forever to support the ancient world on his head and hands, when the atlas of today is brought forth for a lesson in geography? About this time comes a story, it may be fact or it may be fiction, that the Phoenicians had sailed right round Africa. The voyage was arranged by Neko, an enterprising Egyptian king, who built his ships in the Red Sea in the year 613 B.C. The story is told by Herodotus, the Greek traveler, many years afterwards. Libya, he says, is known to be washed on all sides by the sea, except where it is attached to Asia. This discovery was first made by Neko, the Egyptian king, who sent a number of ships manned by Phoenicians, with orders to make for the Pillars of Hercules, now known as the Straits of Gibraltar, and return to Egypt through them and by the Mediterranean Sea. The Phoenicians took their departure from Egypt by way of the Eritrean Sea, and so sailed into the Southern Ocean. When autumn came, it is supposed they left the Red Sea in August, they went ashore wherever that might happen to be, and having sown a tract of land with corn, waited until the grain was fit to cut. Having reaped it, they set sail, and thus it came to pass, that two whole years went by, and it was not till the third year that they doubled the pillars of Hercules, and made good their voyage home. On their return they declared, I for my part, says Herodotus, do not believe them, but perhaps others may, that in sailing round Libya, they had the sun upon their right hand. In this way was the extent of Libya first discovered. To modern students who have learned more of Phoenician enterprise, the story does not seem so incredible as it did to Herodotus, and a modern poet, Edwin Arnold, has dreamed into a verse a delightful account of what his, this voyage may have been like. Ithobal of Tyre, chief captain of the seas, Standing before Nico, Pharaoh and king, ruler of Nile and its lands, relates the story of his two years' voyage, of the strange things he saw, of the hardships he endured, of the triumphant end. He tells how, with the help of mechanics from Tarnish, Tyre and Sidon, he built three goodly ships, Ocean's Children in a windless creek on the Red Sea, how he loaded them with clothes and beads, the wares wild people love. Food flour for the ship, cakes, honey, oil, pulse, meal, dried fish and rice, and salted goods. Then the start was made down the Red Sea, until at last the great ocean opened east and south to the unknown world, and into the great nameless sea, by the coast of the large land whence none has come, they sailed. Ithobald had undertaken no light task, Contrary winds, mutiny on board, want of fresh water, all the hardships that confront the mariner who pilots his crews in search of the unknown. Strange tribes met them on the coast and asked them whither they went. We go as far as the sun goes, as far as the sea rolls, as far as the stars, shine still in sky, to find for mighty Pharaoh what his world holds hidden. South and ever south they sailed, day after day and night succeeding night, close clinging to the shore. New stars appeared, lower and lower sank the sun, moons rose and waned, and still the coast stretched southwards till they reached a cape of storms, and found the coast was turning north. 
and now occurred that strange phenomenon mentioned by Herodotus, that while sailing westwards the sun was on their right hand. No man had seen that thing in Syria or in Egypt. A year and a half had now passed away since they left home, but onward to the north they now made their way, past the mouth of the Golden Waters, Orange River, past the Niger, past the island of gorillas described by Hanno, who explored the west coast under Nico, either before or after this time, until at last the little Phoenician ships sailed peacefully into the Mediterranean Sea. Here is the ocean gate, here is the strait, twice before seen, where goes the middle sea. And to the setting sun and the unknown, no more unknown, it about ships have sailed, around all Africa. Our task is done. These are the pillars, this the Midland Sea. The road to Tyre is yonder, every wave is homely. Yonder shore old Nilus pours, into this sea, the waters of the world, whose secret is his own and thine and mine. It will ever remain one of the many disputed points in early geography, whether or not Africa was circumnavigated at this early date. If the Phoenicians did accomplish such a feat, they kept their experiences as secret as usual, and the early maps gave a very wrong idea of South Africa. On the other hand, we know they had good seaworthy ships in advance of their neighbors. I remember, says Xenophon, I once went aboard a Phoenician ship, where I observed the best example of good order that I ever met with, and especially it was surprising to observe the vast numbers of implements which were necessary for the management of such a small vessel. What numbers of oars, stretchers, ship hooks, and spikes were there for bringing the ship in and out of the harbor? What number of shrouds, cables, ropes, and other tackling for the ship? What a vast quantity of provisions were there for the sustenance and support of the sailors. Captain and sailors knew where everything was stowed away on board, and, while the captain stood upon the deck, he was considering with himself what things might be wanting in his voyage, what things wanted repair, and what length of time his provisions would last. For, as he observed to me, it is no proper time, when the storm comes upon us, to have the necessary implements to seek, or to be out of repair, or to want them on board, for the gods are never favorable to those who are negligent or lazy, and it is their goodness that they do not destroy us when we are diligent. There is an old story which says that one day the Greeks captured a Phoenician ship and copied it. However this may be, the Greeks soon became great colonizers themselves, and we have to thank a Greek philosopher living in Miletus, on the coast of Asia Minor, for making the first map of the ancient world. Of course, the Babylonians and Egyptians had made maps thousands of years before this. But this Greek, Anaximander, introduced the idea of map-making to the astonished world about the year 580 B.C., what was the map like? It was a bronze tablet where upon the whole circuit of the earth was engraved with all its seas and rivers. This is all we know, but this map-making Greek was famous for another idea in advance of his time. He used to study the heavens and the earth, and after much study he made up his mind that the earth was round and not flat. He taught that the world hung free in the midst of the universe, or rather in the midst of the waters. The center of the earth was at Delphi. In the world of legend, there was a reason for this. Two eagles had been let loose, one from the eastern extremity of the world, the other from the west, and they met at Delphi. Hence it was assumed that Delphi was at the center of the world. And Delphi at this time was such a wonderful city, on the slopes of Mount Parnassus it stood high on a rock. On the heights stood the temple of Apollo with its immense riches, its golden statue of the great god, and its ever-smoking fire of wood. In the same way, in those days of imperfect geography, 
as we hear of Delphi being the center of the Greek world, so we hear of Jerusalem being considered the central point of the world. This is your Jerusalem, says Ezekiel, in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. In the Mappamundi, 13th century, in Hereford Cathedral, Jerusalem is still the center of the earth. Following close on these ideas came another. It too came from Miletus, now famous for its school of thought and its searchers after truth. A Tour of the World is the grand-sounding title of the work of Hecataeus, who wrote it about 500 years B.C. It contains an account of the coast and islands of the Mediterranean Sea, and an outline of all the lands the Greeks thought they knew. In the fragments that have come down to us, the famous old geographer divides both his work and the world into two parts. One part he calls Europe, the other Asia, in which he includes Africa, bounded by the river Nile. He held that these two parts were equal. They were divided from one another by the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, while round the whole flat world still flowed the everlasting ocean stream. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of A Book of Discovery – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh – Chapter 4 – Herodotus the Traveler The greatest traveler of olden times now comes upon the scene, Herodotus the Greek, the father of history. He is a traveler as well as a writer. He has journeyed as one eager for knowledge, with a hungry heart and a keen, observant eye. He tells us what he has seen with his eyes, what he has heard with his ears. He insists that the world is flat. He acknowledges that it is divided into two parts, Europe and Asia. But he can afford to laugh at those who draw maps of the world without any sense to guide them, in which they make the whole world round, as if drawn with a pair of compasses, with the ocean stream running round it, making Europe and Asia of equal size. His first journey is to Egypt. I speak at length about Egypt, he says, because it contains more marvelous things than any other country, things too strange for words. Not only is the climate different from that of the rest of the world, and the rivers unlike any other rivers, but the people also, in most of their manners and customs, reverse the common practice of mankind. The women are employed in trade and business, while the men stay at home to spin and weave. Other nations is weaving, throw the woof up the warp, but an Egyptian throws it down. In other countries, Sons are constrained to make provision for their parents. In Egypt it is not only the sons, but the daughters. In other countries the priests have long hair. In Egypt their heads are shaven. Other nations fasten their ropes and hooks to the outside of their sails, but the Egyptians to the inside. The Greeks write and read from left to right, but the Egyptians from right to left. After sailing for some seven hundred miles up the river Nile, from the coast, past Heliopolis, the once famous city of ancient Egypt, past Memphis, the old capital, past Thebes, with its hundred gates, to Elephantine, the ivory island, opposite to what is now Aswan, he is more than ever puzzled about its course and the reason of its periodical floods. Concerning the nature of the river, I was not able to gain any information from the priests. I was particularly anxious to learn from them why the Nile, at the commencement of the summer solstice, begins to rise and continues to increase for a hundred days, and why, as soon as that number is passed, it forthwith retires and contracts its stream, continuing low during the whole of the winter, 
until the summer solstice comes round again. On none of these points could I obtain any explanation from the inhabitants, though I made every inquiry. The sources of the Nile entirely baffled Herodotus, as they baffled many another later explorer, long years after he had passed away. Of the sources of the Nile no one can give any account, since the country through which it passes is desert and without inhabitants. He explains, his thirst for knowledge unsatisfied. Some priest volunteers this explanation. On the frontiers of Egypt are two high mountain peaks called Krofi and Mofi. In an unfathomable abyss between the two rose the Nile. But Herodotus does not believe in Krofi and Mofi. He inclines to the idea that the Nile rises away in the west and flows eastward right across Libya. He traveled a little about Libya himself, literalizing the size of the great continent of Africa through which he passed. Many a strange tale of these unknown parts did he relate to his people at home. He had seen the tallest and handsomest race of men in the world, who lived to the age of one hundred and twenty years. Gold was so abundant that it was used even for the prisoner's chains. He had seen folks who lived on meat and milk only, never having seen bread or wine. Some thirty days' journey from the land of the lotus-eaters, he had found tribes who hunted with four-horse chariots, and whose oxen walked backwards as they grazed, because their horns curved outwards in front of their heads, and if they moved forward, these horns would stick in the ground. Right across the desolate sandy desert of the north, Herodotus seems to have made his way. The region of the wild beasts must have been truly perilous, for this is the tract, he says, in which huge serpents are found, and the lions, the elephants, the bears, and the horned asses. He also tells us of antelopes, gazelles, asses, foxes, wild sheep, jackals, and panthers. There is no end to the quaint sights he records. Here is a tribe whose wives drive the chariots to battle, here another who paints themselves red and eat honey and monkeys, another who grow their hair long on the right side of their heads, and shave it close on the left. Back through Egypt to Syria went our observant traveler, visiting the famous seaport of Tyre on the way. I visited the temple of Hercules at that place, and found two pillars, one of pure gold, the other of emerald, shining with great brilliancy at night. That temple was already 2,300 years old. Herodotus makes some astounding statements about various parts of the world. He asserts that a good walker could walk across Asia Minor from north to south in five days, a distance we now know to be 300 miles. He tells us that the Danube rises in the Pyrenees Mountains and flows right through Europe till it empties its waters into the Black Sea, giving us a long and detailed account of a country he calls Scythia, Russia, with many rivers flowing into the same Black Sea. But here we must leave the old traveler, and picture him reading aloud to his delighted hearers his account of his discoveries and explorations, discussing with learned Greeks of the day the size and wonders of the world as they imagined it. News traveled slowly in these bygone days, and we know the Phoenicians were very fond of keeping their discoveries secret but it seems strange to think that Herodotus never seems to have heard the story of Hanno the Carthaginian, who coasted along the west of North Africa, being the first explorer to reach the place we know as Sierra Leone. Hanno's Periplus, or the Coasting Survey of Hanno, is one of the few Phoenician documents that has lived through the long ages. In it, the commander of expedition, himself tells his own story. With an idea of colonizing, he left Carthage, the most famous of the Phoenician colonies, with sixty ships containing an enormous number of men and women. When we had set sail, says Hanno shortly, and passed the pillars of Hercules after two days' voyage, we founded the first city. Below the city lay a great plain. 
Sailing thence westward, we came to a promontory of Libya, thickly covered with trees. Here we built a temple to the sea god, and proceeded thence half a day's journey eastward, till we reached a lake, lying not far from the sea, and filled with abundance of great reeds. Here were feeding elephants and a great number of other wild animals. After we had gone a day's sail beyond the lakes, we founded cities near to the sea. Making friends with the tribes along the coast, they reached the Senegal River. Here they fell in with savage men clothed with the skins of beasts, who pelted them with stones so that they could not land. Past Cape Verde they reached the mouth of the Campia, great and broad and full of crocodiles and river horses, and thence coasted twelve days to the south, and again five days to the south, which brought them to Sierra Leone, the Lion Mountain, as it was called long years after by the Portuguese. Here Hanno and his party landed, but as night approached, they saw flames issuing from the island, and heard the sound of flutes and cymbals and drums, and the noise of confused shouts. Great fear then came upon us. We sailed therefore quickly thence, much terrified, and passing on for four days, found at night a country full of fire. In the middle was a lofty fire, greater than all the rest, so that it seemed to touch the stars. When day came on, we found that this was a great mountain, which they called the Chariot of the Gods. They had a last adventure before they turned homeward at what they called the Isle of Gorillas. Here they found a savage people, gorillas, whom they pursued, but were unable to catch. At last they managed to catch three. But when these, biting and tearing those that led them, would not follow us, we slew them and, flaying off their skins, carried them to Carthage. Then abruptly this quaint account of the only Phoenician voyage on record stops. Further, says the commander, we did not sail, for our food failed us. Further knowledge of the world was now supplied by the Greeks, who were rapidly asserting themselves, and settling round the coast of the Mediterranean, as the Phoenicians had done before them. As in more ancient days Babylonians and Egyptians had dominated the little world, so now the power was shifting to the Greeks and Persians. The rise of Persia does not rightly belong to this story, which is not one of conquest and annexation, but of discovery. So we must content ourselves by stating the fact that Persia had become a very important country, with no less than fifty-six subject states, paying tribute to her, including the land of Egypt. Efforts to include Greece had failed. In the year 401 B.C., one Artaxerxes sat on the throne of Persia, the mighty empire, which extended eastwards beyond the knowledge of Greeks or Phoenicians, even to the unknown regions of the Indus. He had reigned for many years, when Cyrus, his brother, a dashing young prince, attempted to seize the throne. Collecting a huge army, including the famous ten thousand Greeks, he led them by way of Phrygia, Kilikia, and along the banks of the Euphrates, to within fifty miles of the gates of Babylon. The journey took nearly five months, a distance of one thousand seven hundred miles through recognized tracks. Here a battle was fought, and Cyrus was slain. It was midwinter when the ten thousand Greeks, who had followed their leader so loyally through the plains of Asia Minor, found themselves friendless and in great danger in the very heart of the enemy's country. Now Xenophon, a mere Greek volunteer, who had accompanied the army from the shores of Asia Minor, rose up and offered to lead his countrymen back to Greece, is a matter of history. It would take too long to tell in detail how they marched northward through the Assyrian plains, past the neighborhood of Nineveh, till they reached the mountain regions which were known to be inhabited by fierce fighters, and conquered even by the powerful Persians. Up to this time their line of retreat had followed the royal road of merchants and caravans. Their only chance of safety lay in striking north, 
into the mountains inhabited by this warlike tribe, who had held out amid their wild and rugged country against the Persians themselves. They now opposed the Greeks with all their might, and it took seven days of continuous fighting to reach the valley which lay between them and the high table-land of Armenia. They crossed the Tigris near its source, and a little farther on they also crossed the Euphrates, not far from its source, so they were informed by the Armenians. They now found themselves some five or six thousand feet above sea level, and in the midst of a bitter Armenian winter. Snow fell heavily, covering all tracks, and day after day a cold north-east wind, whose bitter blast was torture, increased their sufferings as they ploughed their way on, on and on through such depths of snow as they had never seen before. Many died of cold and hunger, many fell grievously sick, and others suffered from snow blindness and frostbite. But Xenophon led his army on, making his notes of the country through which they were toiling, measuring distances by the day's march, and at last one day when the soldiers were climbing a steep mountain, a cry, growing louder and more joyous every moment, ran the air. Thalassa, Thalassa, the sea, the sea. True enough, on the distant horizon, glittering in the sunlight, was a narrow silver streak of sea, the Black Sea, the goal of all their hopes. The long struggle of five months was over. They could sail home now along the shores of the Black Sea. They had reached the coast near the spot Colchis, where the Argonauts landed to win the Golden Fleece long centuries before. In a work known as the Anabasis, Xenophon wrote the adventures of the ten thousand Greeks, and no geographical explorer ever recorded his travels through unknown countries more faithfully than did the great leader of twenty three hundred years ago. End of chapter four. Chapter five of a Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 5 Alexander the Great Explores India. Still greater light was shed on the size of the world by Alexander the Great on his famous expedition to India, by which he almost doubled the area of the world known to the people of his time. It was just sixty years after Xenophon had made his way right across Asia to the shores of Black Sea, when Alexander resolved to break, if possible, the power of the Persians. The great Persian empire extended from the shores of the Mediterranean right away to the east, far beyond the knowledge of the Greeks. Indeed, their knowledge of the interior of Asia was very imperfect, and Alexander's expedition was rather that of an explorer than that of the conqueror. How he overthrew the Persians and subdued an area as large as Europe in the space of twelve years reads like a romance rather than fact, and it is not for us to tell the story in detail. Rather, let us take up the story after Alexander had fought and conquered the Persians, twice, besieged Tyre, taken the Phoenician fleet, occupied Egypt, marched across the desert and crossed the Euphrates, passed over the plain and followed the Tigris to near Nineveh, where he crossed that river too, fought another famous battle over the Persians, which decided the fate of king and monarchy, and opened to him the capitals of Babylon and Susa, wherein the immense treasures of the Persian Empire were stored. King of all Asia, he sat on the throne of the Persian kings, under a golden canopy in the palace of Persepolis. So far the whole expedition was our country known, if imperfectly, to the Greeks. Now we have to follow the conquering hero more closely as he leads us into an unknown land away to the east, known as the farthest region of the inhabited world towards the east, 
beyond which lies the endless sandy desert void of inhabitants. And all the while the great land of India lay beyond, and beyond again was China, and away far over the ocean sea lay America, and they knew it not. Alexander was a young man yet, only twenty-six. It was four years since he had left Europe, and in that short time he had done wonders. He had conquered the whole eastern half of the Persian Empire. Now he resolutely turned his face to the unknown east, and started forth on an expedition of exploration. Following the main highway from Media, which today leads from Tehran, capital of modern Persia, into the land of the Turkomans and the borders of Russia, he found himself between the great salt desert and the mountains, which today mark the frontier of Persia. Suddenly, to his great surprise, the Caspian Sea came into sight. It seemed about the same size as the Black Sea, and he concluded it was connected with the Sea of Azov, though the men of his day were certain enough that it was the most northern of four great gulfs connected with the outer ocean which flowed round the world. Onwards, towards the east, he marched with his great army. To conciliate the tribes through which he passed, he adopted Persian dress. This annoyed his Greek countrymen, but, as they admired his other virtues, they thought he might be suffered to please himself a little and enjoy his vanity. Arrived at the modern boundary between Persia, Afghanistan, and Russia, he and his men pushed on across Afghanistan by the caravan route that had long existed from the shores of the Caspian, by modern Herat, Kandahar, which still bears the conqueror's name, and Kabul to India. Their way lay through deep snow, deeper than they had ever seen before, and by the time they had reached the mountains of Kabul, it was midwinter. Between Alexander and India still lay the lofty range of the Hindu Kush, or Indian Caucasus. But before going south toward India, he turned northwards to explore the unknown country, which lay about the river Oxus. They found the Oxus, a mighty stream, swollen with melting snows. There were no boats and no wood to build them, so Alexander pioneered his men across in life preservers, made out of their leather tent coverings and stuffed with straw. This river impressed the Greeks even more than the Euphrates and Tigris, as it impressed many an explorer and poet since these early days. Let us recall Matthew Arnold's famous description of the Oxus, now seen for the first time by the Greeks. But the majestic river floated on, out of the midst and hum of that low land, into the frosty starlight he flowed, right for the fuller star past Orguny, brimming and bright and large, then sands begin, to hem his watery march and dumb his streams, and split his currents, that for many a league the shorn and parcelled oxus strains along, through beds of sand and matted rushy isles, oxus forgetting the bright speed he had, in his high mountain cradle in Pamir, a fold circuitous wanderer, till at last the longed-for dash of waves is heard and wide, his luminous home of water opens, bright and tranquil, from whose floor the new based stars emerge and shine upon the aral sea. Here in this valley the Greeks met more determined opposition than they had yet encountered since entering Asia and over two years were occupied in reducing this single district, now Bokhara and Turkestan, to submission, though it was only some 350 miles square, and in one single year Alexander had conquered a kingdom over 1,000 miles in width. It was not till the spring of 827 B.C. that he was ready to cross the Hindu Kush and begin the great expedition into India. The night before the start, Alexander discovered that his troops were now so heavily laden with spoils that they were quite unfit for the long march. So, in the early morning, when they were all ready to start, he suddenly set fire to his own baggage, and giving orders 
that all his men were to do the same, the army started for the passes of the lofty mountain rage. And, as a troop of peddlers from Kabul cross underneath the Indian Caucasus, the vast sky neighboring mountain of milk snow, crossing so high that, as they mount, they pass, long flocks of traveling birds dead on the snow, choked by the air and scarce can they themselves, slake their parched throats with sugared mulberries. In single file they move and stop their breath, for fear they should dislodge the overhanging snows. The banks of the river of Kabul were reached at last. Sending part of the army by the now famous Kiber Pass toward the Indus, Alexander himself undertook to subdue the mountain tribes and get control of the Ketral passes. The shepherds of the region opposed him vigorously, but swiftly and pitilessly the king of Asia sacked their peaceful homes, and city after city fell to him as he advanced toward the boundaries of Kashmir. At last the valley of the Indus was reached. A bridge of boats was hastily thrown over, and Alexander and his army passed to the other side. Porus, the ruler of the country between the Indus and the river Hidaspes, Jerlam, sent presents of welcome to the invader, including three thousand animals for sacrifice, ten thousand sheep, thirty elephants, two hundred talents of silver, and seven hundred horsemen. The new king was also greeted with presents of ivory and precious stones. Even from far Kashmir came greetings to Alexander, whose fame was spreading rapidly. He now entered the Punjab, the land of the five rivers. But on the other side of the river Hidaspis, a different reception awaited him. There the king Porus had assembled a sturdy, well-disciplined troop to dispute the passage of the river, which separated the new king of Asia from his territory. But under cover of a mighty thunderstorm, Alexander contrived to cross, though the river was rushing down yellow and fierce after the rains. Secretly the Greeks put together their thirty oared galleys, hidden in a wood, and utterly surprised Porus by landing on the other side. In their strange wanderings the Greeks had fought under varying conditions, but they had never faced elephants before. Nevertheless, they brilliantly repulsed an onslaught of these animals, who slowly retreated, facing the foe like ships backing water, and nearly uttering a shrill piping sound. Despite the elephants, the old story was repeated. Civilized arms triumphed over barbarians, and the army of Porus was annihilated, his chariots shattered, and thirty-three thousand men slain. The kingdom beyond the Hidaspes was now Alexander's. Ordering a great fleet of rafts and boats to be built for his proposed voyage to the mouth of the Indus, he pushed on to complete the conquest of the five-stream land, or the Punjab, the last province of the great Persian Empire. This was India, all that was known at this time. The India of the Gangs Valley was beyond the knowledge of the Western world, the Gangs itself unknown to the Persians. And Alexander saw no reason to change his mind. The great sea surrounds the whole earth, he stoutly maintained. But when he reached the eastern limit of the Punjab and heard that beyond lay a fertile land, where the inhabitants were skilled in agriculture, where there were elephants in yet greater abundance, and men were superior in stature and courage, the world stretched out before him in an unexpected direction, and he launched to explore farther, to conquer new and utterly unknown worlds. But at last his men struck, they were weary, some were wounded, some were ill. Seventy days of incessant rain had taken the heart out of them. I am not ignorant, soldiers, said Alexander to the hesitating troops, that during the last few days the natives of this country have been spreading all sorts of rumors to work upon your fears. The Persians in this way sought to terrify you with the gates of Kilikia, with the plains of Mesopotamia, with the Tigris and Euphrates, and yet this river you crossed by a ford, and that by means of a bridge. By my troth, 
we had long ago fled from Asia could fables have been able to scare us. We are not standing on the threshold of our enterprise, but at the very close. We have already reached the sunrise and the ocean, and unless your sloth and cowardice prevent, we shall thence return in triumph to our native land, having conquered the earth to its remotest bounds. I beseech you that ye desert not your king just at the very moment when he is approaching the limits of the inhabited world. But the soldiers, with their heads bent earthwards, stood in silence. It was not that they would not follow him beyond the sunset. They could not. Their tears began to flow. Sobs reached the ears of Alexander. His anger turned to pity, and he wept with his men. Oh, sir, at last cried one of his men, we have done and suffered up to the full measure of the capacity of mortal nature. We have traversed seas and lands, and know them better than do the inhabitants themselves. We are standing now almost on the earth's utmost verge, and yet you are preparing to go in quest of an India unknown even to the Indians themselves. You would fain root out, from their hidden recesses and dens, a race of men that herd with snakes and wild beasts, so that you may traverse as a conqueror more regions than the sun surveys. But while your courage will be ever growing, our vigor is fast waning to its end. See how bloodless be our bodies, pierced with how many wounds and gashed with how many scars. Our weapons are blunt, our armor worn out. We have been driven to assume the Persian dress. Which of us has a horse? We have conquered all the world, but are ourselves destitute of all things. The conqueror was at last conquered. The order to turn back was reluctantly given by the disappointed king and leader. It was received with shouts of joy from the mixed multitudes of his followers, and the expedition faced for home. Back they marched through the new lands, where no less than two thousand cities had owned his sway, till they came to the banks of the river, where the ships were building. Two thousand boats were ready, including eighty thirty-oared galleys. It was now September 326 B.C. Nearhus from Crete was made admiral of the new fleet, which at dawn one October morning pushed out upon the river Hydaspes and set sail downstream towards the unknown sea, Alexander standing proudly on the prow of the royal galley. The trumpets rang out, the oars moved, and the strange argosy, such as had never been seen before in these parts, made its way down the unknown river to the unknown sea. Natives swarmed to the banks of the river to wonder at the strange sight, marveling specially to see horses as passengers on board. The greater part of the army followed the ships on land, marching along the shores. At last the waters of the Hydaspes mingled with those of the Indus, and onwards down this great river floated the Persian fleet. Alexander had no pilots, no local knowledge of the country, but with his unquenchable ambition to see the ocean and reach the boundaries of the world, he sailed on, ignorant of everything on the way they had to pass. In vain they asked the natives assembled on the banks how far distant was the sea. They had never heard of the sea. At last they found a tide mixing its salt waters with the fresh. Soon a flood tide burst upon them, forcing back the current of the river and scattering the fleet. The sailors of the Mediterranean knew nothing of the rise and fall of tides. They were in a state of panic and consternation. Some tried to push off their ships with long poles, others tried to row against the incoming tide. Prows were dashed against poops, Oars were broken, sterns were bumped, until at last the sea had flowed over all the level land near the river mouth. Suddenly a new danger appeared. The tide turned and the sea began to recede. Further misfortunes now befell the ships. Many were left high and dry. Most of them were damaged in some way or another. 
Alexander sent horsemen to the seashore with instructions to watch for the return of the tide, and to ride back in haste so that the fleet might be prepared. Thus they got safely out to sea on the next high tide. Alexander's explorations were now at the end. Leaving Nerhus to explore the sea coast at the mouth of the Indus, he left the spot near where the town of Hyderabad now stands, and turned his face toward the home he was never to reach. We must not linger over his terrible coast journey through the scorching desert of Beluchistan, the billows of sand, the glare of the barren sea, the awful thirst, the long hungry marches of forty miles a day under the burning eastern sun. Our story is one of discovery, and we must turn to Nerhus, admiral of the fleet, left behind at the mouth of the Indus to explore the coast of the Persian Gulf, where he was to meet Alexander if possible. Shortly after the fleet had emerged from the mouth of the Indus, a violent southwest monsoon began to blow, and Nerhus was obliged to seek shelter in a harbor, which he called the Port of Alexander, but which today is known as Karachi, the most western seaport of India. The waters of the Indian Ocean were quite unknown to the Greeks, and they could only coast along in sight of land, anchoring at different points for the man to land and get water and food. Past the wild barren shores of Beluchistan they made their way. The natives subsisted on fish, entirely even as they do today, even their huts being made of fish bones, and their bread of pounded fish. They had but one adventure in their five months' cruise to the Persian Gulf, but we have a graphic account of how the terrified Greeks met a shoal of whales, and how they frightened the whales away. Here is the story. One day, towards daybreak, they suddenly saw water spouting up from the sea, as if being violently carried upwards by whirlwinds. The sailors, feeling very frightened, asked their native guides what it meant. The natives replied that it was caused by whales blowing the water up into the air. At this explanation the Greek sailors were panic-stricken and dropped the oars from their hands. Norhus saw that something must be done at once, so he bade the men draw up their ships in line as if for battle and row forward side by side towards the whales, shouting and splashing with their oars. At a given signal they duly advanced, and when they came near the sea monsters, they shouted with all their might, and blew their trumpets, and made all possible noise with their oars. On hearing which, says the old story, the whales took fright and plunged into the depth, but not long after came to the surface again, close to the sterns of the vessels, and once more spouted great jets of water. Then the sailors shouted aloud at their happy and unlooked-for escape, and Nerhus was cheered as the saviour of the fleet. It is not uncommon today for steamers bound from Aden to Bombay to encounter what is called a shoal of whales, similar to those which alarmed the fleet of Nerhus in the year 323 B.C. The expedition was completely successful, and Nerhus pioneered his fleet to the mouth of the Euphrates. But the death of Alexander the Great, and the confusion that followed, set back the advance of geographical discovery in this direction for some time. Alexandria, one of the many towns founded by Alexander, had become the world center of the learned from Europe, Asia, and Africa. Its position was unrivaled, situated at the mouth of the Nile, it commanded the Mediterranean Sea, while by the means of the Red Sea it held easy communication with India and Arabia. When Egypt had come under the sway of Alexander, he had made one of his generals ruler over that country, and men of intellect collected there to study and to write. A library was started, and a Greek, Eratosthenes, held the post of librarian at Alexandria for forty years, namely, from 240 till 190 B.C. During this period he made a collection of all the travels and books of Earth's description, the first the world had ever known, 
and stored them in the great library of which he must have felt so justly proud. But Erastotenius did more than this. He was the originator of scientific geography. He realized that no maps could be properly laid down till something was known of the size and shape of the earth. By this time all men of science had ceased to believe that the world was flat. They thought of it as a perfect round, but fixed at the center in space. Many had guessed at the size of the earth. Some said it was 40,000 miles round. But Aristotenes was not content with guessing. He studied the length of the shadow thrown by the sun at Alexandria, and compared it with that thrown by the sun at Sion, near the first cataract of the Nile, some five hundred miles distant, and, as he thought, in the same longitude. The differences in the length of these two shadows, he calculated, would represent one-fifties of the circumference of the earth, which would accordingly be twenty thousand miles. There was no one to tell him whether he had calculated right or wrong, but we know today that he was wonderfully right. But he must know more. He must find out how much of this earth was habitable. To the north and south of the known countries men declared it was too hot or too cold to live. So he decided that from north to south, that is, from the land of Tul to the land of Punt, Somaliland, the habitable earth stretched for some 3,800 miles, while from east to west, that is, from the pillars of Hercules, Straits of Gibraltar to India, would be some 8,000 miles. All the rest was ocean. Ignoring the division of the world into three continents, he divided it into two, north and south, divided by the Mediterranean and by a long range of mountains, intersecting the whole of Asia. Then the famous librarian drew a map of the world for his library at Alexandria, but it has perished with all the rest of the valuable treasure collected in this once celebrated city. We know that he must have made a great many mistakes in drawing a map of his little island world, which measured 8,000 miles by 3,800 miles. It must have been quaintly arranged, the Caspian Sea was connected with the Northern Ocean. The Danube sent a tributary to the Adriatic. There was no Bay of Biscay. The British Isles lay in the wrong direction. Africa was not half its right size. The gangs flowed into the Eastern Ocean. Ceylon was a huge island stretching east and west, while across the whole of Asia a mountain chain stretched in one long and broken line. And yet... With all his errors, he was nearer the truth than men three centuries later. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of A Book of Discovery – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 6. Pythias Finds the British Isles. For some centuries past, men had been pushing eastward, and to west, vast lands lay unexplored, and dreamed of, amongst them a little far-off island set in a silver sea. Pythias was the first explorer to bring the world news of the British Isles. About the time that Alexander was making his way eastward through Persia, Pythias was leaving the Greek colony of Marcelles from the west and north. The Phoenicians, with their headquarters at Carthage, had complete command of the mineral trade of Spain, the Mexico of the ancient world. They knew where to find the gold and silver from the rivers, indeed, they said that the coast, from the Tagus to the Pyrenees, was stuffed with mines of gold and silver and tin. The Greeks were now determined to see for themselves. The men of Carthage should no longer have it all their own way. Where were these tin islands kept so secret by the master mariners of the ancient world? A committee of merchants met at Marseilles and engaged the services of Pythias, a great mathematician, 
and one who made a study of the effect of the moon on the tides. All sorts of vague rumors had reached the ears of Pythias about the northern regions he was about to visit. He would discover the homes of the tin and amber merchants. He would find the people who lived at the back of the north wind. He would reach a land of perpetual sunshine, where swans sang like nightingales, and life was one unending banquet. So Pythias, the mathematician of Marcellus, started off on his northern trip. Unfortunately, his diary and book called The Circuit of the Earth have perished, and our story of geographical discovery is the poorer. But these facts have survived. The ships first touched at Cadiz, the Tyre of the West, a famous port in those days, where Phoenician merchants lived careless and secure and rich. This was the limit of Greek geographical knowledge. Here were the pillars of Hercules, beyond which all was dim and mysterious and interesting. Five days' sail, that is to say, some three hundred miles along the coast of Spain, brought Pythias to Cape St. Vincent. He thought he was navigating the swift ocean river flowing around the world. He was, therefore, surprised to find, as he rounded the Cape, that the current had ceased, or, in his own words, the ebb came to an end. Three days more, and they were at the mouth of the Tagus. Near this part of the coast lay the Tin Islands, according to Greek ideas, though even today their exact locality is uncertain. Pythias must have heard the old tradition that the Cassiterides were ten in number, and lay near each other in the ocean, they were inhabited by people who wore black cloaks and long tunics reaching to the feet, that they walked with long staves and subsisted by their cattle. They led a wandering life. They bartered hides, tin, and lead with the merchants in exchange for pottery, salt, and implements of bronze. That these islands had already been visited by Himilco the Carthaginian seems fairly certain. He had started from Cadiz for the north when Hanno started for the south. From the Tin Islands his fleet had ventured forth into the open sea. Thick fogs had hidden the sun, and the ships were driven south before a north wind, till they reached, though they did not know it, the Sargasso Sea, famous for its vast plains of seaweed, through which it was difficult to push the ships. Sea animals, he tells us, crept upon the tangled weed, it has been thought that with a little good fortune, Himilco might have discovered America two thousand years before the birth of Columbus. But Himilco returned home by the Azores, or Fortunate Islands, as they were called. Leaving the Tin Islands, Pythias voyaged on the Cape Finisterre, landing on the island of Ushant, where he found a temple served by women priests, who kept up a perpetual fire in honor of their god. Thence Pythias sailed prosperously on up to the English Channel, till he struck the coast of Kent. Britain, he announced, was several days' journey from Ushant, and about one hundred and seventy miles to the north. He sailed round part of the coast, making notes of distances, but these are curiously exaggerated. This was not unnatural, for the only method of determining distance was roughly based on the number of miles, that the ship could go in an hour along the shore. Measuring in this primitive fashion, Pythias assures us that Britain is a continent of enormous size, and that he has discovered a new world. It is, he says, three-cornered in shape, something like the head of a battle-axe. The south side, lying opposite the coast of France, is 835 miles in length, the eastern coast is 1,665 miles, the western 2,222. Indeed, the whole country was thought to be over 4,000 miles in circumference. These calculations must have been very upsetting to the old geographers of that age, because up to this time they had decided that the whole world was only 3,400 miles long and 6,800 broad. He tells us that he made journeys into the interior of Britain, that the inhabitants drink mead, 
and that there is an abundance of wheat in the fields. The natives, he says, collect the sheaves in great barns and trash out the corn there, because they have so little sunshine that an open trashing place would be of little use in that land of clouds and rain. He seems to have voyaged north as far as the Shetland Islands, but he never saw Ireland. Having returned from the north of the Thames, Petius crossed the North Sea to the mouth of the Rhine, a passage which took about two and a half days. He gives a pitiable account of the people living on the Dutch coast, and their perpetual struggle with the sea. The natives had not learned the art of making dikes and embankments. A high tide with a wind setting toward the shore would sweep over the low-lying country and swamp their homes. A mounted horseman could barely gallop from the rush and force of these strong North Sea tides. But the Greek geographers would not believe this. They only knew the tideless Mediterranean, and they thought Petius was lying when he told of the fierce northern sea. Petius sailed past the mouth of the Elbe, noting the amber cast upon the shore by the high spring tides. But all these interesting discoveries paled before the famous land of Thule, six days' voyage north of Britain, in the neighborhood of the frozen ocean. Grand excitement reigned among geographers when they heard of Thule, and a very sea of romance rose up around the name. Had Petius indeed found the end of the world? Was it an island? Was it mainland? In the childhood of the world, where so little was known and so much imagined, men's minds caught at the name of Tool, Ultima Thule, far away Tool, and weaved round it many and beautiful legends. But today we ask, was it Iceland? Was it Lapland? Was it one of the Shetland Isles? Petius said that the forces parts of the world are those which lie about Tool, the northernmost of the Britannic Isles. But he never said whether Tool was an island or whether the world was habitable by man, as far as that point. I should think myself, the speaker is Strabo, a famous Greek traveler who wrote seventeen books of geography, I should think myself that the northern limit of habitude lies much farther to the south, for the writers of our age say nothing of any place beyond Ireland, which is situated in front of the northern parts of Britain. Petius said that Tool was six days' sail north of Britain. But who in his senses would believe this? cries Strabo again. For Petius, who described Tool, has been shown to be the falsest of men. A traveller starting from the middle of Britain and going five hundred miles to the north, would come to a country somewhere about Ireland, where living would be barely possible. The first account of the Arctic regions likewise reads like pure romance to the ignorant and untraveled. After one day's journey to the north of Thule, says Petius, men come to a sluggish sea, where there is no separation of sea, land, and air, but a mixture of these elements, like the substance of jellyfish, through which one can neither walk nor sail. Here the nights were very short, sometimes only two hours, after which the sun rose again. This, in fact, was the sleeping palace of the sun. With all this wealth of discovery, Petius returned home by the Bay of Biscay to the mouth of the Gironde, thence sailed up the Garonne, and from the modern town of Bordeaux he reached Marcel's by an overland journey. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 7 Julius Caesar as Explorer Our next explorer is Julius Caesar. As Alexander the Great had combined the conqueror with the explorer, so now history repeats itself, and we find the Roman Caesar not only conquering but exploring. 
It was Caesar who first dispelled the mist that lay over the country about the French Seine, the German Rhine, the English Thames. Caesar, who gives us the first graphic account of crossing the English Channel from France to England. Pythias had hinted at the fog-bound lands of the north. Caesar brought them into the light of the day. Since the days of Alexander, the center of empire had shifted from Greece to Rome, and Rome was now conquering and annexing land, as Persia had done in the olden days. Hence it was that Julius Caesar was in the year 58 B.C., appointed governor of a new province recently brought under Roman sway, stretching from the Alps to the Garonne and northward to the Lake of Geneva, which at this time marked the frontier of the Roman Empire. Caesar made no secret of his intentions to subdue the tribes to the north of his province and bring all Gaul under the dominion of Rome. His appointment carried with it the command of four legions, including some twenty thousand soldiers. His chance soon came, and we find Caesar, with all the ability of a great commander, pushing forward with his army into the very heart of France, one hundred and fifty miles beyond the Roman frontier. On the banks of the river Saone, he defeated the large body of Celtic people who were migrating from Switzerland to make their homes in the warmer and roomier plains at the foot of the Pyrenees. While the defeated Celts returned to their chilly homes among the mountains, victorious Caesar resolved to push on at the head of his army toward the Rhine, where some German tribes, under a ferocious headstrong savage, threatened to overrun the country. After marching through utterly unknown country for three days, he heard that fresh swarms of invaders had crossed the Rhine, intending to occupy the more fertile tracts on the French side. They were making for the town we now call Ben Sasson, then, as now, strongly fortified, and nearly surrounded by the river Dobes. By forced marches night and day, Caesar hastened to the town, and took it before the arrival of the invaders. Accounts of the German tribes, even now approaching, were brought in by native traders and Gaulish chiefs, until the Roman soldiers were seized with alarm. Yes, said the traders, these Germans were men of huge stature, incredible valor, and practiced skill in wars. Many a time they had themselves come across them, and had not been able to look them in the face or meet the glare of their piercing eyes. The Romans felt they were in an unknown land, about to fight against an unknown foe. Violent panic seized them, completely paralyzing everyone's judgment and nerve. Some could not restrain their tears, others shut themselves up in their tents and bemoaned their fate. All over the camp men were making their wills, until Caesar spoke, and the panic ceased. Seven days' march brought them to the plain of Alsace some fifty miles from the Rhine. A battle was fought with the German tribes, and the enemy all turned tail and did not cease their flight until they reached the Rhine. Some swam across, some found boats, many were killed by the Romans in hot pursuit. For the first time Romans beheld the German Rhine, that great river that was to form a barrier for so long between them and the tribes beyond. But Caesar's exploration was not to end here. The following year found him advancing against the Belgi, tribes living between the Rhine and the Seine. In one brilliant campaign he subdued the whole of northeastern Gaul, from the Seine to the Rhine. Leaving Roman soldiers in the newly conquered country, he returned to his province, and was some eight hundred miles away when he heard that a general rebellion was breaking out in that part we now know as Brittany. He at once ordered ships to be built on the Loire, which flows into the ocean, oarsmen to be trained, seamen and pilots assembled. The spring of 56 B.C. found Caesar at the seat of war. His ships were ready on the Loire, but the navy of the Veneti was strong. They were a sea-going folk, who knew their own low rocky coast, intersected by shallow inlets of the sea. They knew their tides and their winds. Their flat-bottomed boats were suitable to shallows and ebbing tides. Bows and sterns stood high out of the water, 
to resist heavy seas and severe gales. The hulls were built of oak. Leather was used for sails to withstand the violent ocean storms. The long Roman galleys were no match for these, and things would have gone badly had not Caesar devised a plan of cutting the enemy's rigging with hooks, sharpened at the end and fixed to long poles. With these, the Romans cut the rigging of the enemy's ships, forming the fleet of Brittany. The sails fell, and the ships were rendered useless. One after another they were easily captured, and at sunset the victory lay with the Romans. The whole of Gaul, from the Rhine to the Pyrenees, seemed now subdued. Caesar had conquered as he explored, and the skill of his well-disciplined army triumphed everywhere over the untrained courage of the barbarian tribes. Still, the German tribes were giving trouble about the country of the Rhine, and, in the words of the famous commentaries, Caesar was determined to cross the Rhine, but he hardly thought it safe to cross in boats. Therefore, although the construction of a bridge presented great difficulties on account of the breadth, swiftness, and depth of the stream, he nevertheless thought it best to make the attempt or else not cross at all. Indeed, he wanted to impress the wild German people on the other side with a sense of the vast power of the Roman Empire. The barbarian tribes beyond must, indeed, have been impressed with the skill of the Roman soldier. For in ten days the bridge was completed. Timber had been hauled from the forest, brought to the banks of the Rhine, worked into shape, piles driven into the bed of the river, beams laid across and Caesar led his army in triumph to the other side. They stood for the first time in the land of the Germans, near the modern town of Koblenz, and after eighteen days on the farther side, they returned to Gaul, destroying the bridge behind them. Caesar had now a fresh adventure in view. He was going to make his way to Britain. The summer of 55 B.C. was passing, and in these parts, the whole of Gaul having a northerly trend, winter sets in early, wrote Caesar afterwards. There would be no time to conquer, but he could visit the island, find out for himself what the people were like, learn about harbors and landing places. For of all this the Greeks knew practically nothing. No one, indeed, readily undertakes the voyage to Britain except traders, and even they know nothing of it except the coast. Caesar summoned all the traders he could collect, and inquired the size of the island, what tribes dwelt there, their names, their customs, and the shortest sea passage. Then he went for the ships which had vanquished the fleet of Brittany the previous year. He also assembled some eighty merchant ships on the northern coast of Gaul, probably not very far from Calais. It was near the end of August, when soon after midnight the wind served and he set sail. A vision of the great Roman, determined, resolute, rises before us, as, standing on the deck of the galley, he looks out on the dark waters of the unknown sea, bound for the coast of England. After a slow passage, the little fleet arrived under the steep white cliffs of the southern coast, about nine o'clock next morning. Armed forces of barbarians stood on the heights above Dover, and, finding it impossible to land, Caesar gave orders to sail some seven miles further, along the coast, where they ran the ships aground, not far from Deal. But the visit of the Romans to Britain on this occasion lasted but three days, for a violent storm scattered the ships with the horses on board. The same night, says Caesar, it happened to be full moon, which generally causes very high tides in the ocean, a fact of which our men were not aware. Indeed, we may well believe that a night of full moon and an unusually high tide would be a mystery to those children of the Mediterranean. Their ships had been beached and were lying high and dry when the rapidly rising tide overwhelmed them. Cables were broken, anchors lost, panic ensued. But Caesar's glory lay in overcoming obstacles, and it is well known how he got his troops and ships safely back, across the channel, and how preparations were hurried on in Gaul for a second invasion of Britain. 
This is not the place for the story of his campaign. He was the first to raise the curtain on the mysterious islands discovered by Pythias. For to the west, in the ocean wide, beyond the realm of Gaul, a land there lies. Seagirt it lies, where giants dwelt of old. Caesar remarks on this newfound land are interesting for us today. He tells us of a river called the Thames, about eight miles from the sea. The interior of Britain, he says, is inhabited by a people who, according to tradition, are aboriginal. The population is immense. Homesteads closely resembling those of the Gauls are met with at every turn, and cattle are very numerous. Gold coins are in use, or iron bars of fixed weight. Hares, fowls, and geese, they think it wrong to taste, but they keep them for pastime or amusement. The climate is more equable than in Gaul, the cold being less severe. The island is triangular in shape, one side being opposite Gaul. One corner of this side by Kent, the landing place for almost all ships from Gaul, has an easterly and the lower one a westerly aspect. The extent of this side is about 500 miles. The second trends off towards Spain. Off the coast here is Ireland, which is considered only half as large as Britain. Halfway across is an island called Man, and several smaller islands also are believed to be situated opposite the coast, in which there is continuous night for 30 days. The length of this side is 800 miles. Thus the whole island is 2,000 miles in circumference. The people of the interior do not, for the most part, cultivate grain, but live on milk and flesh meat, and clothe themselves with skins. All Britons, without exception, stain themselves with woad, which produces a bluish tint. They wear their hair long. Caesar crossed the Thames. The river can only be forded at one spot, he tells us, and there with difficulty. Farther he did not go, and so this is all that was known of Britain for many a long year to come. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit a LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter Eight Strabo's Geography. Strabo wrote his famous geography near the beginning of the Christian era but he knew nothing of the north of England, Scotland, or Wales. He insisted on placing Ireland to the north, and scoffed at Pythias' account of Tool. And yet he boasted a wider range than any other writer on geography, for that those who had penetrated farther towards the west had not gone so far to the east, and those on the contrary who had seen more of the east had seen less of the west. Like Herodotus, Strabo had travelled himself from Armenia and western Italy, from the Black Sea to Egypt, and up the Nile to Philae. But the seventeen volumes, vastly important to his contemporaries, read like a romance to us today, and a glance at the map laid down, according to his descriptions, is like a vague and distorted caricature of the real thing. And yet, according to the men of his times, he surpasses all the geographical writings of antiquity, both in grandeur of plan and in abundance and variety of its materials. Strabo has summed for up for us the knowledge of the ancient world as it was in the days of the Emperor Caesar Augustus of the great Roman Empire, as it was when in far-off Syria the Christ was born, and the greater part of the known earth was under the sway of Rome. A wall map had already been designed by order of Augustus to hang in a public place in Rome, the heart of the empire, so that the young Romans might realize the size of their inheritance, while a list of the chief places and the roads, which, radiating from Rome, formed a network over the empire, was inscribed on the golden milestone in the forum. We may well imagine 
with what keen interest the schoolmen of Alexandria would watch the extension of the Roman Empire. Here Strabo had studied, here or at Rome he probably wrote his great work toward the close of a long life. He has read his Homer and inclines to take every word he says as true. Herodotus he will have none of. Herodotus and other writers trifle very much, he asserts, when they introduce into their histories the marvelous like an interlude of some melody. In like manner he disbelieves poor Pythias and his accounts of the land of Ultima Thule and his marvelous walks through Britain while he clings to the writings of Eratosthenes. But in common with them all, Strabo believes the world to be one vast island, surrounded on all sides by ocean, into which the rivers flow, and the Caspian Sea and Persian Gulf are but inlets. So in also the Mediterranean, or our sea, as he prefers to call it. This earth's island reaches north to south, from Ireland barely habitable on account of the cold, to the cinnamon country, Somaliland, the most southerly point of the habitable earth. From west to east it stretches from the pillars of Hercules, right through the middle of our sea, to the shores of Asia Minor, then across Asia, by an imaginary chain of mountains, to an imaginary spot where the gangs, lately discovered, emptied its waters in the world surrounding ocean stream. The breadth of the habitable earth is three thousand miles, the length about seven thousand. A little world, indeed, with the greater world lying all around it, still undreamed of by the old student of geography and the traveler after truth. He begins his book with a detailed account of southern Spain. He tells of her two hundred towns. Those best known are situated on the rivers, estuaries, and seas. But the two which have acquired the greatest name and importance are Cordova and Cadiz. After these, Seville is the most noted. A vast number of people dwell along the Quadalquivir, and you may sail up it almost a hundred and twenty miles from the sea to Cordova, and the places a little higher up. The banks and little inlets of this river are cultivated with the greatest diligence. The eye is also delighted with groves and gardens, which in this district are met with in the highest perfection. For fifty miles the river is navigable for ships of considerable size, but for the cities higher up smaller vessels are employed, and thence to Cordova river boats. These are now constructed of planks joined together, but they were formerly made out of a single trunk. A chain of mountains, rich in metal, runs parallel to the Quadalquivir, approaching the river, sometimes more, sometimes less, toward the north. He grows enthusiastic over the richness of this part of southern Spain, famous from ancient days, under the name of Tartessus, for its wealth. Large quantities of corn and wine are exported, besides much oil, which is of the first quality, also wax, honey, and pitch. The country furnishes the timber for their shipbuilding. They have likewise mineral salt and not a few salt streams. A considerable quantity of salted fish is exported, not only from hence, but also from the remainder of the coast beyond the pillars. Formerly they exported large quantities of garments, but they now send the unmanufactured wool remarkable for its beauty. The stuffs manufactured are of incomparable texture. There is a separate abundance of cattle and a great variety of game, while on the other hand there are certain little hares which burrow in the ground, rabbits. These creatures destroy both seeds and trees by gnaving their roots. They are met with throughout almost the whole of Spain. It is said that formerly the inhabitants of Majorca and Minorca set a deputation to the Romans, requesting that a new land might be given them, as they were quite driven out of their country by these animals, being no longer able to stand against their vast multitudes. The seacoast on the Atlantic side abounds in fish, says Strabo. The congers are quite monstrous, far surpassing the size those of our sea. Shoals of rich fat, tiny fish, 
are driven hither from the sea coast beyond. They feed on the fruit of stunted oak, which grows at the bottom of the sea, and produces very large acorns. So great is the quantity of fruit, that at the season, when they are ripe, the whole coast on either side of the pillars is covered with acorns thrown up by the tides. The tiny fish became gradually thinner, owing to the failure of their food as they approached the pillars from the outer sea. He describes, too, the metals of this wondrous land, gold, silver, copper, and iron. It is astonishing to think that, in the days of Strabo, the silver mines employed 40,000 workmen, and produced something like 900 pounds a day in our modern money. But we cannot follow Strabo over the world in all his detail. He tells us of a people living north of the Tagus, who slept on the ground, fed on acorn bread, and wore black cloaks by day and night. He does not think Britain is worth conquering. Ireland lies to the north, not west, of Britain. It is a barren land full of cannibals and wrapped in eternal snows. The Pyrenees run parallel to the Rhine. The Danube rises near the Alps. Even Italy herself runs east and west instead of north and south. His remarks on India are interesting. The reader, he says, must receive the accounts of this country with indulgence. Few persons of our nation have seen it. The greater part of what they relate is from report. Very few of the merchants who now sail from Egypt by the Nile and the Arabian Gulf to India have proceeded as far as the Ganges. He is determined not to be led astray by the fables of the great size of India. Some had told him it was a third of the whole habitable world, some that it took four months to walk through the plain only. Salem is said to be an island lying out at sea seven days' sail from the most southerly parts of India. Its length is about 800 miles. It produces elephants. Strabo died about the year 21 A.D., and half a century passed before Pliny wrote an account of countries, nations, seas, towns, havens, mountains, rivers, distances, and peoples who now exist or formerly existed. Strange to say, he never refers in the most distant way to his famous predecessor Strabo. He has but little to add to the earth's knowledge of Strabo, but he gives us a fuller account of Great Britain, based on the fresh discoveries of Roman generals. End of chapter 8、chapter、Nine of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 9 The Roman Empire and Pliny. In the year 48 AD, the Emperor Claudius resolved to send an expedition to the British coast, lying amidst the mists and fog of the northern ocean. A gigantic army landed near the spot where Caesar had landed just a hundred years before. The discovery and conquest of Britain now began in real earnest. The Isle of Wight was overrun by Romans. The south coast was explored. Roman soldiers lost their lives in the bogs and swamps of Gloucestershire. The eastern counties, after fierce opposition, submitted at the last. The spirit of Caractacus and Bodicea spread from tribe to tribe, and the Romans were constantly assailed. But gradually they swept the island. They reached the banks of the river Tyne, they crossed the Tweed, and explored as far as the Firth of Clyde and Forth. From the coast of Galloway the Romans beheld for the first time the dim outline of the Irish coast. In the year 88 A.D., Agricola, a new Roman commander, made his way beyond the first of fourth. Now is the time to penetrate into the heart of Caledonia and to discover the utmost limits of Britain, cried the Romans, as they began their advance to the highlands of Scotland. While a Roman fleet surveyed the coasts and harbors, Agricola led his men up the valley of the Tay 
to the edge of the highlands, but he could not follow the savage Caledonians into their rugged and inaccessible mountains. To the north of Scotland they never penetrated, and no part of Ireland ever came under Roman sway. In that air the Roman eagle never fluttered. The Roman account of Britain at this time is interesting. Britain, says Tacitus, the largest of all the islands which have come with the knowledge of the Romans, stretches on the east towards Germany, on the west towards Spain, and on the south it is even within sight of France. The Roman fleet at this period, first sailing round this remotest coast, gave certain proof that Britain was an island and at the same time discovered and subdued the Orkney Islands, till then unknown. Tool was also distinctly seen, which winter and eternal snow had hitherto concealed. The sky in this country is deformed by clouds and frequent rains, but the cold is never extremely rigorous. The earth yields gold and silver and other metals, the ocean produces pearls. The account of Ireland is only from Hersey. This island, continues Tacitus, is less than Britain, but larger than those of our sea. Situated between Britain and Spain, and lying commodiously to the Bay of Biscay, it would have formed a very beneficial connection between the most powerful parts of the empire. Its soil, climate, and the manners and dispositions of its inhabitants are little different from those of Britain. Its ports and harbors are better known from the concourse of merchants for purposes of commerce. Not only the British Isles, but a good deal of the wild North Sea, and the low-lying coast on the opposite side, were explored by Roman ships and Roman soldiers. Caesar had crossed the Rhine. He had heard of a great forest, which took a man four months to cross. And in 16 AD, a Roman general, Drusus, penetrated in the, the interior of Germany. Drusus crossed the Rhine, near the coast, made his way across the river Weser, and reached the banks of the Elbe. But the fame of Drusus rests mainly on his navigation of the German Ocean, or North Sea, in the Roman fleet. Near the mouth of the Rhine, a thousand ships were quickly built by expert Romans. Some were short, with narrow stern and prow, and broad in the middle, the easier to endure the shock of the waves. Some had flat bottoms, that without damage they might run aground. Many were fitted for carrying horses and provisions, convenient for sails and swift with oars. The Roman troops were in high spirits as they launched their splendid fleet on the northern ocean, and sailed prosperously to the mouth of the Elbe, startling the Frisians into submission. But no friendliness greeted them on the farther side of the river. The Germans were ready to defend their land, and further advance was impossible. Returning along the northern coast, the Romans got a taste of the storms of this northern ocean, of which they were in such complete ignorance. The sea, at first calm, says Tacitus, resounded with the oars of a thousand ships, but presently... A shower of hail poured down from a black mass of clouds, at the same time storms raging on all sides, in every variety, the billows rolling now here, now there, obstructed the view, and made it impossible to manage the ships. The whole expanse of air and sea was swept by a southwest wind, which, deriving strength from the mountainous regions of Germany, its deep rivers and boundless tract of clouded atmosphere, and rendered still harsher by the rigor of the neighboring north, tore away the ships, scattered, and drove them into the open ocean, or upon islands dangerous from precipitous rocks or hidden sandbanks. Having got a little clear of these, but with great difficulty, the tide turning and flowing in the same direction as that in which the wind blew, they were unable to ride at anchor, or bail out the waters that broke in upon them. Horses, beasts of burthen, baggage, even arms were thrown overboard to lighten the holds of the ships, which took in water at their sides, and from the waves too, running over them. Around were either shores inhabited by enemies, 
or a sea so vast and unfathomable as to be supposed the limit of the world, and unbounded by lands. Part of the fleet was swallowed up. Many were driven upon remote islands, where the men perished through famine. The galley of Drusus, or, as he was hereafter called, Germanicus, alone reached the mouth of the weather. Both day and night, amid the rocks and prominences of the shore, he reproached himself as the author of such overwhelming destruction, and was hardly restrained by his friends from destroying himself in the same sea. At last, with the returning tide and a favoring gale, the shattered ships returned, almost all destitute or with garments spread for sails. The wreck of the Roman fleet in the North Sea made a deep impression in the Roman capital, and many a garbled story of the extreme parts of the world was circulated throughout the empire. Here was new land outside the boundaries of the empire, country great with possibilities. Pliny, writer of the natural history, now arises and endeavors to clear the minds of his countrymen by some account of these northern regions. Strabo had been dead some fifty years, and the empire had grown since his days. But Pliny has news of land beyond the Elbe. He can tell us of Scandinavia, an island of unknown extent, of Norway, another island, the inhabitants of which sailed as far as Toul, of the seamen or Swedes, who lived in the northern half of the world. It is madness to harass the mind with attempts to measure the world, he asserts, but he proceeds to tell us the size of the world as accepted by him. Our part of the earth, floating as it were in the ocean which surrounds it, stretching out to the greatest extent from India to the pillars at Cadiz, is 8,568 miles. The breadth from south to north is commonly supposed to be half its length. But how little was known of the north of Europe at this time is shown by a startling statement that certain Indians sailing from India for the purposes of commerce had been driven by tempests into Germany. Thus it appears, concludes Pliny, that the seas flow completely round the globe, and divide it into two parts. How Baal was discovered and claimed for the empire, some of the African desert, is related by Pliny. He tells us, too, how another Roman general left the west coast of Africa, marched for ten days, reached Mount Atlas, and, in a desert of dark-colored sand, met a river, which he supposed to be the nigger. The home of the Ethiopians in Africa likewise interested Pliny. There can be no doubt that the Ethiopians are scorched by their vicinity to the sun's heat, and that they are born like persons who have been burned, with beard and hair frizzled, while in the opposite and frozen parts of the earth there are nations with white skins and long light hair. Pliny's geography was the basis of much medieval writing, and his knowledge of the course of the nigger remained unchallenged, till Mungo Park were discovered it many centuries after. End of chapter 9、Chapter、Ten of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 10 Ptolemy's Maps And so we reach the days of Ptolemy, the last geographer of the pagan world. This famous Greek was born in Egypt, and the great Roman Empire was already showing signs of decay. While Ptolemy was searching the great Alexandrian library for materials for his book, Alexandria was now the first commercial city of the world, second only to Rome. She supplied the great population in the heart of the empire with Egyptian corn. Ships sailed from Alexandria to every part of the known world. It was, therefore, a suitable place for Ptolemy to listen to the yarns of the merchants, to read the works of Homer, Herodotus, Erastosinis, Strabo, Pliny, and others, 
to study and observe, and finally to write. He begins his great geography with the northwest extremities of the world, the British Isles, Iverna, and Albion, as he calls Ireland and England. But he places Ireland much too far north, and the shape of Scotland has little resemblance to the original. He realized that there were lands to the south of Africa, to the east of Africa, and to the north of Europe, all stretching far away beyond his ken. He agrees with Pliny about the four islands in the neighborhood of Scandinavia, and draws the Volga correctly. He realizes, too, that the Caspian is an inland sea, and unconnected with the surrounding ocean. Perhaps the most remarkable part of Ptolemy's geography is that which tells us of the lands beyond the Ganges. He knows something of the Golden Chersonese, or Malay Peninsula, something of China, where far away toward the north, and bordering on the eastern ocean, there is a land containing a great city from which silk is exported, both raw and spun and woven into textures. The wonder is that Ptolemy did not know more of China, for that land had one of the oldest civilizations in the world, as wondrous as those of Assyria and Egypt. But China had had little or no direct intercourse with the West till after the death of Ptolemy. Merchants had passed between China and India for long centuries, and the Indians had made journeys in the golden deserts in troops of one or two thousand, and it is said that they do not return from those journeys till the third or fourth year. This was the desert of Gobi, called Golden because it opened the way to wealth. But perhaps the most interesting part of this great geography, which was to inform the world for centuries yet to come, was the construction of a series of twenty-six maps and the general map of the known world. This was one of the most important maps ever constructed, and forms our frontispiece from medieval copies of the original. The twelve heads blowing sundry winds on to the world's surface are characteristic of the age. The twenty-six maps are in sections. They are the first maps to be drawn with lines of latitude and longitude. The measurements are very vague. The lines are never ruled. They are drawn uncertainly in red. They are neither straight nor regular. So the spaces between the lines indicate degrees of fifty miles. The maps are crowded with towns, each carefully walled in by little red squares and drawn by hand. The water is all colored a somber, greeny blue, and the land is washed in a rich yellow-brown. A copy can be seen at the British Museum. It is only by looking back that we can realize the progress made in Earth's knowledge. Ptolemy wrote just a thousand years after Homer, when the little world round the Mediterranean had become a great empire stretching from the British Isles to China. Already the barbaric hordes which haunted the frontiers of the Roman Empire were breaking across the ill-defended boundaries, desolating streams were bursting over the civilized world, until at last the storm broke. The unity of the empire was ended, commerce broken up, and the darkness of ignorance spread over the earth. During this time little in the way of progress was made, and for the next few centuries our only interest lies in filling up some of the shadowy places of the earth without extending its known bounds. End of chapter 10、11. Chapter 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 11 Pilgrim Travelers. Meanwhile, a new inspiration had been given to the world, which affected traveling to no small extent. In far off Roman province of Syria, The Christ had lived, the Christ had died. And his words were ringing through the land, Go ye and make disciples of all the nations. Preach the gospel to every creature. 
here at once was a new incentive to travel, a definite reason for men to venture forth into the unknown, to brave dangers, to endure hardship. They must carry their master's words unto the ends of the world. The Roman Empire had brought men under one rule. They must now be brought to serve one God. So men passed out of Syria. They landed on the islands in the Mediterranean. They made their way to Asia Minor and across to Greece. Until in the year 60 A.D., we get the graphic account of Paul the Traveler, one of the first and most famous of the missionaries of the first century. Jerusalem now became indeed the world center. A very stream of pilgrim travelers tramped to the holy city from far away lands to see for themselves the land where the Christ had lived and died. The pilgrim age begins with the journey of a woman, the beautiful and learned daughter of the king of Britain, Helena, mother of the emperor Constantine. She was a student of divinity and a devoted Christian. In the year 326, she undertook the difficult journey to Jerusalem, where she is reported to have discovered the true cross, which had been buried, with Pilate's inscription in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. When the news of her discovery was noised abroad, a very rush of pilgrims took place from every part of the world. Indeed, one pilgrim, his name is unknown, thought it worthwhile to write a guidebook for the benefit of his fellow travelers. His itinerary from Bordeaux to Jerusalem is very interesting, being the first Christian guidebook and one of the earliest travel documents ever written for the use of travelers. This ancient Bradshaw has been translated into English and throws light on 4th century travelling. Enthusiastic indeed must these early pilgrims have been to undertake the long and toilsome journey. The guidebook takes them, save for crossing the Bosphorus, entirely by land. It leads them from the city of Bordeaux, where is the river Garonne, in which the ocean ebbs and flows, for 100 leagues more or less, to Arles, with 30 changes and 11 halts in 372 miles. There were milestones along the Roman roads to guide them, and houses at regular intervals where horses were kept for posting. From Arles the pilgrim goes north to Avignon, crosses the Alps, and halts at the Italian frontier. Skirting the north of Italy by Turin, Milan, and Padua, he reaches the Danube at Belgrade, passes through Serbia and Bulgaria, and so reaches Constantinople, the great new city of Constantine. Grand total from Bordeaux to Constantinople, 2,221 miles, with 230 changes and 112 halts. From Constantinople, continues the guidebook, you cross the strait and walk on through Asia Minor, passing the spot where lies King Hannibal, once king of the Africans. Thus onward, through the long dreary miles to Tarsus, where was born the Apostle Paul, till Syria is reached at last. Then the Bradshaw becomes a Baedeker. Long and detailed accounts are given of the country through which the pilgrim has to pass. From Caesarea he is led to Jezreel by the spot where David slew Goliath, by Job's country horse to see him, where Joseph is laid, and thence to Jerusalem. Full accounts follow of the holy city and Mount Sion, the little hill of Golgotha, where the Lord was crucified, the Mount of Olives, Jericho, Jordan, Bethlehem, and Hebron. Here is a monument of square form built of stone and wondrous beauty, in which lie Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah. From Constantinople to Jerusalem is 1,159 miles, with 69 changes and 58 halts. Here the guidebook ends abruptly with a brief summary of distances. Thither then flocked the pilgrims, some by land and some by sea, men and women from all parts of the world. Even the Briton, separated from our world, leaves the setting sun and seeks a place known to him only by fame, and the narrative of the scriptures. One of the earliest was Paula of Rome, 
a weak, fragile woman, accustomed to a life of luxury and ease, but, fired with the enthusiasm of her religion, she resolved to brave the dangers and hardships of a journey to the east. Her travels were written by St. Jerome. When the winter was spent and the sea was open, he writes, she longed and prayed to sail. She went down to the harbor, accompanied by her brother, her relatives, her connections, and more than these by her children, who strove to surpass the affection of the kindest of mothers. Soon the sails were swelling in the breeze, and the ship, guided by the oars, gained the open sea. Little Exotinus piteously stretched forth his hands from the shore. Rufina, a grown-up girl, by her tears silently besought her mother to stay, until she was married. Yet she herself, without a tear, turned her eyes heavenward, overcoming her love for her children by her love for God. Meanwhile the ship was ploughing the sea, the winds were sluggish, and all speed slow. But the ship passed between Scylla and Charybdis, and reached Antioch in safety. From this spot she followed the guidebook directions, until she arrived at Jerusalem. How Paula and one of her younger daughters walked over the rough ground, endured the hardships of desert life, and finally lived twenty years at Bethlehem, would take too long to tell. And she was but one of many. Sylvia of Aquitaine, traveling at the same time, wrote a strangely interesting account of her travels. The early part of her manuscript is lost, and we find her first in Arabia. All was new and strange. Meanwhile, as we walked, we arrived at a certain place, where the mountains between which we were passing opened themselves out and formed a great valley, very flat and extremely beautiful. And beyond the valley appeared Sinai, the holy mount of God. This is the same great and flat valley in which the children of Israel waited during the days when holy Moses went up into the mount of God. It was late on the Sabbath when we came to the mountain, and, arriving at a certain monastery, the kindly monks who lived there entertained us, showing us all kindliness. Sylvia had to ascend the mountain on foot, because the ascent could not be made in a chair, but the view over Egypt and Palestine and the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, which leads to Alexandria, also the boundless territory of the Saracens, we saw below us, hard though it is to believe, all of which things these holy men pointed out to us. But we must not follow her to Jerusalem, on to Mesopotamia, where she saw the great river Euphrates, rushing down in a torrent like the Rhine, but greater. She reached Constantinople by the guidebook route, having spent four years in travel, and walked two thousand miles to the very limit of the Roman Empire. Her boundless energy is not exhausted yet. Ladies, my beloved ones, she writes, whilst I prepare this account for your pure zeal, it is already my purpose to go to Asia. But we must turn away for a moment from the stream of pilgrim travelers wending their weary way from Britain, France, Spain, and the east to Jerusalem to follow the travels of St. Patrick through the wilds of Ireland. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 12 Irish Explorers. Patrick had been a pilgrim to Rome from the banks of the Clyde, where he lived and having seen the Pope, he had returned to Ireland by sea, landing on the Wicklow coast in the year 482. Hungry and tired after the long voyage, he tried to get some fish from the fishermen, but they replied by throwing stones at him, and he put out to sea again and headed north. Past Brayhead, past the Bay of Malahide, he sailed, but he could get neither fish nor food till he reached a spot, between the Liffey and the Boyne, 
where he built his first Christian church. Now in the fifth century, when light first breaks o'er Ireland, it breaks o'er a land torn by perpetual tribal strife, a land in the chaos of wild heathendom. It was reserved for St. Patrick to save her from increasing gloom. Patrick and his companions now sailed on past Luz, by the low-lying shore with long stretches of sandy flats, on under the shadow of great peaks frowning o'er the sea. He landed near Don Patrick, founded another church, and spent the winter in these parts, for the autumn was far advanced. Spring found him sailing back to the Boyne, and attacking the fierce heathen king at Tara, the capital of Ireland. From Tara, five great roads led to different parts of the island. St. Patrick now made his way through Meath to the very heart of the country, building churches as he went. Thence he crossed the Shannon, entered the great plain of Roscommon, passed by Mayo, and at length reached the western sea. He had now been eight years in Ireland, eight laborious years, climbing hills, wading through waters, camping out by night, building, organizing, preaching. He loved the land on the western sea, little known as yet. I would choose to remain here on a little land, after fearing around churches and waters. Since I am weary, I wish not to go further. St. Patrick climbed the great peak, afterwards called Crochpatrick, and on the summit exposed to wind and rain, he spent the forty days of Lent. From here he could look down onto the one of the most beautiful bays in Ireland, down onto the hundred little islands in the glancing waters below, while away to the north and south stretched the rugged coastline. And he tells us how the great white birds came and sang to him there. It would take too long to tell how he returned to Tara and started again with a train of thirteen chariots, by the great north-western road, to the spot afterwards known as Don Patrick Heed. He passed along the broken coast to extreme north, where the great ocean surf breaks on the rugged shore, returning again to the Irish capital. He travelled over a great part of Ireland, founded 350 churches, converted heathen tribes to Christianity and civilization, and finally died at Armagh in 493. His work was carried on by St. Columba, a native of Ireland, who, deciding to go abroad for Christ, sailed away with twelve disciples to a low rocky island of the west coast of Scotland, where he founded the famous monastery of Yona, about 563. Thence he journeyed away to the highlands, making his way through rugged and mountainous country that had stayed the warlike Romans long years before. He even sailed across the stormy northern sea to the Orkney Islands. Let us picture the Scotland of the 6th century in order to realize those long lonely tramps of St. Columba and his disciples across the rough mountains, through the dense forests, across bleak moors and wet bogs, till after dreary wanderings they reached the coast, and in frail ships boldly faced the wild seas, that rage round the northern islands. We can see Columba and his disciples journeying on foot, as poor and as barely provided as were Christ and his disciples, with neither silver nor gold nor brass in their purses, and over a wilder country and among a wilder people. These pilgrims tramped to and fro, clad in simple tunics, over a monkish dress of undyed wool, bound round the waist by a strong cord all their worldly goods on their backs, and a staff in their hands. The hermit instinct was growing, and men were sailing away to lonely islands, where God might be better served apart from the hounds of men. Perhaps it was this instinct that inspired St. Brandon to sail away across the trackless ocean in search of the island of saints reported in the western seas. His voyage suggests the old expedition of Ulysses. A good deal of it is mythical. Some is added at a later date. 
but it is interesting as being an attempt to cross the wide Atlantic Ocean, across which no man had yet sailed. For seven years St. Brandon sailed on the unknown sea, discovering unknown islands, until he reached the island of saints, the goal of his desires. And the fact remains that for ten centuries after this, an island, known as Brandon's Isle, was marked on maps somewhere to the west of Ireland, though to the end it remained as mysterious as the island of Toul. Here is the old story. Brandon, abbot of a large Irish monastery containing one thousand monks, sailed off in an other boat covered with tanned hides and carefully greased, provisioned for seven years. After forty days at sea, they reached an island with steep sides, where they took in fresh supplies. Then the winds carried the ship to another island, where they found sheep. Every sheep was as great as an ox. This is the island of sheep, and here it is every summer, they were informed by an old islander. This may have been Madeira. They found other islands in the neighborhood, one of which was full of singing birds, and the passing years found them still tossing to and fro on the unknown sea, until at last the end came. And St. Brandon sailed forty days south in full great tempest, and another forty days brought the ship right into a bank of fog. But when the fog lifted, they saw the fairest country eastward, that any man might see. It was so clear and bright that it was a heavenly sight to behold, and all the trees were charged with ripe fruit. And they walked about the island for forty days, and could not find the end. And there was no night there, and the climate was neither hot nor cold. Be ye joyful now, said a voice, for this is the land ye have sought, and our Lord wills, that you laden your ships with the fruit of this land, and he you hence, for ye may no longer abide here, but thou shalt sail again into thine own country. So the monks took all the fruit they could carry, and weeping that they might stay no longer in this happy land, they sailed back to Ireland. Hazy indeed was the geography of the Atlantic in the sixth century. Nor can we leave St. Brandon's story without quoting a modern poet who believed that the voyage was to the Arctic regions and not in the Atlantic. St. Brandon sails the northern main. The brotherhood of saints are glad. He greets them once, he sails again. So late, such storms, the saint is mad. He heard across the howling seas chime convent bells on wintry nights. He saw... On spray swept Hebrides, twinkle the monastery lights. But north, still north, St. Brandon steered. And now, no bells, no convents more. The hurtling polar lights are reached. The sea without a human shore. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 Of A Book of Discovery this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 13 After Mohammed So once more we turn back to the east. Jerusalem is still the center of the earth. But a change has passed over the world which influenced not a little the progress of geography. Mohammed in the seventh century lived and died in Arabia. There is but one God, and Mohammed is his prophet, proclaims his followers, the Arabs or Saracens, as they were called. And just as men had traveled abroad to preach Christianity to those who knew it not, so now the Mohammedans set forth to teach the faith of their Lord and Master. But whereas Christianity was taught by peaceful means, Mohammedanism was carried by the sword. The Roman provinces of Syria and Egypt had been conquered by the Arabs, and the famous cities of Jerusalem and Alexandria were filled with teachers of the new faith. The Mohammedans had conquered Spain and were pressing by Persia towards India. 
What deep root their preaching took in these parts is still evident. Still the weary fight between the two religions continues. The first traveler of note through this distracted Europe was a Frenchman named Arculf, a Christian bishop. When he had visited the Holy Land and Egypt, his ship was caught in a violent storm and driven onto the west coast of Scotland. After many adventures, Arkel found himself at the famous convent of Yona, made welcome by an Irish monk, Adamnan, who was deeply interested in Arkel's account of his wanderings, and wrote them down at his dictation, first on wax tablets, copied later onto parchment. How tenderly the two monks dwell on all the glories of Jerusalem! But in that beautiful place where once the temple had been, the Saracens now frequent a four-sided house of prayer, which they have built, rudely constructing it by raising boards and great beams, on some remains of ruins, which house can hold three thousand men at once. And Arkov draws on the wax tablets a picture of some church or tomb, to make his narrative clearer to his friend Adamnan. Perhaps the most interesting part of all the travels is the account of the lofty column that Arkolf describes in the midst of Jerusalem. This column, he says, as it stands in the center of the heaven, shining straight down from above, proves that the city of Jerusalem is situated in the middle of the earth. Arkolf's journey roused great interest among the newly converted Christians of the north, and Willibald, a high-born Englishman, started off in 721 to explore farther. But the road through Europe was now full of danger. The followers of Mohammed were strong, and it required true courage to face the perils of the long journey. Willibald was undaunted, and with his father and two brothers, he sailed from Southampton, crossed to France, sailed up the Seine to Rouen, and reached Italy. Here the old father died. Willibald and his brothers traveled on, through the vast lands of Italy, through the depths of the valleys, over the steep brows of the mountains, over the levels of the plains, climbing on foot the difficult passes of the Alps, over the ice-bound and snow-capped summits, till they arrived at Rome. Thence they made their way to Syria, where they were at once thrown in prison by Mohammedan conquerors. They were brought before the ruler of the Mohammedan world, or caliph, whose seat was at Damascus. He asked whence they came. These men come from the western shore, where the sun sets, and we know not of any land beyond them but water only, was the answer. Such was Britain to the Mohammedans. They never got a footing in that country. Their empire lay to the east, and their capital was even now shifting to Baghdad. But before turning to their geographical discoveries, we must see how Cosmas, the Egyptian merchant monk, set the clock back by his quaint theories of the world in the 6th century. Cosmas hailed from Alexander's great city. His calling carried him into seas and countries remote from home. He knew the Mediterranean Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea. He had narrowly escaped shipwreck in the Indian Ocean, which in those days was regarded with terror on account of its violent currents and dense fogs. As the ship carrying the merchant approached this dread region, a storm gathered overhead, and flocks of albatross, like birds of ill omen, hovered about the masts. We were all in alarm, relates Cosmas, for all the men of experience on board, whether passengers or sailors, began to say that we were near the ocean, and called out to the pilot, Steer the ship to the port, and make for the gulf, or we shall be swept along by the currents and carried into the ocean and lost. For the ocean rushing into the gulf was swelling with billows of portentous size, while the currents from the gulf were driving the ship into the ocean, and the outlook was so altogether so dismal that we were kept in a state of great alarm. That he eventually reached India is clear, for he relates strange things concerning Ceylon. There is a large oceanic island lying in the Indian Sea, he tells us. It has a length of nine hundred miles, and it is of the like extent in breadth. 
There are two kings in the island, and they are at food, that one with the other. The island, being as it is in a central position, is much frequented by ships, from all parts of India, and from Persia and Ethiopia, and from the remotest countries. It receives silk, alloys, cloves, and other products. Farther away is the clove country, then Tsinista, China, which produces silk. Beyond this there is no other country, for the ocean surrounds it on the east. Cosmos was the first to realize that China was bounded on the east by the ocean. He tells us a good story about the Lord of India, who always went to war with two thousand elephants. Once upon a time this king would lay siege to an island city of the Indians, which was on every side protected by water. A long while he sat down before it, until, what was his elephants, his horses, and his soldiers, all the water had been drunk up. He then crossed over to the city Dryshod and took it. But strange as are the travels and information of Cosmos, still stranger is his Christian topography. His commercial traveling done, he retired, became a devout Christian monk, and devoted his leisure time in trying to reconcile all the progress of geographical knowledge with old biblical ideas. He assures us that the world is flat and not round, and that it is surrounded by an immense wall supporting the firmament. Indeed, if we compare the maps of Cosmos in the 6th century with those of the Babylonians thousands of years before, there is mighty little difference. With amazing courage he refutes all the old theories, and draws the most astounding maps, which, nevertheless, are the oldest Christian maps which survive. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 14 The Vikings Sail the Northern Seas a more interesting force than the pilgrim travelers now claims our attention, and we turn to the frozen north, to the wild region at the back of the north wind, for new activity and discovery. Out of this land of fable and myth, legend and poetry, the fierce inhabitants of Scandinavia begin to take shape. Tacitus speaks of them as mighty in fame, Ptolemy, as savage and clothed in the skins of wild beasts. From time to time we have glimpses of those folk sailing about in the Baltic Sea. They were known to the Finns of the North as sea rovers. The sea is their school of war, and the storm their friend. They are sea wolves that live on the pillage of the world, sang an old Roman long years ago. The daring spirit of their race had already attracted the attention of Britons across the seas. The careless glee with which they seized either sword or oar, and waged war with the stormy seas for a scantly livelihood, raiding all the neighboring coasts, had earned them the name of Vikings, or Creek Men. Their black-sailed ships stood high out of the water, prow and stern ending in the head and tail of some strange animal while their long beards, their loose shirts, and battle-axe made them conspicuous. From the fury of the Norsemen save us, Lord, prayed those who had come in contact with those Vikings. In the ninth century they spring into fame as explorers by the discovery of Iceland. It was in this wise. The chief of a band of pirates, one Nadund, during a voyage to the Faroe Islands was driven by a storm upon the eastern coast of an unknown land. Not a soul was to be seen. He climbed a high mountain covered with snow, and took a look round. But though he could see far and wide, not a human being could he detect. So he named it Snowland, and l sailed home to relate his adventures. A few years later another Viking, Gardar, bound for the west coast of Scotland, was likewise blown by a storm on to the coast of Snowland. 
he sailed right round and found it to be an island. Considering that it was unsafe to navigate the icy northern seas in winter, he built himself a hut on the island, lived there till the spring, and returned home. His account of the island fired the enthusiasm of an old viking called Floki, who sailed away, meaning to take possession of the newly discovered country. At the Faroe Islands he let fly three ravens. The first returned. The second came back to the ship. The third guided the navigator to the island which he sought. He met a quantity of drift ice about the northern part of the island, and called it Iceland, the name it has borne ever since. But amid the Arctic ice he spent a desolate winter. The island seemed full of lofty mountains covered with eternal snow. His companions, however, were delighted with the climate and the soil. Milk drops from every plant and butter from every twig, they said. This was a land where men might live free from the tyranny of kings. Free indeed, for the island was totally uninhabited. Iceland soon became a refugee for pirates and other lawless characters. Among these was a young viking called Eric the Red. He was too lawless even for Iceland, and, being banished for three years, he sailed away in 985 in search of new lands. At the end of his three years he returned and reported that he had discovered land with rich meadows, fine woods, and good fishing, which he had named Greenland. So glowing was his description that soon a party of men and women, with household goods and cattle, started forth in twenty-five ships to colonize the new land. Still the passion for discovery continued, and Eric's son Leif fitted out a vessel to carry thirty-five men in quest of land already sighted to the west. It was in the year 1000 that they reached the coast of North America. It was a barren and rocky shore to which Leif gave the name of Rockland. Sailing farther, they found a low coast, wooded to its edge, to which they gave the simple name of Woody Land. Two days later an island appeared, and on the mainland they discovered a river up which they sailed. On low bushes by the banks of the river they found sweet berries, or wild grapes, from which a sort of wine was made. So Leif called the land Vinland. It is now supposed that Vinland and Woody Land are really Newfoundland and Labrador on the shores of North America. After this, shipload followed shipload from Iceland to colonize Vinland, but without success. So the Viking discoveries in these cold and unhospitable regions were but transitory. The clouds lifted but for a moment to settle down again over America, till it was rediscovered some five hundred years later. Before leaving these northern explorers, let us remind ourselves of the old saga, so graphic in its description of their ocean lives. Down the fjords sweep wind and rain, our sails and tackle sway and strain, wet to the skin, we sound within. Our sea steeds through the foam goes prancing, while shields and spears and helms are glancing. From fjord to sea, our ships ride free, and down the wind with swelling sail, we scud before the gathering gale. Now, while these fierce old Vikings were navigating unknown seas, Alfred the Great was reigning over England. Among his many and varied interests, he was deeply thrilled in the geography of the world. He was always ready to listen to those who had been on voyages of discovery, and in his account of the geography of Europe, he tells us of a famous old sea captain called Osire, who had navigated the unknown seas to the north of Europe. Osire told his lord, King Alfred, that he dwelt northmost of all northermen, on the land by the western sea. He said that the land is very long, thence to the north, but it is all waste, save that in a few places here and there Finns reside. He said, that he wished to find out how far the land lay right north, or whether any man dwelt to the north of the waste. Then he went right north near the land, and he left all the way the waste land on the right, and the wide sea on the left for three days. 
There was he as far north as the whale hunters ever go. He then went yet right north, as far as he could sail in the next three days. After sailing for another nine days, he came to a great river. They turned up into the river, but they durst not sail beyond it on account of hostility, for the land was all inhabited on the other side. He had not before met with any inhabited land, since he came from his own home, for the land was uninhabited all the way on his right, save by fishermen, hunters, and fowlers, and they were all fins, and there was always a wide sea on his left. And as a trophy of distant lands, and a proof of his having reached farthest north, Othir presented the king with a snow-white walrus tooth. But King Alfred wanted his subjects to know more of the world around them, and even in the midst of his busy life he managed to write a book in Anglo-Saxon, which sums up for us the world's knowledge some nine hundred years after Ptolemy, nine hundred barren years as far as much geographical progress was concerned. Alfred does not even allude to Iceland, Greenland, and Windland. The news of these discoveries had evidently not reached him. He repeats the old legend of Thule to the northwest of Ireland, which is known to few on account of its very great distance. So end the brief but thrilling discoveries of the Norsemen, who knew not fear, and we turn again to landsmen and the East. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 15. Arab Wayfarers. And now we leave the fierce energy of the Norsemen westwards and turn to another energy which was leading men toward the east, to the lands beyond the Euphrates, to India, across Central Asia, even into Far Cathay. These early travelers to the east were for the most part Arabs. Mohammed had bidden his followers to spread his teaching far and wide. This teaching had always appealed more to the eastern than to the western mind. So farther and farther to the east traveled the Arabs, converting the uncivilized tribes that Christianity had not reached. What a contrast are these Arabs to the explorers of the vigorous north! They always traveled by land and not by the sea, which was life to the wicking folk. To the Arabs the encircling ocean was a very sea of darkness, indeed. The unknown ocean beyond China was called the Sea of Pitchy Darkness. Their creed taught that the ocean was boundless, so that ships dared not venture out of sight of land, for there was no inhabited country beyond and mariners would assuredly be lost in mists and fogs. So, while the Vikings tossed fearlessly about the wild northern seas, the Arab wayfarers rode eastward by well-known caravan tracks, trading and teaching the ways of Mohammed. Arabic enterprise had pushed on far beyond Ptolemy's world. The Arab center lay in the city of Baghdad, the headquarters of the ruler or caliph of the Mohammedan world. They had already opened up a considerable trade with the rapidly rising Mongol Empire, which no European had yet reached. But as this country was to play a large part in the travels of the near future, it will be interesting to hear the account given by two Mohammedan friends who journeyed thither in the year 881, just four hundred years before Marco Polo's famous account. The early part of their story is missing and we raise the curtain when they have arrived in the land of China itself, then a very small empire compared with what it is now. The emperor of China reckons himself next after the kings of the Arabs, who they all allow to be the first, and beyond all dispute the most powerful of kings, because he is the head of a great religion. In this great kingdom of China, they tell us, there are over two hundred cities, 
each city has four gates, at each of which are five trumpets, which the Chinese sound at certain hours of the day and of the night. There are also within each city ten drums, which they beat at the same time, as a public token of their obedience to the emperor, as also to signify the hour of the day and of the night, to which end they also have dials and clocks with ways. China is a pleasant and truthful country. The air is much better than the Indian provinces. Much rain falls in both these countries. In India are many desert tracts, but China is inhabited and peopled throughout its whole extent. The Chinese are handsomer than the Indians, and come nearer to the Arabs, not only in countenance but in dress, in their way of riding, in their manners, and in their ceremonies. They wear long garments and girdles in form of belts. The Chinese are dressed in silk both in winter and summer, and this kind of dress is common to the prince and the peasant. Their food is rice, which they often eat with a broth, which they pour upon the rice. They have several sorts of fruits, apples, lemons, quinces, figs, grapes, cucumbers, walnuts, almonds, plums, apricots, and coconuts. Here, too, we get the first mention of tea, which was not introduced into Europe for another seven hundred years, but which formed a Chinese drink in the ninth century. This Chinese drink is a herb or shrub, more bushy than the pomegranate tea, and of a more pleasant scent, but somewhat bitter to the taste. The Chinese boil water and pour it in scouting hot upon this leaf, and this infusion keeps them from all distempers. Here, too, we get the first mention of China ware. They have an excellent kind of earth, wherewith they make a ware of equal fineness with glass and equally transparent. There is no time here to tell of all the curious manners and customs related by these two Mohammedans. One thing struck them as indeed it must strike us today. The Chinese, poor and rich, great and small, learn to read and write. There are schools in every town for teaching the poor children, and the masters are maintained at public charge. The Chinese have a stone ten cubits high erected in the public squares of their cities, and on this stone are engraved the names of all the medicines, with the exact price of each. And when the poor stand in need of physic, they go to the treasury, where they receive the price each medicine is rated at. It was out of such troubles as these that the famous romance of Sinbad the Sailor took shape, a true story of Arab adventures of the ninth and tenth centuries in a romantic setting. As in the case of Uruses, the adventures of many voyages are ascribed to one man, and related in a collection of tales, which bears the title of The Arabian Nights. Of course, Sinbad was a native of Baghdad, the Arab center of everything at this time, and of course, he journeyed eastwards, as did most Mohammedans. It occurred to my mind, says Sinbad, to travel to the countries of other people. Then I rose and collected what I had of effects and apparel and sold them, after which I sold my buildings and all that my hand possessed, and amassed three thousand pieces of silver. So I embarked in a ship, and with a company of merchants we traversed the sea for many days and nights. We had passed by island after island, and from sea to sea, and land to land, and in every place we sold and bought and exchanged merchandise. We continued our voyage until we arrived at an island, like one of the gardens of paradise. Here they anchored and lit fires, when suddenly the master of the ship cried aloud in great distress, O oh, ye passengers, come up quickly into the ship, leave your merchandise and flee for your lives. For this apparent island upon which ye are is not really an island, but it is a great fish that has become stationary in the midst of the sea, and the sand has accumulated upon it, and trees have grown upon it. And when ye lighted a fire, it felt the heat, 
and now it will descend with you into the sea, and you will be all drowned. As he spoke, the island moved, and descended to the bottom of the sea, with all that were upon it, and the roaring sea, agitated with waves, closed over it. Let Sinbad continue his own story. I sank in the sea with the rest, but God delivered me and saved me from drowning, and supplied me with a great wooden bow, and I laid hold upon it, and got into it, and beat the water with my feet as with oars, while the waves sported with me. I remained so a day and a night, until the bowl came to a stoppage under a high island, whereupon were trees overhanging the sea. So I laid hold upon the branch of a lofty tree, and clung to it, until I landed on the island. Then I threw myself upon the island like one dead. After wandering about he found servants of the king of Borneo, and all sailed together to an island beyond the Malay Peninsula. And the king of Borneo sent for Sindbad, and heaped him with honors. He gave him costly dress, and made him superintendent of the seaport, and adviser of affairs of state. And Sindbad saw many wonders in this far distant sea. At last, one day I stood upon the shore of the sea, with a staff in my hand, as was my custom. And lo, a great vessel approached, wherein were many merchants. They unloaded their wares, telling Sinbad that the owner of their goods, a man from Baghdad, had been drowned, and they were selling his things. What was the name of the owner of the goods? asked Sinbad. His name was Sinbad of the Sea. Then Sinbad cried, O oh, master, know that I am the owner of the goods, and I am Sinbad of the Sea. Then there was great rejoicing, and Sinbad took leave of this king of Borneo, and set sail for Baghdad, the abode of peace. But the spirit of unrest was upon him, and soon he was off again. Indeed, he made seven voyages in all, but there is only room here to note a few of the most important points in each. This time he sailed to the coast of Zanzibar, East Africa, and, Anchoring on the beautiful island of Madagascar, amid sweet-smelling flowers, pure rivers, and warbling birds, Sinbad fell asleep. He awoke to find the ship had sailed away, leaving him without food or drink, and not a human being was to be seen on the island. Then I climbed up into a lofty tree, and began to look from it to the right and left, but saw nothing save sky and water, and trees, and birds, and islands, and sands. At last he found an enormous bird. Unwinding his turban, he twisted it into a rope, and tying one end round his wrist, tied the other to one of the bird's great feet. Up flew the giant bird, high into the sky, and Sinbad with it, descending somewhere in India in the Valley of Diamonds. The bird was afterwards identified as an enormous eagle. And I rose and walked in that valley, says Sinbad, and I beheld its ground to be composed of diamonds, with which they perforate minerals and jewels, porcelain, and the onyx, and it is a stone so hard that neither iron nor rock have any effect upon it. All that valley was likewise occupied by serpents and venomous snakes. Here Sinbad found the comfort trees. Under each of these trees a hundred men might shade themselves. From these trees flowed liquid camphor. In this island, too, is a kind of wild beast called rhinoceros. It's a huge beast with a single horn, thick, in the middle of its head, and it lifteth the great elephant upon its horn. Thus, after collecting heaps of diamonds, Sinbad returned to Baghdad, a rich man. Again his soul yearns for travel. This time he starts for China, but his ship is driven out of its course and cast on the island of apes, probably Sumatra. These apes, the most hideous of beasts, covered with hair like black felt, 
surrounded the ship. They climbed up the cables and severed them with their teeth to Sinbad's great alarm. He escaped to the neighboring islands known as the Clow Islands, and again reached Baghdad safely. Again and yet again he starts forth on fresh adventures. Now he is sailing on the seas beyond Salem. Now his ship is being pursued by a giant roe, whose young have been killed and eaten by Sinbad. Sinbad, as usually, escapes upon a plank, and sails to an island, where he meets the old man of the sea, probably a huge ape from Borneo. On he passed to the island of apes, where every night the people who reside in it go forth from the doors of the city, that open upon the sea in their fear of the apes, lest they should come down upon them in the night from the mountains. After this we find Sinbad trading in pepper on the Coromandel coast of modern India, and discovering a wealth of pearls by the seashore of Salem. But at last he grew tired of seafaring, which was never congenial to Arabs. Hateful was the dark blue sky, vaulted over the dark blue sea, sore task to heart, worn out by many wars, and eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars. So he leaves private adventuring alone, and is appointed by the Caliph of Baghdad to convey a letter and present to the Indian Prince of Salem, an expedition that lasts him twenty-seven years. The presents were magnificent. They included a horse worth ten thousand pieces of gold, with its saddle adorned with gold set with jewels, a book, a splendid dress, and some beautiful white Egyptian cloth. Greek carpets, and a crystal cup. Having duly delivered these gifts, he took his leave, meaning to return to his own country. But the usual adventures befell him. This time his ship was surrounded by a number of boats, on board of which were men, like little devils with swords and daggers. These attacked the ship, captured Sinbad, and sold him to a rich man as a slave. He set him to shoot elephants from a tree with bows and arrows. At last, after many other adventures, and having made seven long voyages, poor Sinbad reached his home. The romance of Sinbad the Sailor is really a true story of Arab adventures at sea during the ninth and tenth centuries, put into a romantic setting and ascribed to one man. In the above map, which is a portion of the map of the world, made by the famous Arab geographer, Edrisi, in 1154 A.D., many of the places to which Sinbad's story relates have been identified. Their modern names are as follows. Kotroba is probably Sokotra. Kolameli is Kolon, near Cape Comorin. Hind is India. Serendib is Ceylon. Mufili, or Monsul, the Valley of Diamonds, is Mazulipatam. Roibahat, the Klow Islands, are the Maldive Islands. Rami, the Island of Apes, is Sumatra. Maidzaba, the island with the volcano, is Banka. Senf is Tsiampa. South Conchin China. Muza, or Meroji, is Borneo. Cameroon is Java. Made the Camphor Island is Formosa. Edris's names are as those which are used in the Arabian Nights. End of chapter 15、yes. Chapter 16 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M.B. Singh. Chapter 16 Travelers to the East. But if the Sindbad saga is based on the stories of Mohammedan travelers and sum up Arab adventures by sea in the 10th century, we must turn to another Arab. Masudi by name, for land travel of the same period. 
Masudi left his home at Baghdad very young, and seems to have penetrated into every Mohammedan country from Spain to farther India. In his famous Meadows of Gold, with its 132 chapters, dedicated to the most illustrious kings, he describes the various lands through which he has traveled giving us at the same time a good deal of incorrect information about lands he has never seen. I have gone so far towards the setting sun that I have lost all remembrance of the east, and my course has taken me so far towards the rising sun that I have forgotten the very name of west. One cannot but look with admiration on the energetic Arab traveler when one remembers the labor of travel even in the tenth century. There were the long, hot rides through Central Asia, under a burning sun, the ascent of unknown mountains, the crossing of unbridged rivers. From his lengthy work we will only extract a few details. Though he had gone so far towards the setting sun, his knowledge of the West was very limited, and while Vikings tossed on the Atlantic westwards, Masudi tells us that It is impossible to navigate beyond the pillars of Hercules, for no vessel sails on that sea. It is without cultivation or inhabitant, and its end, like its depth, is unknown. Such was the green sea of darkness, as it was called by the Arabs. Masudi is more at home when he journeys towards the rising sun to the east, but his descriptions of China, the flowery land, the celestial country, were to be excelled by others. We must pass over Edrisi, who, in 1153, wrote, on the going abroad of a curious man to explore all the wonders of the world, which wonders he explored very imperfectly, though he has left us a map of the world, which may be seen today at the Bodleian Library at Oxford. But we cannot pass over Benjamin of Tudela in so few words. Our Benjamin, he is called by Pinkerton, who in the 18th century made a wonderful collection of voyages and travels of all ages. Our Benjamin was a Jew, hailing from Tudela in Spain, and he started forth on his travels with a view to ascertaining the condition and numbers of Jews living in the midst of the great Mohammedan empire. Benjamin made his way in the year 1160 to the exceeding great city of Constantinople, which has none to compare with it except Baghdad, the mighty city of the Arabs. With the great temple of St. Sophia and its pillars of gold and silver, he was immensely struck. In rapt admiration he gazed at the emperor's palace, with its walls of beaten gold, its hanging crown suspended over the imperial throne, blazing with precious stones, so splendid that the whole needed no other light. No less striking were the crimson embroidered garments worn by the Greeks, who rode to and from the city like princes on horseback. Benjamin turned sadly to the Jewish quarter. No Jew might ride on horseback here. All were treated as objects of contempt. They were herded together, often beaten in the streets. From the wealth and luxury of Constantinople, Benjamin makes his way to Syria. At Jerusalem he finds some two hundred Jews commanding the dying trade. And here we must remind ourselves that the second crusade was over, and the third had not yet taken place, that Jerusalem, the city of peace, had been in the hands of the Mohammedans, or Saracens, till 1099, when it fell into the hands of the crusaders. From Jerusalem, by way of Damascus, Benjamin entered Persia, and he gives us an interesting account of Baghdad and its caliphs. The caliph was the head of the Mohammedans, in the same way as the pope was the head of the Christians. He was, says our Benjamin, a very dignified personage, friendly towards the Jews, a kind-hearted man, but never to be seen. Pilgrims from distant lands, passing through Baghdad on their way to Mecca, prayed to be allowed to see the brightness of his face but they were only allowed to kiss one end of his garment. Now, although Benjamin describes the journey from Baghdad to China, it's very doubtful if he ever got to China himself, 
so we will leave him delighting in the glories of Baghdad, with its palm trees, its gardens and orchards, rejoicing in the statistics of Jews, and turn to the adventures of one Carpini, who really did reach Tartary. This Carpini, or Friar John, was a Franciscan who was chosen by the Pope to go to the great Khan of the Mongol Empire, which was threatening to overrun Christendom. On 16th April, 1245, Friar John left the cloister for the unknown tract of country by which he had to pass into China. By way of Bohemia he passed into Russia, and having annexed Brother Benedict in Poland and Brother Stephen in Bohemia, together with a guide, Carpini made his way eastwards. It was midwinter. The travelers had to ride on Tartar horses, for they alone could find grass under the snow, or live as animals must in Tartary, without hay or straw. Sometimes Friar John fell so ill that he had to be placed in a cart and carried through the deep snow. It was Easter, 1246, just a year after their start, that Friar John and his companions began the last section of their journey beyond the Volga, and most tearfully we set out not knowing whether it was for life or for death. So thin had they all become that not one of them could ride. Still they toiled on, till one July day they entered Mongolia and found the headquarters of the great Khan about half a day's journey from Karakorum. They arrived in time to witness the enthronement of the new Khan in August. Here were crowds of ambassadors from Russia and Persia as well as from outlying parts of the growing Mongol Empire. These were laden with gifts. Indeed, there were no less than five hundred crates full of silks, satins, brocades, fur, gold embroidery. Friar John and his companions had no gifts to offer, save the letter from the Pope. Impressive indeed, in the eyes of the once cloistered friar, must have been this first sight of eastern splendor. High on a neighboring hill stood the Khan's tent, resting on pillars, plated with gold, top and sides covered with silk brocades, while the great ceremony took place. But the men of the West were not welcomed by the new emperor of the East. It was supposed that he intended shortly to unfurl his standard against the whole of the Western world, and in November Friar John and his companions found themselves formally dismissed with the missive from the great Khan to the Pope, signed and sealed by the Khan himself. The return journey was even more trying. Winter was coming up, and for nearly seven months the Pope's faithful envoy struggled on across the endless open plains of Asia towards Russia, resting their eyes on vast expanses of snow. At last they reached home, and Friar John wrote his book of the Tartars, in which he informs us that Mongolia is in the east part of the world, and that Kathi is a country in the east of Asia. To the southwest of Mongolia he heard of a vast desert, where lived certain wild men unable to speak, and with no joints in their legs. These occupy themselves in making felt out of camel's hair for garments to protect them from the weather. Agan Carpini tells us about that mythical character figuring in the travel books of this time, Priester John. The Mongol army, he says, marched against the Christians dwelling in the greater India, and the king of that country, known by the name of Prester John, came forth with his army to meet them. This Prester John caused a number of hollow copper figures to be made, resembling men, which were stuffed with combustibles and set upon horses, each having a man behind on the horse, with a pair of bellows to stir up the fire. At the first onset of the battle, these mounted figures were sent forward to the charge. The men who rode behind them set fire to the combustibles, and then strongly blew with the bellows. Immediately the Mongol horses and men were burnt with wild fire, and the air was darkened with smoke. We shall hear of Prester John again, for within a few years of the return of Friar John, another Franciscan friar, William de Rupruquis, was sent forth, this time by the French king, Louis, 
to carry letters to the great Khan, begging him to embrace Christianity and acknowledge the supremacy of the Pope. William and his chosen companions had a painful and difficult journey of some months before they reached the camps on the Volga of one of the great Mongol lords. Indeed, if it had not been for the grace of God and the biscuit which we brought with us, we had surely perished, remarked the pious friar in the history of his adventures. Never once did they enjoy the shelter of the house or tent, but passed the nights in the open air in a cart. At last they were ordered to appear at the court of the great ruler with all their books and vestments. We were commanded to array ourselves in our sacred vestments, to appear before the prince. Putting on, therefore, our most precious ornaments, I took a cushion in my arms, together with the Bible I had from the king of France, and the beautiful psalter which the queen bestowed upon me. My companion at the same time carried the missal and the crucifix, and the clerk, clothed in his surplice, bore a censer in his hand. In this order we presented ourselves, singing the Salve Regina. It is a strange picture, this, the European friars, in all the vestments of their religion, standing before the eastern prince of this far-off country. They would fain have carried home news of his conversion, but they were told in angry tones that the prince was not a Christian, but a Mongol. They were dismissed with orders to visit the great Khan at Karakorum. Resuming their journey early in August, the messengers did not arrive at the court of the great Khan till the day after Christmas. They were miserably housed in a tiny hut, which scarcely room for their beds and baggage. The cold was intense. The bare feet of the friars caused great astonishment to the crowds of onlookers, who stared at the strange figures as though they had been monsters. However, they could not keep their feet bare long, for very soon Rubrukis found that his toes were frozen. Chanting in Latin the hymn of the Nativity, the visitors were at last admitted to the imperial tent, hung about with clothes of gold, where they found the Khan. He was seated on a couch, a little man of moderate height, aged about forty-five, and dressed in a skin spotted and glossy like a seal. The Mongol emperor asked numerous questions about the kingdom of France and the possibility of conquering it, to the righteous indignation of the friars. They stayed in the country till the end of May, when they were dismissed, having failed in their mission, but having gained a good deal of information about the great Mongol empire and its somewhat mysterious ruler. But while the kingdoms in Europe trembled before the growing expansion of the Mongol empire, and the dangers of Tartar hordes, the merchants of Venice rejoiced in the new markets which were opening for them in the east. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 17 Marco Polo Now Venice, at this time, was full of enterprising merchants, merchants such as we hear of in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Among these were two Venetians, the brothers Polo, Rumors had reached them of the wealth of the mysterious land of Cathy, of the great Khan, of Europeans making their way, as we have seen, through barren wildernesses, across burning deserts in the face of hardships indescribable, to open up a highway to the far east. So off started Mafio and Niccolo Polo on a trading enterprise, and having crossed the Mediterranean, came, with a fair wind and the blessing of God, to Constantinople, where they disposed of a large quantity of their merchandise. Having made some money, they directed their way to Bokhara, where they fell in with their Tartar nobleman, who persuaded them to accompany him to the court of the great Khan himself. Ready for adventure, they agreed, and he led them in northeasterly direction, 
Now they were delayed by heavy snows, now by the swelling of unbridged rivers, so that it was a year before they reached Pekin, which they considered was the extremity of the east. They were courteously received by the great Khan, who questioned them closely about their own land, to which they replied in the Tartar language which they had learned on the way. Now since the days of Prior John there was a new Khan named Kublai, who wished to send messengers to the Pope to beg him to send a hundred wise men to teach the Chinese Christianity. He chose the Polar brothers as his envoys to the Pope, and accordingly they started off to fulfill his behests. After an absence of fifteen years, they again reached Venice. The very year they had left home, Nicolas' wife had died, and his boy, afterwards to become the famous traveller Marco Polo, had been born. The boy was now fifteen. The story is told by his father and uncle of the Far East, and the court of the greatest emperor on earth filled the boy with enthusiasm. And when, in 1271, the brothers Polo set out for their second journey to China, not only were they accompanied by the young Marco, but also by two preaching friars to teach the Christian faith to Kublai Khan. Their journey lay through Armenia, through the old city of Nineveh to Baghdad, where their last caliph had been butchered by the Tartars. Entering Persia as traders, the Polo family passed on to Ormuz, hoping to take ship from here to China. But for some unknown reason this was impossible, and the travelers made their way north-eastwards to the country about the sources of the river Oxus. Here young Marco fell sick of a low fever, and for a whole year could not proceed. Resuming their journey at last, in high spirits, they crossed the great highlands of the Pamirs, known as the Roof of the World, and descending on cotton, found themselves face to face with the great Gobi Desert. For thirty days they journeyed over the sandy wastes of the silent wilderness, till they came to a city in the province of Tangut, where they were met by messengers from the Khan, who had heard of their approach. But it was not till May 1275 that they actually reached the court of Kublai Khan, after their tremendous journey of one thousand days. The preaching friars had long since turned homewards, alarmed at the dangers of the way, so only the three stout-hearted polos were left to deliver the Pope's message to the ruler of Mongol Empire. The Lord of all the earth, as he was called by his people, received them very warmly. He inquired at once who was the young man with them. My Lord, replied Niccolo, he is my son and your servant. Then, said the Khan, he is welcome. I am much pleased with him. So the three Venetians abode at the court of Kublai Khan. His summer palace was at Changtu, called Hanadu by the poet Coleridge. In Hanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alp, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sacred sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground, with walls and towers were girled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, and here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. So the three Venetians abode at the court of the Chinese emperor for no less than seventeen years. Young Marco displayed so great intelligence that he was sent on a mission for the Khan, some six months' journey distant. And so well did he describe the things he had seen, and the lands through which he had passed, that the Khan heaped on him honors and riches. Let us hear what Marco says of his lord and master. The great Khan, lord of lords, named Kublai, is of middle stature, neither too full nor too short. He has a beautiful fresh complexion, his color is fair, his eyes dark. The capital of the empire, Pekin, two days' journey from the sea, and the residence of the court during the month of December, January, and February, called out the unbounded enthusiasm of the polos. The city, two days' journey from the ocean, in the extreme northeast of Cathay, had been newly rebuilt in the regular square, six miles on each side, surrounded by walls of earth, 
and having twelve gates. The streets are so broad and so straight, says Marco, that from one gate another is visible. It contains many beautiful houses and palaces, and a very large one in the midst containing a steeple with a large bell, which at night sounds three times, after which no man must leave the city. At each gate a thousand men keep guard, not from dread of any enemy, but in reverence of the monarch who dwells within it, and to prevent injury by robbers. This square form of Pekin, the great breadth of the straight streets, the closing of the gates by sound of a bell, the largest in the world, is noted by all travelers to this far eastern city of Kasi. But greater even than Pekin was the city of King Sai, Hang Chou Fu, the city of heaven in the south of China. It had but lately fallen into the hands of Kublai Khan. And now I will tell you all its nobleness, says Marco, for without doubt it is the largest city in the world. The city is one hundred miles in circumference, and has twelve thousand stone bridges, and beneath the greater part of these a large ship might pass. And you need not wonder there are so many bridges, because the city is wholly on the water, and surrounded by it like Venice. The merchants are so numerous and so rich, that their wealth can neither be told nor believed. They and their ladies do nothing with their own hands, but live as delicately as if they were kings. These females also are of most angelic beauty, and live in the most elegant manner. The people are idolaters, subject to the great Khan, and use paper money. They eat the flesh of dogs and other beasts, such as no Christian would touch for the world. In the city, too, are four thousand baths, in which the citizens, both men and women, take great delight, and frequently resort thither, because they keep their persons very cleanly. They are the largest and most beautiful baths in the world, insomuch that one hundred of either sex may bathe in them at once. Twenty-five miles from thence is the ocean, and there is the city Ningpo, which has a very fine port, with large ships and much merchandise of immense value, from India and other quarters. But though Marco revels in the description of wonderful cities, he is continually leading us back to the great Khan himself. His festivals were splendid. The tables were arranged so that the emperor sat higher than all the others, always with his face to the south. His sons and daughters were placed so that their heads were on a level with his feet. Some forty thousand people feast on these occasions, but the Khan himself is served only by his great barons, their mouths wrapped in rich towels, embroidered in gold and silver, that their breath might not blow upon the plates. His presents were on a colossal scale. It was no rare occurrence for him to receive five thousand camels, one hundred thousand beautiful horses, and five thousand elephants covered with gold and silver. And now I will relate a wonderful thing, says Marco. A large lion is led into his presence, which, as soon as it sees him, drops down and makes a sign of deep humility, owning him its lord and moving about without a chain. His kingdom was ruled by twelve barons, all living at Pekin. His province is numbered thirty-four, hence their method of communication was very complete. Messengers are sent to diverse provinces, says Marco, and on all the roads they find at every twenty-five miles a post, where the messengers are received. At each is a large edifice containing a bed, covered with silk, and everything useful and convenient for a traveler. Here, too, they find full four hundred horses, whom the prince has ordered to be always in waiting, to convey them along the principal roads. Thus they go through the provinces, finding everywhere inns and horses for their reception. Moreover, in the intervals between these stations, at every three miles are erected villages of about forty houses inhabited by foot-runners, also employed on these dispatches. They wear large girdles set round with bells, which are heard at a great distance. Receiving a letter or packet, one runs full speed to the next village, when his approach being announced by bells, another is ready to start, and proceed to the next, 
and so on. By these pedestrian messengers, the Khan receives news in one day and night, from places ten days' journey distant, in two days from those twenty off, and in ten from those a hundred days' journey distant. Thus he sends his messengers through all his kingdoms and provinces, to know if any of his subjects have had their crops injured through bad weather, and, if any such injury has happened, he does not exact from them any tribute for that season. Nay, he gives them corn out of his own stores to subsist on. This first European account of China is all so delightful that it is difficult to know where to stop. The mention of coal is interesting. Throughout the whole province of Cathay, says Marco, are a kind of black stones cut from the mountains in veins, which burn like logs. They maintain the fire better than wood. If you put them on in the evening, they will preserve it the whole night, and it will be found burning in the morning. Throughout the whole of Cathay, this fuel is used. They have also wood, but the stones are much less expensive. Neither can we pass over Marco's account of the wonderful stone bridge, with its twenty-four arches of pure marble across the broad river, the most magnificent object in the whole world, across which ten horsemen could ride abreast, or the yellow river, Hong Ho, so large and broad that it cannot be crossed by a bridge, and flows on even to the ocean, or the wells of mulberry trees throughout the land, on which lived the silkworms that have made China so famous for her silk. Then there are the people famous for their manufacture of fine porcelain ware. Great quantities of porcelain earth were here collected into heaps, and in this way exposed to the action of the atmosphere for some forty years, during which time it was never disturbed. By this process it became refined and fitted for manufacture. Such is Marco's only allusion to China ware. With regard to tea, he is entirely silent. But he is the first European to tell us about the islands of Japan, 1,500 miles from the coast of China, now first discovered to the geographers of the West. Sipangu, says Marco, is an island situated at a distance from the mainland. The people are fair and civilized in their manners. They possess precious metals in extraordinary abundance. The people are white, of gentle manners, idolaters in religion, and are a king of their own. These folk were attacked by the fleet of Kublai Khan in 1264 for their gold, for the king's house, windows, and floors were covered with it, but the king allowed no exportation of it. Thus Marco Polo records in dim outline the existence of land beyond that ever dreamed of by Europeans indeed, denied by Ptolemy and other geographers of the West. In the course of his service under Kublai Khan, he opened up the eight provinces of Tibet, the whole of Southeast Asia, from Canton to Bengal, and the archipelago of Farther India. He tells us, too, of Tibet, the wide country, vanquished and wasted by the Khan for the space of twenty days' journey, a great wilderness wanting people, but overrun by wild beasts. Here were great Tibetan dogs, as large as asses. Still on duty for Kublai Khan, Marco reached Bengal, which borders upon India. But he was glad enough to return to his adopted Chinese home, the richest and most famous country of all the East. At last the Polo family varied of court owners, and they were anxious to return to their own people at Venice. However, the Khan was very unwilling to let them go. One day their chance came. The Persian ruler was anxious to marry a princess of the house of Kublai Khan, and it was decided to send the lady by sea, under the protection of the trusted Polos, rather than to allow her to undergo the hardships of her overland journey from China to Persia. So in the year 1292 they bade farewell to the great Kublai Khan, and with the little princess of seventeen, and her suit, they set sail with an escort of fourteen ships for India. Passing many islands, with gold and much trade, 
After three months at sea, they reached Java, at this time supposed to be the greatest island in the world, above three thousand miles round. At Sumatra they were detained five months by stress of weather, till at last they reached the Bay of Bengal. Sailing on a thousand miles westwards, they reached Ceylon, the finest island in the world, remarks Marco. It was not till two years after their start, and the loss of six hundred sailors, that they arrived at their destination, only to find that the ruler of Persia was dead. However, they gave the little bride to his son, and passed on by Constantinople to Venice, where they arrived in 1295. And now follows a strange sequel to the story. After their long absence, and in their travel-stained garments, their friends and relations could not recognize them, and in vain did they declare that they were indeed the Polos, father, son, and uncle, who had left Venice twenty-four long years ago. It was no use. No one believed their story. So this is what they did. They arranged for a great banquet to be held, to which they invited all their relations and friends. This they attended in robes of crimson satin. Then suddenly Marco rose from the table, and going out of the room, returned with the three coarse, travel-stained garments. They ripped open seams, tore out the lining, and a quantity of precious stones, rubies, sapphires, diamonds, and emeralds poured forth. The company were filled with wonder, and when the story spread, all the people of Venice came forth to do honor to their famous fellow of countrymen. Marco was surnamed Marco of the Millions, and never tired of telling the wonderful stories of Kublai Khan, the great emperor who combined the rude magnificence of the desert with the pomp and elegance of the most civilized empire in the old world. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of A Book of Discovery – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh – Chapter 18 – The End of Medieval Exploration The two names of Ibn Battuta and Sir John Mandeville now conclude our medieval period of travel to the eastward. Both the Arab and the Englishman date their travels between the years 1325 and 1355. But while Ibn Battuta, the traveler from Tangiers, adds very valuable information to our geographical knowledge, we have to lay the travel volumes of Sir John Mandeville aside, and acknowledge sadly that his book is made up of borrowed experiences, that he has wantonly added fiction to fact, and distorted even the travel stories told by other travelers. And yet, strange to say, while the work of Ibn Battuta remains entirely disregarded, the delightful work of the Englishman is still read vigorously today, and translated into nearly every European language. In it we read strange stories of Prester John, the great emperor of India, who is served by seven kings, seventy-two dukes, and three hundred and sixty earls. He speaks of the Isle of Cathay. He repeats the legend of the island near Java, on which Adam and Eve wept for one hundred years, after they had been driven from paradise. He speaks of giants thirty feet high, and of pygmies who came dancing to see him. We turn to the Arab traveler for a solid document, which rings more true, and we cannot doubt his accounts of shipwreck and hardships encountered by the way. Ibn Battuta left Tangiers in the year 1324, at the early age of twenty-one, on a pilgrimage to Mecca. He made his way across the north of Africa to Alexandria. Here history relates he met a learned and pious man named Imam. I perceive, said Imam, that you are fond of visiting distant countries. That is so, answered Ibn Battuta. Then you must visit my brother in India, my brother in Persia, 
and my brother is China, and when you see them, present my compliments to them. Ibn Battuta left Alexandria with a resolve to visit these three persons, and indeed, wonderful to say, he found them all three and presented to them their brother's compliments. He reached Mecca and remained there for three years, after which he voyaged down the Red Sea to Aden, a port of much trade. Coasting along the east coast of Africa, he reached Mombasa, from which port, so soon to fall into the hands of the Portuguese, he sailed to Ormuz, a city on the seashore, at the entrance of the Persian Gulf. Here he tells us of the head of a fish that might be compared to a hill. Its eyes were like two doors, so that people could go in at one eye and out of other. Crossing Central Arabia and the Black Sea, he found himself for the first time in a Christian city, and was much dismayed at all the bells ringing. He was anxious to go north through Russia, to the land of darkness, of which he had heard such wonderful tales. It was a land where there were neither trees, nor stones, nor houses, where dogs with nails in their feet drew little sledges across the ice. Instead he went to Constantinople, arriving at sunset when the bells were ringing so loud that the very horizon shook with the noise. Ibn was presented to the emperor as a remarkable traveler, and a letter of safe conduct was given to him. He then made his way through Bokhara and Herat, Kandahar and Kabul, over the Hindu Kush and across the Indus to Delhi, the greatest city in the world. But at this time it was a howling wilderness, as the inhabitants had fled from the cruelty of the Turkish emperor. Into his presence our traveller was now called, and graciously received. The Lord of the world appoints you to the office of judge in Delhi, said the emperor. He gives you a dress of honour, with a saddle horse, and a large yearly salary. Ibn held this office for eight years, till one day the emperor called him, and said, I wish to send you as ambassador to the emperor of China, for I know that you are fond of travelling in foreign countries. The Emperor of China had sent presents of great value to the Emperor of India, who was now anxious to return the compliment. Quaint indeed were the gifts from India to China. There were all one hundred high-bred horses, one hundred dancing girls, one hundred pieces of cotton stuff, also silk and wool, some black, some white, blue-green or blue. There were swords of state and golden candlesticks, silver basins, brocade dresses, and gloves embroidered with pearls. But so many adventures did Ibn Battuta have on his way to China, that it is certain that none of these things ever reached that country. For eighty miles from Delhi the cavalcade was attacked, and Ibn was robbed of all he had. For days he wandered alone in a forest, living on leaves till he was rescued, more dead than alive, and carried back to Delhi. The second start was also unfortunate. By a circuitous route he made his way to Calicut, on the Malabar coast, where he made a stay of three months, till the monsoons should permit him to take ship for China. The harbour of Calicut was full of great Chinese ships called junks. These junks struck him as unlike anything he had seen before. The sails are made of cane reed, woven together like a mat, which, when they put into port, they leave standing in the wind. In some of these vessels there will be a thousand men, sailors and soldiers. Built in the ports of China only, they are rowed with large oars, which may be compared to great masts. On board are wooden houses in which the higher officers reside with their wives. The time of the voyage came. Thirteen huge junks were taken, and the imperial presents were embarked. All was ready for a start on the morrow. Ibn stayed on shore praying in the mosque till starting time. That night a violent hurricane arose, and most of the ships in the harbor were destroyed. Treasure, crew and officers all perished, and Ibn was left alone and almost penniless. He feared to return to Delhi, so he took ship which landed him on one of a group of a thousand islands, which Ibn calls 
one of the wonders of the world. The chief island was governed by a woman. Here he was made a judge, and soon became a great personage. But after a time he grew restless, and set sail for Sumatra. Here, at the court of the king, who was a zealous disciple of Mohammed, Ibn met with a kind reception, and after a fortnight, provided with provisions, the restless Mohammedan again voyaged northwards into the calm sea, or the Pacific as we call it now. It was so still, disturbed by neither wind nor waves, that the ship had to be towed by a smaller ship till they reached China. This is a vast country, writes Ibn, and it abounds in all sorts of good things, fruit, corn, gold, and silver. It is traversed by a great river, the waters of life, which runs through the heart of China for a distance of six months' journey. It is bordered with villages, cultivated plains, orchards, and markets, just like the Nile in Egypt. Ibn gives an amusing account of the Chinese poultry. The cocks and hens are bigger than our geese. I one day bought a hen, he says, which I wanted to boil, but one pot would not hold it, and I was obliged to take two. As for the cocks in China, they are as big as ostriches. Pooh, cried an owner of Chinese fowls, there are cocks in China much bigger than that. And I found he had said no more than the truth. Silk is very plentiful, for the worms which produce it require little attention. They have silk in such abundance that it is used for clothing even by poor monks and beggars. The people of China do not use gold and silver coin in their commercial dealings. Their buying and selling is carried on by means of pieces of paper about the size of the palm of the hand, carrying the seal of the emperor. The Arab traveler has much to say about the superb painting of China. They study and paint every stranger that visits their country, and the portrait thus taken is exposed on the city wall. Thus, should a stranger do anything to make flight necessary, his portrait would be sent out into every province, and he would soon be discovered. China is the safest as well as the pleasantest of all the regions on the earth for a traveler. You may travel the whole nine months' journey to which the empire extends, without the slightest cause to fear, even if you have treasure in your charge. But it afforded me no pleasure. On the contrary, my spirit was sorely troubled within me to see how paganism had the upper hand. Troubles now broke out among the Khan's family, which led to civil wars and the death of the great Khan. He was buried with great pomp. A deep chamber was dug into the earth, into which a beautiful couch was placed, on which was led the dead Khan, with his arms, and all his rich apparel, the earth over him being heaped to the height of a large hill. Batuta now hurried from the country, to Kajang to Sumatra, thence to Calicut, and by Ormond's home to Tangier, where he arrived in 1348. He had done what he set forth to do. He had visited the three brothers of Imam in Persia, India, and China. In addition, he had traveled for twenty-four years, and accomplished in all about seventy-five thousand miles. With him the history of medieval exploration would seem to end, for within eighty years of his death, the modern epoch opens with the energies and enthusiasm of Prince Henry of Portugal. For the last few centuries we have found all travel undertaken more or less as a religious crusade. So far during the last centuries, travel had been for the most part by land. Few discoveries had been made by sea. Voyages were too difficult and dangerous. The Phoenicians had ventured far with intrepid courage. The Vikings had tossed furlessly over the stormy northern seas to the yet unknown land of America. But this was long ago. Throughout the Middle Ages, hardly a sail was to be seen on the vast Atlantic and Pacific oceans. No ships ventured on what was held to be the Sea of Darkness. No man was emboldened to risk life and money on the unknown waters beyond his own safe home. End of chapter 18
Chapter 19 of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 19 Medieval Maps. We cannot pass from the subject of medieval exploration without a word on the really delightful, if ignorant, maps of the period, for they illustrate better than any description the state of geography at this time. The Ptolemy map, summing up all the Greek and Roman learning, with its longitudes and latitudes, with its shaped continents and its many towns and rivers, indicates the high-water mark of a tide that was soon to ebb. With the decline of the Roman Empire, and the coming of Christianity, we get a new spirit inspiring our medieval maps, in which Jerusalem, hitherto totally obscure, dominates the whole situation. The Christian topography of Cosmos in the 6th century sets a new model. Figures blowing trumpets representing the winds still blow on to the world, as they did in the days of Ptolemy, but the earth is once more flat, and it is again surrounded by the ocean stream. Round this ocean stream, according to Cosmos, is an outer earth, the seat of paradise, the earth beyond the ocean where men dwelt before the flood. Although these maps of Cosmos were but the expression of one man's ideas, they served as a model for others. There is a Turin, a delightful map of the 8th century, with the four winds and the ocean stream, as usual. The world is divided into three, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Adam and Eve stand on the top. To the right of Adam lies Armenia and the Caucasus. To the left of Eve are Mount Lebanon, the river Jordan, Sidon, and Mesopotamia. At their feet lie Mount Canal, Jerusalem, and Babylon. In Europe we find a few names, such as Constantinople, Italy, France, Britannia, and Scotland, are islands in the circling sea. Africa is suitably represented by the Nile. Of much the same date is another map known as the Albi, preserved in the library at Albi in Languedoc. The world is square, with rounded corners. Britain is an island off the coast of Spain and a beautiful green sea flows round the whole. An example of 10th century map-making, known as the Cotoniana, or Anglo-Saxon map, is in the British Museum. Here is a mixture of biblical and classical knowledge. Jerusalem and Bethlehem are in their place, and the pillars of Hercules stand at the entrance of the Mediterranean Sea. The British Isles are still distorted, and quantities of little unnamed islands lie about the north of Scotland. In the extreme east lies an enormous Ceylon. In the northeast corner of Asia is drawn a magnificent lion with mane and curling tail. With the words around him, here lions abound. Africa, as usual, is made up of the Nile, Alexandria at its mouth, and its source in a lake. There is another form of these early maps. They are quite small and round. They are known as T-maps, being divided into three parts, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Jerusalem is always in the center, and the ocean stream flows round. After the manner of these, only on a very large scale, is the famous Mappa Mundi, by Richard of Haldingham, on the walls of the Hereford Cathedral of the 13th century. Jerusalem is in the center, and the crucifixion is there depicted. At the top is the last judgment, with the good and bad folk divided on either side. Adam and Eve are there, so are the pillars of Hercules, Scylla, and Charybdis, the Red Sea colored red, the Nile and the mountains of the moon, strange beasts and stranger men. With the Hereford map came in that pictorial geography, that makes the maps of the later Middle Ages so delightful. This is indeed the true way to make a map, says a modern writer. 
If these old maps erred in the course of their rivers, and the lines of their mountains and space, they are not so misleading as your modern atlas, with its too accurate measurements. For even your most primitive map, with paradise in the east, a gigantic Jerusalem in the center, gives a less distorted impression than that which we obtain from the most scientific chart on Mercator's projection. End of chapter 19「20 of A Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 20 Prince Henry of Portugal But now a new era was about to begin. A new age was dawning and we open a wonderful chapter in the history of discovery, perhaps the most wonderful in all the world. In Portugal a man had arisen who was to awaken the slumbering world of travel and direct it to the high seas. And the name of this man was Henry, a son of King John of Portugal. His mother was an English woman, daughter of John of Gaunt, time-honored Lancaster. The prince was, therefore, a nephew of Henry the Fourth and great-grandson of Edward of England. But if English blood flowed in his veins, he, too, was the son of the greatest king that ever sat on the throne of Portugal. And at the age of twenty he had already learned something of the sea that lay between his father's kingdom and the northern coast of Africa. Thus, when in the year 1415 King John planned a great expedition across the narrow seas to Tsota, an important Moorish city in North Africa. It fell to Prince Henry himself to equip seven triremes, six biremes, twenty-six ships of burden, and a number of small craft. These he had ready at Lisbon, when news reached him that the queen, his mother, was stricken ill. The king and three sons were soon at her bedside. It was evident that she was dying. "'What wind blows so strongly against the side of the house?' she asked suddenly. "'The wind blows from the north,' replied her sons. "'It is the wind most favorable for your departure,' replied Philippa. And with these words the English queen died. "'This is not the place to tell how the expedition started at once, as the dead queen had wished, how Tsota was triumphantly taken, and how Prince Henry distinguished himself till all Europe rang with his fame.' Henry V of England begged him to come over and take command of his forces. The Emperor of Germany sent the same request. But he had other schemes for his life. He would not fight the foes of England or of Germany. Rather would he fight the great ocean whose waves dashed high against the coast of Portugal. He had learned something of inland Africa, of the distant coast of Guinea, and he was fired with the idea of exploring along this west coast of Africa, and possibly reaching India by sea. Let us recall what was known of the Atlantic only six centuries ago. It was, says an old writer, a vast and boundless ocean, on which ships dared not venture out of sight of land. For even if the sailors knew the direction of the winds, they would not know whither those winds would carry them. And as there is no inhabited country beyond, they would run great risk of being lost in mist and vapor. The limit of the west is Atlantic Ocean. The ocean was a new and formidable foe, hitherto unconquered and unexplored. At last one had arisen to attempt its conquest. As men had lifted the veil from the unknown land of China, so now the mists were to be cleared from the sea of darkness. On the inhospitable shores of southern Portugal, amid the sadness of a waste of shifting sand, in a neighborhood so barren that only a few stunted trees struggled for existence, on one of the coldest, dreariest spots of sunny Portugal, Prince Henry built his naval arsenal. In this secluded spot, far from the gaieties of court life, with the vast Atlantic rolling measureless and mysterious before him, Prince Henry took up the study of astronomy and mathematics. 
Here he gathered round him men of science. He built ships and trained Portuguese sailors in the art of navigation, so far as it was known in those days. Then he urged them seawards. In 1418, two gentlemen of his household, Zarco and Vaz, volunteered to sail to Cape Bojador, toward the south. They started off, and as usual, hugged the coast for some way. But a violent storm arose, and soon they were driven out to sea. They had lost sight of land, and given themselves up for lost, when, at break of day, they saw an inland not far off. Delighted at their escape, they named it Porto Santo, and, overjoyed at their discovery, hastened back to Portugal to relate their adventures to Prince Henry. They described the fertile soil and delicious climate of the newly found island, the simplicity of its inhabitants, and they requested leave to return and make a Portuguese settlement there. To reward them, Prince Henry gave them three ships and everything to ensure success in their new enterprise. But unfortunately he added a rabbit and her family. These were turned out and multiplied with such astonishing rapidity that in two years' time they were numerous enough to destroy all the vegetation of the island. So Porto Santo was colonized by the Portuguese, and one Perestrello was made governor of the island, and it is interesting to note that his daughter became the wife of Christopher Columbus. But the original founders, Zarco and Vaz, had observed from time to time a dark spot on the horizon, which aroused their curiosity. Sailing towards it, they found an island of considerable size, uninhabited and very attractive, but so covered with woods that they named it Madeira, the island of woods. But although these two islands belong to Portugal, Today, and although Portugal claimed their discovery, it has been proved that already an Englishman and his wife had been there, and the names of the islands appear on an Italian map of 1851. The story of this first discovery is very romantic. In the reign of Edward, a young man named Robert Machin sailed away from Bristol with a very wealthy lady. A northeast wind carried them out of their course, and after thirteen days driving before a storm, they were cast on to an island. It was uninhabited and well wooded and watered. But the sufferings and privations proved too much for the poor English lady, who died after three days, and Machin died a few days later of grief and exposure. The crew of the ship sailed away to the coast of Africa, there to be imprisoned by the Moors. Upon their escape in 1416, they made known their discovery. So Zarco and Vaz divided the island of Madeira, calling half of it Funchal, the Portuguese for fennel, which grew here in great quantities. And the other half Machizo, after the poor English discoverer Machin. The first two Portuguese children born in the island of Madeira were called Adam and Eve. Year after year Prince Henry launched his little ships on the yet unknown, uncharted seas, urging his captains to venture farther and even farther. He longed for them to reach Cape Bojador, and bitter was his disappointment, when one of his squires, dismayed by travellers' tales, turned back from the Canary Islands. "'Go out again,' urged the enthusiastic prince, "'and give no heed to their opinions, for, by the grace of God, you cannot fail to derive from your voyage both honor and profit. And the squire went forth from the commanding presence of the prince, resolved to double the cape, which he successfully accomplished in 1434. Seven years passed away, till in 1441, two men, Gonzalves, master of the wardrobe, a strange qualification for difficult navigation, and Nuno Tristam, a young knight, started forth on the prince's service, with orders to pass Cape Bojador, where a dangerous surf, breaking on the shore, had terrified other navigators. There was a story, too, that any man who passed Cape Bojador would be changed from white into black, that there were sea monsters, sheets of burning flame, and boiling waters beyond. The young knight Tristam discovered the white headland beyond Cape Bojador, 
named it Cape Blanco, and took home some moors of high rank to the prince. A large sum was offered for their ransom, so Gonzalves conveyed them back to Cape Blanco, and coasted along to the south, discovering the island of Arquin of the Capa Verde group, and reaching the neighborhood of Sierra Leone, reached by Hanno many centuries before this. Here he received some gold dust, and with this and some thirty negroes he returned to Lisbon, where the strange black negroes caused the most lively astonishment among the people. The small quantity of gold dust created a sensation among the Portuguese explorers, and the spirit of adventure grew. No longer had the prince to urge his navigators forth to new lands and new seas. They were ready and willing to go, for the reward was now obvious. The news was soon noised abroad, and Italians, then reckoned among the most skilful seamen of the time, flocked to Portugal, anxious to take service under the prince. Love of gain was the magic wand that drew them on and on, into unknown leagues of waters, into wild adventures and desperate affrays. The navigator himself looked beyond these things. He would find a way to India. He would teach the heathen to be Christians. He was always ready to welcome these with superior knowledge of navigation. So in 1454 he sent an Italian, known to history as Cadamosto, to sail the African seas. The young Venetian was but twenty-one, and he tells his story simply. Now I, Luigi Cadamosto, had sailed nearly all the Mediterranean coasts, but being caught by a storm of Cape St. Vincent, had to take refuge in the prince's town, and was there told of the glorious and boundless conquest of the prince, the which did exceedingly stir my soul, eager as I was, for gain above all things else. My age, my vigor, my skill are equal to any toil. Above all, my passionate desire to see the world and explore the unknown set me all on fire with eagerness. In 1455, Cadamosto sailed from Portugal for Madeira, now sickly peopled with Portuguese. From Madeira to the Canaries, from the Canaries to Cape Blanco, natives black as moles were dressed in white flowing robes, with turbans wound round their heads. Here was a great market of Arab traders from the interior. Here were camels laden with brass, silver, and gold, as well as slaves innumerable. But Cadamosto pushed on for some four hundred miles by the low, sandy shore to the Senegal River. The Portuguese had already sailed by this part of the coast, and the Negroes had sought their ships to be the great birds from afar, cleaving the air with their white wings. When the crews furled their sails and drew into shore, the natives changed their minds, and so they were fishes, and all stood on the shore, gazing stupidly at this new wonder. Cadamosto landed and pushed some two hundred and fifty miles up the Senegal River, where he set up a market, exchanging cotton and clothes for gold, while the negroes came stupidly, crowding round me, wondering at our white color, which they tried to wash off, our dress, our garments of black silk, and robes of blue clothes. Joined by two other ships from Portugal, the Italian explorer now sailed on to Cape Verde, so called from its green grass. The land here, he tells us, is all low and full of fine large trees, which are continually green. The trees never wither like those in Europe. They grow so near the shore that they seem to drink, as it were, the water of the sea. The coast is most beautiful. Many countries have I been in, to east and west, but never did I see a prettier sight. But the negroes here, big, comely men, were lawless and impossible to approach, shooting at the Portuguese explorers with poisoned arrows. They discovered that the capital of the country was called Gambra, where lived a king. But the negroes of the Gambra were unfriendly. There was little gold to be had. His crews fell sick and ill, and Cadamosto turned home again. But he had reached a point beyond all other explorers of the time, a point where only once did we see the North Star, which was so low that it seemed almost to touch the sea. We know that he must have been to within eleven degrees of the equator, 
and it is disappointing to find the promising young Italian disappearing from the pages of history. And now we come to the last voyage planned by Prince Henry, that of Diego Gomez, his own faithful servant. It followed close on Cadamosto's return. No long time after, the prince equipped a ship called the Vren, and set over it Diego Gomez, with two other ships, of which he was commander-in-chief. Their orders were to go as far as they could. Gomez wrote his own travels, and his adventures are best told in his own words. We take up his story from the far side of Cape Blanco. After passing a great river beyond Rio Grande, we met such strong currents in the sea that no anchor could hold. The other captains and their men were much alarmed, thinking we were at the end of the ocean, and begged me to put back. In the mid-current the sea was very clear, and the natives came off from the shore and brought us their merchandise. As the current grew even stronger, we put back and come to a land, where were groves of palms near the shore, with their branches broken. There we found a plain covered with hay and more than five thousand animals, like stags, but larger, who showed no fear of us. Five elephants with two young ones came out of a small river that was fringed by trees. We went back to the ships, and next day made our way from Cape Verde, and saw the broad mouth of a great river, which we entered and guessed to be the Gambia. We went up the river as far as Cantor, some five hundred miles. Farther than this the ships could not go, because of the thick groves of trees and underwood. When the news spread through the country that the Christians were in Cantor, they came from Timbuktu in the north, from Mount Gelu in the south, here I was told there is gold in plenty, and caravans of camels cross over there with goods from Carthage, Tunis, Fez, Cairo, and all the land of the Saracens. I asked the natives of Cantor about the road to the gold country. They told me the king lived in Kukia, and was lord of all the mines on the right side of the river of Cantor, and that he had before the door of his palace a mass of gold, just as it was taken from the earth, so large that twenty men could hardly move it, and that the king always fastened his horse to it. While I was thus trafficking with these negroes, my men became worn out with the heat, and so we returned towards the ocean. But Diego Gomez had succeeded in making friends with the hostile natives of this part. He left behind him a better idea of Christian men than some of the other explorers had done. His own account of the conversion of the Mohammedan king, who lived near the mouth of the river Gambia, which was visited on the return voyage, is most interesting. Now the houses here are made of seaweed, covered with straw, and while I stayed here, at the river mouth, three days, I learned all the mischiefs that had been done to the Christians by a certain king. So I took pains to make peace with him, and sent him many presents by his own men in his own canoes. Now the king was in great fear of the Christians, lest they should take vengeance upon him. When the king heard that I had always treated the natives kindly, he came to the riverside with great force, and sitting down on the bank sent for me. And so I went and paid him all respect. There was a bishop there of his own face, who asked me about the God of the Christians, and I answered him as God had given me to know. At last the king was so pleased with what I said, that he sprang to his feet and ordered the Mohammedan bishop to leave his country within three days. So when the Portuguese returned home, Prince Henry sent a priest and a young man of his own household to the black king at the mouth of the Gambia. This was in 1458. In the year of our Lord, 1460, Prince Henry fell ill in this town of Cape St. Vincent, says his faithful explorer and servant, Diego Gomez, and of that sickness he died. Such was the end of the man who has been called the originator of modern discovery. What had he done? He had inspired and financed the Portuguese navigators to sail for some two thousand miles down the West African coast. From his way washed home, he inspired the courage of his men and planned their voyages and by the purity of his actions and the devotion of his life, 
really lived up to his inspiring motto, Talent de bien faire. And more than this, for each successive discovery had been carefully noted at the famous sacred settlement, and these had been worked up by an Italian monk named Fra Mauro into an enormous wall map, over six feet across, crammed with detail, the work of three years' incessant labor. End of chapter 20「Chapter twenty one of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter twenty one. Bartholomew Diaz reaches the Stormy Cape. But though Prince Henry was dead, the enthusiasm he had aroused among Portuguese navigators was not dead, and Portuguese ships still stole forth by twos and threes to search for treasure down the West African coast. In 1462 they reached Sierra Leone, the farthest point attained by Hanno of olden days. Each new headland was now taken in the name of Portugal. Wooden crosses already marked each successive discovery and many a tree near the coast bore the motto of Prince Henry, carved roughly on its bark. Portugal had officially claimed this kingdom of the seas, as it was called, and henceforth stone crosses, some six feet high, inscribed with the arms of Portugal, the name of the navigator, and the date of discovery, marked each newly found spot. It was not until 1471 that the navigators unconsciously crossed the equator, into a new heaven and new earth. They saw stars unknown in the northern hemisphere, and the northern pole star sunk nearly out of sight. Another thirteen years, and Diego Cam, a knight of the king's household, found the mouth of the Congo, and erected a great Portuguese pillar on the famous spot. It was in the year 1484 that Diego Cam was ordered to go as far to the south as he could. He crossed the equator, which for past years had been the limit of knowledge, and, continuing southwards, he reached the mouth of the mighty river Congo, now known as the second of all the African rivers for size. The explorer ascended the river, falling in with peacefully inclined natives. But they could not make themselves understood, so Cam took back four of them to Portugal, where they learned enough Portuguese to talk a little. They were much struck with Portugal and the kind treatment they received from the king, who sent them back to their country, laden with presents for their black king at home. So with Diego come, they all sailed back to the Congo River. They were received by the king in royal state. Seated on a throne of ivory, raised on a lofty wooden platform, he could be seen from all sides, his black and glittering skin shining out above a piece of damask, given to him to wear by the Portuguese explorer. From his shoulder hung a dressed horse's tail, a symbol of royalty. On his head was a cap of palm leaves. It was here in this Congo district that the first Negro was baptized in the presence of some 25,000 heathen comrades. The ceremony was performed by Portuguese priests, and the Negro king ordered all idols to be destroyed throughout his dominions. Here, too, a little Christian church was built, and the king and queen became such earnest Christians that they sent their children to Portugal to be taught. But even the discoveries of Diego Cam pale before the great achievement of Bartholomew Diaz, who was now to accomplish the great task which Prince Henry the Navigator had yearned to see fulfilled, the rounding of the Cape of Storms. The expedition set sail for the south in August 1486. Passing the spot where Diego Cam had erected his farthest pillar, Diaz reached a headland, now known as Diaz Point, where he too placed a Portuguese pillar that remained unbroken till about a hundred years ago. Still to the south he sailed, struggling with wind and weather, to Cape Voltas, close to the mouth of the Orange River. Then for another fortnight the little ships were driven before the wind, south and ever south, with half-reefed sails and no land in sight. 
Long days and longer nights passed to find them still drifting in an unknown sea, knowing not what an hour might bring forth. At last the great wind ceased to blow, and it became icy cold. They had sailed to the south of South Africa. Steering north, Diaz now fell in with land, land with cattle near the shore and cohorts tending them. But the black cohorts were so alarmed at the sight of the Portuguese that they fled away inland. We now know, what neither Diaz nor his crew even suspected, that he had actually rounded, without seeing, the Cape of Good Hope. The coast now turned eastward, till a small island was reached in a bay we now call Algoa Bay. Here Bartholomew Diaz set up another pillar with its cross and inscription, naming the rock Santa Cruz. This was the first land beyond the Cape ever trodden by European feet. Unfortunately, the natives, Kafirs, threw stones at them, and it was impossible to make friends and to land. The crews, too, began to complain. They were worn out with continual work, weary for fresh food, terrified at the heavy seas that broke on these southern shores. With one voice they protested against proceeding any farther. But the explorer could not bear to turn back. He must sail onwards now, just three days more, and then, if they found nothing, he would turn back. They sailed on and came to the mouth of a large river, the Great Fish River. Again the keen explorer would sail on and add to his already momentous discoveries. But the crews again began their complaints, and, deeply disappointed, Diaz had to turn. When he reached the little island of Santa Cruz, and bade farewell to the cross which he had there erected, it was with grief as intense as if he were leaving his child in the wilderness with no hope of ever seeing him again. To him it seemed as though he had endured all his hardships in vain. He knew not what he had really accomplished as yet, but his eyes were soon to be opened. Sailing westward, Diaz at last came in sight of the remarkable cape, which had been hidden from the eyes of man for so many centuries. Remembering their perils past, he called it the Stormy Cape, and hastened home to the King of Portugal with his great news. The king was overjoyed, but he refused to name it the Cape of Storms. Would not such a name deter the seamen of the future? Was not this the long-sought passage to India? Rather it should be called the Cape of Good Hope, the name which it has held throughout the centuries. In the course of one voyage Diaz had accomplished the great task, which for the past seventy years Prince Henry had set before his people. He had lifted for the first time in the history of the world the veil that had hung over the mysterious extremity of the great African continent. The Phoenicians may have discovered it some seventeen hundred years before Diaz, but the record of tradition alone exists. Now with the new art of printing, which was transforming the whole aspect of life, the brilliant achievement of Bartholomew Diaz was made known far and wide. It was shortly to be followed by a yet more brilliant feat, by a yet more brilliant navigator, the most illustrious that the world has seen. The very name of Christopher Columbus calls up the vision of a resolute man beating right out into the westward unknown seas, and finding, as his great reward, a whole new continent, a new world of whose existence mankind had hardly dreamed. End of chapter 21「ちょっと待ってください。We linger over all that leads up to the momentous start westwards. We recall his birth and early life at Genoa, towards the middle of the fifteenth century, his apprenticeship to his father as a weaver of clothes, his devotion to the sea, 
His love of the little sailing ships that passed in and out of the busy Genoese harbor, from all parts of the known world. At the age of fourteen the little Christopher went at sea, a red-haired, sunburned boy with bright blue eyes. He learned the art of navigation, he saw foreign countries, he learned to chart the seas, to draw maps, and possibly worked with some of the noted Italian draughtsmen. At the age of twenty-eight, in 1474, he left Genoa for Portugal, famous throughout the world for her recent discoveries, though as yet the stormy cape lay veiled in mystery. Columbus wanted to learn all he could about these discoveries. He made voyages to Guinea, Madeira, and Porto Santo. He also went to England and sailed a hundred leagues to the island of Tulle in 1477. He was now a recognized seaman of distinction, with courteous manners and fine appearance. He set himself to study maps and charts at Lisbon, giving special attention to instruments for making observations at sea. For many long years he had been revolving a scheme for reaching India by sailing westward instead of the route by Africa. The more he studied the things, the more convinced he became that he was right. What if Mai's man had, as far back as Ptolemy, judged that the earth like an orange was round? None of them ever said, Come along, follow me, sail to the west, and the east will be found. It was not till the year 1480 that Columbus proposed to the king of Portugal his idea of sailing westwards. He explained his reasons, how there were grounds for thinking there was an unknown land to the west, how artistically sculptured pieces of wood had been driven across the ocean by the west wind, suggesting islands not yet discovered, how once the corpses of two men with broad faces, unlike Europeans, had been washed ashore, how on the west coast of Ireland seeds of tropical plants had been discovered. The king listened and was inclined to believe Columbus, but his counselors persuaded him to get from the Genoese navigator his plans, and while they kept Columbus waiting for the king's answer, they sent off some ships privately to investigate the whole matter. The ships started westward, encountered a great storm, and returned to Lisbon, scoffing at the scheme of the stranger. When this news reached his ears, Columbus was very angry. He would have nothing more to do with Portugal, but left that country at once for Spain to appeal to the king and queen of that land. Ferdinand and Isabella were busy with affairs of state, and could not give audience to the man who was to discover a new world. It was not till 1491 that he was summoned before the king and queen. Once more his wild scheme was laughed at, and he was dismissed by the court. Not only was he again indignant, but his friends were indignant too. They believed in him, and would not rest, till they had persuaded the queen to take up his cause. He demanded a good deal. He must be made admiral and viceroy of all the new seas and lands he might discover, and while receiving a large portion of his gains. The queen was prevailed on to provide means for his expedition, and she became so enthusiastic over it that she declared she would sell her own jewels to provide the necessary supplies. Columbus was created admiral of the ocean in all the islands and continents he might discover. Two little ships were made ready, and it seemed as though the dream of his life might be fulfilled. The explorer was now forty-six. His red hair had become gray, was waiting and watching for the possibility of realizing his great scheme. At last the preparations were complete. The Santa Maria was to lead the way with the admiral on board. She was but one hundred tons burden, with high poop and forecastle. It had been difficult enough to find a crew. Men were shy about venturing with the stranger from Genoa on unknown seas, and it was a motley party that finally took service under Columbus. The second ship, the Pinta, was but half the size of the flagship, she had a crew of eighteen, and was the fastest sailor of the little squadron, while the third, the Nina, of forty tons, also carried eighteen men. On the third of August, 1492, the little fleet sailed forth from Spain, on a quest more perilous, perhaps, than any yet on record. No longer could they sail along with the coast always in sight, day after day and night after night. They must sail on an unknown sea in search of an unknown land. 
no one ever expected to see them again. It has well been said that looking back at all that has grown out of it in the four centuries that have elapsed, we now know that the sailing of those three little boats over the bar was, since the fall of Rome, the most momentous event in the world's history. The ships steered for the Canary Islands, and it was not till 9th of the September that the last land faded from the eyes of that daring little company. Something of a panic among the sailors ensued when they realized their helpless position. Some even burst into tears, begging to be taken home. The days passed on. By the 16th they had come within the influence of the trade winds. The weather was like April, says Columbus in his journal. Still westward they sailed, eagerly looking for signs of land. Now they see two pelicans, an indication that land was near. Now a large dark cloud to the north, another sign that land is near. As the days pass on, their hopes die away, and the temper of the crews was getting uglier and uglier as the three little vessels forged westward through the blue weed strewn waters. On ninth October hope revives. All night they hear birds passing through the still air. On the evening of the eleventh, a light was seen glimmering in the distance. From the high stern deck of the Santa Maria it could be plainly seen, and when the sun rose on that memorable morning, the low shores of a land a few miles distant could be plainly seen. Seabirds are wheeling overhead, heedless of the intruders, but on the shore human beings are assembling to watch the strange birds, which now spread their wings and sail toward the island. The Pinta leads and her crew are raising the Te Deum. The crews of the Santa Maria and the Nina join in the solemn chant, and many rough men brush away tears. Columbus, the two Pinzons, and some of the men step into the cutter and route to the shore. Columbus, fully armed under his scarlet cloak, sprang ashore, the enclosed natives fleeing away at sight of the first white man who had ever stepped on their shores. Then, Unfurling the royal standard of Spain and setting up a large cross, the great navigator fell on his knees and gave thanks to God for this triumphant ending of his perilous voyage. He named the island San Salvador and formally took possession of it for Spain. It was one of the Bahama group and is now known as Lotling Island, British. Thus was the mighty enterprise achieved, mighty in its conception, still more important in its results. But Columbus thought he had discovered the Indies, a new route to the east and the Cathay of Marco Polo. He had done more than this. He had discovered another continent. He had sailed over three thousand miles without seeing land, a feat unparalleled in the former history of discovery. He made friends with the natives, who resembled those of the Canary Islands. I believe they would easily become Christians, wrote Columbus. If it please our Lord at the time of my departure, I will take six from here, that they may learn to speak. He also notes that they will make good slaves. From island to island he now made his way, guided by natives. He hoped to find gold, he hoped to find Cathy, for he had a letter from Ferdinand and Isabella to deliver to the great Khan. The charm and beauty of these enchanted islands were a source of joy to the explorer. The singing of the little birds is such that it appears a man would wish never to leave here, and the flocks of pirates obscure the sun. The island of Cuba seemed like heaven itself, but Columbus could not forget that he was searching for gold, for oriental spices for the land of Marco Polo, as he hastened from point to point, from island to island. Already the Pintia and their Martian Pinzon had gone off independently in search of a vague land of gold, to the vexation of the admiral. A worse disaster was now to befall him. On Christmas Day, off the island of Haiti, the Santa Maria struck upon a reef and went over. Columbus and his crew escaped on board the little Nina, but she was too small to carry home the double crew, and Columbus made a little fortress on the island, where the native king was friendly, and left there a little colony of Spaniards. He now prepared for the homeward voyage, and one January day in 1493 he left the newly discovered islands and set his face for home in company with the Pinta, which by this time had returned to him. 
For some weeks they got on fairly well. Then the wind rose. A violent storm came on. The sea was terrible, the waves breaking right over the little homeward-bound ships, which tossed about helplessly for long days and nights. Suddenly the Pinta disappeared. The wind and sea increased. The little forty-ton Nino was in extreme peril, and the crew gave themselves up for lost. Their provisions were nearly finished. Columbus was agonized lest he should perish and the news of his great discovery should never reach Spain. Taking a piece of parchment, he noted down as best he could amid the tossing of the ship a brief account of his work, and, wrapping it in a waxed cloth, he put it into an empty cask and threw it overboard. Then, while the mountainous sea threatened momentary destruction, he waited and prayed. Slowly the storm abated, and on 18th February they reached the Azores. A few days for refreshment, and on he sailed again, feverishly anxious to reach Spain and proclaim his great news. But on 3rd March the wind again rose to hurricane, and death stared the crew in the face. Still, under bare poles and in a heavy cross sea, they scudded on, until they reached the mouth of the Tagus. The news of his arrival soon spread, and excited crowds hurried to see the little ship that had crossed the fierce Atlantic. Bartolomeo Diaz came aboard the Nina, and for a short time the two greatest explorers of their century were together. An enthusiastic welcome awaited him in Spain. Was he not the admiral of the Ocean Sea, viceroy of the Western Indies, the only man who had crossed the unknown for the sake of a cherished dream? Seven months had passed since Columbus had sailed from Spain in the dim light of that summer morning. Now he was back. Through tempestuous seas and raging winter gales, he had guided his ship well, and Spain knew how to do him honor. His journey from the coast to the court was like a royal progress. The roads were lined with excited people. The air was rent with shouts of joy. On Palm Sunday, 1493, he passed through the streets of Seville. A procession preceded him, in which walked the six natives, or Indians as they were called, brought home by Columbus. Parrots and other birds with strange and radiant coloring were also born before the triumphant explorer, who himself rode on horseback among the mounted chivalry of Spain. From windows and roofs a dense throng watched Christopher Columbus as he rode through the streets of Seville. From here he passed on to Barcelona, to be received by the king and queen. The city decked herself to meet me, roared by name. The king, the queen, bade me be seated, speak, and tell them all the story of my voyage. And while I spoke, the crowd's roar fell as at the peace be still. And once I ceased to speak, the king, the queen, sank from their thrones and melted into tears, and knelt and lifted hand and heart and voice in praise to God, who led me through the waste. And then the great Laudamus rose to heaven. It is curious to think what a strange mistake caused all their rejoicing. Not only Spain, but the whole civilized world firmly believed that Columbus had discovered some islands of the coast of Asia, not far from the land of the great Khan, in the Indian seas. Hence the islands were called the West Indies, which name they have kept to this day. End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of a Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter twenty three. A great new world. The departure of Columbus, six months later on his second voyage, was a great contrast to the uncertain start of a year ago. The new fleet was ready by September 1493. The three largest ships were some four hundred tons burden, with fourteen smaller craft and crews of fifteen thousand men. There was no dearth of volunteers this time. High-born Spaniards, thirsting for the wealth of the Indies, offered their services, while Columbus took his brother James and a Benedictine monk chosen by the Pope. 
They took orange and lemon seeds for planting in the new islands, horses, pigs, bulls, cows, sheep and goats, besides fruit and vegetables. So full of hope and joyful expectation they set sail, and so well had Columbus calculated his distance and direction, with but imperfect instruments at his disposal, that he arrived at the islands again on 3rd of November. It was another new island, which he named Dominica, as the day was Sunday. Making for the island of Haiti, where he had left his little Spanish colony, he passed many islands, naming Guadalupe, St. Martin, Santa Cruz, and others. Puerto Rico was also found, but they arrived at Haiti to find no trace of Spaniards. Disaster had overtaken the colony, and the deserted men had been killed by the natives, who had apparently been so friendly. Another spot was selected by Columbus, and a town was soon built, to which he gave the name of Isabella. This is not the place to tell of the miserable disputes and squabbles that befell the little Spanish colony. We are here concerned with the fuller exploration of the West Indies by Columbus. Taking three ships provisioned for six months with a crew of fifty-two, he set out for the coast of Cathay. Instead of this, he found the island of Jamaica, with its low, hazy blue coast, of extreme beauty. Still convinced that he was near the territory of the great Khan, he explored the coast of Cuba, not realizing that it was an island. He sailed about among the islands, till he became very ill. Fever seized him, and at last his men carried him ashore at Isabella, thinking that he must die. He recovered to find a discontented colony, members of which had already sent back stories to Spain of the misdeeds of their founder. Columbus made up his mind to return to Spain to carry a true report of the difficulties of colonization in the Indies. It was June 1496 before he found himself again in the harbor of Cadiz. People had crowded down to greet the great discoverer, but instead of a joyous crew, flushed with new success and rich with the spoils of the golden Indies, a feeble train of wretched men crawled on shore, thin, miserable, and ill. Columbus himself was dressed as a monk, in a long gown girded with a cord. His beard was long and unshaven. The whole man was utterly broken down with all he had been through. But after a stay of two years in Spain, Columbus again started off on his third voyage. With six ships he now took a more southerly direction, hoping to find land to the south of the West Indies. As this he did, but he never lived to know that it was the great continent of South America. Through scorching heat, which melted the tar of their rigging, they sailed onwards, till they were rewarded by the sight of land at last. Columbus had promised to dedicate the first land he saw to the Holy Trinity. What, then, was his surprise when land appeared from which arose three distinct peaks, which he at once named La Trinidad? The luxuriance of the island pleased the Spaniards, and as they made their way slowly along the shore, their eyes rested for the first time, and unconsciously, on the mainland of South America. It appeared to the explorer as a large island, which he called Isla Santa. Here oysters abounded, and very large fish, and parrots as large as hens. Between the island and the mainland lay a narrow channel, through which flowed a mighty current. While the ships were anchoring here, a great flood of fresh water came down with a great roar, nearly destroying the little Spanish ships, and greatly alarming both Columbus and his men. It was one of the mouths of the river Orinoco, to which they gave the name of the Dragon's Mouth. To danger over they sailed on, charmed with the beautiful shores, the sight of the distant mountains, and the sweetness of the air. Columbus decided that this must be the center of the earth's surface, and with its mighty rivers. Surely it was none other than the earthly paradise, with the rivers of the Garden of Eden, that some of the fathers had declared to be situated in the extreme east of the old world, and in a region so high that the flood had not overwhelmed it. The world then, said Columbus, could not be a perfect round, but pear-shaped. With these conclusions he hastened across the Haiti, where his brother was ruling over the little colony in his absence. But treachery and mutiny had been at work. Matters had gone ill with the colony, 
and Columbus did not improve the situation by his presence. He was a brilliant navigator, but no statesman. Complaints reached Spain, and a Spaniard was sent out to replace Columbus. This high-handed official at once put the poor navigator in chains, and placed him on board a ship bound for Spain. Queen Isabella was overwhelmed with grief when the snowy-haired explorer once again stood before her, his face lined with suffering. He was restored to royal favor and provided with ships to sail forth on his fourth and last voyage. But his hardships and perils had told upon him, and he was not really fit to undertake the long voyage to the Indies. However, he arrived safely off the coast of Honduras and searched for the straits, that he felt sure existed, but which were not to be found till some eighteen years later by Magellan. The natives brought him coconuts, which the Spaniards now tasted for the first time. They also brought merchandise from a far land denoting some high civilization. Columbus believed that he had reached the Golden East, when the gold had been obtained for Solomon's temple. Had Columbus only sailed west, he might have discovered Mexico, with all its wealth, and a succession of splendid discoveries, would have shed fresh glory on his declining age, instead of his sinking amidst gloom, neglect, and disappointment. At the Isthmus of Darien, Columbus gave up the search. He was weary of the bad weather, incessant downpours of rain, storms of thunder and lightning with terrific seas. These discouraged him. Disaster followed disaster. The food was nearly finished. The biscuit was so full of maggots, that the people could only eat it in the dark, when they were not visible. Columbus himself seemed to be at the point of death. Never, he wrote, was the sea seen so high, so terrific, so covered with foam. The waters from heaven never ceased. It was like a repetition of the deluge. He reached Spain in 1504, to be carried ashore on a litter, and to learn that the Queen of Spain was dead. He was friendless, penniless, and sick unto death. After twenty years of toil and peril, he says pitifully, I do not own a roof in Spain. Bedridden and alone, cast off, put by, scouted by count and king, the first discoverer starves. And so the brilliant navigator Christopher Columbus passed away, all unconscious of the great new world he had reached. Four centuries have passed away, but when shall the world forget the glory and the depth, indomitable soul, immortal Genoese? Not while the shrewd salt gale winds amid shroud and sail, about the rhythmic droll and thunder of the seas. It has been well said, injustice was not buried with Columbus, and soon after his death an attempt was made, and made successfully, to name the new world after another a Florentine pilot, Amerigo Vespucci. It was but natural that when the first discoveries by Columbus of land to westward had been made known, that others should follow in the track of the great navigator. Among these was a handsome young Spaniard, one Hoyeda, who had accompanied Columbus on his second voyage. Soon after he fitted out an expedition, 1499, reaching the mainland of the yet unknown continent near the Trinidad of Columbus. With him was Americo Vespucci. Here they found a native village with houses, built of tree trunks and connected by bridges. It was so like a bit of old Venice, that the explorers named it Little Venice, or Venezuela, which name it bears today. Nothing was publicly known of this voyage till a year after the death of Columbus, when men had coasted farther to the south of Venezuela, and discovered that this land was neither Asia nor Africa, that it was not the land of Marco Polo, but a new continent indeed. It is proper to call it a new world, says Amerigo Vespucci. Men of old said over and over again that there was no land south of the equator. But this last voyage of mine has proved them wrong, since in southern regions I have found a country more sickly inhabited by people and animals than our Europe or Asia or Africa. These words, among others, and an account of his voyages published in Paris, 1507, created a deep impression. A letter from Columbus announcing his discoveries had been published in 1498. 
but he said nothing, because he knew nothing of a new world. Men therefore said that Amerigo Vespucci had discovered a new continent, wherefore the new continent ought to be called America, from its discoverer Amerigo, a man of rare ability, inasmuch as Europe and Asia derived their names from women. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of a Book of Discovery。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter twenty four. Vasco da Gama reaches India. Thus the name of America was gradually adopted for the new world though the honor and glory of its first discovery must always belong to Christopher Columbus. But while all this wonderful development westwards was thrilling the minds of men, other great discoveries were being made to the east, whither the eyes of the Portuguese were still straining. Portugal had lost Columbus, she could lay no claim to the shores of America discovered by Spaniards, but the sea road to India by the east was yet to be found by one of her explorers, Vasco da Gama. His achievement stands out brilliantly at this time, for within a few years of the discovery of the new world, he had been able to tell the world that India and the East could be reached by the Cape of Good Hope. The dream of Prince Henry the Navigator was fulfilled. How Vasco da Gama was chosen for the great command has been graphically described by a Portuguese historian, whose words are received with caution by modern authorities. The king of Portugal, Don Manuel, having set his kingdom in order, being inspired by the Lord, took the resolution to inform himself about the affairs of India. He knew that the province of India was very far away, inhabited by dark people, who had great riches and merchandise, and there was much risk in crossing the wide seas and land to reach it. But he felt it a sacred duty to try and reach it. He ordered ships to be built according to a design of Bartolomeu Diaz, the hero of the Cape. Low amidships, with high castles towering fore and aft, they rode the water like ducks. The ships ready, the king prayed the Lord to show him the man whom it would please him to send upon this voyage. Days passed. One day the king was sitting in his hall with his officers, when he raised his eyes and saw a gentleman of his household crossing the hall. It suddenly occurred to the king that this was the man for his command, and calling Vasco da Gama, he offered him the command at once. He was courageous, resolute, and firm of purpose. On his knees he accepted the great honor. A silken banner blazing with the cross of the Order of Christ was bestowed upon him. He chose the St. Gabriel for his flagship, appointed his brother to the St. Raphael, and prepared for his departure. Books and charts were supplied, Ptolemy's geography was on board, as well as the book of Marco Polo. All being ready, Vasco da Gama and his captains spent the night in the little chapel by the sea at Belem, built for the manners of Henry the Navigator. Next morning, it was July, they walked in solemn procession to the shore, lighted candles in their hands, priests chanting a solemn litany as they walked. The beach was crowded with people, under blazing summer sun, they kneeled once more before taking leave of the weeping multitudes. Listen to the Portuguese poet, Camoens, who makes Vasco da Gama the hero of his Luisad. The neighboring mountains murmured back the sound, as if to pity mood for human woe, and counted as the grains of golden sand, the tears of thousands fell on Belem's strand. So the Portuguese embarked, weighed anchor, and unfurled the sails that bore the red cross of the Order of Christ. The four little ships started on what was to be the longest and most momentous voyage on record, while crowds stood on the shore, straining their eyes till the fleet, under full sail, vanished from their sight. After passing Cape Verde, in order to escape the currents of the Gulf of Guinea, Vasco da Gama steered southwest into an unknown part of the South Atlantic. He did not know that at one time he was within six hundred miles of the coast of South America. Day after day, 
week after week, passed in dreary monotony as they sailed the wide ocean that surrounds St. Helena, a lonely dreary waste of seas and boundless sky. Everything ends at last, and having spent ninety-six days out of sight of land, and sailed some four thousand five hundred miles, they drifted on to the southwest coast of Africa. It was a record voyage, for even Columbus had only been two thousand six hundred miles without seeing land. November found them in a broad bay, and, says the old log of the voyage, we named it St. Helena, which name it still retains. After a skirmish with some tawny-colored Hottentots, the explorers sailed on, putting their trust in the Lord to double the cape. But the sea was all broken with storm, high rolled the waves, and so short were the days the darkness prevailed. The crews grew sick and with fear and hardship, and all clamored to put back to Portugal. With angry words Vasco da Gama bade them be silent, though he well saw how much reason they had at every moment to despair of their lives. The ships were now letting in much water, and cold rain soaked them all to the skin. All cried out to God for mercy upon their souls, for now they no longer took heed of their lives. At last the storm ceased, the seas grew calm, and they knew that, without seeing it, they had doubled the dreaded cape, on which great joy fell upon them, and they gave great praise to the Lord. But their troubles were not yet over. The sea was still very rough, for the winter of that country was setting in, and even the pilot suggested turning back to take refuge for a time. When Vasco da Gama heard of turning backward, he cried that they should not speak such words, because as he was going out of the bar of Lisbon, he had promised God, in his heart, not to turn back a single span's breadth of the way, and he would throw into the sea whosoever spoke such things. None could withstand such an iron will, and they struggled on to Mossel Bay, already discovered by Diaz. Here they landed, and bought a fat ox for three bracelets. This ox we dined off on Sunday, we found him very fat and his meat nearly as toothsome as the beef of Portugal. A pleasant meal, indeed, after three months of salted food. Here, too, they found penguins as large as ducks, which had no feathers on their wings and which bray like asses. But there was no time to linger here. They sailed onwards till they had passed and left behind the last pillar erected by deers, near the mouth of the great fish river. All was new now. No European had sailed these seas, no European had passed this part of the African coast. On Christmas Day they found land to which, in commemoration of Christ's nativity, they gave the name of Natal. Passing Delagoa Bay and Sofala without sighting them, Vasco da Gama at last reached the mouth of a broad river, now known as Quilimane River, but called by the weary mariners the River of Mercy or Good Tokens. Here they spent a month cleaning and repairing, and here for the first time in the history of discovery the fell disease of scurvy broke out. The hands and feet of the men swelled, their gums grew over their teeth, which fell out so that they could not eat. This proved to be one of the surges of early navigation, the result of too much salted food on the high seas, and no cure was found till the days of Captain Cook. Arrived at Mozambique, a low-lying coral island, they found no less than four ocean-going ships belonging to Arab traders, laden with gold, silver, cloves, pepper, ginger, rubies, and pearls from the east. There were rumors, too, of a land belonging to Prester John, where precious stones and spices were so plentiful that they could be collected in baskets. His land could only be reached by camels. This information rendered us so happy that we cried with joy and prayed God to grant us health, that we might behold what we so desired, relates the faithful journal. But difficulties and delays prevented their reaching the ever-mythical land of Prester John. Their next landing place was Mombasa. Here they were nearly killed by some treacherous Mohammedans, who hated these dogs of Christians, as they called them. And the Portuguese were glad to sail on to Melindi, where the tall, whitewashed houses, standing round the bay, with their cocoa palms, maize fields, and hop gardens, 
reminded them of one of their own cities on the Tagus. Here all was friendly. The king of Melindi sent three sheep and three leave for the strangers to enter the port. Vasco in return sent the king a casco, two strings of coral, three washhand basins, a hat and some bells. Whereupon the king, splendidly dressed in a damask robe with green satin and an embroidered turban, allowed himself to be rowed out to the flagship. He was protected from the sun by a crimson satin umbrella. Nine days were pleasantly passed in the port of Melindi, and then, with a Christian pilot provided by the king, the most thrilling part of the voyage began, with a start across the Arabian Gulf to the west coast of India. For twenty-three days the ship sailed to the northeast, with no land visible. Suddenly the dim outline of land was sighted, and the whole crew rushed on deck to catch the first glimpse of the unknown coast of India. They had just discerned the outline of lofty mountains, when a thunderstorm burst over the land, and a downpour of heavy rain blotted out the view. At last, on 21st May, nearly eleven months after the start from Portugal, the little Portuguese ships anchored off Calicut. "'What has brought you thither?' cried the natives, probably surprised at their foreign dress. And what seek ye so far from home? We are in search of Christians and spice, was the ready answer. A lucky venture, plenty of emeralds. You owe great thanks to God for having brought you to a country holding such riches, was the Mohammedan answer. The city of Calicut runs the diary, is inhabited by Christians. They are of a tawny complexion, some of them have big birds and long hair, whilst others clip their hair short as a sign that they are Christians. They also wear moustache. Within the town, merchants lived in wooden houses, thatched with palm leaves. It must have been a quaint sight to see Vasco da Gama, accompanied by thirteen of his portuguese, waving the flag of their country, carried shoulder-high through the densely crowded streets of Calicut, on his way to the chief temple, and on to the palace of the king. Roofs and windows were thronged with eager spectators, anxious to see these Europeans from so far a country. Many a scuffle took place outside the palace gates. Knives were brandished, and men were injured before the successful explorer reached the king of Calicut. The royal audience took place just before sunset on 28th of May, 1498. The king lay on a couch covered with green velvet under a gilt canopy, while Vasco da Gama related an account of Portugal and his king, the lord of many countries, and the possessor of great wealth, exceeding that of any king of these parts, adding that for sixty years the Portuguese had been trying to find the sea route to India. The king gave leave for the foreigners to barter their goods, but the Indians scoffed at their offer of hats, scarlet hoods, coral, sugar, and oil. That which I ask of you is gold, silver, corals, and scarlet clothes, said the king, for my country is rich in cinnamon, cloves, ginger, pepper, and precious stones. Bosco da Gama left India with a scant supply of Christians and spices, but with his great news he now hurried back to Portugal. What if he had lost his brother Paul and over one hundred of his men after his two years' absence, he had discovered the ocean route to India, a discovery more far-reaching than he had any idea of at this time. And the king, relates the old historian, overjoyed at his coming, sent a nobleman and several gentlemen to bring him to court, where, being arrived through crowds of spectators, he was received with extraordinary honor. From this glorious prize of service, the privilege of being called Don was annexed to his family. To his arms was added part of the king's. He had a pension of three thousand ducats yearly, and he was afterwards presented to greater honors for his services in the Indies, where he will soon appear again. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 25 Discovery of the Spice Islands It was but natural that the Portuguese, flushed with victory, should at once dispatch another expedition to India. Was there some vexation in the heart of the Admiral of India when the command of the new fleet was given to Pedro Cabral? History is silent. Anyhow, in the march of 1500 we find this gentleman of great merit starting off with thirteen powerfully armed ships and some fifteen hundred men, among them the veteran explorer Bartholomew Diaz, a party of eight Franciscan friars to convert the Mohammedans, eight chaplains, skilled gunners, and merchants to buy and sell in the king's name at Calicut. The king himself accompanied Gabral to the waterside. He had already adopted the magnificent title, King, by the grace of God, of Portugal and of the Algarvies, both on this side the sea and beyond it in Africa, Lord of Guinea and of the conquest, navigation and commerce of Ethiopia, Arabia, Persia and India. Then Cabral, flying a banner with the royal arms of Portugal, started on a voyage which was to secure for Portugal an empire destined to be richer and greater than all her dominions in Asia. Sailing far to the west, he fell in with the South American continent, and was carried to a new land. The men went on shore and brought word that it was a fruitful country, full of trees and well inhabited. The people were swarthy and used bows and arrows. That night a storm arose, and they ran along the coast to seek a port. Here mass was said, and parrots exchanged for paper and clothes. Then Cabral erected a cross, which was still shown when Lindley visited Brazil, three hundred years later, and named the country the Land of the Holy Cross. This name was, however, discarded later, when the newfound land was identified with Brazil, already sighted by Pinzon in one of the ships of Christopher Columbus. Meanwhile, unconscious of the importance of this discovery, Cabral sailed on towards the Cape of Good Hope. There, in no time to tell of the great comet that appeared, heralding a terrific storm that suddenly burst upon the little fleet. In the darkness and tempest four ships went down with all hands, amongst them old Bartholomew Diaz, the discoverer of the Cape of Good Hope, who thus perished in the waters he had been the first to navigate. September found Cabral at last an anchor off Calicut. He found the king yet more resplendent than Vasco da Gama the year before. The old historians revel in their descriptions of him. On his head was a cap of cloth of gold. At his ears hung jewels, composed of diamonds, sapphires, and pearls, two of which were larger than walnuts. His arms, from the elbow to the wrist, and from the knees downwards, were loaded with bracelets, set with infinite precious stones of great value. His fingers and toes were covered with rings. In that, on his great toe, was a large ruby of a surprising lustre. Among the rest there was a diamond bigger than a large bean. But all this was nothing, in comparison to the richness of his girdle, made with precious stones set in gold, which cast a lustre that dazzled everybody's eyes. He allowed Cabral to establish a depot at Calicut for European goods, so a house was selected by the waterside, and a flag bearing the arms of Portugal erected on the top. For a time all went well, but the Mohammedans proved to be a difficult customers, and disputes soon arose. A riot took place. The infuriated native traders stormed the depot and killed the Portuguese within. Cabral in revenge bombarded the city, and, leaving the wooden houses in flames, he sailed away to Cochin and Cananor, on the coast of Malabar. Soon after this he returned home, with only six out of the thirteen ships, and from this time he disappears from the pages of history. Just before his return, the king of Portugal, thinking trade was well established between India and his own country, dispatched a valiant gentleman in command of four ships to carry merchandise to the newly discovered country. But his voyage and adventures are only important inasmuch as he discovered the island of Ascension, when outward bound on the island of St. Helena on the way home. So favorable was the account of this island, that all Portugal admirals were ordered for the future to touch there for refreshments. 
The news of Cabral's adventures at Calicut inspired a yet larger expedition to the east, and Vasco da Gama, now admiral of the eastern seas, was given command of some fifteen ships, which sailed from the Tagus in February 1502. The expedition, though avowedly Christian, was characterized by injustice and cruelty. Near the coast of Malabar the Portuguese fleet met with a large ship, full of Mohammedan pilgrims from Mecca. The wealth on board was known to be enormous, and Don Vasco commanded the owners to yield up their riches to the king of Portugal. This they somewhat naturally refused to do, whereupon the Portuguese fired, standing calmly to watch the blazing ships with their human freight of men, women, and children. True, one historian declares that all the children were removed to the Portuguese ship to be converted into good little Catholics. Another is more nearly concerned with the money. We took a Mecca ship on board of which were three hundred and eighty men, and many women and children, and we took from it fully twelve thousand ducats, with goods worth at least another ten thousand. And we burned the ship and all the people on board with gunpowder on the first day of October. Their instructions to banish every Mohammedan in Calicut was faithfully obeyed. Don Vasco seized and hanged a number of helpless merchants, quietly trading in the harbor. Cutting off their heads, hands, and feet, he had them flung into a boat, which was allowed to drift ashore, with the cruel suggestion that the severed limbs would make an Indian curry. Once more Calicut was bombarded, and Don Vasco sailed on to other ports on the Malabar coast, where he loaded his ships with spices taken from poor folk who dared not refuse. He then sailed home again, reaching Portugal safe and sound, Deo gratias, but leaving behind him hatred and terror, and a very quaint idea of these Christians, who felt it their duty to exterminate all followers of Mohammed. Conquest usually succeeds discovery, and the Portuguese, having discovered the entire coast of West, South, and a good deal of East Africa, and Western coast of India, now proceeded to conquer it for their own. It was a far cry from Portugal to India in these days, and the isolated depots on the coast of Malabar were obviously in danger, when the foreign ships laden with spoil left their shores. True, Vasco da Gama had left six little ships, this time under Sodrez, to cruise about the Indian seas, but Sodrez wanted treasure, so he cruised northwards and found the southern coast of Arabia, as well as the island of Socotra. He had been warned of the tempestuous seas that raged about these parts at certain seasons. But heeding not the warning, he perished with all his knowledge and treasure. Expedition after expedition now left Portugal for the east coast of Africa and India. There were the two cousins, Albuquerque, who built a strong fort of wood and mud at Cochin, leaving a garrison of one hundred and fifty trained soldiers under the command of one Pacheco, who saved the fort and kept things going under great difficulties. On the return of Albuquerque, the hero of Cochin, the king decided to appoint a viceroy of India. He would fain have appointed Tristan da Cunha, the discoverer of the island that still bears his name, but he was suddenly struck with blindness, and in his stead Don Francisco Almeida, a nobleman of courage and experience, sailed off with the title of viceroy. Not only was he to conquer, but to command, not only to sustain the sea power of Portugal, but to form a government. There is a story told of the ignorance of the men sent to man the ships under Almeida. So raw were they that they hardly knew their right hand from their left, still less the difference between starboard and larboard, till their captain hit on the happy notion of tying a bundle of garlic over one side of the ship, and a handful of onions over the other. So the pilot gave orders to the helmsman thus, Onion your helm, or garlic your helm. On the way out, Almeida built a strong fortress near Zanzibar, organized a regular Portuguese Indian pilot service, and established his seat of government at Cochin. Then he sent his son, a daring youth of eighteen, to bombard the city of Quilon, whose people were constantly intriguing against the Portuguese. Having carried out his orders, young Lorenzo ordered to explore the Maldive Islands, 
was driven by a storm to an island opposite Cape Comorin, called Ceylon, and separated from thence by a narrow sea, where he was warmly received by the native king, whose dress sparkled with diamonds. Lorenzo erected here a marble pillar, with the arms of Portugal carved thereon, and took possession of the island. He also sent back to Portugal the first elephant ever seen thither. Ceylon was now the farthest point which flew the flag of Portugal toward the east. Doubtless young Lorenzo would have carried it farther, but he was killed at the early age of twenty-one, his legs being shattered by a cannonball during a sea-fight. He sat by the mainmast and continued to direct the fighting, till a second shot ended his short but brilliant career. The viceroy, whose whole being was centered in his devotion to his only son, received the tidings with outward stoicism. Regrets, he merely remarked, regrets are for women. Nevertheless, he revenged the death of his son by winning a victory over the opposing fleet and bidding his captains rejoice over the good vengeance our Lord has been pleased of his mercy to grant us. But the days of Almeida were numbered. He had subdued the Indian coast, he had extended Portuguese possessions in various directions. His term of office was over, and he was succeeded by the famous Albuquerque, who had already distinguished himself in the service of Portugal by his efforts to obtain Ormus for the Portuguese. Now, viceroy of India, he found full scope for his boundless energy and vast ambition. He first attacked Calicut and reduced it to ashes. Then he turned his attention to Goa, which he conquered, and which became the commercial capital of the Portuguese in India for the next hundred years. Not only this, but it was soon the wealthiest city on the face of the earth and the seat of the government. Albuquerque's next exploit was yet more brilliant and yet more important. In 1509, he had sent a Portuguese explorer, Sequira, with a small squadron to make discoveries in the east. He was to cross the Bay of Bengal, and explore the coast of Malacca. Sequira reached the coast, and found it a center for trade from east and west, most rich and populous. But he had reason to suspect the demonstrations of friendship by the king of these parts, and refused to attend a festival prepared in his honor. This was fortunate, for some of his companions who landed for trade were killed. He sailed about the island of Sumatra, the first land in which we know of man's flesh being eaten by certain people in the mountains who gild their teeth. In their opinion, the flesh of the blacks is sweeter than that of whites. Many were the strange tales, brought back to Cochin by Sakira from the new lands, rivers of oil, hens with flesh as black as ink, people with tails like sheep. Anyhow, Albuquerque resolved that Malacca should belong to the Portuguese, and with nineteen ships and fourteen hundred fighting men, he arrived off the coast of Sumatra, spreading terror and dismay among the multitudes that covered the shore. The work of destruction was short, though the king of Pahan and king Mahomet came out in person on huge elephants to help in the defense of their city. At last every inhabitant of the city was driven out or slain, and the Portuguese plundered the city to their heart's content. The old historian waxes eloquent on the wealth of the city, and the laden ships started back, leaving a fort and a church under the care of Portuguese conquerors. The amount of booty mattered little, as a violent storm of the coast of Sumatra disposed of several ships and a good deal of treasure. The fall of Malacca was one of vast importance to the Portuguese. Was it not the key to the eastern gate of the Indian Ocean? the gate through which the whole commerce of the Spice Islands, the Philippines, Japan, and Far Cathay, passed on its road to the Mediterranean? Was it not one of the largest trade markets in Asia, where rode the strange ships of many a distant shore? The fame of Albuquerque spread through the eastern world, but he was not content with Malacca. The Spice Islands lay beyond, the Spice Islands, with all their clubs and nutmegs and their countless riches, must yet be won for Portugal. Up to this year, 1511, they had not been reached by the Portuguese. But now, Francisco Serrano was sent off from Malacca to explore farther. 
skirting the north of Java, he found island after island, rich in cloves and nutmeg. So struck was he with his new discoveries that he wrote to his friend Magellan, I have discovered yet another new world, larger and richer than that found by Vasco da Gama. It's curious to remember how vastly important was this little group of islands, now part of the Malay archipelago and belonging to the Dutch, to the explorers of the 16th century. Strange tales as usual reached Portugal about these newly found lands. Here lived men with spores on their ankles like cocks, hogs with horns, hens that laid their eggs nine feet underground, rivers with living fish, yet so hot that they took the skin of any man that bathed in their waters. Poisonous crabs, oysters with shells so large that they served as fonts for baptizing children. Truly these mysterious spice islands held more attractions for the Portuguese explorers than did the new world of Columbus and Vespucci. Their possession meant riches and wealth, and this was not the end. Was there not land beyond? Indeed, before the Spice Islands were conquered by Portugal, trade had already been opened up with China, and, before the century was half over, three Portuguese seamen had visited Japan. End of chapter 25、Chapter、26 Of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A book of discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 26. Balboa sees the Pacific Ocean. It is said that Ferdinand Magellan, the hero of all geographical discovery, With his circumnavigation of the whole round world, had cruised about the Spice Islands, but what he really knew of them from personal experience no one knows. He had served under Almeida and with Albuquerque had helped in the conquest of Malacca. After seven years of a vivid life of adventure by sea and land, a life of siege and shipwreck, of war and wandering, inaction became impossible. He busied himself with charts and the art of navigation. He dreamed of reaching the Spice Islands by sailing west, and after a time he laid his schemes before the King of Portugal. Whether he was laughed at as a dreamer or as fool, we know not. His plans were received with cold refusal. History repeats itself. Like Christopher Columbus twenty years before, Magellan now said goodbye to Portugal and made his way to Spain. Since the first discovery of the New World by Spain, that country had been busy sending out explorer after explorer to discover and annex new portions of America. Bold navigators, Pinzon, Mendoza, Bastidas, Juan de la Cosa, and Soles, these and others had almost completed the discovery of the East Coast, indeed. Soles might have been the first to see the great Pacific Ocean, had he not been killed and eaten at the mouth of River La Plata. This great discovery was left to Vasco Nunez de Balboa, who first saw beyond the strange new world from the peak of Darien. Now his discovery threw a lurid light on to the limitation of land that made up the new country and illuminated the scheme of Magellan. Balboa was a gentleman of good family, great parts, liberal education, of a fine person, and in the flower of his age. He had emigrated to the new Spanish colony of Haiti, where he had got into debt. No debtor was allowed to leave the island, but Balboa, the gentleman of good family, yearned for further exploration. He yearned beyond the skyline, where the strange roads go down. And one day the yearning grew so great that he concealed himself in a bread cask on board a ship, leaving the shores of Haiti. For some days he remained hidden. When the ship was well out to sea, he made his appearance. Angry indeed was the captain, so angry that he threatened to land the stowaway on a desert island. He was, however, touched by the entreaties of the crew, and Balboa was allowed to sail on in the ship. It was a fortunate decision, for when, soon after, the ship ran heavily upon a rock, 
It was the Spanish stowaway Balboa who saved the party from destruction. He led the shipwrecked crew to a river of which he knew, named Darien by the Indians. He did not know that they stood on the narrow neck of land, the Isthmus of Panama, which connects North and South America. The account of the Spanish intrusion is typical. After having performed their devotions, the Spaniards fell resolutely on the Indians, whom they soon routed, and then went to the town, which they found full of provisions to their wish. Next day they marched up the country, among the neighboring mountains, where they found houses replenished with a great deal of cotton, both spun and unspun, plates of gold in all to the value of ten thousand pieces of fine gold. A trade in gold was set up by Balboa, who became a governor of the new colony formed by the Spaniards. But the greed of these foreigners quite disgusts the native princes of these parts. What is this, Christians? Is it for such a little thing that you quarrel? If you have such a love of gold, I will show you a country where you may fulfill your desires. You will have to fight your way with great kings, whose country is distant from our country six suns. So saying, he pointed away to the south, where he said lay a great sea. Balboa resolved to find this great sea. It might be the ocean sought by Columbus in vain, beyond which was the land of great riches, where people drank out of golden cups. So he collected some two hundred men, and started forth on an expedition, full of doubt and danger. He had to lead his troops, worn with fatigue and disease, through deep marshes rendered impassable with heavy rains, or mountains covered with trackless forest, and through defiles from which the Indians showered down poisoned arrows. At last, led by native guides, Balboa and his men struggled up the side of a high mountain. When near the top he bade his men stop. He alone must be the first to see the great sight that no European had yet beheld. With transports of delight he gained the top, and, silent upon a peak in Darien, he looked down on the boundless ocean, bathed in tropical sunshine. Falling on his knees, he thanked God for his discovery of the southern sea. Then he called up his men, You see here, gentlemen and children mine, the end of our labors. The notes of the Te Deum then rang out on the still summer air, and having made a cross of stones, the little party hurried to the shore. Finding two canoes, they sprang in, crying aloud joyously that they were the first Europeans to sail on the new sea, whilst Balboa himself plunged in, sword in hand, and claimed possession of the southern ocean for the king of Spain. The natives told him that the land of the south was without end, and that it was possessed by powerful nations who had abundance of gold. And Balboa thought this referred to the Indies, knowing nothing as yet of the riches of Peru. It is melancholy to learn that the man who made this really great discovery was publicly hanged four years later in Darien. But his news had reached Magellan. There was then a great southern ocean beyond the new world. He was more certain now than ever that by this sea he could reach the Spice Islands. Moreover, he persuaded the young king of Spain that his country had a right to these valuable islands, and promised that he would conduct a fleet round the south of the great new continent, westward to these islands. His proposal was accepted by Charles V, and the useful Spanish monarch provided Spanish ships for the great enterprise. The voyage was not popular, the pay was low, the way unknown, and in the streets of Seville the public crier called for volunteers. Hence it was a motley crew of some two hundred and eighty men, composed of Spaniards, Portuguese, Genoese, French, Germans, Greeks, Malays, and one Englishman only. There were five ships. They are very old and patched, says a letter addressed to the King of Portugal, and I would be sorry to sail even for the canneries in them, for their ribs are soft as butter. Magellan hoisted his flag on board the Trinidad, of one hundred and ten tons burden. The largest ship, St. Antonio, was captained by a Spaniard, Cartagena, the Conception, ninety tons, 
by Gaspar Quesada, the Victoria, of eighty-five tons, who alone bore home the news of the circumnavigation of the world, was at first commanded by the traitor Mendoza, and the little Santiago, seventy-five tons, under the brother of Magellan's old friend Serrano. What if the commander himself left a young wife, and a son of six months old? The fever of discovery was upon him, and flying the Spanish flag for the first time in his life, Magellan, on board the Trinidad, led his little fleet away from the shores of Spain. He never saw wife or child again. Before three years had passed, all three were dead. Carrying a torch or faggot of burning wood on the poop, so that the ships should never lose sight of it, the Trinidad sailed onwards. Follow the flagship and ask no questions. Such were his instructions to his not too loyal captains. End of chapter 26「Chapter twenty seven of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter twenty seven. Magellan Sails Round the World. They had left Seville on twenty September, fifteen nineteen. A week later, they were at the Canaries, then passed Cape Verde, and land faded from their sight as they made for the southwest. For some time they had a good run in fine weather. Then the upper air burst into life, and the months of heavy gales followed. The Italian count, who accompanied the fleet, writes long accounts of the sufferings of the crew during these terrific Atlantic storms. During these storms, he says, the body of St. Anselm appeared to us several times. One night, that it was very dark on account of the bad weather, the saint appeared in the form of a fire, lighted at the summit of the mainmast, and remained there near two hours and a half, which comforted us greatly, for we were in tears only expecting the hour of perishing, and, when that holy light was going away from us, it gave out so great a brilliancy in the eyes of each, that we were like people blinded, and calling out for mercy. For without any doubt nobody hoped to escape from that storm. Two months of incessant rain and diminished rations added to their miseries. The spirit of mutiny now began to show itself. Already the Spanish captains had murmured against the Portuguese commander. Be they false men or true, I will fear them not, I will do my appointed work said the commander firmly. It was not till November that they made the coast of Brazil in South America, already sighted by Cabral and explored by Pinzon. But the disloyal captains were not satisfied, and one day the captain of the St. Antonio boarded the flagship and openly insulted Magellan. He must have been a little astonished when the Portuguese commander seized him by the collar, exclaiming, "'You are my prisoner!' giving him into custody and appointing another in his place. Food was now procurable, and a quantity of sweet pineapples must have had a soothing effect on the discontented crews. The natives traded on easy terms. For a knife, they produced four or five fowls. For a comb, fish for ten men. For a little bell, a basket full of sweet potatoes. A long draught had preceded Magellan's visit to these parts, but rain now began with the advent of the strangers, and the natives made sure that they had brought it with them. Such an impression once made, there was little difficulty in converting them to the Christian faith. The natives joined in prayer with the Spaniards, remaining on their knees, with their hands joined in great reverence, so that it was a pleasure to see them, writes one of the party. The day after Christmas again found them, sailing south by the coast, and early in the new year they anchored at the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, where Solis had lost his life at the hands of the cannibals some five years before. He had succeeded Vespucci in the service of Spain, and was exploring the coast, when a body of Indians, with a terrible cry and most horrible aspect, suddenly rushed out upon them, 
killed, roasted, and devoured them. Through February and March, Magellan led his ships along the shores of bleak Patagonia, seeking for an outlet for the Spice Islands. Winter was coming on, and no straits had yet been found. Storm after storm now burst over the little ships, often accompanied by thunder and lightning. Poops and forecastles were carried away, and all expected destruction, when the holy body of St. Anselm appeared, and immediately the storm ceased. It was quite impossible to proceed further to the unknown south, so, finding a safe and roomy harbour, Magellan decided to winter there. Port St. Julian he named it, and he knew full well that they must remain there for some four or five months. He put the crew on diminished rations for fear the food should run short before they achieved their goal. This was the last straw. Mutiny had long been smoldering. The hardships of the voyage, the terrific Atlantic storms, the prospect of a long Antarctic winter of inaction on that wild Patagonian coast, these alone caused officers and men to grumble, and to demand an immediate return to Spain. But the stout heart of Magellan was undaunted. On Easter day the mutiny began. Two of the Spanish captains boarded the St. Antonio, seized the Portuguese captain thereof, and put him in chains. Then stores were broken open, bread and wine generously handed round, and the plot hatched to capture the flagship, kill Magellan, seize his faithful Serrano, and sail home to Spain. The news reached Magellan's ears. He at once sent a messenger with five men, bearing hidden arms, to summon the traitor captain on board the flagship. Of course, he stoutly refused. As he did so, the messenger sprang upon him and stabbed him dead. As the rebellious captain fell dead on the deck of his ship, the dazed crew at once surrendered. Thus Magellan, by his prompt measures, quelled a mutiny that might have lost him the whole expedition. No man ever tried to mutiny again while he lived and commanded. The fleet had been two whole months in the port St. Julian, without seeing a single native. However, one day, without anyone expecting it, we saw a giant, who was on the shore of the sea, dancing and leaping and singing. He was so tall that the tallest of us only came up to his waist. He was well built, he had a large face, painted red all round, and his eyes were also painted yellow around them and he had two hearts painted on his cheeks. He had but little hair on his head, and it was painted white. The great Patagonian giant pointed to the sky to know whether these Spaniards had descended from above. He was soon joined by others, evidently greatly surprised, to see such large ships and such little men. Indeed, the heads of the Spaniards hardly reached the giant's waist, and they must have been greatly astonished when two of them ate a large basketful of biscuits and rats, without skinning them, and drank half a bucket of water at each sitting. With the return of spring weather, in October 1520, Magellan led the little fleet upon its way. He was rewarded a few days later, by finding the straits, for which he and others had been so long searching. It was the strait, says the historian simply, now called the Strait of Magellan's. A struggle was before them. For more than five weeks, the Spanish mariners fought their way through the winding channels of the unknown straits. On one side rose high mountains, covered with snow. The weather was bad, the way unknown. Do we wonder to read that one of the ships stole away privately and returned into Spain, and the remaining men begged piteously to be taken home? Magellan spoke in measured and quiet tones. If I have to eat the leather of the ship's yards, yet will I go on and do my work. His words came truer than he knew. On the southern side of the strait, constant fires were seen, which led Magellan to give the land the name it bears today, Tierra del Fuego. It was not visited again for a hundred years. At last the ships fought their way to the open sea. Balboa's Southern Ocean, and when the Captain Magellan was past the strait, and saw the way open to the other main sea, 
he was so glad thereof, that for joy the tears fell from his eyes. The expanse of calm waters seemed so pleasant after the heavy, tiring storms that he called the still waters before him, the Pacific Ocean. Before following him across the unknown waters, let us recall the quaint lines of Camoens. Along these regions, from the burning zone, to deepest south, he dares the course unknown. A land of giants shall his eyes behold, of Camel's strength surpassing human mould. And, onward still, thy fame his proud heart's guide, Beneath the southern stars called gleam he braves, And stems the whirls of land-surrounded waves, Forever sacred to the hero's fame. These foaming straits shall bear his deathless name. Through these dread jaws of rock he presses on, Another ocean's breast immense and known. Beneath the south, cold wings, unmeasured wide, Received his vessels through the dreary tide, in darkling shades where never man before heard the waves whole he dares the nameless shore. Three little ships had now emerged, battered and worn, manned by crews gaunt and thin and shivering. Magellan took a northerly course to avoid the intense cold before turning to cross the strange obscure ocean, which no European had yet realized. Just before Christmas the course was altered, and the ships were turned to the northwest, in which direction they expected soon to find the Spice Islands. No one had any idea of the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. Well was it named the Pacific, remarks the historian, for during three months and twenty days we met with no storm. Two months passed away, and still they sailed peacefully on, day after day, week after week, across a vast of desolate waters. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. At last, one January day, they sighted a small wooden island, but it was uninhabited. They named it St. Paul's Island, and passed on their way. They had expected to find the shores of Asia close by those of America. The size of the world was astounding. Another island was passed. Again no people, no consolation, only many sharks. There was bitter disappointment on board. They had little food left. We ate biscuit, but in truth it was biscuit no longer, but a powder full of worms. So great was the want of food that we were forced to eat the hides with which the main yard was covered to prevent the chafing against the rigging. These hides we exposed to the sun, first to soften them by putting them overboard for four or five days, after which we put them on the embers and ate them thus. We had also to make use of sawdust for food, and rats became a great delicacy. No wonder scurvy broke out in its worst form. Nineteen died, and thirteen lay too ill to work. For ninety-eight days they sailed across the unknown sea, a sea so vast that the human mind can scarcely grasp it, till at last they came on a little group of islands, peopled with savages of the lowest type, such expert thieves that Magellan called the new islands the Ladrones, or Isle of Robbers. Still, there was fresh food here, and the crews were greatly refreshed before they sailed away. The food came just too late to save the one Englishman of the party, Master Andrew of Bristol. He died just as they moved away. Then they found the group afterwards known as the Philippines, after Philip II of Spain. Here were merchants from China, who assured Magellan that the famous Spice Islands were not far off. Now Magellan had practically accomplished that he set out to do but he was not destined to reap the fruits of his victory. With a good supply of fresh food, the sailors grew better, and Magellan preferred cruising about the islands, making friends of the natives and converting them to Christianity, to pushing on for the Spice Islands. Here was gold, too, and he busied himself making the native rulers pay tribute to Spain. Easter was drawing near, and the Easter services were performed on one of the islands. 
A cross and a crown of thorns was set upon the top of the highest mountain, that all might see it and worship. Thus April passed away, and Magellan was still busy with Christians and gold. But his enthusiasm carried him too far. A quarrel arose with one of the native kings. Magellan landed with armed men, only to be met by thousands of defiant natives. A desperate fight ensued. Again and again the explorer was wounded, till at last the Indians threw themselves upon him with iron-pointed bamboo spears, and every weapon they had, and ran him through, our mirror, our light, our comforter, our true guide, until they killed him. Such was the tragic fate of Ferdinand Magellan, the greatest of ancient and modern navigators. Tragic because, after dauntless resolution and unvaried courage, he died in a miserable skirmish, at the last on the very eve of victory. With grief and despair in their hearts, the remaining members of the crew, now only one hundred and fifteen, crowded on the Trinidad and Victoria for the homeward voyage. It was September 1522 when they reached the Spice Islands, the goal of all their hopes. Here they took on board some precious clothes and birds of paradise, spent some pleasant months, and, laden with spices, resumed their journey. But the Trinidad was too overladen, with clothes and too rotten, to undertake so long a voyage, till she had undergone the repair. So the little Victoria alone sailed for Spain, with sixty men aboard, to carry home their great and wonderful news. Who shall describe the terrors of that homeward voyage, the suffering, starvation, and misery of the weary crew? Man after man drooped and died, till by the time they reached the Cape Verde islands there were but eighteen left. When the welcome shores of Spain at length appeared, eighteen gaunt, famine-stricken survivors, with their captain, staggered ashore to tell their proud story of the first circumnavigation of the world by their lost commander, Ferdinand Magellan. We miss the triumphal return of the conqueror, the audience with the king of Spain, the heaped honors, the crowded streets, the titles and the riches. The proudest crest ever granted by a sovereign, the world with the words, Thou hast encompassed me, fell to the lot of Belcano, the captain who brought home the little Victoria. For Magellan's son was dead, and his wife Beatrix, grievously sorrowing, had passed away on hearing the news of her husband's tragic end. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of a Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 28 Cortes Explores and Conquers Mexico One would have thought that the revelation of this immense sheet of water on the far side of America would have drawn other explorers to follow, but news was slowly assimilated in those days, and it was not till fifty-three years later that the Pacific was crossed a second time by Sir Francis Drake. In the maps of the day, Newfoundland and Florida were both placed in Asia, while Mexico was identified with the Quincy of Marco Polo. For even while Magellan was fighting the gales of the Atlantic en route, for his long-thought strait, another strange and wonderful country was being unveiled, and its unsurpassed wealth laid at the feet of Spain. The starting place for further Spanish exploration had been, from the days of Columbus, the West Indies. From this center, the coast of Florida had been discovered in 1513. From here, the same year, Balboa had discovered the Pacific Ocean. From here, in 1517, a little fleet was fitted out under Francisco Hernando de Cordova, a man very prudent and courageous, and strongly disposed to kill and kidnap Indians. As pilot he had been with Columbus on his fourth voyage some fourteen years before. He suggested 
that his master had heard rumors of land to the west, and sure enough, after sailing past the peninsula of Yucatan, they found signs of the eastern civilization so long sought in vain. Strange-looking towers or pyramids, ascended by stone steps, greeted their eyes, and the people who came out in canoes to watch the ships were clad in kilted cotton doublets and wore cloaks and brilliant plumes. They had heard of the Spaniards. Indeed, only one hundred miles of sea divided Yucatan from Cuba, and they were anything but pleased to see these strangers off their coast. Coes Cotoje, come to my house, they cried, for which reason Cordova called the place Cape Catoje, as it is marked in our maps today. Along the coast sailed the Spaniards to a place called by the Indians Quimpeje, now known as Campeche Bay. They were astonished to find how civilized were these natives, and how unlike any others they had met in these parts. But the inhabitants resented the landing of Cordova and his men, and with arrows and stones and darts they killed or wounded a great number of Spaniards, including the commander himself, who sent an account of his voyage to the governor of Cuba, and died a few days later. His information was interesting and inspiring, and soon young Juan Grijalva was on his way to the same land, accompanied by two hundred and fifty stout soldiers and the old pilot, Alvarado, who had led both Columbus and Cordova. Grijalva explored for the first time the coast of this great new country. Mexico, Mexico, repeated the Indians, with whom they conversed. Gold, too, was produced, gold ornaments, gold workmanship, until the young and handsome Grijalva was fitted out completely with a complete suit of gold armor. He returned enthusiastic over the new land, where lived a powerful ruler over many cities. Surely this was none other than the great Khan of Marco Polo fame, with the riches and magnificence of an eastern potentate, a land worthy of further exploration. The conqueror of Mexico now comes upon the scene, young, bold, devout, unscrupulous, a respectable gentleman of good birth, Hernando Cortes. Great was the enthusiasm in Cuba to join the new expedition to the long-lost lands of the great Khan. Men sold their lands to buy horses and arms, pork was salted, armor was made, and at last Cortes, a plume of feathers and a gold medal in his cap, erected on board his ship a velvet flag with the royal arms embroidered in gold and the words, Brothers, follow the cross in faith, for under its guidance we shall conquer. His address to his men called forth their devotion. I hold out to you a glorious prize, but it is to be won by incessant toil. Great things are achieved only by great exertions, and glory was never the reward of sloth. If I have labored hard and staked my all on this undertaking, it is for the love of that renown, which is the noblest recompense of man. But if any among you covet riches more, be but true to me, as I will make you masters of such as our countrymen have never dreamed of. You are few in number, but strong in resolution. Doubt not but that the Almighty, who has never deserted the Spaniard in his contest with the infidel, will shield you, for your cause is a just cause, and you are to fight under the banner of the cross. In this spirit of enthusiasm, the fleet sailed for the shores of Cuba on 18th February 1519, and was soon on its way to the land of Mexico. The pilot Alvarado was with this expedition also. Rounding Cape Catoche and coasting along the southern shores of Campeche Bay, with a pleasant breeze blowing off the shore, Cortes landed with all his force, some five hundred soldiers, on the very spot where now stands the city of Veracruz. Little did the conqueror imagine that the desolate beach on which he first planted his foot was one day to be covered by a flourishing city, the great mart of European and Oriental trade, the commercial capital of New Spain. On a wide level plain Cortes encamped, 
his soldiers driving in stakes and covering them with boughs to protect themselves from the scorching rays of the fierce tropical sun. Natives came down to the shore, bringing their beautiful featherwork cloaks and golden ornaments. Cortes had brought presents for the great king, the Khan, as he thought, and these he sent with a message that he had come from the king of Spain and greatly desired an audience with the great Khan. The Indians were greatly surprised to hear that there was another king in the world as powerful as their Montezuma, who was more god than king, who ate from dishes of gold, on whose face none dared look, in whose presence none dared speak without leave. To impress the messengers of the king, Cortes ordered his soldiers to go through some of their military exercises on the wet sands. The bold and rapid movement of the troops, the glancing of the weapons, and the shrill cry of the trumpet filled the spectators with astonishment. But when they heard the thunder of the cannon, and witnessed the volumes of smoke and flame issuing from these terrible engines, the rushing of the balls as they hissed through the trees of the neighboring forest, shivering their branches, they were filled with consternation. To the intense surprise of the Spaniards, these messengers sketched the whole scene on canvas with their pencils, not forgetting the Spanish ships, or water-houses as they called them, with their dark hulls and snow-white sails, reflected in the water, as they swung lazily at anchor. Then they returned to the king, and related the strange doings of the white strangers, who had landed on their shores. They showed him their picture-writing, and Montezuma, king of the great Mexican empire, which stretched from sea to sea, was sore troubled. He refused to see the Spaniards. The distance of his capital was too great, since the journey was beset with difficulties. But the presents he sent were so gorgeous, so wonderful, that Cartes resolved to seek for himself the city which produced such wealth, whatever its ruler might decree. Here was a plate of gold, as large as a coach wheel, representing the sun, one in silver, even larger, representing the moon. There were numbers of golden toys, representing dogs, lions, tigers, apes, ducks, and wonderful plumes of green feathers. The man who had sailed across two thousand leagues of ocean held lightly the idea of a short land journey, however difficult, and Cortes began his preparations for the march to Mexico. He built the little settlement at Veracruz, the rich town of the True Cross, on the seashore as a basis for operations. Although the wealth allured them, there were many who viewed with dismay the idea of the long and dangerous march into the heart of the hostile land. After all there were but a handful of men pitted against a powerful nation. Murmurs arose, which reached the ears of Cortes. He was equal to the occasion, and resolutely burnt all the ships in the harbor, save one. The panic ensued. Mutiny threatened. "'I have chosen my part,' cried Cortes. "'I will remain here, while there is one to bear me company. If there be any so craven as to shrink from sharing the dangers of our glorious enterprise, let them go home. There is still one vessel left. Let them take that and return to Cuba. They can tell there how they have deserted their commander and their comrades, and patiently wait till we return loaded with the spoils of Mexico. He touched the right cord. Visions of future wealth and glory rose again before them. Confidence in their leader revived, and shouting bravely, To Mexico! To Mexico! The party started off on their perilous march. It was 16th August, 1519, when the little army, buoyant with high hopes and lofty plans of conquest, set forth. The first part of the way lay through beautiful country, rich in cochinal and vanilla, with groves of many-colored birds and insects, whose enameled wings glistened like diamonds in the blazing sun of the tropics. Then came the long and tedious ascent of the Cordilleras, leading to the tableland of Mexico. Higher and higher grew the mountains, heavy falls of sleet and hail, 
Icy winds and driving rain drenched the little Spanish party, as they made their way bravely upwards, till at last they reached the level of seven thousand feet, to find the great table-land rolling out along the crest of the Cordilleras. Hitherto they had met with no opposition among the natives they had met. Indeed, as the little army advanced, it was often found that the inhabitants of the country fled or was struck from before them. Now the reason was this. The Mexicans believed in a god called the Bird Serpent, around whom many a legion had grown up. Temples had been built in his honor, and horrible human sacrifices offered to appease him. For was he not the ruler of the winds, the lord of the lightning, the gatherer of the clouds? But the brave god had sailed away one day, saying he would return with fair-skinned men to possess the land in the fullness of time. Surely then the time had come, and their god had come again, here were the fair-skinned men in shining armor, marching back to their own again, and Cortez at their head. Was he not the god himself? The cross, too, was a Mexican symbol, so Cortez was allowed to put it up in the heathen temples without opposition. The inhabitants of Tlaxcala, fierce republicans, who refused to own the sway of Montezuma, alone offered resistance and how Cortés fought and defeated them with his handful of men, is truly a marvel. It was three months before they reached the goal of all their hopes, even the golden city of Mexico. The hardships and horrors of the march had been unsurpassed, but as the beautiful valley of Mexico unfolded itself before them, in the early light of the July morning, the Spaniards shouted with joy, It is the promised land! Mexico, Mexico. Many of us were disposed to doubt the reality of the scene before us, and to suspect we were in a dream, says one of the party. I thought we had been transported by magic to the terrestrial paradise. Water, cultivated plains, shining cities with shadowy hills beyond, lay like some gorgeous fairy land before and below them. At every step some new beauty appeared in sight, and the wonderful city of the waters, with its towers and shining palaces, arose out of the surrounding mists. The city was approached by a three solid causeways, some five miles long. It was crowded with spectators, eager to behold such men and animals as had never been seen in that part of the world. At any moment the little army of four hundred and fifty Spaniards might have been destroyed, surrounded as they were by overwhelming numbers of hostile Indian foes. It was a great day in the history of European discovery, when the Spaniard first set foot in the capital of the Western world. Everywhere was evidence of a crowded and thriving population, and a high civilization. At the walls of the city they were met by Montezuma himself, amid a crowd of Indian nobles, preceded by officers of state, bearing golden wands, was the royal palanquin blazing with burnished gold. It was borne on the shoulders of the nobles, who, barefooted, walked slowly with eyes cast to the ground. Descending from his litter, Montezuma then advanced under a canopy of gaudy featherwork, powdered with jewels and fringed with silver. His cloak and sandals were studded with pearls and precious stones, among which emeralds were conspicuous. Cortes dismounted, greeted the king, and spoke of his mission to the heathen and of his master, the mighty ruler of Spain. Everywhere Cortes and his men were received with friendship and reverence. For was he not the long-lost child of the sun? The Spanish explorer begged Montezuma to give up his idols, and to stop his terrible human sacrifices. The king somewhat naturally refused. Cortes grew angry. He was also very anxious. He felt the weakness of his position, the little handful of men in this great populous city, which he had sworn to win for Spain. The king must go. Why do we waste time on this barbarian? Let us seize him, and, if he resists, plunge our swords into his body, cried the exasperated commander. This is no place for the pathetic story of Montezuma's downfall. 
Prescott's Conquest of Mexico is within the reach of all. It tells of the Spanish treachery, of the refusal of the Mexican ruler to accept the new face, of his final appeal to his subjects, of chains, degradation, and death. It tells of the three great heaps of gold, pearls, and precious stones taken by Cortés, of the final siege and conquest. The news of this immense Mexican empire, discovered and conquered by Spain, brought honors from the king, Charles V, to the triumphant conqueror. Nor did Cortés stop even after this achievement. As governor and captain-general of Mexico, he sent off ships to explore the neighboring coasts. Hearing that Honduras possessed rich mines and that a strait into the Pacific Ocean might be found, Cortés led an expedition by land. Arrived at Tabasco, he was provided with an Indian map of cotton cloth, whereon were painted all the towns, rivers, mountains, as far as Nicaragua. With this map and the mariner's compass, he led his army through gloomy woods, so thick that no sun ever penetrated, and after a march of one thousand miles, reached the sea coast of Honduras, took over the country for Spain to be governed with Mexico by himself. This enormous tract of country was known to the world as New Spain. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 29 Explorers in South America The success of Cortés and his brilliant conquest of Mexico gave a new impulse to discovery in the New World. The spirit of exploration dominated every adventurous young Spaniard, and among those living in the West Indies there were many ready to give up all for the golden countries in the West, rumors of which were always reaching their ears. No sooner had these rich lands been realized than the news of Magellan's great voyage revealed the breadth of the ocean between America and Asia, and destroyed forever the idea that the Spice Islands were near. Spanish enterprise, therefore, lay in the same direction as heretofore, and we must relate the story of how Pizarro discovered Peru for the king of Spain. He had accompanied Balboa to Darien, and had with him gazed out on to the unknown waters of the Pacific Ocean below. With Balboa after crossing the isthmus of Darien, he had reached Panama on the South Sea, where he heard of a great nation far to the south. Like Mexico, it was spoken of as highly civilized and rich in mines of gold and silver. Many an explorer would have started off straightway for this new country, but there was a vast tract of dark forest and tangled underwood between Panama and Peru, which had damped the ardor of even the most ardent of Spanish explorers. But Pizarro was a man of courage and dauntless resolution, and he was ready to do and dare the impossible he made a bad start. A single ship with some hundred men aboard left Panama under the command of Pizarro in 1526. He was ignorant of southern navigation. The Indians along the shore were hostile. His men died one by one. The rich land of Peru was more distant than they had thought. And having at length reached the island of Gallo near the equator, they awaited reinforcements from Panama. Great then was the disappointment of Pizarro, when only one ship arrived and no soldiers. News of hardships and privations had spread through Panama, and none would volunteer to explore Peru. By this time, the handful of wretched men, who had remained with Pizarro, living on crabs picked up on the shore, begged to be taken home. They could endure no longer. Then came one of those tremendous moments— that lifts the born leader of men above his fellows. Drawing his sword, Pizarro traced a line on the sand from east to west. Friends, he cried, turning to the south, on that side are toil, hunger, nakedness, the drenching storm, desertion, and death, and on this side ease and pleasure. 
There lies Peru with its riches, here Panama and its poverty. For my part, I go south. So saying, he stepped across the line. Twelve stout-hearted men followed him. The rest turned warily homewards. The reduced but resolute little party then sailed south, and the voyage of two days brought them within sight of the long-sought land of Peru. Communication with the natives assured them that there was wealth and fortune to be made, and they hurried back to Panama, whence Pizarro sailed for Spain, for permission to conquer the empire of Peru. It's interesting to find Cortes contributing some of his immense wealth from Mexico towards this new quest. In February 1531, three small ships with 180 soldiers and 36 horses sailed south under Pizarro. It was not till the autumn of 1532 that he was ready to start on the great march to the interior. A city called Cusco was the capital, the holy city, with its great temple of the sun, the most magnificent building in the new world, had never yet been seen by Europeans. But the residence of the king was at Caxamalea, and this was the goal of the Spaniards for the present. Already the news was spreading through the land, that white and bearded strangers were coming up from the sea, clad in shining panoply, riding upon unearthly monsters, and wielding deadly thunderbolts. Pizarro's march to the heart of Peru, with a mere handful of men, was not unlike that of Cortes' expedition to Mexico. Both coveted the rich empire of unknown monarchs, and dared all to possess. Between Pizarro and his goal lay the stupendous mountain range of the Andes, or South American Cordilleras, rock piled upon rock, their crests of everlasting snow glittering high in the heavens. Across these and over narrow mountain passes the troops had now to pass. So steep were the sides that the horsemen had to dismount and scramble up, leading their horses as best they might. Frightful chasms yawned below them, terrific peaks rose above, and at any moment they might be utterly destroyed by bodies of Peruvians in overwhelming numbers. It was bitterly cold as they mounted higher and higher up the dreary heights, till at last they reached the crest. Then began the descent, precipitous and dangerous, until after seven days of this, the volley of Caxamalea unrolled before their delighted eyes, and the little ancient city with its white houses lay glittering in the sun. But dismay filled the stoutest heart when, spread out below for the space of several miles, tents as thick as snowflakes covered the ground. It was the Peruvian army. And it was too late to turn back. So with a bold a countenance as we could, we prepared for our entrance into Caxamalea. The Peruvians must already have seen the cavalcade of Spaniards, as with banners streaming and armor glistening in the rays of the evening sun, Pizarro led them towards the city. As they drew near, the king, Atahualpa, covered with plumes of feathers and ornaments of gold and silver blazing in the sun, was carried forth on a throne, followed by thirty thousand men, to meet the strangers. It seemed to the Spanish leader that only one course was open. He must seize the person of this great ruler at once. He waved his white scarf. Immediately the cavalry charged, and a terrible fight took place around the person of the ruler of Peru, until he was captured and taken prisoner. Atahualpa tried to regain his liberty by the offer of gold, for he had discovered, amid all their outward show of religious zeal, a greed for wealth among those strange white men from over the stormy seas. He suggested that he should fill with gold the room in which he was confined, as high as he could reach. Standing on tiptoe, he marked the wall with his hand. Pizarro accepted the offer, and the Spaniards greedily watched the arrival of their treasure from the roofs of palace and temple. They gained a sum of something like three million sterling, and then put the king to death. Pizarro was the conqueror of Peru, and he had no difficulty in controlling the abstract Peruvians, who regarded the relentless Spaniards as supernatural. 
the children of the sun indeed. A year later, these children of the sun entered the old town of Cusco, the capital of this rich empire, where they found a city of treasure surpassing all expectation. Meanwhile, Almagro, one of the most prominent among the Spanish explorers, had been granted a couple of hundred miles along the coast of Chile, which country he now penetrated. But the cold was so intense that men and horses were frozen to death, while the Chileans, clad in skins, were difficult to subdue. Almagro decided that Cusco belonged to him, and miserable disputes followed between him and Pizarro, ending in the tragic end of the veteran explorer Almagro. As the shiploads of gold reached the shores of Spain, more and more adventurers flocked over to the New World. They swarmed into Golden Castile, about the city of Panama, and journeyed into the interior of the yet new and unknown world. There are terrible stories of their greed and cruelty to the native Indians. One story says that the Indians caught some of these Spaniards, tied their hands and feet together, threw them on the ground, and poured liquid cold into their mouths, crying, Eat, eat cold, Christian! Amongst other adventurers into South America at this time was Orellana, who crossed the continent from ocean to ocean. He had accompanied one of Pizarro's brothers into the land of the cinnamon forests, and with him had crossed the Andes in search of another golden kingdom beyond Quito. The expedition under Pizarro, consisting of some three hundred and fifty Spaniards, half of whom were horsemen, and four thousand Indians, set forward in the year 1540 to penetrate to the remote regions in the hinterland, on the far side of the Andes. Their sufferings were intense. Violent thunderstorms and earthquakes terrified man and beast. The earth opened and swallowed up five hundred ho- houses. Rain fell in such torrents as to flood the land and cut off all communication between the explorers and cultivated regions. While crossing the lofty ridge of the Andes, the cold was so intense that numbers of the party were literally frozen to death. At length they reached the land of the cinnamon trees, and still pushing on, came to a river which must be crossed to reach the land of gold. They had finished their provisions, and had nothing to subsist on, now save the wild fruit of the country. After following the course of the river for some way, Pizarro decided to build a little vessel to search for food along the river. All set to work, Pizarro and Orellana, one of his chief captains, working as hard as the men. They set up a forge for making nails, and burnt charcoal with endless trouble owing to the heavy rains, which prevented the tinder from taking fire. They made nails from the shoes of the horses, which had been killed to feed the sick. For tar, they used resin from the trees. For oakum, they used blankets and old shirts. Then they launched the little homemade boat, thinking their troubles would be at end. For some four hundred miles, they followed the course of the river, but the supply of roots and berries grew scarcer, and men perished daily from starvation. So Pizarro ordered Orellana to go quickly down the river, with fifty men, to some inhabited land of which they had heard, to fill the boat with provisions, and return. Off started Orellana down the river, but no villages or cultivated lands appeared, nothing was to be seen, save flooded plains and gloomy, impenetrable forests. The river turned out to be a tributary of a much larger river. It was indeed the great river Amazon. Orellana now decided to go on down this great river and to desert Pizarro. True, his men were utterly weary, the current was too strong for them to row against, and they had no food to bring to their unhappy companions. There was likewise the possibility of reaching the kingdom of gold, for which they were searching. There were some among his party, who objected strongly to the course proposed by Orellana, to whom he responded by landing them on the edge of the dense forest, and there leaving them to perish of hunger. It was the last day of 1540 that, having eaten their shoes and saddles boiled with a few wild herbs, 
they set out to reach the kingdom of gold. It was truly one of the greatest adventures of the age, and historic, for here we get the word El Dorado, used for the first time in the history of discovery. The legendary land of gold, which was never found, but which attracted all the Elizabethan sailors to this romantic country. It would take too long to tell how they had to fight Indian tribes in their progress down the fast-flowing river, how they had to build a new boat, making bellows of their leather buskins, and manufacturing two thousand nails in twenty days, how they found women on the banks of the river, fighting as valiantly as men, and named the new country the Amazon land, and how at long last, after incredible hardship, they reached sea in August 1541. They had navigated some two thousand miles. They now made their rigging and ropes of grass and sails of blankets, and so sailed out in the open sea, reaching one of the West India Islands a few days later. And the deserted Pizarro, tired of waiting for Orellana, he made his way sorrowfully home, arriving after two years' absence in Peru, with eighty men left out of four thousand three hundred and fifty, all the rest having perished in the disastrous expedition. And so we must leave the Spanish conquerors for the present, exploring, still conquering in these parts, ever adding glory and riches to Spain. Indeed, Spain and Portugal, as we have seen, entirely monopolize the horizon of geographical discovery till the middle of the sixteenth century, when other nations enter the arena. End of chapter 29「English eyes were already straining across the seas. English hands were ready to grasp the treasure that had been Spain's for the last fifty years. While Spain was sending Christopher Columbus to and fro across the Atlantic to the West Indies, while Portugal was rejoicing in the success of Bosco da Gama, John Cabot, in the service of England, was making his way from Bristol to the New World. News of the first voyage of Columbus had been received by the Cabots, John and his son Sebastian, with infinite admiration. They believed with the rest of the world that the coast of China had been reached by sailing westward. Bristol was at this time the chief seaport in England, and the center of trade for the Iceland fisheries. The merchants of the city had already ventured far onto the Atlantic, and various little expeditions had been fitted out by the merchants, for possible discovery westward, but one after another failed, including the most scientific mariner in all England, who started forth to find the island of Brazil to the west of Ireland, but after nine miserable weeks at sea, was driven back to Ireland again by foul weather. Now Columbus had crossed the Atlantic. Cabot got leave from the English king, Henry the Seventh, to sail to the east, west, or north, with five ships carrying the English flag, to seek and discover all the islands, countries, regions, or provinces of pagans in whatever part of the world. Further, the king was to have one-fifth of the prophets, and at all risks any conflict with Spain must be avoided. Nothing daunted, Cabot started off to fulfill his lord's commands in a tiny ship with eighteen men. We have the barest outlines of his proceedings. Practically all is contained in this one paragraph. In the year 1497, John Cabot, a Venetian, and his son Sebastian, discovered on the 24th of June, about five in the morning, that land, to which no person had before ventured to sail, which they named Prima Vista, or first seen, because, as I believe, it was the first part seen by them from the sea. 
The inhabitants use the skins and furs of wild beasts for garments, which they hold in as high estimation as we do our finest clothes. The soil yields no useful production, but it abounds in white bears and deer much larger than ours. Its coasts produced vast quantities of large fish, great seals, salmons, soles above a yard in length, and prodigious quantities of cod. So much for the contemporary account of this historic voyage. A letter from England to Italy describes the effect of the voyage on England. The Venetian, our countryman, who went with a ship from Bristol in quest of new islands, is returned, and says that seven hundred leagues hence he discovered land, the territory of the great Khan. He coasted for three hundred leagues and landed. He saw no human beings, but he has brought hither to the king certain snares, which had been set to catch game and a needle for making nets. He also found some felled trees. Wherefore he supposed there were inhabitants, and returned to his ships in alarm. He was there three months on the voyage, and on his return he saw two islands to starboard, but would not land, time being precious, as he was short of provisions. He says the tides are slack, and do not flow as they do here. The King of England is much pleased with this intelligence. The King has promised that in the spring our countrymen shall have ten ships to his order, and at his request has conceded to him all the prisoners to man his fleet. The king has also given him money, wherewith to amuse himself till then, and he is now at Bristol with his wife and sons. His name is Cabot, and he is styled the Great Admiral. Whilst honour is paid to him, he dresses in silk, and the English run after him like mad people. Yet another letter of the time tells how Master John Cabot has won a part of Asia without a stroke of the sword. This Master John, too, has the description of the world in a chart, and also in a solid globe which he has made, and he shows where he landed. And they say that it is a good and temperate country, and they think that Brazil wood and silks grow there, and they affirm that that sea is covered with fishes. But Master John had set his heart on something greater. Constantly hugging the shore of America, he expected to find the island of Kipango, Japan, in the equinoctial region, where he should find all the spices of the world, and any amount of precious stones. But after all this great promise, Master John disappears from the pages of history, and his son Sebastian continues to sail across the Atlantic, not always in the service of England, though in 1502 we find him bringing to the King of England three men taken in the Newfoundland, clothed in beasts' skins and eating raw flesh, and speaking a language which no man could understand. They must have been kindly dealt with by the king, for two years later the poor savages are clothed like Englishmen. Though England claimed the discovery of this newfound land, the Portuguese declared that one of their countrymen, Corteral, a gentleman of the royal household, had already discovered the land of the codfish in 1463. But then, had not the Vikings already discovered this country five hundred years before? End of chapter 30「French sailors had fished in the seas, washing the western coast of North America. Verrazzano, a Florentine, in the service of France, had explored the coast of the United States, and a good deal was known when Jacques Cartier, a Frenchman, steps upon the scene and wins for his country a large tract of land about the river St. Lawrence. His object was to find a way across America to Cathay, with two little ships of sixty tons and sixty-one chosen men, 
Cartier left St. Malo on 20th of April, 1584. With prosperous weather, he tells us he made the coast of Newfoundland in three weeks, which would mean sailing over 100 miles a day. He was a little too early in the season, for the easterly winds which had helped him on his way had blocked the east coast of the island with arctic ice. Having named the point at which he first touched land, Cape Bona Vista, he cruised about, till, the ice having melted, he could sail down the Straits of Belle Isle, between the mainland of Labrador and Newfoundland, already discovered by Breton fishermen. Then he explored the now familiar Gulf of St. Lawrence, the first European to report on it. All through June the little French ships sailed about the Gulf, darting across from island to island and cape to cape. Prince Edward Island appealed to him strongly. It's very pleasant to behold, he tells us. We found sweet-smelling trees as cedars, dews, pines, ash, willow. Where the ground was bare of trees, it seemed very fertile and was full of wild corn, red and white gooseberries, strawberries, and blackberries, as if it had been cultivated on purpose. It now grew hotter, and Cartier must have been glad of a little heat. He sighted Nova Scotia, and sailed by the coast of New Brunswick, without naming or surveying them. He describes accurately the bay, still called Chalor Bay. We name this the Warm Bay, for the country is warmer even than Spain, and exceedingly pleasant. They sailed up as far as they could, filled with hope that this might be the long-sought passage to the Pacific Ocean. Hope Cape, they named the Southern Point, but they were disappointed by finding only a deep bay, and today, by a strange coincidence, the point opposite to northern shore is known as Cape Despair, the Cap d'Espoir of the early French mariners. Sailing on to the north, amid strong currents and a heavy sea, Cartier at last put into a shelter, Gaspé Bay. Here, on the 24th of July, we made a great cross, thirty feet high, on which we hung up a shield, with three floors de lis, and inscribed the cross with this motto, Vive le Roi de France. When this was finished, in presence of all the natives, we all kneeled down before the cross, holding up our hands to heaven and praising God. Storms and strong tides now decided Cartier to return to France. He knew nothing of the Cabot Strait between Newfoundland and the land afterwards called Nova Scotia, so he guided his little ships right through the Straits of Belle Isle, and after being much tossed by a heavy tempest from the east, which we weathered by the blessing of God, he arrived safely home on 5th of September, after his six months' adventure. He was soon commissioned to continue the navigation of those new lands, and in May 1535 he safely led three ships, slightly larger than the last, across the stormy Atlantic. Contrary winds, heavy gales, and thick fogs turned the voyage of three weeks into five, the ships losing one another not to meet again till the coast of Labrador was reached. Coasting along the southern coast, Cartier now entered a very fine and large bay, full of islands, and with channels of entrance and exit in all winds. Cartier named it Bay St. Lawrence, because has entered it on 10th of August, the Feast of St. Lawrence. Do any of the English men and women who steam up the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the great ocean steamers today, on their way to Canada, ever give a thought to the little pioneer French ships that four hundred years ago saw they were sailing toward Cathay? Savages, as Cartier calls the Indians, told him that he was near the mouth of the great river, Hohelaga, now the St. Lawrence, which became narrower as we approached towards Canada, where the water is fresh. On the first day of September, says Cartier, we set sail from the said harbor of for Canada. Canada was just a native word for a town or village. It seems strange to read of the Lord of Canada coming down the river with twelve canoes and many people to greet the first white men he had ever seen. Strange, too, 
to find Cartier arriving at the place called Hochelaga, twenty-five leagues above Canada, where the river becomes very narrow, with a rapid current and very dangerous on account of rocks. For another week the French explorers sailed on up the unknown river. The country was pleasant, well wooded, with vines as full of grapes as they would hang. On 2nd October, Cartier arrived at the native town of Hochelaga. He was welcomed by hundreds of natives, men, women, and children, who gave the travelers as friendly a welcome as if we had been of their own nation, come home after a long and perilous absence. The women carried their children to him to touch them, for they evidently thought that some supernatural being had come up from the sea. All night they danced to the light of fires lit upon the shore. The next morning Cartier, having dressed himself splendidly, went ashore with some of his men. All were well armed, though the natives seemed peacefully disposed. They marched along a well-beaten track to the Indian city, which stood in the midst of cultivated fields of Indian corn and maize. Again the inhabitants met them with signs of joy and gladness, and the king was carried shoulder high, seated on a large deerskin with a red breast, round his head, made of the skins of hedgehogs instead of a crown. A curious scene then took place. The king placed his crown on the head of the French explorer, before whom he humbled himself as before a god. Thus evidently did the people regard him, for they brought to him their blind, their lame, and their diseased folk, that he might cure them. Touched with pity at the groundless confidence of these poor people, Cartier signed them with the sign of the cross. He then opened a service book and read the Passion of Christ in an audible voice, during which all the natives kept a profound silence, looking up to heaven and imitating all our gestures. He then caused our trumpets and other musical instruments to be sounded, which made the natives very merry. Cartier and his men then went to the top of the neighboring mountain. The extensive view from the top created a deep impression on the French explorer. He grew enthusiastic over the beauty of the level valley below and called the place Mont-Royal, a name communicated to the busy city of Montreal that lies below. Winter was now coming on, and Cartier decided against attempting the homeward voyage so late in the year. But to winter in the country he chose a spot between Montreal and Quebec, little thinking what the long winter months would bring forth. The little handful of Frenchmen had no idea of the severity of the Canadian climate. They little dreamt of the interminable months of ice and snow, when no navigation was possible. Before Christmas had come round, the men were down to scurvy by the middle of February. Out of one hundred and ten persons composing the companies of our three ships, there were not ten in perfect health. Eight were dead already. The sickness increased to such a pitch that there were not above three sound men in the whole company. We were obliged to bury such as died under the snow, as the ground was frozen quite hard and we were all reduced to extreme weakness, and we lost all hope of ever returning to France. From November to March, four feet of snow lay upon the decks of their little ships, and yet, shut up as they were in the heart of a strange and unknown land, with their ships ice-bound, and naught but savages around, there is no sound of murmur or complaint. It must be allowed, that the winter that year was uncommonly long, is all we hear. May found them free once more, and making for home, with the great news that, though they had not found the way to Cathay, they had discovered and taken a great new country for France. A new map of the world in 1586 marks Canada and Labrador, and gives the river St. Lawrence just beyond Montreal. A map of 1550 goes further, and calls the sea that washes the shores of Newfoundland and the Labrador the Sea of France, while to the south it is avowedly the Sea of Spain. End of chapter 31
Chapter Thirty Two of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter Thirty Two. Search for a Northeast Passage. England was now awakening from her sleep, too late to possess the Spice Islands, too late for India and the Cape of Good Hope, too late it would seem for the New World. The Portuguese held the eastern route, the Spaniards the western route to the Spice Islands. But what if there were a northern route? All ways apparently led to Cathay. Why should England not find a way to that glorious land by taking a northern course? If the seas towards the north be navigable, we may go to these spice islands by a shorter way than Spain and Portugal, said Master Thorn of Bristol, a friend of the Cabots. But the northern seas are blocked with ice, and the northern lands are too cold for man to dwell in, objected some. There is no land uninhabitable, nor sea unnavigable, was the heroic reply. It was in this belief, and in this heroic temper, that England set herself to take possession of her heritage, the North. But it was not till the reign of Edward the Sixth that a company of merchant adventurers was formed for the discovery of regions, dominions, islands, and places unknown, with old Sebastian Cabot as its first governor, and not till the year 1553 that three little ships and their seer Hugh Willoughby and Richard Kanzler were fitted out for a northern cruise. They carried letters of introduction from the boy king of England to all kings, princes, rulers, judges, and governors of the earth, in all places under the universal heaven, including those inhabiting the northeast parts of the world toward the mighty empire of Cathay. Sir Hugh Willoughby, a most valiant gentleman, hoisted the English flag on the Bona Esperanza, a good little ship of one hundred and twenty tons. The next in command was Richard Kanzler, a man of great estimation for many good parts of wit in him, who sailed the Edward Bonadventure, which though not so fast as the flagship, was slightly larger. So certain were the promoters that the ships would reach the hot climates beyond Cathay, that they had them sheathed with lead to protect them from worms, which had proved so destructive in the tropics before. The account of the start of these first English Arctic explorers is too quaint to be passed in silence. It was thought best that, by the twentieth of May, the captains and mariners should take shipping and depart if it pleased God. They, having saluted their acquaintance, one his wife, another his children, another his kinsfolk, another his friends dearer than his kinsfolk, were ready at the day appointed. The greater ships are towed down with boats and oars, and the mariners, being all apparelled in sky-coloured clothes, made way with diligence. And being come near to Greenwich, where the courts then lay, the courtiers came running out, and the common people flocked together, standing very thick upon the shore. The privy council, they looked out of the windows of the court, and the rest ran up to the tops of the towers, and the mariners shouted in such sort, that the sky rang again with the noise thereof. But alas! The good King Edward, he only by reason of his sickness, was absent from this show. The ships dropped down to Woolwich, with the tide, and coasted along the east coast of England, till at the last, with a good wind, they hoisted up sail, and committed themselves to the sea, giving their last adieu to their native country. Many of them could not refrain from tears." Richard Kanzler himself had left behind two little sons, and his poor mind was tormented with sorrow and care. By the middle of July the North Sea has been crossed, and the three small ships were off the shores of Norway, coasting among the islands and fjords that lined that indented kingdom. Coasting still northward, Willoughby led his ships to the Lofoten Islands, plentifully inhabited by very gentle people, under the King of Denmark. They sailed on. To the west of them was the ocean, to the right the desolate shore. Till they had passed the North Cape, already discovered by Adair, 
the old sea captain who dwelt in Helgoland. A terrible storm now arose, and the sea was so outrageous that the ships could not keep their intended course, but some were driven on one way, and some another way, to their great peril and hazard. Then Sir Hugh Willoughby shouted across the roaring seas to Richard Cancellor, begging him not to go far from him. But the little ships got separated, and never met again. Willoughby was blown across the sea to Nova Zemlya. The sea was rough and stormy, the tempest howled and wailed, and the sea fog like a ghost haunted the dreary coast, but onward still I sailed. The weather grew more and more arctic, and he made his way over to a haven in Lapland, where he decided to winter. He sent men to explore the country, but no signs of mankind could be found. There were bears and foxes and all manner of strange beasts, but never a human being. It must have been desperately dreary as the winter advanced, with ice and snow and freezing winds from the north. What this little handful of Englishmen did, how they endured the bitter winter on the desolate shores of Lapland, no man knows. Willoughby was alive in January, 1554. Then all is silent. And what of Richard Cancellor on board the Bonadventure? Pensive, heavy, and sorrowful, but resolute to carry out his orders, Master Cancellor held on his hook course towards that unknown part of the world, and sailed so far that he came at last to the place where he found no night at all, but the continual light and brightness of the sun, shining clearly upon the huge and mighty sea. After a time he found and entered a large bay, where he anchored, making friends with the fisher folk on the shores of the White Sea to the north of Russia. So frightened were the natives at the greatness of the English ships, that at first they ran away, half dead with fear. Soon, however, they regained confidence, and throwing themselves down, they began to kiss the explorer's feet. But he, according to his great and singular courtesy, looked pleasantly upon them. By signs and gestures he comforted them, until they brought food to the newcome guests, and went to tell their king of the arrival of a strange nation of singular gentleness and courtesy. Then the king of Russia, or Muscovy, Ivan Vasilievich, sent for Master Cancellor to go to Moscow. The journey had to be made in sledges over the ice and snow. A long and weary journey it must have been, for his guide lost the way, and they travelled nearly one thousand five hundred miles before Master Cancellor came at last to Moscow, the chief city of the kingdom, as great as the city of London, with all its suburbs, remarks Cancellor. Arrived at the king's palace, Master Cancellor was received by one hundred Russian courtiers, dressed in clothes of gold to the very ankles. The king sat aloft on a high throne, with a crown of gold on his head, holding in his hand a glittering sceptre studded with precious stones. The Englishman and his companions saluted the king, who received them graciously, and read the letter from Edward the VI with interest. They did not know that the boy king was dead, and that his sister Mary was on the throne of England. The king was much interested in the long beards grown by the Englishmen. That of one of the company was five foot two inches in length, thick, broad, and yellow colored. This is God's gift, said the Russians. To Edward the VI of England, the king sent a letter by the hands of Richard Cancellor, giving leave readily for England to trade with Russia. Master Cancellor seems to have arrived home again safely with his account of Russia, which encouraged the merchant adventurers to send forth more ships to develop trade with this great new country, of which they knew so little. To this end, Anthony Jenkinson, a resolute and intelligent gentleman, was selected, and with four tall, well-appointed ships he sailed on 12th of May, 1557, towards the land of Russia. He reached Cape North on 2nd July, and a few days later he passed the spot where Sir Hugh Willoughby and all his company had perished. Anchoring in the Bay of St. Nicholas, he took a sledge for Moscow, where he delivered his letter safely to the king. So ice-bound was the country, that it was April 1558, before he was able to leave Moscow for the south, to accomplish, if possible, 
the orders of the merchant adventurers to find an overland route to Cathay, with letters of introduction from the Russian king to the princes and kings through whose dominions he was to pass. Master Jenkinson made his way to the Volga, whence he continued his voyage with a Russian captain who was travelling south in great style to take up a command at Astrakhan with five hundred boats laden with soldiers, stores, food, and merchandise. After three months travelling, and having passed over some one thousand two hundred miles, the Englishmen reached the south. The city of Astrakhan offered no attractions and no hope of trade, so Jenkinson boldly took upon himself to navigate the mouth of the Volga and to reach the Caspian Sea. He was the first Englishman to cross Russia from the White Sea to the Caspian. Never before on the Caspian had the Red Cross of St. George been seen flying from the masthead of a ship sailed by Englishmen. After three weeks buffeting by contrary winds, they found themselves on the eastern shores, and getting together a caravan of one thousand camels, they went forward. No sooner had they landed than they found themselves in the land of thieves and robbers. Jenkinson hastened to the sultan of these parts, a noted robber himself, to be kindly received by the Tartar prince, who set before him the flesh of a wild horse and some mars milk. Then the little English party travelled on for three weeks, through desolate land, with no rivers, no houses, no inhabitants, till they reached the banks of the Oxus. Here we refreshed ourselves, says the explorer, having been three days without water and drink, and tarried there all the next day making merry, with our slain horses and camels. For a hundred miles they followed the course of this great river, until they reached another desert, where they were again attacked by bands of thieves and robbers. It was Christmas Eve when they at last reached Bokhara, only to find that the merchants were so poor that there was no hope of any trade worth following, though the city was full of caravans from India and the Far East. And there they heard that the way to Cassi was barred by reason of grievous wars which were going on. Winter was coming on, so Jenkinson remained for a couple of months before starting on his long journey home. With a caravan of six hundred camels, he made his way back to the Caspian, and on 2nd September he had reached Moscow, safely, with presents of a white coast tail of Cathy and a drum of Tartary for the king, which seemed to give that monarch the greatest pleasure. He evidently stayed for a time in Russia, for it is not till the year 1560 that we find him writing to the merchant adventurers, that at the next shipping I embark myself for England. While Jenkinson was endeavouring to reach the far east by land, a Portuguese named Pinto had succeeded in reaching it by sea. The discovery of Japan is claimed by three people. Antonio de Mota had been thrown by a storm onto the island of Nisson, called by the Chinese Japan, Japan, in the year 1542. Pinto claims to have discovered it the same year. It seems that the Japanese were expecting the return of a god, and as the white men who in sight they exclaimed, These are certainly the chinky kogis spoken of in our records, who, flying over the waters, shall come to be lords of the lands, where God has placed the greatest riches of the world. It will be fortunate for us if they come as friends." No man of the time refused to believe in the travels of Mendex Pinto. He should be called Mendax Pinto, said one, whose book is one continued chain of monstrous fiction which deserves no credit. While a hundred and fifty years later, Congreve wrote, Ferdinando Mendes Pinto was but a type of thee, the liar of the first magnitude. End of chapter 32 Chapter thirty three of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter thirty three. Martin Frobisher searches for a northwest passage. So far the expeditions 
of Willoughby, Cancellor, and Jenkinson, had all failed to reach the far east. The Spanish had a way thither by Magellan Strait, the Portuguese by the Cape of Good Hope. England, in the middle of the sixteenth century, had no way. What about a northwest passage, leading round Labrador from the Atlantic to the Pacific? England was waking up to possibilities of future exploration. She was also ready and anxious to annoy Spain for having monopolized the riches and wealth of the New World. And so it was that Queen Elizabeth turned with interest to the suggestions of one of her subjects, Martin Frobisher, a mariner of great experience and ability, when he enthusiastically consulted her on the navigation of the Northwest Passage. For the last fifteen years he had been trying to collect ships and men for the enterprise. It is the only thing in the world left undone, whereby a notable mind might be made famous and fortunate, he affirmed. But it was not till the year 1576 that he got a chance of fitting out two small ships, two very small ships, the Gabriel of twenty tons, the Michael of twenty-five tons, to explore the icy regions of the north. A wave of the queen's hand gladdened his heart as he sailed past the palace of Greenwich, where the court resided, and he was soon sailing northward, harassed and battered by many storms. His little ten-ton pinnace was lost, and the same storm that overtook little fleet to the north of Scotland, so terrified the captain of the Michael, that he deserted and turned home, with the news that Frobisher had perished with all hands. Meanwhile, Frobisher, resolute in his undertaking, was nearing the coast of Greenland, alone in the little Gabriel, with a mere handful of men, all inexperienced in the art of navigating the polar seas. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. As Frobisher sailed his storm-beaten ship across the wintry seas. But, I will sacrifice my life to God, rather than return home without discovering a northwest passage to Cathay, he told his eighteen men, with sublime courage. Passing Cape Farewell, he sailed northwest with the Greenland current, which brought him to the ice-bound shores near Hudson Bay. He did not see the straits afterwards discovered by Hudson, but, finding an inlet farther north, he sailed some hundred miles, in the firm belief that this was the passage for which he was searching, that America lay on his left and Asia on his right. Magellan had discovered straits in the extreme south. Frobisher made sure that he had found corresponding straits to the extreme north, and Frobisher's straits they were accordingly named, and as such they appeared on the maps of the day, till they had to be renamed Lumley's Inlet. The snow and ice made further navigation impossible for this year, and full of their great news, they returned home, accompanied by an Eskimo. These natives had been taken for purposes by our English explorers, but later they were reported to be strange infidels, whose like was never seen, read, or heard of before. Martin Frobisher was received with enthusiasm, and highly commended of all men for his great and notable attempt but specially famous for the great hope he brought of the passage to Cathay. Besides the Eskimo, the explorers carried home a black stone, which, when thrown on the fire by one of the sailors' wives, glittered like gold. The gold refiners of London were hastily called in, and they reported that it contained a quantity of gold. A new incentive was now given to polar exploration. The queen herself contributed a tall ship of some two hundred tons to the new expedition that was eagerly fitted out, and the high admiral of all seas and waters, countries, lands, and isles, as Frobisher was now called, sailed away again for the icy north, more to search for gold than to discover the northwest passage. He added nothing more to the knowledge of the world, and though he sailed through the strait afterwards known as Hudson's, he never realized his discovery. His work was hampered by the quest for gold, for which England was eagerly clamoring, and he disappears from our history of discovery. The triumphant return of Francis Drake in 1580, laden with treasure from the Spice Islands, 
put into the shade all schemes for a north-west passage for the moment. Nevertheless, this voyage of Martin Frobisher is important in the history of exploration. It was the first attempt of an Englishman to make search amid the ice of the Arctic regions, a search in which so many were yet to lay down their lives. End of chapter 33「Chapter 34 of A Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 34 Drake's Famous Voyage Round the World Call him on the deep sea, call him up the sound, Call him when ye sail to meet the foe, Where the old dreads plying, and the old folk flying, They shall find him where and waking, As they found him long ago. Henry Newbold Drake's famous voyage, as it is known to history, 1577-1580, was indeed famous, For although Magellan's ship had sailed around the world fifty years before, Drake was the first Englishman to do so, and further, he discovered for us land to the south of Magellan Strait, round which washed the waters of Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, showing that the mysterious land, marked on contemporary maps as Terra Australis, and joined to South America, was a separate land altogether. He also explored the coast of America as far north as Vancouver Island, and disclosed to England the secret of the Spice Islands. The very name of Drake calls up a vision of thrilling adventure on the high seas. He had been at sea since he was a boy of fifteen, when he had been apprenticed to the master of a small ship, trading between England and the Netherlands, and many a time he had sailed on the grey North Sea. But the narrow seas were a prison for so large a spirit born for greater undertakings, and in 1567 we find Drake sailing forth on board the Judith, in an expedition over to the Spanish settlements in America, under his kinsman, John Hawkins. Having crossed the Atlantic, and filled his ship with Spanish treasure from the Spanish main, and having narrowly escaped death from the hands of the Spaniards, Drake had hurried home to tell of the riches of this new country, still close to all other nations. Two years later, Drake was off again, this time in command himself of two ships, with crews of seventy-three young men, their modest aim being nothing less than to seize one of the Spanish ports, and empty into their holds the treasure-house of the world. What if this act of reckless daring was unsuccessful? The undertaking was crowned with a higher success than that of riches, for Drake was the first Englishman to see the waters of the Pacific Ocean. His expedition was not unlike that of Balboa some sixty years before, as with eighteen men chosen companions, he climbed the forest-clad spurs of the ridge dividing the two great oceans. Arrived on the top, he climbed up a giant tree on the golden sea of which he had so often heard, the Pacific Ocean of Magellan, the waters washing the golden shores of Mexico and Peru, all lay below him. Descending from the heights, he sank upon his knees, and humbly besought Almighty God, of his goodness, to give him life and leave to sail once in an English ship in that sea. Jealously had the Spanish guarded this beautiful southern sea, now her secrets were laid bare, for an Englishman had gazed upon it, and he was not likely to remain satisfied with this alone. In 1573, Drake came home with his wonderful news, and it was not long before he was eagerly talking over with the Queen a project for a raid into this very golden sea, guarded by the Spaniards. Elizabeth promised help on condition that the object of the expedition should remain a secret. Ships were bought for a voyage to Egypt. There was a pelican of one hundred tons, the marigold of thirty tons, and a provision ship of fifty tons. 
a fine new ship of eighty tons, named the Elizabeth, mysteriously added itself to the little fleet, and the crews numbered in all some one hundred and fifty men. No expense was spared in the equipment of the ships. Musicians were engaged for the voyage. The arms and ammunition were of the latest pattern. The flagship was lavishly furnished. There were silver bowls and mugs and dishes richly gilt and engraved with the family arms, while the commander's cabin was full of sweet-smelling perfumes, presented by the queen herself. Thus, complete at last, Drake led his gay little squadron out of Plymouth, harbour on 15th November, 1577, bound for Alexandria, so the crews thought. Little did Drake know what was before him, as, dressed in his seaman's shirt, his scarlet cap with its gold band on his head, he waved farewell to England. Who could foresee the terrible beginning, with treachery and mutiny at work, or the glorious ending, when the young Englishman sailed triumphantly home, after his three years' voyage, the world encompassed. Having reached the Cape de Verde Islands in safety, the object of the expedition could no longer remain a secret, and Drake led his squadron boldly across the Atlantic Ocean. On 5th April the coast of Brazil appeared, but fogs and heavy weather scattered the ships, and they had to run into the mouth of the La Plata, for shelter. Then for six weary weeks the ship struggled southward, battered by gales and squalls, during which nothing but the daring seamanship of the English navigators saved the little vessels from destruction. It was not till 20th June that they reached Port St. Julian of Magellan fame, on the desolate shores of Patagonia. As they entered the harbor, a grim sight met their eyes. On that fine swept shore, was the skeleton of the man, hung by Magellan years before. History was to repeat itself, and the same fate was now to befall an unhappy Englishman, guilty of the same conduct. Drake had long had reason to suspect the second in command, Doughty, though he was his dear friend. He had been guilty of worse than disobedience, and the very success of the voyage was threatened. So Drake called a council together, and Dofty was tried according to English law. After two days' trial he was found guilty and condemned to die. One of the most touching scenes in the history of exploration now took place. One sees the little English crews far away on the desolate shore, the ships laying at anchor in the harbour, the block prepared, the altar raised beside it, the two old friends, Drake and Dofty, kneeling side by side, then the flush of the sword, and Drake holding up the head of his friend with the words, Lo, this is the end of traitors. It was now midwinter, and for six weeks they remained in harbour till August came, and with three ships they emerged to continue their way to the Straits of Magellan. At last it was found, and boldly they entered. From the towering mountains that guarded the entry, Tempests of wind and snow swept down upon the daring intruders. As they made their way through the rough and winding waters, they imagined with all the other geographers of their time that the unknown land to the south was one great continent leading beyond the boundaries of the world. Fires lit by the natives on the southern coast added terror to the wild scene. But at the end of sixteen days they found themselves once more in the open sea, they were at last on the Pacific Ocean. But it was anything but Pacific. A terrible tempest arose, followed by other storms no less violent, and the ships were driven helplessly southward and westward far beyond Cape Horn. When they once more reached the coast, they found in the place of the great southern continent an indented, wind-swept shore washed by waves terrific in their height and strength. In the careless gale, the marigold foundered, with all hands, and was never heard of again. A week later, the captain of the Elizabeth turned home, leaving the pelican, now called the Golden Hen, to struggle on alone. After nearly two months of storm, Drake anchored among the islands southward of anything, yet known to the geographers, where Atlantic and Pacific rolled together, 
in one boisterous flood. Walking alone to the farthest end of the island, Drake is said to have laid himself down, and with his arms embraced the southernmost point of the known world. He showed that Tierra del Fuego, instead of being part of a great continent, the Terra Australis, was a group of islands with open sea to east, south, and west. This discovery was first shown on a Dutch silver medallion, struck in Holland about 1581, known as the Silver Map of the World, and may be seen today in the British Museum. Remarking that the ocean he was now entering would have been better called Mare Furiosum than Mare Pacificum, Drake now directed his course along the western coast of South America. He found the coast of Chile, but not as the general maps had described it, wherefore it appears that this part of Chile has not been truly hitherto discovered, remarked one on board the Golden Hind. Bristling with guns, the little English ship sailed along the unknown coast, till they reached Valparaiso. Here they found the great Spanish ship laden with treasure from Peru. Quickly boarding her, the English sailors bound the Spaniards, stowed them under the hatches, and hastily transferred the cargo onto the Golden Hand. They sailed on northwards to Lima and Panama, chasing the ships of Spain, plundering as they went, till they were deeply laden with stolen Spanish treasure, and knew that they had made it impossible to return home by that coast. So Drake resolved to go on northward and discover, if possible, a way home by the north. He had probably heard of Frobisher's Strait, and hoped to find a western entrance. As they approached the Arctic regions, the weather grew bitterly cold, and while thick stinking fogs determined them to sail southward. They had reached a point near what we now know a Vancouver Island, when contrary winds drove them back, and they put in at a harbor, now known as San Francisco, to repair the ship for the great voyage across the Pacific, and home by the Cape of Good Hope. Drake had sailed past seven hundred miles of new coastline in twelve days, and he now turned to explore the new country, to which he gave the name of New Albion. The Indians soon began to gather in large quantities on the shore, and the king himself, tall and comely, advanced in a friendly manner. Indeed, he took off his crown and set it on the head of Drake, and hanging chains about his neck, the Indians made him understand that the land was now his, and that they were his vassals. Little did King Drake dream, as he named his country New Albion, that Californian gold was so near. His subjects were loving and peaceable, evidently, regarding the English as gods, and reverencing them as such. The chronicler is eloquent in his detailed description of all the royal doings. Before we left, he says, our general caused to be set up a monument of our being there, as also of Her Majesty's right and title to that kingdom, namely, a plate of brass, fast nailed to a great and firm post, whereon is engraved Her Grace's name, and the day of year of our arrival here, and of the free giving up of the province, both by the people and king, into Her Majesty's hands, together with Her Highness' picture, and arms in a piece of his sixpence current money. The Spanish never so much as set foot in this country, the utmost of their discoveries reaching, only to many degrees southward of this place. And now, as the time of our departure was perceived by the people, so did the sorrows and miseries seem to increase upon them. Not only did they lose on a sudden all mirth, joy, glad countenance, pleasant speeches, agility of body, but with signs and sorrowings, with heavy hearts and grieved minds, they poured out woeful complaints and moans, with bitter tears and wringing of their hands, tormenting themselves. And as men refusing all comfort, they only accounted themselves as those whom the gods were about to forsake. Indeed, the poor Indians looked on these Englishmen as gods, and when the day came for them to leave, they ran to the top of the hills to keep the little ship in sight as long as possible, after which they burned fires and made sacrifices at their departure. 
Drake left New Albion on 23rd July, 1579, to follow the lead of Magellan and to pass home by the southern seas and the Atlantic Ocean. After sixty-eight days of quick and straight sailing, with no sight of land, they fell in with the Philippine Islands, and on 3rd November with the famous Spice Islands. Here they were well received by the king, a magnificent person attired in clothes of gold, with bare legs and shoes of Cordova skins, rings of gold in his hair, and the chain of perfect gold about his neck. The Englishmen were glad enough to get fresh food after their long crossing, and fared sumptuously on rice, hens, imperfect and liquid sugar, sugar canes, and the fruit they call figo, with plenty of cloves. On a little island near Celebes, the golden hind was thoroughly repaired for her long voyage home. But the little treasure-laden ship was nearly wrecked, before she got away from the dangerous shoals and currents of these islands. Upon the ninth of January we ran suddenly upon a rock, where we stuck fast from eight of the clock at night till four of the clock in the afternoon the next day, being indeed out of all hope to escape the danger. But our general, as he had always hitherto showed himself courageous, so now he and we did our best endeavours to save ourselves which it pleased God so to bless, that in the end we cleared ourselves most happily of the danger. Then they ran across the Indian Ocean, rounded the Cape of Good Hope in calm weather, abusing the Portuguese for calling it the most dangerous cape in the world, for intolerable storms. For this cape, said the English, is the most stately thing, and the finest cape we saw, in the whole circumference of the earth. And so they came home, after nearly three years' absence, Drake triumphantly sailed his little golden hind into Plymouth Harbour, where he had long ago been given up as lost. Shouts of applause rang through the land at the news that an Englishman had circumnavigated the world. The Queen sent for Drake to tell his wonderful story, to which she listened spellbound. A great banquet was held on board the little ship, at which Elizabeth was present and knighted Drake, while she ordered that the golden hind should be preserved as a worthy rival of Magellan's Victoria, and as a monument to all posterity of that famous and worthy exploit of Sir Francis Drake. It was afterwards taken to pieces, and the best parts of wood were made into a chair at Oxford, commemorated by Cowley's lines. To this great ship, which round the world has run, and matched in race the chariot of the sun. Drake and his ship could never have wished for fate, a happier station or more blessed estate. For lo, a seat of endless rest is given to her in Oxford and to him in heaven. Sir Francis Drake died at sea in 1596. The waves became his winding sheet, the waters were his tomb. But for his fame, the ocean sea was not sufficient room. End of chapter 34。Chapter 35 of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 35 Davis Strait But even while Drake was sailing round the world, and Frobisher's search for a northwest passage had been diverted into a quest for gold, men's minds were still bent on the achievement of reaching Cathay by some northern route. A discourse by Sir Humphrey Gilbert to prove the existence of a passage by the northwest to Cathay and the East Indies in ten chapters, was much discussed, and the Elizabethan seamen were still bent on its discovery. When I gave myself to the study of geography, said Sir Humphrey, and came to the fourth part of the world, commonly called America, which by all descriptions I found to be an island, environed brown by sea, having on the south side of it the Strait of Magellan, on the west side the Sea of the South, which sea runneth towards the north, 
separating it from the east parts of Asia, and on the north side the sea that severs it from Greenland, through which northern seas the passage lies, which I take now in hand to discover. The arguments of Sir Humphrey seemed conclusive, and in 1585 they chose John Davis, a man well grounded in the principles of the art of navigation, to search for the north-west passage to China. They gave him two little ships, the Sunshine of fifty tons, with a crew of seventeen seamen, four musicians and a boy, and the Moonshine of thirty-five tons. It was a daring venture, but the expedition was ill-equipped to battle with the ice-bound seas of the frozen north. The ships left Dorsmouth of the 7th June, and by July they were well out on the Atlantic, with porpoises and whales playing around them. Then came a time of fog and mist, with a mighty great roaring of the sea. On 20th July they sailed out of the fog, and beheld the snow-covered mountains of Greenland, beyond a wide stream of pack ice, so gloomy, so waste and void of any creatures, so bleak and inhospitable, that the Englishmen named it the land of desolation, and passed on to the north. Rounding the point, after rights named by Davis Cape Farewell, and sailing by the western coast of Greenland, they hoped to find the passage to Cathay. Landing amid the fjords and the green and pleasant isles about the coast, they anchored a while to refresh, and named their bay Jobert Sound after Sir Humphrey and Davis' own little boy, Gilbert, left at home. The people of the country, says Davis, having espied our ships, came down unto us in their canoes, holding up their right hand towards the sun. We doing the like, the people came aboard our ships, men of good stature, unbearded, small-eyed, and of tractable conditions. We bowed the clothes from their backs, which were all made of seal-skins and bird-skins, their buskins, their hose, their gloves, all being commonly sued and well-dressed. These simple Greenlanders, who worshipped the sun, gave Davis to understand that there was a great and open sea to the northwest, and full of hope he sailed on. But he soon abandoned the search, for the season was advancing, and crossing the open sea he entered the broad channel, named after him Davis Strait, crossed the Arctic Circle, and anchored under a promontory, the cliffs whereof were orient as gold, naming it Mount Raleigh. Here they found four white bears, of a monstrous bigness, which they took to be goats or wolves, till on nearer acquaintance they were discovered to be great polar bears. There were no signs of human life, no wood, no grass, no earth, nothing but rock, so they coasted southward, and to their joy they found an open strait to the west free from ice. Eagerly they sailed the little moonshine and sunshine on the opening, which they called Cumberland Sound, till thick fogs and adverse winds drove them back. Winter was now advancing, the six months' provisions were ended, and satisfied with having found an open passage westward, Davis sailed home in triumph to fit out another expedition as soon as spring came round. His news was received with delight. The northwest passage is a matter nothing doubtful, he affirmed, but at any time almost to be passed, the sea navigable, void of ice, the air tolerable, and the waters very deep. With this certainty of success, the merchants readily fitted out another expedition, and Davis sailed, early in May 1586, with four ships. The little moonshine and sunshine were included in the new fleet, but Davis himself commanded the mermaid of one hundred and twenty tons. The middle of June found him on the west coast of Greenland, battling his way with great blocks of ice to his old quarters at Gilbert Sound. What a warm welcome they received from their old Eskimo friends! They rowed to the boat and took hold on the oars and hung about, with such comfortable joy as would require a long discourse to be uttered. Followed by a wandering crowd of natives eager to help him up and down the rocks, Davis made his way inland to find an inviting country, with earth and grass such as our moory and waste grounds of England are. He found, too, mosses and wild flowers in the sheltered places. 
but his business lay in the icy waters, and he boldly pushed forward. But ice and snow and fog made further progress impossible. Shrouds, ropes, and sails were turned into frozen mass, and the crew was filled with despair. Our men began to grow sick and feeble and hopeless of good success, and they advised me that in conscience I ought to regard the safety of mine own life with the preservation of theirs, and that I should not through my overboldness leave their widows and fatherless children to give me bitter curses. So Davis rearranged his crews and provisions, and with the moonshine and the selection of his best men, he determined to voyage on, as God should direct him, while the mermaid should carry the sick and feeble and fine-hearted home. Davis then crossed over the strait, called by his name, and explored the coast about Cumberland Sound. Again he tried her to discover the long-sought passage, but the brief summer season was almost past, and he had to content himself with exploring the shores of Labrador, unconsciously following the track made by John Cabot eighty-nine years before. But on his return home, the merchants of London were disappointed. Davis had indeed explored an immense extent of coastline, and he had brought back a cargo of codfish and five hundred sealskins, but Cassie seemed as far off as ever. One merchant prince, Sanderson by name, was still very keen, and he helped Davis to fit out yet another expedition. With three ships, the Sunshine, the Elizabeth, and the Helen, the undaunted Arctic explorer now found himself for the third summer in succession at his old halting place, Gilbert Sound, on the west coast of Greenland. Leaving his somewhat discontented crews to go fishing of the coast of Labrador, he took the little twenty-ton pinnace, with a small party of brave spirits like his own, and made his way northwards in a free and open sea. The weather was hot, land was visible on both sides, and the English mariners were under the impression that they were sailing up a gulf. But the passage grew wider and wider, till Davis found himself with the sea all open to the west and north. He had crossed the Arctic Circle, and reached the most northerly point ever yet reached by an explorer. Seeing on his right a lofty cliff, he named it Sanderson his hope, for it seemed to give hope of the long-sought passage to Cathay. It was a memorable day in the Annals of Discovery, 13th June, 1587, when Davis reached this famous point on the coast of Greenland. A bright blue sea extended to the horizon on the north and west, obstructed by no ice, but here and there a few majestic icebergs with peaks snowy shooting up into the sky. To the eastward were the granite mountains of Greenland, and beyond them the white line of the mightiest glacier in the world. Rising immediately above the tiny vessel was the beetling wall of Hope Sanderson, with its summit eight hundred and fifty feet above sea level. At its base the sea was a sheet of foam and spray. It must have been a scene like fairyland, for, as Davis remarked, there was no ice towards the north, but the great sea, free, large, very salt and blue, and of an unsearchable depth. But again disappointment awaited him. That night a wind from the north barred further advance as a mighty bank of ice, some eight feet thick, came drifting down towards the Atlantic. Again and again he attempted to get on, but it was impossible, and reluctantly enough he turned the little ship southwards. This Davis has been three times employed. Why has he not found the passage, said the folk at home, when he returned and reported his doings? How little they realized the difficulties of the way. The commander of the twenty-ton Ellen had done more than any man had done before him in the way of Arctic exploration. He had discovered 732 miles of coast, from Cape Farewell to Sanderson's Hope. He had examined the whole coast of Labrador. He had converted the Arctic regions from a confused myth into a defined area. He lighted Baffin into his bay. He lighted Hudson into his strait. He lighted Hans Ejid to the scene of his Greenland labor. And more than this, says his enthusiastic biographer, 
his true-hearted devotion to the cause of Arctic discovery, his patient scientific research, his loyalty to his employers, his dauntless gallantry and enthusiasm, form an example, which will be a beacon light to maritime explorers for all time to come. And Davis three times forth, for the northwest made, still striving by that course to enrich the English trade, and as he well deserved to his eternal fame, there by a mighty sea immortalized his name. End of chapter 35「The English search for Cathy came to an end for the present. But the merchant of Amsterdam took up the search, and in 1594 they fitted out an expedition under William Barents, a burgher of Amsterdam and a practical seaman of much experience. The three voyages of Barents form some of the most romantic reading in the history of geographical discovery, and the preface to the old book compiled for the Dutch after the death of Barents sums up in pathetic language the tragic story of the three voyages, so strange and wonderful, that the like has never been heard of before. They were done and performed three years, says the old preface, one after the other, by the ships of Holland, on the north sides of Norway, Moscovy, and Tartary, towards the kingdoms of Cathay and China, showing discoveries of the country lying under eighty degrees, which is thought to be Greenland, where never any man had been before, with the cruel bears and other monsters of the sea, and the unsupportable and extreme cold that is found to be in these places. And how that in the last voyage the ship was enclosed by the ice, that it was left there, whereby the men were forced to build a house in the cold and desert country of Nova Zembla, wherein they continued ten months together, and never saw nor heard of any man, in most great cold and extreme misery, and how after that, to save their lives, they were constrained to sail about one thousand miles in little open boats, along and over the main seas, in most great danger, and with extreme labor, unspeakable troubles and great hunger. Surely no more graphic summary of disaster has ever appeared than these words penned three hundred and fourteen years ago which cry to us down the long, intervening ages of privation and suffering endured in the cause of science. In the year 1594, then, four ships were sent forth from Amsterdam, with orders to the wise and skilful pilot, William Barons, that he was to sail into the North Seas and discover the kingdoms of Cathay and China. In the months of July, the Dutch pilot found himself off the south coast of Nova Zemla, whence he sailed as the wind pleased to take him, ever making for the north and hugging the coast as close as possible. On 9th July they found a creek, very far north, to which they gave the name of Beer Creek, because here they suddenly discovered their first polar beer, to which they gave the name of Bear Creek, because here they suddenly discovered their first polar bear. It tried to get into their boat, so they shot it with a musket, but the bear showed most wonderful strength, for, notwithstanding that she was shot into the body, yet she leapt up and swam in the water. The men that were in the boat rowing after her cast a rope above her neck and drew her at the stern of the boat, for, not having seen the like bear before, they sought to have carried her alive in the ship, and to have showed her for a strange wonder in Holland. But she used such force that they were glad they were rid of her, and contented themselves with her skin only. This they brought back to Amsterdam in great triumph, their first white polar bear. But they went farther north than this, until they came to a plain field of ice, 
and encountered very misty weather. Still they kept sailing on, as best they might, round about the ice, till they found the land of Nova Zemlia was covered with snow. From Ice Point they made their way to islands, which they named Orange Islands, after the Dutch prince. Here they found two hundred walrus, or seahorses, lying on the shore and basking in the sun. The seahorse is a wonderful strong monster of the sea. They brought back word much bigger than an ox, having a skin like a seal, with very short hair, mouth like a lion. It has four feet, but no ears. The little party of Dutchmen advanced boldly with hatchets and pikes to kill a few of these monsters to take home, but it was harder work than they thought. The wind suddenly rose, too, and rent the ice into great pieces, so they had to content themselves by getting a few of their ivory teeth which they reported to be half an ell long. With these and other treasures, Barons was now forced to return from these high latitudes, and he sailed safely into the Texel after three and a half months' absence. His reports of Nova Zembla encouraged the merchants of Amsterdam to persevere in their search for the kingdoms of Cassie and China by the northeast, and the second expedition was fitted out under Barons the following year but it started too late to accomplish much, and we must turn to the third expedition, for the discovery which has forever made famous the name of William Barons. It was yet early in the May of 1596 when he sailed from Amsterdam with two ships for the third and last time, bound once more for the frozen northern seas. By 1st of June he had reached a region where there was no night, and a few days later a strange sight startled the whole crew, for on each side of the sun there was another sun and two rainbows more, the one come passing round about the suns, and the other right through the great circle, and they found they were under seventy-one degrees of the height of the pole. Sighting the north cape of Lapland, they held on the northwesterly course, till on ninth June they came upon a little island which they named Bear Island. Here they nearly met their end, for having ascended a steep snow mountain on the island to look around them, they found it too slippery to descend. We thought we should all have broken our necks, it was so slippery, but we sat up on the snow and slid down, which was very dangerous for us, and break both our arms and legs, for that at the foot of the hill there were many rocks. Barnes himself seems to have sat in the boat and watched them with intense anxiety. They were once more amid ice and polar bears. In hazy weather they made their way north, till on the 19th they saw land, and the land was very great. They thought it was Greenland, but it was really Spitsbergen, of which he was thus the discoverer. Many things astonished the navigators here. Although they were in such high latitudes, they saw grass and leafy trees and such animals as bucks and hearts, while several degrees to the south there groweth neither leaves nor grass, nor any beasts that eat grass or leaves, but only such beasts as eat flesh as bears and foxes. By 1st July he had explored the western shore and was sailing south to Bear Island. He never landed in the coast of Spitsbergen, so we have no further account of this Arctic discovery. Sailing across the wide northern sea, now known as Barents Sea, he made land again in the north of Nova Zemlia, and hugging the western shore came to Ice Point. Here they were sorely harassed by polar bears and floating ice and bitter gales of wind. Still they coasted on till they had rounded the northern end of Nova Zemlia, and unexpectedly sailed into a good harbor where they could anchor. The wind now blew with redoubled vigor. The ice came mightily driving in, until the little ship was nearly surrounded, and with all the wind began more and more to rise, and the ice still drave harder and harder, so that our boat was broken in pieces between the ship and the ice, and it seemed as if the ship would be crushed in pieces too. As the August days passed on, they tried to get out of their prison, but it was impossible, and there was nothing for it but to winter in great cold, poverty, misery, and grief, in this bleak and barren spot. The successful pilot was to explore no more, but the rest of the tragic tale must be shortly told. 
with the ice heaping high, as the salt hills there are in Spain, and the ship in danger of going to pieces, they collected trees and roots driven on to the desolate shores from Tartary, wherewith, as if God had purposely sent them unto us, we were much comforted. Through the September days they drew wood across the ice and snow to build a house for the winter. Only sixteen men could work, and they were none too strong and well. Throughout October and November they were snowed up in their winter hut, with fall stormy weather outside, the wind blowing ceaselessly out of the north and snow lying deep around. They trapped a few foxes from day to day to eat, making warm caps out of their fur. They heated stones and took them into their cabin beds, but their sheets froze as they washed them, and at last their clock froze too. They looked pitifully upon one another, being in great fear that if the extremity of the cold grew to be more and more, we should all die there with the cold. Christmas came and went, and they comforted one another by remembering that the sun was as low as it could go, and that it must begin to come to them again. But as the day lengthens, so the cold strengthens, and the snow now lay deeper until it covered the roof of their house. The new year found them still imprisoned with great cold, danger, and disease. January, February, March, April passed, and still the little ship was stuck fast in the ice. But as the sun began to gain power, hope revived, and they began to repair their boats, to make new sails, and repair tackle. They were too weak and ill to do much work, but by the middle of June the boats were fairly ready, and they could cut away through the ice to the open sea. This was their only hope of escape, to leave the ship behind, and embark in two little open boats for the open sea. Then William Barons wrote a letter, which he put into a musket's charge, and hanged it up in the chimney, showing how we came out of Holland to sail to the kingdom of China, and how we had been forced in our extremity to make that house, and had dwelt ten months therein, and how we were forced to put to sea in two small open boats, for that the ship lay fast in the ice. Barons himself was now too ill to walk, so they carried him to one of the little boats, and on 14th June, 1597, the little party put off from their winter quarters and sailed round to Ice Point. But the pilot was dying. Are we about Ice Point? he asked feebly. If we be, then I pray you lift me up, for I must view it once again. Then suddenly the wind began to rise, driving the ice so fast upon them, that it made our hair stand upright upon our heads. It was so fearful to behold, so that we thought verily that it was a foreshadowing of our last end. They drew the boats up onto the ice, and lifted the sick commander out, and laid him on the icy ground, where a few days later he died. Our chief guide, and only pilot on whom we reposed, ourselves, next under God. The rest of the story is soon told. On 1st November, 1597, some twelve gowned and haggard men, still wearing caps of white fox and coats of bearskin, having guided their little open boats all the way from Nova Zemlia, arrived at Amsterdam and told the story of their exploration to the astonished merchants, who had long since given them up as dead. It was not till 1871 that Barron's old winter quarters on Nova Zemlia were discovered, there stood the cooking pans over the fireplace, the old clocks against the wall, the arms, stools, the drinking vessels, the instruments and the books that had beguiled the weary hours of that long night, two hundred and seventy-eight years ago. Among the relics were a pair of small shoes and a flute, which had belonged to a little cabin boy who had died during the winter. End of chapter 36 Chapter thirty seven of a Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. 
Chapter Thirty Seven. Hudson finds his bay. Henry Hudson was another victim to perish in the hopeless search for a passage to China by the North. John Davis had been dead two years, but not till after he had piloted the first expedition undertaken by the newly formed East India Company for commerce with India and the East. It was no more important than ever to find a short way to these countries, other than rounds by the Cape of Good Hope. So Henry Hudson was employed by the Muscovy Company to discover a shorter route to Cathay by sailing over the North Pole. He knew the hardships of the way. He must have realized the fate of Willoughby, the failure of Robisher, the sufferings of Barons and his men, the difficulties of Davis. Indeed, it is more than probable that he had listened to Davis speaking on the subject of Arctic exploration to the merchants of London at his uncle's house at Mortlake. Never did man start on a bolder or more perilous enterprise than did this man when he started for the North Pole in a little boat of eighty tons, with his little son Jack, two mates, and a crew of eight men. Led by Hudson, with the fire of a great face in his eyes, the men solemnly marched to St. Ethelburg Church of Bishopsgate Street, London, to partake of Holy Communion and ask God's aid. Back to the muddy water found, opposite the tower, a hearty God speed from the gentlemen of the Moscovy Company, pompous in self-importance and lace ruffles, and the little crew steps into a clumsy river-boat with brick-red sails. After a six-week stumble over a waste of waters, Hudson arrived off the coast of Greenland, the decks of little Hopewell coated with ice, her rigging and sails hard as boards, and a northeast gale of wind and snow against her. A barrier of ice forbade further advance, but sailing along the edge of this barrier, the first navigator to do so, he made for the coast of Spitsbergen, already roughly charted by Barents. Tacking up the west coast by the north, Hudson now explored further the fjords, islands, and harbors, naming some of them, notably Whale Bay and Haklut Headland, which may be seen on our maps of today. By 13th July he had reached his farthest north, farther than any explorer had been before him, farther than any to be reached again for over 150 years. It was a land of walrus, seal, and, and polar bear, but as usual ice shut off all further attempts to penetrate the mysteries of the pole. Thick fog hung around the little ship, and with a fair wind Hudson turned southward. It pleased God to give us a gale and away we steered, says the old ship log. Hudson would fain have steered Greenland way, and had another try for the north. But his men wanted to go home, and home they went, through slubby weather. But the voice of the north was still calling Hudson, and he persuaded the Muscovy Company to let him go off again. This he did in the following year. Only three of his former crew volunteered for service, and one of these was his son. But this expedition was devoid of result. The icy seas about Nova Zemda gave no hope of a passage in this direction, and being void of hope, the wind stormy and against us, much ice driving, we weighed and sent sail westward. Hudson's voyages for the Muscovy Company had already come under the notice of the Dutch, who were vying with the English for the discovery of this short route to the east. Hudson was now invited to undertake an expedition for the Dutch East India Company, and he sailed from Amsterdam in the early spring of 1809, in a Dutch ship called the Half Moon, with a mixed crew of Dutch and English, including once more his own son. Summer found the enthusiastic explorer of the coast of Newfoundland, where some cod fishing refreshed the crews before they sailed on south, partly seeking an opening to the west, partly looking for the colony of Virginia under Hudson's friend Captain John Smith. In hot, misty weather, they cruised along the coast. They passed what is now Massachusetts, an Indian country of great hills, a very sweet land. On 7th August, Hudson was near the modern town of New York, so long known as New Amsterdam. But midst hid the low-lying hills, and the half-moon drifted on to James River, 
then driven back by a heat hurricane, he made for the inlet on the old charts, which might lead yet east. It was 2nd September when he came to the great mouth of the river that now bears his name. He had been beating about all day in gales and fogs, when the sun arose and we saw the land all like broken islands. From the land which we had first sight of, we came to a large lake of water like drowned land, which made it to rise like islands. The mouth has many shores, and the sea breaketh on them. This is a very good land to fall in with, and a pleasant land to see. At three of the clock in the afternoon we came to three great rivers. We found a very good harbor, and went in with our ship. Then we took our nets to fish, and caught ten great mullets of a foot, and a half long each, and a ray as great as four men could haul into the ship. The people of the country came aboard of us, seeming very glad of our coming, and brought green tobacco. They go in deer skins, well dressed. They desire clothes, and are very civil. They have great store of maize, whereof they make good bread. The country is full of great and tall oaks. To this he adds that the women had red copper tobacco pipes, many of them being dressed in mantles of feathers or furs, but the natives proved treacherous. Sailing up the river, Hudson found it a mile broad, with high land of both sides. By the night of 19th September, the little half-moon had reached the spot where the river widens near the modern town of Albany. He had sailed for the first time, the distance covered today by magnificent steamers, which ply daily between Albany and New York City. Hudson now went ashore with an old chief of the country. Two men were dispatched in quest of game, so records Hudson's manuscript, who brought in a pair of pigeons. They likewise killed a fat dog, and skinned it with great haste with shells. The land is the finest for cultivation that ever I in my life set foot upon. Hudson had not found a way to China, but he had found the great and important river that now bears his name. Yet he was to do greater things than these, and to lose his life in the doing. The following year, 1610, found him once more bound for the north, continuing the endless search for a northwest passage, this time for the English and not for the Dutch. On board the little discovery of fifty-five tons, with his young son Jack, still his faithful companion, with a treacherous old man as a mate, who had accompanied him before, with a good-for-nothing young spendthrift, taken at the last moment, because he wrote a good hand, and a mixed crew, Hudson crossed the wide Atlantic for the last time. He sailed by way of Iceland, their fresh fish and dainty fowl, batridges, curly, plover, teal, and goose, much refreshed, the already discontented crews, and the hot baths of Iceland delighted them. The men wanted to return to the pleasant land discovered in the last expedition, but the mysteries of the frozen north still called the old explorer, and he steered for Greenland. He was soon battling with ice upon the southern end of desolation, whence he crossed the snowy shores of Labrador, sailing into the great straits that bear his name today. For three months he sailed aimlessly about that labyrinth without end, as it was called by Abacuc Prickett, who wrote the account of this fourth and last voyage of Henry Hudson. But they could find no opening to the west, no way of escape. Winter was coming on, the nights were long and cold, and the earth was covered with snow. They were several hundred miles south of the Straits, and no way had been found to the Pacific. They had followed the south shore to the westernmost bay of all, James Bay, but lo, there was no South Sea. Hudson recognized the fact that he was land-bound and winter-bound in a desolate region with a discontented crew, and that the discontent was amounting to mutiny. On 1st of November they called up the ship and selected a wintering place. Ten days later they were frozen in, and snow was falling continuously every day. We were victualled for six months, and of that which was good, runs the record. For the first three months they shot partridges as white as milk, but these left with the advent of spring, and hunger seized on the handful of Englishmen, wintering in this unknown land. Then we went into the woods, hills, and valleys, 
and the moth and the frog were not spared. Not till the month of May did the ice begin to melt, and the men could fish. The first day this was possible they caught five hundred fish, as big as good herrings and some trout, which revived their hopes and their health. Hudson made a last despairing effort to find a westward passage. But now the men rose in mutiny. We would rather be hanged at home than starved abroad, they cried miserably. So Hudson fitted all things for his return, and first delivered all the bread out of the bread-room, which came to a pound apiece for every man's share, and he wept when he gave it unto them. It was barely sufficient for fourteen days, and even with the fourscore small fish they had caught, it was a poor relief for so many hungry bellies. With a fair wind in the month of June, the little discovery was headed for home. A few days later she was stopped by ice. Mutiny now burst forth. The master and his men had lost confidence in each other. There were ruffians on board, rendered almost wild by hunger and privation. There is nothing more tragic in the history of exploration than the desertion of Henry Hudson and his boy in their newly discovered bay. Every detail of the conspiracy is given by Prickett. We know how the rumor spread, how the crew resolved to turn the master and the sick men adrift, and to share the remaining provisions among themselves, and how in the early morning Hudson was seized and his arms bound behind him. What does this mean? he cried. You will know soon enough when you are in the shallop, they replied. The boat was lowered, and into it Hudson was put with his son, while the poor, sick, and lame men were called upon to get them out of their cabins into the shallop. Then the mutineers lowered some powder and shot, some pikes and iron pot, and some meal into her, and the little boat was soon adrift, with her living freight of suffering, starving men, adrift in that ice-bound sea, far from home and friends and all human help. At the last moment the carpenter sprang into the drifting boat, resolved to die with the captain sooner than desert him. Then the discovery flew away with all sail up as from an enemy. And the master perished, how and when we knew not. Fortunately the mutineers took home Hudson's journals and charts. Ships were sent out to search for the lost explorer, but the silence has never been broken since that summer's day, three hundred years ago, when he was deserted in the waters of his own bay. End of chapter 37「Chapter 38 of A Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 38 Buffin Finds His Bay Two years only after the tragedy of Henry Hudson, another Arctic explorer appears upon the scene. William Buffin was already an experienced seaman in the prime of life. He had made four voyages to the icy north, when he was called on by the new company of merchants of London, discoverers of the Northwest Passage, formed in 1612, to prepare for another voyage of discovery. Distressed beyond measure at the desertion of Henry Hudson, the Muscovy Company had dispatched Sir Thomas Button with our old friend Abacook Prickett to show him the way. Button had reached the western side of Hudson's Bay, and after wintering there, returned fully convinced that a northwest passage existed in this direction. Buffin returned from an expedition to Greenland the same year. The fjords and islets of West Greenland, the ice flows and glaciers of Spitsbergen, the tidal phenomena of Hudson Strait, and the geographical secrets of the far northern bay were all familiar to him. He was, therefore, chosen as mate and associate to Bylot, one of the men who had deserted Hudson, but who had sailed three times with him previously, and knew well the western seas. So in the good ship called the Discovery, of fifty-five tons, with a crew of fourteen men and two boys, William Baffin sailed for the northern seas. May found the expedition on the coast of Greenland, with a gale of wind and great islands of ice. However, Baffin crossed Davis Strait, 
and after a struggle with ice at the entrance to Hudson Strait, he sailed along the northern side till he reached a group of islands which he named Savage Islands. For here were Eskimos again, very shy and fearful of the white strangers. Among their tents, relates Baffin, all covered with seal skins, were running up and down about forty dogs, most of them muzzled, about the bigness of our mongrel mastiffs, being a brindled black color, looking almost like wolves. These dogs they used instead of horses, or rather as the laps do their deer, to draw their sledges from place to place over the ice, their sledges being shod or lined with bones of great fishes, to keep them from wearing out, and the dogs have furniture and colors very fitting. The explorers went on bravely, till they were stopped by masses of ice. They thought they must be at the mouth of a large bay, and seeing no prospect of a passage to the west, they turned back. When two hundred years later, Perry sailed in Baffin's track, he named this place Baffinland, out of respect to the memory of that able and enterprising navigator. The discovery arrived in Plymouth Sound by September, without the loss of one man, a great achievement in these days of salt junk and scurvy. And now it may be, adds Baffin, that some expect I should give my opinion concerning the passage. To these my answer must be that, doubtless, there is a passage. But within this strait, which is called Hudson Strait, I am doubtful, supposing to the contrary. Buffin further suggested that if there was a passage, it must now be sought by Davis Strait. Accordingly, another expedition was fitted out, and Buffin had his instructions. For your course, you must make all possible haste to Cape Desolation, and from hence you, William Buffin, as pilot, keep along the coast of Greenland and up Davis Strait, until you come toward the height of eighty degrees, if the land will give you leave. Then shape your course west and southerly, so far as you shall think it convenient, till you come to the latitude of sixty degrees. Then direct your course to fall in with the land of Yezo, leaving your further sailing southward to your own discretion. Although our desires be, if your voyage prove so prosperous, that you may have the year before you, that you go far south, as that you may touch the north part of Japan, from whence we would have you bring home one of the men of the country. And so, God blessing you, with all expedition to make your return home again. The discovery had proved a good little ship for exploration, so she was again selected by Baffin for this new attempt in the far north. Upon 26th March, 1616, he sailed from Gravesend, arriving off the coast of Greenland, in the neighborhood of Gilbert Sound, about the middle of May. Working against terrible winds, they plied to the northward, the old ship making but slow progress, till at last they sighted Sanderson his hope, the farthest point of Master Davis. Once more English voices broke the silence of thirty years. The people who appeared on the shore were wretchedly poor. They lived on seal's flesh, which they ate raw, and clothed themselves in the skins. Still northward they sailed, cruising along the western coast. Though the ice was beginning to disappear, the weather kept bitterly cold, and on midsummer day the sails and ropes were frozen too hard to be handled. Stormy weather now forced them into a sound, which they named Whale Sound, from the number of whales they discovered here. It was declared by Buffin to be the greatest and largest bay in these parts. But beyond this they could not go, so they sailed across the end of what we now know as Baffin's Bay, and explored the opposite coast of America, naming one of the greater openings Lancaster Sound, after Sir James Lancaster of East India Company fame. Here, says Baffin pitifully, our hope of passage began to grow less every day. It was the old story of ice, advancing season, and hasty conclusions. There is no hope of passage to the north of Davis Straits, the explorer further asserts, but he asserts wrongly, for Lancaster Sound was to prove an open channel to the west. So he returned home. He had not found the passage, but he had discovered the great northern sea that now bears his name. The size of it was for long plunged in obscurity, 
and the wildest ideas centered round the extent of this northern sea. A map of 1706 gives it an indefinite amount of space, adding vaguely, some will have Baffin's Bay to run as far as this faint shadow, while a map of 1818 marks the bay, but adds that it is not now believed. For the next two hundred years, the ice-bound regions of the north were practically left free from invasion, silent, inhospitable, unapproachable. But while these Arctic explorers were busy battling with the northern seas to find a passage which should lead them to the wealth of the east, others were exploring the new world and endeavoring by land and river to attain the same end. End of chapter 38「Chapter thirty nine of a Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter thirty nine. Sir Walter Raleigh searches for El Dorado. It is pleasant to turn from the icy regions of North America to the sunny south and to follow the fortunes of that fine Elizabethan gentleman, Sir Walter Raleigh, to the large, rich, and beautiful empire of Guiana, and the great and golden city of Manaoa, which the Spaniards call El Dorado. Even since the conquest of Peru, sixty years before, they had floated about rumors of a great kingdom abounding in gold. The king of this golden land was sprinkled daily with gold dust, till he shone as the sun, while Manoa was full of golden houses and golden temples with golden furniture. The kingdom was wealthier than Peru, it was richer than Mexico. Expedition after expedition had left Spain in search of this El Dorado, but the region was still plunged in romantic mists. Raleigh had just failed to establish an English colony in Virginia. To gain a rich kingdom for his queen— to extend her power and to enrich her treasury was now his greatest object in life. What about El Dorado? Oh, unwearied feet, travelling you know not whither, soon, soon, it seems to you, you must come forth on some conspicuous hilltop, and but a little way further, against the setting sun, to cry the spires of El Dorado. February 1595 found him ready and leaving England with five ships and after a good passage of forty-six days, landing on the island of Trinidad, and thence making his way to the mouth of the Orinoco. Here Raleigh soon found that it was impossible to enter the Orinoco with his English ships, but nothing daunted, he took a hundred men and provisions for a month, in three little open boats, and started forward to navigate this most difficult labyrinth of channels, out of which, they were guided by an old Indian pilot named Ferdinando. They had much to observe. The natives living along the river banks dwelt in houses all the summer, but in the winter months they constructed small huts to which they ascended by means of ladders. These folk were cannibals, but cannibals of a refined sort, who beat the bones of their lords into powder and mixed the powder with their drinks. The stream was very strong and rapid, and the men rode against it in great discomfort. The weather being extreme hot, the river bordered with very high trees that kept away the air, and the current against us every day stronger than the other, until they became, as Roulet tells us, wearied and scorched and doubtful. The heat increased as they advanced, and the crews grew weaker as the river ran more violently against them. But Roulet refused to return yet, lest the world would laugh us to scorn. Fortunately, delicious fruits hung over the banks of the Orinoco, and having no bread and for water only the sick and troubled water of the river, they refreshed themselves gladly. So they rode on up the great river, through province after province of the Indians, but no El Dorado appeared. Suddenly the scene changed as if by magic, the high banks giving way to low-lying plains, Green grass glued close to the water's edge, and deer came down to feed. I never saw a more beautiful country, says Raleigh, 
nor more lively prospects, hills raised here and there over the valleys, the river winding into different branches, plains without bush or stubble, all fair green grass, deer crossing our path, the birds towards evening singing on every tree with a thousand several tunes, herons of white, crimson, and carnation perching on the riverside, the air fresh with a gentle wind, and every stone we stooped to pick up promised either gold or silver. His account of the great cataract at the junction of the tributary Caroni is very graphic. They had already heard the roar, so they ran to the tops of some neighboring hills, discovering the wonderful breach of waters, which ran down Caroli, and from that mountain sees the river, how it ran in three parts, about twenty miles off, and there appeared some ten or twelve overfalls in sight, every one as high over the other as a church tower, which fell with that fury that the rebound of waters made it seem as if it had been all covered over with a great shower of rain, and in some places we took it at the first for a smoke that had risen over some great town. The country was the province of Guiana, but it was not El Dorado, the object of their quest, and though it was very beautiful, it was inhabited by cannibals. Moreover, winter was advancing, and they were already some four hundred miles from their ships, in little open boats, and in the heart of a strange country. Suddenly, too, the river began to rise, to rage and overflow very fearfully. Rain came down in torrents, accompanied by great gusts of wind, and the crews with no change of clothes got wet through, sometimes ten times a day. Whosoever had seen the fury of that river after it began to rise would perchance have turned his back somewhat sooner than we did if all the mountains had been gold or precious stones, remarked Raleigh, who indeed was no coward. So they turned the boats for home, and at a tremendous rate they spun down the stream, sometimes doing as much as one hundred miles a day, till after sundry adventures they safely reached their ships at anchor off Trinidad. Raleigh had not reached the golden city of Manoa, but he gave a very glowing account of this country to his queen. Guiana, he tells her, is a country that has yet her maidenhood. The face of the earth has not been torn. The graves have not been opened for gold. It has never been entered by any army of strength, and never conquered by any Christian prince. Men shall find here more rich and beautiful cities, more temples adorned with gold than either Cortes found in Mexico or Pizarro in Peru, and the shining glory of this conquest will eclipse all those of the Spanish nation. But Rolet had brought back no gold, and his schemes for a conquest of Guiana were received coldly by the queen. She could not share his enthusiasm for the land. Where Orinoco, in his pride, rose to the main no tribute tied, but gains broad ocean wages for, a rival sea of roaring war, while in ten thousand eddies driven, the billows ring their foam to heaven, and the pale pilot seeks in vain, where rolls the river, where the main. But besides the Orinoco in South America, there was the St. Lawrence in North America, still very imperfectly known. Since Jacques Cartier had penetrated the hitherto undisturbed regions lying about the river of Canada, little had been explored farther west, till Samuel Champlain, one of the most remarkable men of his day, comes upon the scene, and was still discovering land to the west, when Rollet was making his second expedition to Guiana in the year 1617. End of chapter 39「Chapter 40 of A Book of Discovery」this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 40 Champlain Discovers Lake Ontario To discover a passage westward was still the main object of those who made their way up the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. This, too, was the object of Samuel Champlain, known as the father of New France, when he arrived with orders from France to establish an industrial colony, which should hold for that country the gateway of the Golden East. 
he had already ascended the river Saguene, a tributary of the St. Lawrence, till stopped by rapids and rocks, and the natives had told him of a great salt sea to the north, which was Hudson's Bay, discovered some seven years later, in 1610. He now made his way to a spot called by the natives Quebec, a word meaning the strait or narrows, this being the narrowest place in the whole magnificent waterway. He had long been searching for a suitable site for settlement, but I could find none more convenient, he says, or better situated than the point of Quebec, so called by the savages, which was covered with nut trees. Accordingly here, close to the present Champlain market, arose the nucleus of the city of Quebec, the great warehouse of New France. Having passed the winter of 1608 at Quebec, the passion of exploration still on him, in a little two-masted boat, piloted by Indians, he went up the St. Lawrence, towards Cartier's Montreal. From out the thick forest land that lined its banks, Indians discovered the steel-clad strangers, and gazed at them from the river banks in speechless wonder. The river soon became alive with Indian canoes, but the Frenchmen made their way to the mouth of the Richelieu River, where they encamped for a couple of days hunting and fishing. Then Champlain sailed on, his little two-masted boat outstripping the native canoes, till the unwelcome sound of rapids fell on the silent air, and through the dark foliage of the islet of St. John he could see the gleam of snowy foam and the flush of hurrying waters. The Indians had assured him that his boat could pass unobstructed through the whole journey. It afflicted me and troubled me exceedingly, he tell us, to be obliged to return without having seen so great a lake, full of fair islands, and bordered with the fine countries which they had described to me. He could not bear to give up the exploration into the heart of the land, and visited by white men. So sending back his party, accompanied only by two Frenchmen, as brave as himself, he stepped into an Indian canoe to be carried round the rapids, and so continue his perilous journey, perilous indeed, for bands of hostile natives lurked in the primeval forests that closed the river banks in dense masses. As they advanced the river widened out, the Indian canoes carried them safely over the broad stream shimmering in the summer sun, till they came to a great silent lake over one hundred miles long, hitherto unexplored. The beauty of the new country is described with enthusiasm by the delighted explorer, but they were now in the Mohawk country, and progress was fraught with danger. They traveled only by night, and lay hidden by day in the depths of the forest, till they had reached the far end of the lake, named Lake Champlain, after the discoverer. They were near the rocky promontory, where Fort Ticonderoga was afterwards built. When they met a party of Iroquois, war cries pealed across the waters of the lake, and by daybreak battle could be no longer averted. Champlain and his two companions, in doublet and hose, buckled on their breastplates, cuisses of steel and plumed helmets, and with sword and arquebus advanced. Their firearms won the day, but all hope of further advance was at an end, and Champlain returned to Quebec with his great story of new lands to the south. It was not till the spring of 1611 that he was again free to start on another exploring expedition into the heart of Canada. His journey to the rapids of the St. Louis has been well described. Like specks on the broad bosom of the waters, two pygmy vessels held their course up the lonely St. Lawrence. They passed abandoned Tadoussac, the channel of Orleans, the tenantless rock of Quebec, the wide lake of St. Peter, with its crowded archipelago, and the forest plain of Montreal. All was solitude. Hochelaga had vanished, and of the savage population that Cartier had found sixty-eight years before, no trace remained. In a skiff with a few Indians, Champlain tried to pass the rapids of St. Louis, but oars, paddles, and poles alike proved vain against the foaming surges, and he was forced to return, but not till the Indians had drawn for him rude plans of the river above, with its chain of rapids and its lakes and its cataracts. They were quite impassable, said the natives, though indeed to these white strangers everything seemed possible. 
These white men must have fallen from the clouds, they said. How else could they have reached us through the woods and rapids, which even we find it hard to pass? Champlain wanted to get to the upper waters of the Ottawa River, to the land of the cannibal Nipissings, who dealt on the lake that bears their name, but they were enemies, and the natives refused to advance into their country. Two years later he accomplished his desire, and found himself at last in the land of the Nipissings. He crossed their lake and steered his canoes down the French river. Days passed, and no signs of human life appeared amid the rocky desolation, till suddenly three hundred savages, tattooed, painted, and armed, rushed out on them. Fortunately they were friendly, and it was from them that Champlain learned the good news that the great fresh water lake of the Hurons was close at hand. What if the friar Le Caron, one of Champlain's party, had preceded him by a few days? Champlain was the first white man to give an account of it, if not the first to sail on its beautiful waters. For over one hundred miles he made his way along its eastern shores, until he reached a broad opening, with fields of maize and bright patches of sunflower, from the seeds of which the Indians made their hair oil. After staying a few days at the little Huron village, where he was feasted by friendly natives, Champlain pushed on by Indian trails, passing village after village, till he reached the narrow end of Lake Simcoe. A shrill clamor of rejoicing and the screaming flight of terrified children hailed his approach. The little fleet of canoes pursued their course along the lake, and then down the chain of lakes leading to the river Trent. The inhabited country of the Hurons had now given place to a desolate region with no sign of human life, till from the mount of the Trent, like a flock of ventures and wild fowl, they found themselves floating on the waters of Lake Ontario, across which they made their way safely. It was a great day in the life of Champlain, when he found himself in the very heart of a hostile land, having discovered the chain of inland lakes, of which he had heard so much. But they were now in the land of the Iroquois, deadly foes of the Hurons. There was nothing for it but to fight, and a great battle now took place between the rival tribes, every warrior yelling at the top of his voice. Champlain himself was wounded in the fray, and all further exploration had to be abandoned. He was packed up in the basket, and carried away on the back of a Huron warrior. Bundled in a heap, wrote the explorer, doubled and strapped together after such a fashion that one could move no more than an infant in swaddling clothes. I never was in such torment in my life, for the pain of the wound was nothing to that of being bound and pinioned on the back of one of our savages. As soon as I could bear my weight, I got out of this prison. How Champlain wintered with the Hurons, who would not allow him to return to Quebec, how he got lost while hunting in one of the graced forests, in his eagerness to shoot a strange-looking bird, how the lakes and streams froze, and how his courage and endurance were sorely tried over the toilsome marches to Lake Simcoe, but how finally he reached Montreal by way of Nipissing and the Ottawa River must be read elsewhere. Champlain's work as an explorer was done, Truly has he been called the father of New France. He had founded Quebec and Montreal. He had explored Canada, as no man had ever done before or since. Faithful to the passion of his life, he died in 1635 at Quebec, the city he had founded and loved. End of chapter 40「Chapter forty one of a Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter forty one Early Discoverers of Australia. While the French and English were feverishly seeking a way to the east, either by the North Pole or by way to America, the Dutch were busy discovering a new land in the southern seas. And as we have seen America emerging from the mist of ages in the 16th century, so now in the 17th we have the great island continent of Australia 
mysteriously appearing bit by bit out of the yet little known sea of the south. There is little doubt that both Portuguese and Spanish had touched on the western coast early in the sixteenth century, but gave no information about it beyond sketching certain rough and undefined patches of land and calling it Terra Australis in their early maps. No one seems to have thought this mysterious land of much importance. The maritime nations of that period carefully concealed their knowledge from one another. The proud Spaniard hated his Portuguese neighbor as a formidable rival in the race of wealth and fame, and the Dutchman, who now comes on the scene, was regarded by both as a natural enemy by land or sea. Magellan in 1520 discovered that the Terra Australis was not joined to South America, as the old maps had laid down, and we find Frobisher remarking in 1578 that Terra Australis seems to be a great firm land lying under and about the South Pole, not thoroughly discovered. It is known at the south side of the Strait of Magellan, and is called Terra del Fuego. It is thought the south land about the pole, Antarctic, is far bigger than the north land about the pole, Arctic. But whether it be so or not, we have no certain knowledge, for we have no particular description thereof, as we have of the land about the north pole. And even one hundred years later, the mystery was not cleared up. This land about the straits is not perfectly discovered, whether it be continent or islands. Some take it for continent, esteeming the Terra Australis, or the southern continent, may for the largeness thereof take a first place in the division of the whole world. The Spaniards were still masters of the sea, when Juan Leitnant Torres first sailed through the strait, dividing Australia from New Guinea, already discovered in 1527. As second in command, he had sailed from America under a Spaniard, the Quiros, in 1605, and in the Pacific they had come across several island groups. Among others they sighted the island group, now known as the New Hebrides. Quiros supposed that this was the continent for which he was searching, and gave it the name of Terra Australis del Espirito Santo. And then a curious thing happened. At one hour past midnight, relates Torres in his account of the voyage, the Capitana, Quiros' ship, departed without any notice given us and without making any signal. After waiting for many days, Torres at least set sail, and having discovered that the supposed land was only an island, he made his way along the dangerous coast of New Guinea to Manila, thus passing through the straits that were afterwards named after him, and unconsciously passing almost within sight of the very continent for which he was searching. This was the end of Spanish enterprise for the present. The rivals of sea power in the 17th century were England and Holland. Both had recently started East India companies. Both were very keen to take a large part in East Indian trade and to command the sea. For a time the Dutch had it all their own way. They devoted themselves to founding settlements in the East Indies, ever hoping to discover new islands in the South Seas as possible trade centers. Scientific discovery held little interest for them. As early as 1606, a Dutch ship, the Little Sun, had been dispatched from the Moluccas to discover more about the land called by the Spaniards New Guinea, because of its resemblance to the West African coast of Guinea. But the crews were greeted with a shower of arrows as they attempted a landing, and with nine of their party killed, they returned disheartened. A more ambitious expedition was fitted out in 1617 by private adventurers, and two ships, the Unity and the Horn, sailed from the Texel under the command of a rich Amsterdam merchant named Isaac Le Maire and a clever navigator, Cornelius Schouten of Horn. Having been provided with an English gunner and carpenter, the ships were steered boldly across the Atlantic. Hitherto, the object of the expedition had been kept a secret, but on crossing the line the crews were informed that they were bound for the Terra Australis del Espirito Santo of Quiros. The men had never heard of the country before, and we are told they wrote the name in their caps in order to remember it. 
By midwinter they had reached the eastern entrance of the Straits of Magellan, through which many a ship had passed since the days of Magellan, some hundred years before this. Unfortunately, while undergoing some necessary repairs here, the little horn caught fire and was burned out, the crews all having to crowd on the unity. Instead of going through the strait, they sailed south and discovered Staten Land, which they thought might be a part of the southern continent, for which they were seeking. We now know it to be an island, whose heights are covered with perpetual snow. It was named by Schouten after the Staten, or States General of Holland. Passing through the strait, which divided the newly discovered land from the Terra del Fuego, called later the Straits of Le Mer, after its discoverer, the Dutchman found a great sea, full of whales and monsters innumerable. Sea mews, larger than swans, with wings stretching six feet across, fled screaming round the ship. The wind was against them, but after endless tacking, they reached the southern extremity of land, which Schouten named, after his native town, and the little burnt ship, Horn, and the Cape Horn it is known today. But the explorers never reached the Terra Australis. Their little ship could do no more, and they sailed to Java to repair. Many a name on the Australian map today testifies to Dutch enterprise about this time. In 1616, Captain Dirk Hartog of Amsterdam discovered the island that bears his name of the coast of Western Australia. A few years later, the captain of a Dutch ship, called the Levin, or Lioness, touched the southwest extremity of the continent, calling that point Cape Levin. Again a few years, and we find Captain Newts giving his name to a part of the southern coast, though the discovery seems to have been accidental. In 1628, Carpentaria received its name from Carpenter, a governor of the East India Company. Now, one day a ship from Carpenter's land returned laden with gold and spice, and though certain men had their suspicions that these riches had been fished out of some large ship wrecked upon the inhospitable coast, yet a little fleet of eleven ships was at once dispatched to reconnoitre further. Captain Pelsart commanded the Batavia, which in a great storm was separated from the other ships and driven alone on to the shoals, marked as the Abrolos, a Portuguese word meaning open your eyes, implying a sharp lookout for dangerous reefs, on the west coast of Australia. It was night when the ship struck, and Captain Pelsart was sick in bed. He ran hastily onto the deck. The moon shone bright. The sails were up. The sea appeared to be covered with white foam. Captain Pelsart charged the master with the loss of the ship, and asked him in what part of the world he saw they were. God only knows that, replied the master, adding that the ship was fast on a bank, hitherto undiscovered. Suddenly a dreadful storm of wind and rain arose, and being surrounded with rocks and shoals, the ship was constantly striking. The women, children, and sick people were out of their wits for fear. So they decided to land, seize on an island, for their cries and noise served only to disturb them. The landing was extremely difficult, owing to the rocky coast, where the waves were dashing high. When the weather had moderated a bit, Captain Pelsart took the ship and went in search of water, thereby exploring a good deal of coast, which, he remarked, resembled the country near Dover. But his exploration amounted to little, and the account of his adventures is mostly taken up with an account of the disasters that befell the miserable party left on the rock-bound islands of Abrolos, conspiracies, mutinies, and plots. His was only one of many adventures on this unknown and inhospitable coast, which about this time, 1644, began to take the name of New Holland. End of chapter 41「Tasman 
At this time, Antony van Diemen was governor at Batavia, and one of his most trusted commanders was Abel Tasman. In 1642, Tasman was given command of two ships for making discoveries of the unknown South Land, and hoisting his flag on board the Sea Hen, he sailed south from Batavia, without sighting the coast of Australia. Despite foggy weather, hard gales, and a rolling sea, he made his way steadily south. It was three months before land was sighted, and high mountains were seen to the southeast. The ship stood in to shore. As the land has not been known before to any European, we called it Antony van Diemen's Land, in honor of our governor-general, who sent us out to make discoveries. I anchored in a bay and heard the sound of people upon the shore, but I saw nobody. I perceived in the sand the marks of wild beasts' feet, resembling those of a tiger. Setting up a post with the Dutch East India Company's mark, and leaving the Dutch flag flying, Tasman left Van Diemen's land, which was not to be visited again for over one hundred years, when it was called after its first discoverer. He had no idea that he was on an island. Tasman now sailed east, and after about a week at sea he discovered a high mountainous country, which he named Statenland. We found here abundance of inhabitants. They had very hoarse voices, and were very large-made people. They were of color between brown and yellow, their hair long and thick, combed up and fixed on the top of their heads with a quill in the very same manner that Japanese fasten their hair behind their heads. Tasman anchored on the north coast of the south island of New Zealand, but canoes of warlike Maoris surrounded the ships. A conflict took place in which several Dutch seamen were killed. The weather grew stormy, and Tasman sailed away from the bay he named Murderer's Bay, rediscovered by Captain Cook about a hundred years later. This is the second country discovered by us, says Tasman. We named it Statenland in honor of the States General. It is possible that it may join the other Statenland, of Schouten and Lemaire, to the south of Terra del Fuego. But it is uncertain. It is a very fine country, and we hope it is part of the unknown South Continent. Is it necessary to add that the Statenland was really New Zealand, and the bay where the ships anchored is now known as Tasman Bay? When the news of Tasman's discoveries was noised abroad, all the geographers, explorers, and discoverers at once jumped to the conclusion that this was the same land on whose coast Belsart had been wrecked. It's most evident, they said, that New Guinea, Carpentaria, New Holland, Van Diemen's Land, make one old continent, from which New Zealand seems to be separated by a strait, and perhaps is part of another continent, answering to Africa, as this plainly does to America, making indeed a very large country. After a ten months' cruise, Tasman returned to Batavia. He had found Van Diemen's Land and New Zealand, without sighting Australia. A second expedition was now fitted out. The instructions of the Commodore, Captain Abel Jansen Tasman, make interesting reading. The orders are detailed and clear. He will start the end of January 1644, and we shall expect you in July following, attended with good success. Of all the lands, countries, islands, capes, inlets, bays, rivers, shoals, reefs, sands, cliffs, and rocks, which you pass in this discovery, you are to make accurate maps. Be particularly careful about longitude and latitude. But be circumspect and prudent in landing with small craft, because at several times New Guinea has been found to be inhabited by cruel, wild savages. When you converse with any of these savages, Behave well and friendly to them, and try by all means to engage their affection to you. You are to show the samples of the goods which you carry along with you, and inquire what materials and goods they possess. To prevent any other European nation from reaping the fruits of our labor in these discoveries, you are everywhere to take possession in the name of the Dutch East India Company. To put up some sign, erect a stone or post, and carve on them the arms of the Netherlands. The yachts are manned with one hundred and eleven persons, and for eight months plentifully victualled. 
manage everything well and orderly. Take notice, you see the ordinary portion of two meat and two pork days, and a quarter of vinegar and a half quarter of sweet oil per week. He was to coast along New Guinea to the farthest known spot, and to follow the coast despite adverse winds, in order that the Dutch might be sure whether this land is not divided from the great known south continent or not. What he accomplished on this voyage is best seen in the complete map of the southern continent, surveyed by Captain Abel Tasman, which was inlaid on the floor of the large hall in the Stadthouse of Amsterdam. The Great South Land was henceforth known as New Holland. End of chapter 42《ハッピーバックスクリプト》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《A Book of Discovery》by M. B. Singh《ハッピーバックスクリプト》Dampier discovers his strait. It was not long before the great stretch of coastline, carefully charted by Tasman, became known to the English, and while the Dutch were yet busy exploring farther, Dampier, the first Englishman to visit the country, had already set foot on its shores. We lie entirely at the mercy of the Dutch East India Company's geography for the outline of this part of the coast of New Holland, for it does not appear that the ships of any other nation have even approached it, says an old history of the period. Some such information as this became known in South America, in which country the English had long been harassing the Spaniards. It reached the ears of one William Dampier, a Somersetshire man, who had lived a life of romance and adventure with the buccaneers, pillaging and plundering foreign ships in these remote regions of the earth. He had run across the southern Pacific, carrying his life in his hand. He had marched across the Isthmus of Panama, one hundred and ten miles in twenty-three days, through deep and swiftly flowing rivers, dense growth of the tropical vegetation full of snakes, his only food being the flesh of monkeys. Such was the man who now took part in a privateering cruise under Captain Swan, bound for the East Indies. On 1st March, 1686, Swan and Dampier sailed away from the coast of Mexico on the voyage that led to Dampier's circumnavigation of the globe. For fifty days they sailed without sighting land, and when at last they found themselves off the island of Guam, they had only three days' food left, and the crews were busy plotting to kill Captain Swan and eat him, the other commanders sharing the same fate in turn. "'Ah, Dampier,' said Captain Swan, when he and all the men had refreshed themselves with food. You would have made but a poor meal. For Dampier was as lean as the captain was, fat and fleshy. Soon, however, fresh trouble arose among the men. Captain Swan lost his life, and Dampier on board the little Kignet sailed hurriedly for the Spice Islands. He was now on the Australian parallels, in the shadow of a world lying dark upon the face of the ocean. It was January 1688 when Dampier sighted the coast of New Holland, and anchored in a bay, which they named Kegnet Bay after their ship, somewhere off the northern coast of eastern Australia. Here, while the ship was undergoing repairs, Dampier makes his observations. New Holland, he tells us, is a very large tract of land. It is not yet determined whether it is an island or a main continent but I am certain that it joins neither to Africa, Asia, or America. The inhabitants of this country, he tells us, are the miserablest people in the world. They have no houses, but lie in the open air without any covering, the earth being their bed, and the heaven their canopy. Their food is a small sort of fish, which they catch at low tide, while the old people that are not able to stir abroad for by reason of their age and the tender infants wait their return, and what providence has bestowed on them, they presently boil on the coals, and eat it in a common. They are tall and thin, 
and of a very unpleasing aspect. Their hair is black, short and curled, like that of the Negroes of Guinea. This Englishman's first description of the Australian natives cannot fail to be interesting. After we had been here a little while, we closed some of the men, designing to have some service from them for it. But we found some wells of water here, and intended to carry two or three barrels of it aboard. But it being somewhat troublesome to carry to the canoes, we sought to have made these men to have carried it for us, and therefore we gave them some clothes, to one an old pair of breeches, to another a ragged shirt, to a third a jacket that was scarce worth opening. We put them on, thinking that this finery would have brought them to work heartily for us, and our water being filled in small, long barrels, about six gallons in each, we brought these our new servants to the wells, and put a barrel on each of their shoulders. But they stood like statues without motion, but grinned like so many monkeys staring one upon another. So we were forced to carry the water ourselves. They had soon had enough of the new country, weighed anchor and steered away to the north. Dampier returned to England, even a poorer man than he had left it twelve years before. After countless adventures and higher breath escapes, after having sailed entirely round the world, he brought back with him nothing but one unhappy black man, Prince Jolly, whom he had bought for sixty dollars. He had hoped to recoup himself by showing the poor native with his rings and bracelets and painted skin, but he was in such need of money on lending that he gladly sold the poor black man on his arrival in the Thames. But Dampier had made himself a name as a successful traveller, and in 1699 he was appointed by the King William III to command the Roebuck, 290 tons, with a crew of 50 men, and provisions for 20 months. Leaving England in the middle of January, 1699, he sighted the west coast of New Holland towards the end of July, and anchored in a bay they called Shark's Bay, not far from the rocks where the Batavia was wrecked with Captain Pelsart in 1629. He gives us a graphic picture of this place, with its sweet-scented trees, its shrubs gay as the rainbow with blossoms and berries, its many-colored vegetation, its fragrant air and delicious soil. The men caught sharks and devoured them with relish, which speaks of scarce provisions. Inside one of the sharks, eleven feet long, they found the hippopotamus, the flesh of it was divided among my men, says the captain, and they took care that no waste should be made of it, but thought it, as things stood, good entertainment. As it had been with Pelsart, so now with Dampier, fresh water was the difficulty, and they sailed northeast in search of it. They fell in with a group of small rocky islands, still known as Dampier's Archipelago, one island of which they named Rosemary Island because there grew here or two or three sorts of shrubs, one just like rosemary. Once again he comes across natives, very much the same blinking creatures, also abundance of the same kind of flesh flies teasing them, with the same black skins and hair frizzled. Indeed, he writes as though the whole country of New Holland was as savage and worthless land inhabited by dreadful monsters. If it were not, he writes, for that sort of pleasure which results from the discovery, even of the barrenest spot upon the globe, this coast of New Holland would not have charmed me much. His first sight of the kangaroo, now the emblem of Australia, is interesting. He describes it as a sort of raccoon, different from that of the West Indies, chiefly as to the legs, for these have very short forelegs but go jumping upon them as the others do, and like them are very good meat. This must have been the small kangaroo, for the large kind was not found till later by Captain Cook in New South Wales. But Dampier and his mates could not find fresh water, and soon varied off the coast of New Holland. An outbreak of scurvy, too, decided them to sail away in search of fresh foods. Dampier had spent five weeks cruising off the coast, he had sailed along some nine hundred miles of the Australian shore, without making any startling discoveries. 
A few months later the Roebuck stood off the coast of New Guinea, a high and mountainous country, green and beautiful with tropical vegetation, and dark with forests and groves of tall and stately trees. Innumerable dusky-faced natives peeped at the ship from behind the rocks, but they were not friendly, and this they showed by climbing the coconut trees and throwing down coconuts on the English, with passionate signs to them to depart. But with plenty of fresh water, this was unlikely, and the crews rode ashore, killed and salted a good load of wild hogs, while the savages still peeped at them from afar. Thus then they sailed on, thinking they were still coasting New Guinea. So doing, they arrived at the straits, which still bear the name of the explorer, and discovered a little island, which he called New Britain. He had now been over fifteen months at sea and the roebuck was only provisioned for twenty months. So Dampier, who never had the true spirit of the explorer in him, left his discoveries and turned homewards. The ship was rotten, and it took three months to repair her at Batavia, before proceeding farther. With pumps going night and day, they made their way to the Cape of Good Hope, but off the island of Ascension the roebuck went down, carrying with her many of Dampier's books and papers. But though many of the papers were lost, the learned and faithful Dampier, as he is called, the Prince of Voyagers, has left us accounts of his adventures, and equaled in those sternous ocean-going days for their picturesque and graphic details. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 44. Bering Finds His Strait. In the great work of Arctic exploration during the 18th and 19th centuries, it is to England and Russia that we owe our knowledge at the present day. It is well known how Peter the Great of Russia journeyed to Amsterdam to learn shipbuilding under the Dutch, and to England to learn the same art under the English, and how the Russian fleet grew in his reign. Among the Danish shipbuilders at Petersburg was one Vitus Bering, already a bold and able commander on the high seas. The life of the great Russian Tsar was drawing to its close. He was already within a few weeks of the end, when he planned an expedition under this same Vitus Bering, for which he wrote the instruction with his own hands. At Kamchatka two decked boats are to be built. With these you are to sail northward along the coast, and as the end of the coast is not known, this land is undoubtedly America. For this reason you are to inquire where the American coast begins, and go to some European colony, and when European ships are seen, you are to ask what the coast is called, note it down, make a landing, and after having charted the coast, return. Were Asia and America joined together, or was there a strait between the two? The question was yet undecided in 1725. Indeed, the east coast of Asia was only known as far as the island of Yezo, while the Pacific coast of America had been explored no farther than New Albion. Peter the Great died on 28th January, 1725. A week later, Bering started for Kamchatka. Right across snow-covered Russia to the boundary of Siberia, he led his expedition. March found him at Toborsk. With rafts and boats, they then made their way by the Siberian rivers, till they reached Yakutsk, where they spent their first winter. Not till the middle of June, 1726, did Bering reach the capital of East Siberia. The rest of the journey was through utterly unknown land. It was some 685 miles eastwards to Okhok, through a rough and mountainous country, cut up by deep and bridgeless streams, the path lay over dangerous swamps and through dense forest. The party now divided, 
bearing with two hundred horses, travelled triumphantly, if painfully, to Okhotsk in forty-five days. The town consisted of eleven huts containing Russian families who lived by fishing. Snow lay deep on the frozen ground, and the horses died one by one for lack of food, but the undaunted explorer had soon got huts ready for the winter, which was to be spent in felling trees and pushing forward the building of his ship, the Fortuna, for the coming voyage of discovery. Bering himself had made a successful journey to the coast, but some of the party encountered terrible hardships, and it was midsummer, 1727, before they arrived while others were overtaken by winter in the very heart of Siberia, and had to make their way for the last three hundred miles on foot, through snow, in places six feet deep. Their food was finished, famine became a companion to cold, and they were obliged to gnaw their shoes and straps and leathern bags. Indeed they must have perished, had they not stumbled on Bering's route, where they found his dead horses." But at last all was ready, and the little ship Fortuna was sailing bravely across the Sea of Okhotsk, some six hundred and fifty miles to the coast of Kamchatka. This she did in sixteen days. The country of Kamchatka had now been crossed, and with boats and sledges this took the whole winter. It was a laborious undertaking, following the course of the Kamchatka River. The expedition had to camp in the snow and few natives were forthcoming for the transport of heavy goods. It was not till March, 1728, that Bering reached his goal, Ostrog, a village near the sea, inhabited by a handful of Cossacks. From this point, on the bleak shores of the Arctic Sea, the exploring party were ordered to start. It had taken over three years to reach the starting point, and even now a seemingly hopeless task lay before them. After hard months of shipbuilding, the stout little Gabriel was launched. Her timber had been hauled by Ostrog by dogs, while the rigging, cable, and anchors had been dragged nearly two thousand miles through one of the most desolate regions of the earth. As to the food on which the explorers lived, fish oil was their butter, and dried fish their beef and pork. Salt they were obliged to get from the sea. Thus supplied with a year's provision, Bering started on his voyage of discovery, along an unknown coast and over an unknown sea. On 18th July, 1728, the sails of the Gabriel were triumphantly hoisted, and Bering, with a crew of forty-four, started on the great voyage. His course lay close along the coast northwards. The sea was alive with whales, seals, sea lions, and dolphins, as the little party made their way north past the mouth of Anadir River. The little Gabriel was now in the strait between Asia and America, though Bering knew it not. They had been at sea some three weeks, when eight men came rowing towards them in a leathern boat. They were the Chukchis, a warlike race living on the northeast coast of Siberia, and subdued and fierce. They pointed out a small island in the north, which Bering named the Isle of St. Lawrence, in honor of the day. Then he turned back. He felt he had accomplished his task and obeyed his orders. Moreover, with adverse winds they might never return to Kamchatka, and the winter among the Chukches was to court to disaster. After a cruise of three months, they reached their starting point again. Had he only known that the coast of America was but thirty-nine miles off, the results of his voyage would have been greater. As it was, he ascertained that there really does exist a northeast passage, and that from the Lena River it is possible, provided one is not prevented by polar ice, to sail to Kamchatka, and thence to Japan, China, and the East Indies. The final discovery was left for Captain Cook. As he approached the straits, which he called after bearing, the sun broke suddenly through the clouds, and the continents of Asia and America were visible at a glance. There was dissatisfaction in Russia with the result of Bering's voyage, and though five years of untold hardship in the extremest corner of the world had told on the Russian explorer 
he was willing and anxious to start off again. He proposed to make Kamchatka again his headquarters, to explore the western coast of America, and to chart the long Arctic coast of Siberia, a colossal task indeed. So the great northern expedition was formed, with Bering in command, accompanied by two well-known explorers to help, Spangberg and Chirikov, and with five hundred and seventy men under him. It would take too long to follow the various expeditions that now left Russia in five different directions to explore the unknown coasts of the old world. The world has never witnessed a more heroic geographical enterprise than these Arctic expeditions. Amid obstacles indescribable, the north line of Siberia, hitherto charted as a straight line, was explored and surveyed. Never was greater courage and endurance displayed. If the ships got frozen in, they were hauled on shore. The men spent the long winter in miserable huts and started off again with the spring, until the northern coast assumed shape and form. One branch of the great northern expedition and their bearing was composed of professors to make a scientific investigation of Kamchatka. These thirty learned Russians were luxuriously equipped. They carried a library with several hundred books, including Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels, seventy reams of writing paper and artist's materials. They had nine wagon loads of instruments, carrying telescopes fifteen feet long, a surgeon, two landscape painters, one instrument maker, five surveyors accompanied them, and the convoy grew like an avalanche as it worked its way into Siberia. Bering seems to have moved this cumbersome machine safely to Yakutsk, though it took the best part of two years. Having left Russia in 1733, it was 1741, when Bering himself was ready to start from the harbor of Okhotsk for the coast of America, with two ships and provisions for some months. He was now nearly sixty, his health was undermined with vexation and worry, and the climate of Okhotsk had nearly killed him. On 18th July, just six weeks after the start, Bering discovered the continent of North America. The coast was jagged, the land covered with snow, mountains extended inland, and above all rose a peak towering into the clouds, a peak higher than anything they knew in Siberia or Kamchatka, which Bering named Mount St. Elias after the patron saint of the day. He made his way with difficulty through the string of islands that skirt the great peninsula of Alaska. Through the months of August and September they cruised about the coast, in damp and foggy weather, which now gave way to violent storms, and Bering's ship was driven along at the mercy of the wind. He himself was ill, and the greater part of his crew were disabled by scurvy. At last, one day, in a high-running sea, the ship struck upon a rock, and they found themselves stranded on an unknown island off the coast of Kamchatka. Only two men were fit to land. They found a dead whale on which they fed their sick. Later on, sea otters, blue and white foxes, and sea cows provided food. But the island was desolate and solitary. Not a human being was to be seen. Here, however, the little party was forced to winter. With difficulty they built five underground huts on the sandy shore of the island, now known as Bering Island. And each day, amid the raging snowstorms and piercing winds, one man went forth to hunt for animal food. Man after man died, and by December Bering's own condition had become hopeless. Hunger and grief had added to his misery, and in his sand hut he died. He was almost buried alive, for the sand rolled down from the pit in which he lay and covered his feet. He would not have it removed, for it kept him warm. Thirty more of the little expedition died during that bitter winter on the island. The survivors, some forty-five persons, built a ship from the timbers of the wreck, and in August 1742, they returned to Kamchatka to tell the story of Bering's discoveries and of Bering's death. End of chapter 44
Chapter Forty Five of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter Forty Five. Cook discovers New Zealand. But while the names of Torres, Carpenter, Dustman, and Dampier are still to be found on our modern maps of Australia, it is the name of Captain Cook that we must always connect most closely with the discovery of the great island continent, the great South Land, which only became known to Europe one hundred and fifty years ago. Dampier had returned to England in 1701 from his voyage to New Holland, but nearly seventy years passed before the English were prepared to send another expedition to investigate further the mysterious land in the south. James Cook had shown himself worthy of the great command that was given to him in 1768, although exploration was not the main object of the expedition. Spending his boyhood in the neighborhood of Whitby, he was familiar with the North Sea fishermen, with the colliers, even with the smugglers that frequented this eastern coast. In 1755 he entered the Royal Navy, volunteering for service and entering His Majesty's ship Eagle as master's mate. Four years later we find him taking his share on board His Majesty's ship Pembroke in the attack of, on Quebec by Wolfe, and later transferred to His Majesty's ship Northumberland, selected to survey the river and Gulf of St. Lawrence. So satisfactory was his work that a few years later he was instructed to survey and chart the coasts of Newfoundland and Labrador. While engaged on this work, he observed an eclipse of the sun, which led to the appointment that necessitated a voyage to the Pacific Ocean. It had been calculated that a transit of Venus would occur in June 1769. A petition to the king set forth, that the British nation, being justly celebrated in the learned world for their knowledge of astronomy, in which they are inferior to no nation upon earth, ancient or modern, it would cast dishonor upon them, should they neglect to have correct observations made of this important phenomenon. The king agreed, and the Royal Society selected James Cook as a fit man for the appointment. A stout, strongly built collier of three hundred and seventy tons, was chosen at Whitby, manned with seventy men, and victualled for twelve months, with instructions to observe the transit of Venus at the island of Georgeland, Otaheite, to make further discoveries in the South Pacific Ocean, and to explore New Zealand if possible. Cook hoisted his flag on His Majesty's ship Endeavour, and started in May 1768. It was an interesting party on board, joined at the last moment by Mr. Joseph Banks, a very rich member of the Royal Society and the student of natural history. He had requested leave to sail in the ship that carries the English astronomers to the new discovered country in the South Sea. No people ever went to sea better fitted out for the purpose of natural history, nor more elegantly, says a contemporary writer. They have a fine library, they have all sorts of machines for catching and preserving insects. They have two painters and draughtsmen. In short, this expedition will cost Mr. Banks ten thousand pounds. Their astronomical instruments were of the best, including portable observatory constructed for sixteen guineas. But most important of all was the careful assortment of provisions to allay, if possible, that scourge of all navigators the scurvy. A quantity of malt was shipped to be made into wort, mustard, vinegar, wheat, orange and lemon juice, and portable soup was put on board, and Cook received special orders to keep his men with plenty of fresh food whenever this was possible. He carried out these orders strenuously, and at Madeira we find him punishing one of his own seamen with twelve lashes for refusing to eat fresh beef. Hence they left Rio de Janeiro, in as good a condition for prosecuting the voyage as on the day they left England. 
Christmas Day was passed near the mouth of the River Platte, and early in the new year of 1769, the Endeavour sailed through the Strait of Le Maire. The wealthy Mr. Banks landed on Staten Island, and hastily added a hundred new plants to his collection. Then they sailed on to St. George's Island. It had been visited by Captain Wallace in the Dolphin the previous year. Indeed, some of Cook's sailors had served on board the Dolphin, and knew the native chiefs of the island. All was friendly. Tents were soon pitched, a fort built, with mounted guns on either side. The precious instruments landed, and on 3rd June, with a cloudless sky and intolerable heat, they observed the whole passage of the planet Venus over the sun's disk. After a stay of three months, they left the island, taking Tupia, a native, with them. Among other accomplishments, the Tupia roasted dogs to perfection, and Cook declares that dog's flesh is next only to English lamb. They visited other islands in the group, now known as the Society Islands and belonging to France, and took possession of all in the name of His Britannic Majesty, George the Third. All through the months of September they sailed south, till on 7th October land was sighted. It proved to be the North Island of New Zealand, never before approached by Europeans from the east. It was 127 years since Tasman had discovered the west coast and called it Statenland but no European had ever set foot on its soil. Indeed, it was still held to be part of the Terra Australis Incognita. The first to sight land was a boy named Nicholas Young, hence the point was called Young Nick's Head, which may be seen on our maps today, covering Poverty Bay. The natives here were unfriendly, and Cook was obliged to use firearms to prevent an attack. The Maoris had never seen a great ship before, and at first thought it was a very large bird, being struck by the size and beauty of its wings, sails. When a small boat was let down from the ship's side, they thought it must be a young, unfledged bird. But when the white men in their bright-colored clothes rowed off in the boat, they concluded these were gods. Cook found the low sandy coast back at by well-wooded hills rising to mountains, on which patches of snow were visible, while smoke could be seen through the trees, speaking of native dwellings. The natives were too treacherous to make it safe landing for the white men, so they sailed out of Poverty Bay and proceeded south. Angry Maoris shook their spears at the Englishmen as they coasted south along the east coast of the North Island. But the face of the country was unpromising, and Cook altered his course for the north at a point he named Cape Turn again. Unfortunately, he missed the only safe port on the east coast between Auckland and Wellington, but he found good anchorage in what is now known as Cook's Bay. Here they got plenty of good fish, wild fowl, and oysters, as good as ever came out of Colchester. Taking possession of the land, they passed in the name of King George, Cook continued his northerly course, passing many a river, which seemed to resemble the Thames at home. A heavy December gale blew them off the northernmost point of land, which they named North Cape, and Christmas was celebrated off Tasman's Islands with goose pie. The new year of 1770 found Cook off Cape Maria van Diemen, sailing south along the western coast of the North Island till the Endeavour was anchored in Ship Go, Queen Charlotte's Sound, only about seventy miles from the spot where Tasman first sighted land. Here the English explorer landed. The country was thickly wooded, but he climbed a hill, and away to the eastward he saw that the seas washing both east and west coasts of the northern island were united. He had solved one problem. Tasman's Staten land was not part of a great southern continent, he now resolved to push through his newly discovered straits between the two islands, and having done this, he sailed north till he reached Cape Turn again, and so he proved beyond a doubt that this was an island. The men thought they had done enough, but Cook, with the true instinct of an explorer, 
turned a deaf ear to the murmurings of his crew for roast beef and old England, and directed his course against south. From the natives he had learned of the existence of two islands, and he must needs sail round the southern, as he had sailed round the northern isle. Storms and gales harassed the navigators through the months of February, as they made their way slowly southwards. Indeed, they had a very narrow escape from death, towards the end of the month, when in a two days gale, with heavy squalls of rain, their foresail was split to pieces, and they lost sight of land for seven days, nearly running on to submerged rocks, which Cook named the Traps. It was nearly dark on 14th of March, when they entered a bay, which they suitably christened Dusky Bay, from which they sailed to Cascade Point, named from the four streams that fell over its face. No country upon earth, remarks Cook, can appear with a more rugged and barren aspect than this does from the sea, for, as far inland as the eye can reach, nothing is to be seen but the summit of these rocky mountains. At last, on 24th of March, they rounded the north point of the South Island. Before them lay the familiar waters of Massacre Bay, Tasman Bay, and Queen Charlotte's Sound. As we have now circumnavigated the whole of this country, it is time for me to think of quitting it, Cook remarked simply enough. Running into Admiralty Bay, the endeavor was repaired for her coming voyage home. Her sails, ill-provided from the first, says Banks, were now worn and damaged by the rough work they had gone through, particularly on the coast of New Zealand, and they gave no little trouble to get into order again. While Banks searched for insects and plants, Cook sat writing up his journal of the circumnavigation. He loyally gives Tasman the honor of the first discovery, but clearly shows his error in supposing it to be part of the great southern land. The natives he describes as a strong, raw-boned, well-made, active people, rather above the common size, of a dark brown color, with black hair, thin black beards, and white teeth. Both men and women paint their faces and bodies with red ochre mixed with fish oil. They wear ornaments of stone, bone, and shells at their ears and about their necks, and the men generally wear long white feathers, stuck upright in their hair. They came off in canoes, which will carry a hundred people, when within a stone's throw from the ship, the chief of the party would brandish a battle-axe, calling out, Come ashore with us, and we will kill you. They would certainly have eaten them, too, for they were cannibals. The ship was now ready, and naming the last point of land Cape Farewell, they sailed away to the west, till we fall in with the coast of New Holland. They had spent six and a half months sailing about in New Zealand waters, and had coasted some 2,400 miles. Nineteen days' sail brought them to the eagerly sought coast, and on 28th April Cook anchored for the first time in the bay known afterwards to history as Botany Bay, so named from the quantity of plants found in the neighborhood by Mr. Banks. Cutting an inscription on one of the trees, with the date and name of the ship, Cook sailed north early in May, surveying the coast as he passed, and giving names to the various bays and capes. Thus Port Jackson, at the entrance of Sydney Harbor, and discovered by Cook, was so named after one of the secretaries of the Admiralty. Smoky Cape, from smoke arising from native dwellings, point to danger by reason of a narrow escape on some shoals, while Morton Bay, on which Brisbane, the capital of Queensland, now stands, was named after the President of the Royal Society. As they advanced, the coast became steep, rocky, and unpromising. Hitherto, reports Cook, we had safely navigated this dangerous coast, where the sea in all parts conceals shores that project suddenly from the shore and rocks that rise abruptly like a pyramid from the bottom more than 1,300 miles. But here we became acquainted with misfortune, and we therefore called the point which we had just seen farthest to the northward, Cape Tribulation. 
It was the tenth of May. The gentlemen had left the deck, in great tranquillity, and gone to bed, when suddenly the ship struck and remained immovable, except for the heaving of the surge, and beat her against the crags of the rock, upon which she lay. Every one rushed to the deck, with countenances which sufficiently express the horrors of our situation. Immediately they took in all sails, lowered the boats, and found they were on a reef of coral rocks. Two days of sickening anxiety followed. The ship sprang a leak, and they were threatened with total destruction. To their intense relief, however, the ship floated off into deep water with a high tide. Repairs were now more than ever necessary, and the poor battered collier was taken into the Endeavour River. Tupia and others were also showing signs of scurvy, so a hospital tent was erected on shore, and with a supply of fresh fish, pigeons, wild plantains, and turtles, they began to improve. Here stands today the seaport of Cooktown, where a monument of Captain Cook looks out over the waters that he discovered. The prospect of further exploration was not encouraging. In whatever direction we looked, the sea was covered with shoals as far as the eye could see. As they sailed out of their little river, they could see the surf breaking on the great barrier reef. Navigation now became very difficult, and more than once even Cook himself almost gave up hope. Great, then, was their joy when they found themselves at the northern promontory of the land, which I have named York Cape, in honor of his late royal highness, the Duke of York. We were in great hopes that he had at last found out a passage into the Indian seas. And he adds an important paragraph. As I was now about to quit the eastern coast of New Holland, which I am confident no European had ever seen before, I once more hoisted the English colors, and I now took possession of the whole eastern coast in right of His Majesty King George the Third, by the name of New South Wales, with all the bays, harbors, rivers, and islands situated upon it. This part of the new land was called by the name of New South Wales. So the endeavor sailed through the straits that Torres had accidentally passed one hundred and sixty-four years before, and just sighting New Guinea, Cook made his way to Java, for his crew were sickly and pretty far gone, was longing for home. The ship, too, was in bad condition. She had to be pumped night and day to keep her free from water, and her sails would hardly stand the least puff of wind. They reached Batavia in safety, and were kindly received by the Dutch there. Since leaving Plymouth two years before, Cook had only lost seven men altogether, three by drowning, two frozen, one from consumption, one from poisoning, none from scurvy, a record without equal in the history of navigation. But the climate of Batavia now wrought havoc amongst the men. One after another died, Tupia among others, and so many were weakened with fever that only twenty officers and men were left on duty at one time. Glad indeed they were to leave at Christmas time, and gladder still to anchor in the Downs and to reach London after their three years' absence. The news of his arrival and great discoveries seems to have been taken very quietly by those at home. Lieutenant Cook of the Navy, says the annual register for 1771, who sailed round the globe, was introduced to His Majesty at St. James, and presented to His Majesty his journal of his voyage, with some curious maps and charts of different places that he had drawn during the voyage. He was presented with a captain's commission. End of chapter 45「Chapter forty six of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A book of discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter forty six. Cook's third voyage and death. Although the importance of his discoveries was not realized at this time, 
Cook was given command of two new ships, the Resolution and Adventure, provisioned for a year, for a voyage to remote parts, a few months later. And the old Endeavour went back to her collier work in the North Sea. Perhaps a letter, written by Cook to a friend at Whitby, on his return from the second voyage, is sufficient to serve our purpose here. For, though the voyage was important enough, yet little new was discovered. And after spending many months in high latitudes, Cook decided that there was no great southern continent to the south of New Holland and New Zealand. Dear Sir, he writes from London in September 1775, I now sit down to fulfill the promise I made you to give you some account of my last voyage. I left the Cape of Good Hope on 22nd November 1772, and proceeded to the south, till I met with a vast field of ice and much foggy weather, and large islets or floating mountains of ice without number. After some trouble and not a little danger, I got to the south of the field of ice, and after beating about for some time, for land, in a sea strewed with ice, I crossed the Antarctic Circle, and the same evening, 17th January, 1773, found it unsafe, or rather impossible, to stand farther to the south for ice. Seeing no signs of meeting with land in these high latitudes, I stood away to the northward, and without seeing any signs of land, I thought proper to steer for New Zealand, where I anchored in Dusky Bay on 26th of March, and then sailed for Queen Charlotte's Sound. Again I put to sea and stood to the south, where I met with nothing but ice and excessive cold, bad weather. Here I spent near four months beating about in high latitudes. Once I got as high as seventy-one degrees, and farther it was not possible to go for ice, which lay as firm as land. Here we saw ice mountains, whose summits were lost in clouds. I was now fully satisfied that there was no southern continent. I nevertheless resolved to spend some time longer in these seas, and with this resolution I stood away to the north. In the second voyage Cook proved that there was no great land to the south of Terra Australis, or South America, except the land of ice lying about the South Pole. But he did a greater piece of work than this. He fought and fought successfully the great curse of Scorby, which had hitherto carried off scores of sailors, and prevented ships on voyages of discovery, or indeed ships of war, from staying long on the high seas without constantly landing for supplies of fresh food. It was no uncommon occurrence for a sea captain to return after even a few months' cruise with half his men suffering from scurvy. Captain Palliser, on His Majesty's ship Eagle, in 1756, landed in Plymouth Sound with 130 sick men out of 400, 22 having died in a month. Cook had resolved to fight this dreaded scourge, and we have already seen that during his three years' cruise of the Endeavour he had only to report five cases of scurvy, so close a watch did he keep on his cruise. In his second voyage he was even more particular, with the result that in the course of three years he did not lose a single man from scurvy. He enforced cold bathing and encouraged it by example. The allowance of salt beef and pork was cut down, and the habit of mixing salt beef fat with the flour was strictly forbidden. Salt butter and cheese were stopped and raisins were substituted for salt suet. Wild celery was collected in Terra del Fuego, and breakfast made from this with ground wheat and portable soup. The cleanliness of the men was insisted on. Cook never allowed anyone to appear dirty before him. He inspected the men once a week at least, and saw with his own eyes that they changed their clothing. Equal care was taken to keep the ship clean and dry between decks and she was constantly cured with fires, or smoked with gunpowder mixed with vinegar. For a paper on this subject read before the Royal Society in 1776, James Cook was awarded a gold medal. 
now in the British Museum. But although the explorer was now forty-eight, he was as eager for active adventure as a youth of twenty. He had settled the question of a southern continent. Now, when the question of the Northwest Passage came up again, he offered his services to Lord Sandwich, first Lord of the Admiralty, and was at once accepted. It was more than two hundred years since Frobisher had attempted to solve the mystery, which even Cook, the first navigator of his day, with improved ships and better-fed men, did not succeed in solving. He now received his secret instructions, and choosing the old resolution again, he set sail, in company with Captain Clerk, on board the Discovery, in the year 1776, for that voyage from which there was to be no return. He was to touch at New Albion, discovered by Drake, and explore any rivers or inlets that might lead to Hudson's or Baffin's Bay. After once more visiting Tasmania and New Zealand, he made a prolonged stay among the Pacific Islands, turning north in December 1777. Soon after they had crossed the line, and a few days before Christmas, a low island was seen, on which Cook at once landed, hoping to get a fresh supply of turtle. In this he was not disappointed. Some three hundred, all of the green kind, and perhaps as good as any in the world, were obtained. The island was named Christmas Island, and the resolution and discovery sailed upon their way. A few days later they came upon a group of islands hitherto unknown. These they named after the Earl of Sandwich, the group forming the Kingdom of Hawaii, the chief island. Natives came off in canoes, bringing pigs and potatoes, and ready to exchange fish for nails. Some were tempted on board, the wildness of their locks expressing their astonishment. Anchorage being found, Cook landed, and as he set foot on shore, a large crowd of natives pressed forward, and throwing themselves on their faces, remained thus, till Cook signed to them to rise. With a goodly supply of fresh provisions, Cook sailed away from the Sandwich Islands, and after some five weeks sailed to the north, the longed-for coast of New Albion was seen. The natives of the country were clad in fur, which they offered for sale. They exacted payment for everything, even for the wood and water that the strangers took from their shores. The weather was cold and stormy, and the progress of the little English ships was slow. By 22nd March they had passed Cape Flattery, a week later, they named Hope Bay, in which we hoped to find a good harbor, and the event proved we were not mistaken. All this part of the coast was called by Cook King George's Sound, but the native name of Nootka has since prevailed. We have an amusing account of these natives. At first, they were supposed to be dark-colored, till after much cleaning, they were found to have skins like our people in England. Expert sieves they were. No piece of iron was safe from them. Before we left the place, says Cook, hardly a bit of brass was left in the ship. Whole suits of clothes were stripped of every button. Copper kettles, tin canisters, candlesticks, all went to wreck, so that these people got a greater variety of things from us than any other people we had visited. It was not till 26 April that Cook at last managed to start forward again, but a two days hard gale drove him from the coast and onwards to a wide inlet to which he gave the name of Prince William's Sound. Here the natives were just like the Eskimos in Hudson's Bay. The ships now sailed westward, doubling the promontory of Alaska, and on 9th August they reached the westernmost point of North America which they named Cape Prince of Wales. They were now on the sea discovered by Bering, 1741, to which they gave his name. Hampered by fog and ice, the ships made their way slowly on to a point named Cape North. Cook decided that the eastern point of Asia was but thirteen leagues from the western point of America. They named the sound on the American side Norton Sound, after the Speaker of the House of Commons. Having passed the Arctic Circle and penetrated into the northern seas, 
which were never free from ice, they met Russian traders, who professed to have known Bering. Then, having discovered four thousand miles of new coast, and refreshed themselves with walrus or seahorse, the expedition turned joyfully back to the Sandwich Islands. On the last day of November, Cook discovered the island of Ohivi, Hawaii, which he carefully surveyed, till he came to anchor in Karakakua Bay. The tragic death of Captain Cook at the hands of these natives is well known to every child. The reason for his murder is not entirely understood today, but the natives, who had hitherto proved friendly, suddenly attacked the English explorer and slew him, and he fell into the water and spoke no more. Such was the melancholy end of England's first great navigator, James Cook, the foremost sailor of his time, the man who had circumnavigated New Zealand, who had explored the coast of New South Wales, named various unknown islands in the Pacific Ocean, and discovered the Sandwich Islands. He died on 14th February, 1779. It was not till 11th January, 1780, that the news of his death reached London, to be recorded in the quaint language of the day by the London Gazette. It is with the utmost concern, runs the announcement, that we inform the public that the celebrated circumnavigator, Captain Cook, was killed by the inhabitants of a new discovered island in the South Seas. The captain and crew were first treated as deities, but upon their revisiting that island, Hostilities ensued, and the above melancholy scene was the consequence. This account is come from Kamchatka by letters from Captain Clerk and others. But the crews of the ships were in a very good state of health, and all in the most desirable condition. His successful attempts to preserve the health of his crew are well known, and his discoveries will be an everlasting honor to his country. Cook's first voyages were published in 1773, and were widely read, but his account of the new country did not at once attract Europeans to its shores. We hear of barren sandy shores and wild rocky coast, inhabited by naked black people, malicious and cruel, on the one hand, and low shores all white with sand, fringed with foaming surf, with hostile natives on the other. It was not till eighteen years after Cook's death that Banks, his old friend, appealed to the British government of the day to make some use of these discoveries. At last the loss of the American colonies in 1776 induced men to turn their eyes towards the new land in the South Pacific. Banks remembered well his visit to Botany Bay with Captain Cook in 1770, and he now urged the dispatch of convicts, hitherto transported to America, to this newly found bay in New South Wales. So in 1787, a fleet of eleven ships, with one thousand people on board, left the shores of England, under the command of Captain Philip. After a tedious voyage of thirty-six weeks, they reached Botany Bay in January 1788. Captain Philip had been appointed governor of all New South Wales, that is, from Cape York to Van Diemen's Land, still supposed to be part of the mainland. But Philip at once recognized that Botany Bay was not a suitable place for settlement. No white man had described these shores since the days of Captain Cook. The green meadows of which Banks spoke were barren swamps and bleak sands, while the bay itself was exposed to the full sweep of violent winds, with a heavy sea breaking with tremendous surf against the shore. Varra, varra, be gone, be gone, shouted the natives, brandishing spears at the water's edge, as they had done eighteen years before. In an open boat, for it was midsummer in these parts, Philip surveyed the coast, an opening marked Port Jackson on Cook's chart attracted his notice, and sailing between two rocky headlands, the explorer found himself crossing smooth, clear water with a beautiful harbor in front, and soft green foliage reaching down to the water's edge. Struck with the loveliness of the scene, and finding both food and water here, he chose the spot for his new colony, 
giving it the name of Sidney, after Lord Sidney, who as Home Secretary had appointed him to his command. We got into Port Jackson, he wrote to Lord Sidney, early in the afternoon, and had the satisfaction of finding the finest harbor in the world, in which a thousand sail of the line may ride in perfect security. To us, wrote one of his captains, it was a great and important day, and I hope will mark the foundation of an empire. But interesting as it is, we cannot follow the fortunes of this first little English colony in the South Pacific Ocean. The English had not arrived a day too soon. A few days later, the French explorer, La Perouse, guided hither by Cook's chart, suddenly made his appearance on the shores of Botany Bay. The arrival of two French men of war caused the greatest excitement amongst the white strangers and the black natives. La Perouse had left France in 1785, in command of two ships, with orders to search for the northwest passage from the Pacific side, a feat attempted by Captain Cook only nine years before. To explore the China Seas, the Solomon Islands, and the Terra Australis, he had reached the coast of Alaska in June 1786, but after six weeks of bad weather, he had crossed to Asia in the early part of the following year. Thence he had made his way by the Philippine Islands to the coasts of Japan, Korea, and Chinese Tartary. Touching at Quelpart, he reached a bay near our modern Vladivostok, and on 2nd August, 1787, he discovered the strait that bears his name today, between Sakhalin and the North Island of Japan. Fortunately, from Kamchatka, where he had landed, he had sent home his journals, notes, plans, and maps by Lesseps, uncle of the famous Ferdinand de Lesseps of Suez Canal fame. On 26 January 1788, he landed at Botany Bay. From here he wrote his last letter to the French government. After leaving this port, he was never seen again. Many years later, in 1826, the wreck of his two ships was found on the reefs of an island near the New Hebrides. End of chapter 46《A Book of Discovery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 47 Bruce's Travels in Abyssinia Perhaps one of the strangest facts in the whole history of exploration is that Africa was almost an unknown land a hundred years ago, and stranger still, that there remains today nearly one-eleventh of the whole area still unexplored, and yet it is one of the three old continents that appear on every old chart of the world in ancient days, with its many mouthed Nile rising in weird spots and flowing in sundry impossible directions. Sometimes it joins the mysterious Niger, and together they flow through country labelled unknown or desert or negro land, or an enterprising cartographer fills up vacant spaces with wild animals stalking through the land. The coast tells a different tale. The west shores are studded with trading forts belonging to English, Danes, Dutch, and Portuguese, where slaves from the interior awaited shipment to the various countries that required Negro labor. The slave trade was the great, in fact the only, attraction to Africa at the beginning of the eighteenth century. In pursuit of this, men would penetrate quite a long way into the interior, but through the long centuries few explorers had traveled to the dark continent. Towards the end of the century we suddenly get one man, a young Scottish giant named James Bruce, thirsting for exploration for its own sake. He cared not for slaves or gold or ivory. He just wanted to discover the source of the Nile, over which a great mystery had hung since the days of Herodotus. The mountains of the moon figure largely on the old world maps, 
but Bruce decided to rediscover these for himself. Herodotus had said that Nile turned west and became the Niger. Others said it turned east and somehow joined the Tigris and Euphrates. Indeed, such was the uncertainty regarding its source that to discover the source of the Nile seemed equivalent to performing the impossible. James Bruce, athletic, daring, standing six feet four, seemed at the age of twenty-four made for a life of travel and adventure. His business took him to Spain and Portugal. He studied Arabic and the ancient language of Abyssinia. He came under the notice of Pitt and was made consul of Algiers. The idea of the undiscovered sources of the Nile took strong hold of Bruce's imagination. It was at this moment, he says, that I resolved that this great discovery should either be achieved by me or remain, as it has done for three thousand years, a defiance to all travellers. A violent dispute with the old Bay of Algiers ended Bruce's consulate, and in 1765, the spirit of adventure strong upon him, he sailed along the North African coast, landed at Tunis, and made his way to Tripoli. On the frontier he found a tribe of Arabs set apart to destroy the lions which beset the neighborhood. These people not only killed, but ate the lions, and they prevailed on Bruce to share their repast. But one meal was enough for the young explorer. In burning heat across the desert sands he passed on. Once a great caravan arrived, journeying from Fez to Mecca, consisting of three thousand men with camels laden with merchandise. But this religious pilgrimage was plundered in the desert soon after. Arrived at Benghazi, Bruce found a terrible famine raging, so he embarked on a little Greek ship bound for Crete. It was crowded with Arabs, the captain was ignorant, a violent storm arose, and close to Benghazi the ship struck upon a rock. Lowering a boat, Bruce and a number of Arabs sprang in and tried to row ashore. But wave after wave broke over them, and at last they had to swim for their lives. The surf was breaking on the shore, and Bruce was washed up breathless and exhausted. Arabs locking down to plunder the wreck found Bruce, and with blows and kicks stripped him of all his clothes and left him naked on the barren shore. At last an old Arab came along, threw a dirty rag over him, and led him to a tent, whence he reached Benghazi once more, and soon after crossed to Crete. It was not till July 1768 that the explorer at last reached Cairo en route from Abyssinia, and five months later embarked on board a Nile boat, or Kanja. His cabin had closed latticed windows, made not only to admit fresh air, but to be a defense against a set of robbers on the Nile, who were wont to swim under water in the dark, or on goatskins to pilfer any passing boats. Then, unfurling her vast sails, the Kanja bore Bruce on the first stage of his great journey. The explorer spent some time in trying to find the lost site of old Memphis, but this was difficult. A man's heart fails him in looking to the south, he says. He is lost in the immense expanse of desert, which he sees full of pyramids before him. Struck with terror from the unusual scene of vastness opened all at once upon leaving the palm trees, he becomes dispirited from the effect of the sultry climate. For some days the Kanja, with a fair wind, stemmed the strong current of the Nile. With great velocity she raced past various villages through the narrow green valley of cultivation, till the scene changed and large plantations of sugar canes and dates began. The wind had now become so strong that the Kanja could scarcely carry her sails. The current was rapid, and the velocity with which she dashed against the water was terrible. Still she flew on day after day, till early in January they reached the spot where spreading Nile parts hundred gated Thebes. Solitude and silence reigned over the magnificent old sepulchres. The hundred gates were gone, robbers swarmed, and the traveller hastened away. So on to Luxor and Karnak, 
to a great encampment of Arabs, who held sway over the desert which Bruce had now to cross. The old sheikh, whose protection was necessary, known as the tiger from his ferocious disposition, was very ill in his tent. Bruce gave him some lime water, which eased his pain, and rising from the ground, the old Arab stood upright and cried, Cursed be those of my people that ever shall lift up their hand against you in the desert. He strongly advised Bruce to return to Kenne and cross the desert from there, instead of going on by the Nile. Reluctantly Bruce turned back, and on 16th February 1769 he joined a caravan setting out to cross the desert to the shores of the Red Sea. Our road, he says, was all the way in an open plain, bounded by hillocks of sand and fine gravel, perfectly hard, but without trees, shrubs, or herbs. There are not even the traces of any living creature, neither serpent, lizard, antelope, nor ostrich, the usual inhabitants of the most dreary deserts. There is no sort of water. Even the birds seem to avoid the place as pestilential. The sun was burning hot. In a few days the scene changed, and Bruce is noting that in four days he passes more granite, porphyry, marble, and jasper than would build Rome, Athens, Corinth, Memphis, Alexandria, and half a dozen more. At last, after a week's travel, they reached Kosir, the little mud-walled village on the shores of the Red Sea. Here Bruce embarked in a small boat, the planks of which were sewn together instead of nailed, with a sort of a straw mattress as a sail, for the emerald mines described by Pliny. But he was driven back by a tremendous storm. Determined to survey the Red Sea, he sailed to the north, and after landing at Tor, at the foot of Mount Sinai, he sailed down the bleak coast of Arabia to Jeddah, the port of Mecca. By this time he was shaking with ague and fever, scorched by the burning sun, and weather beaten by wind and storm. Moreover, he was still dressed as a Turkish soldier. He was glad enough to find kindly English at Jeddah, and after two months' rest he sailed on to the Straits of Badel Manbeb. Being now on English ground, he drank the king's health and sailed across to Masoa, the main port of Abyssinia. Although he had letters of introduction from Judah, he had some difficulty with the chief of Masoa, but at last, dressed in long white Moorish robes, he broke away, and in November 1769 started forth for Gondar, the capital of Abyssinia. It was nearly one hundred and fifty years since any European of note had visited the country, and it was hard to get any information. His way led across mountainous country, rugged and steep. Far above the top of all towers, that stupendous mass, the mountain of Taranta, probably one of the highest in the world, the point of which is buried in the clouds, and very rarely seen but in the clearest weather, at other times abandoned to perpetual mist and darkness, the seat of lightning, thunder, and of storm. Violent storms added to the terrors of the way. Trees were torn up by the roots, and swollen streams rushed along in torrents. Bruce had started with his quadrant carried by four men, but the task of getting his cumbersome instruments up the steep sides of Taranta was intense. However, they reached the top at last, to find a huge plain, perhaps one of the highest in the world, and herds of beautiful cattle feeding. The cows were completely white, with large dewlaps hanging down to their knees, white horns, and long silky hair. After ninety-five days' journey, on 14th February, Bruce reached Gondar, the capital, on the flat summit of a high hill. Here lived the king of Abyssinia, a supposed descendant of King Solomon, but at the present time the country was in a lawless and unsettled condition. Moreover, smallpox was raging at the palace, and the royal children were smitten with it. Bruce's knowledge of medicine now stood him again in good stead. He opened all the doors and windows of the palace, washed his little patients with vinegar and warm water, sent away those not already infected, and all recovered. Bruce had sprung into court favor. 
the ferocious chieftain Ross Mihail, who had killed one king, poisoned another, and was now ruling in the name of a third, sent for him. The old chief was dressed in a coarse, dirty garment wrapped round him like a blanket. His long white hair hung down over his shoulders, while behind him stood soldiers, their lances ornamented with shreds of scarlet clothes, one for every man slain in a battle. Bruce was appointed master of the king's horse, a high office and richly paid. But I told him this was no kindness, said the explorer. My only wish was to see the country, and find the sources of the Nile. But time passed on, and they would not let him go, until, at last, he persuaded the authorities to make him ruler over the province where the Blue Nile was supposed to rise. Amid great opposition, he at last left the palace of Gondar on 28th October, 1770, and was soon on his way to the south to see a river and a bog, no part of which he could take away. An expedition wholly incomprehensible to the royal folk at Gondar. Two days' march brought him to the shores of the great lake Tsana, into which, despite the fact that he was tremendously hot and that crocodiles abounded there, the hardy young explorer plunged for a swim, and thus refreshed he proceeded on his way. He had now to encounter a new chieftain named Fasil, who at first refused to give him leave to pass on his way. It was not until Bruce had shown himself an able horseman and exhibited feats of strength and prowess that leave was at last granted. Fasil tested him in this wise. Twelve horses were brought to Bruce, saddled and bridled, to know which he would like to ride. Selecting an apparently quiet beast, the young traveler mounted. For the first two minutes, he says, I do not know whether I was most in the earth or in the air. He kicked behind, reared before, leaped like a deer all four legs of the ground. He then attempted to gallop, taking the bridle in his teeth. He continued to gallop and ran away as hard as he could, plunging out behind every ten yards, till he had no longer breath or strength and I began to think he would scarce carry me to the camp. On his return, Bruce mounted his own horse, and taking his double-barreled gun, he rode about, twisting and turning his horse in every direction, to the admiration of these wild Abyssinian folk. Not only did Fasil now let him go, but he dressed him in a fine, loose muslin garment, which reached to his feet, gave him guides and a handsome grey horse. Take this horse, he said, as a present from me. Do not mount it yourself. Drive it before you, saddled and bridled as it is. No man will touch you when he sees that horse. Bruce obeyed his orders, and the horse was driven in front of him. The horse was magic. The people gave it handfuls of barley and paid more respect to it than to Bruce himself. Though in many cases the people seemed scared, by the appearance of the horse, and fled away. On 2nd November the Nile came into sight. It was only 260 feet broad, but it was deeply revered by the people who lived on its banks. They refused to allow Bruce to ride across, but insisted on his taking off his shoes and walking through the shallow stream. It now became difficult to get food as they crossed the scorching hot plains. But Bruce was nearing his goal, and at last he stood at the top of the great Abyssinian tableland. Immediately below us appeared the Nile itself, strangely diminished in size, now only a brook that had scarcely water to turn a mill. Throwing off his shoes, trampling down the flowers that grew on the mountainside, falling twice in his excitement, Bruce ran down in breathless haste till he reached the hillock of green sod, which has made his name so famous. It is easier to guess than to describe the situation of my mind at that moment, standing in that spot which had baffled the genius, industry, and inquiry of both ancients and moderns for the course of near three thousand years. Kings had attempted this discovery at the heads of their armies. Fame, riches, and honor had been held out for a series of ages, 
without having produced one man capable of wiping off this stain upon the enterprise and abilities of mankind, or adding this desideratum for the encouragement of geography. Though a mere private Briton, I triumphed here over kings and their armies. I was but a few minutes arrived at the source of the Nile, through numberless dangers and sufferings, the least of which would have overwhelmed me, but for the continual goodness and protection of Providence. I was, however, but then half through my journey, and all those dangers which I had already passed awaited me again on my return. I found a despondency gaining ground fast upon me, and blasting the ground of laurels I had too rashly woven for myself. Bruce then filled a large coconut shell, which he had brought from Arabia, full of the Nile water, and drank to the health of His Majesty King George the Third. End of chapter 47 Chapter 48 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 48 Mongo Park and the Niger Bruce died in the spring of 1794. Just a year later, another Scotsman, Mungo Park, from Selkirk, started off to explore the great river Niger, whose course was as mysterious as that of the Nile. Most of the early geographers knew something of a great river running through Negroland. Indeed, Herodotus tells of five young men, the Nasamonis, who set out to explore the very heart of Africa. Arrived at the edge of the great sandy desert, they collected provisions and supplied themselves with water, and plunged courageously into the unknown. For weary days they made their way across to the south, till they were rewarded by finding themselves in a fertile land, well watered by lakes and marshes, with fruit trees and a little race of men and women whom they called pygmies and a large river was flowing from west to east, probably the Niger. But the days of Herodotus are long since past. It was centuries later when the Arabs, fury with the faith of Mohammed, swept over the unexplored lands. With a fury enthusiasm that nothing could withstand, and inspired by a hope of heaven which nothing could shake, they swept from district to district, from tribe to tribe, everywhere proclaiming to rowing multitudes the face of their master. In this spirit they had faced the terrors of the Sahara Desert, and in the tenth century reached the land of the Negroes, found the Niger, and established schools and mosques westward of Timbuktu. Portugal had then begun to play her part, and the fifteenth century is full of the wonderful voyages inspired by Prince Henry of Portugal which culminated in the triumph of Vasco da Gama's great voyage to India by the Cape of Good Hope. Then the slave trade drew the Elizabethan Englishmen to the shores of West Africa, and the coast was studded with forts and stations in connection with it. Yet in the eighteenth century the Niger and Timbuktu were still a mystery. In 1778 the African Association was founded, with our old friend, Sir Joseph Banks, as an active member, inquiring for a suitable man to follow up the work of the explorer Houghton, who had just perished in the desert on his way to Timbuktu. The opportunity produced the man. Mungo Park, a young Scotsman, bitten with the fever of unrest, had just returned from a voyage to the east on board an East India Company's ship. He heard of this new venture and applied for it. The African Association instantly accepted his services, and on 22nd May, 1795, Mungo Park left England on board the Endeavour, and after a pleasant voyage of thirty days, landed at the mouth of the river Gambia. The river is navigable for four hundred miles from its mouth, 
and Park sailed up to a native town, where the endeavor was anchored, while he set out on horseback for a little village, Pisania, where a few British subjects traded in slaves, ivory, and gold. Here he stayed a while, to learn the language of the country. Fever delayed him till the end of November, when the rains were over, the native crops had been reaped, and food was cheap and plentiful. On 3rd December he made a start, his sole attendants being a negro servant, Johnson, and a slave boy. Mungo Park was mounted on a strong, spirited little horse, his attendants on donkeys. He had provisions for two days, beads, amber, and tobacco, for buying fresh food, an umbrella, a compass, a thermometer, and pocket sextant, some pistols and firearms. And thus attended, thus provided, thus armed, Mungo Park started for the heart of Africa. Three days traveling brought him to Medina, where he found the old king sitting on a bullock's hide, warming himself before a large fire. He begged the English explorer to turn back and not to travel into the interior, for the people there had never seen a white man, and would most certainly destroy him. Mungo Park was not so easily deterred, and taking farewell of the good old king, he took a guide and proceeded on his way. A day's journey brought him to a village, where a curious custom prevailed. Hanging on a tree, he found a sort of masquerading dress made out of bark. He discovered that it belonged to a strange bugbear known to all the natives of the neighborhood as Mumbo Jumbo. The natives, or kafirs, of this part had many wives, with the result that family quarrels often took place. If a husband was offended by his wife, he disappeared into the woods, disguised himself in the dress of Mumbo Jumbo, and armed with the rod of authority, announced his advent by loud and dismal screams near the town. All hurried to the accepted meeting place, for none dared disobey. The meeting opened with song and danced till midnight, when Mumbo Jumbo announced the offending wife. The unlucky victim was then seized, stripped, tied to a post, and beaten with Mumbo's rod amid the shouts of the assembled company. A few days before Christmas, Park entered Faticonda, the place where Major Houghton had been robbed and badly used. He therefore took some amber, tobacco, and an umbrella as gifts to the king, taking care to put on his best blue coat, lest it should be stolen. The king was delighted with his gifts. He furled and unfurled his umbrella, to the great admiration of his attendants. The king then praised my blue coat, says Park, of which the yellow buttons seemed particularly to catch his fancy, and entreated me to give it to him, assuring me, that he would wear it on all public occasions. As it was against my interest to offend him by a refusal, I very quietly took off my coat, the only good one in my possession, and laid it at his feet. Then without his coat and umbrella, but in peace, Park travelled onward to the dangerous district, which was so infested with robbers that the little party had to travel by night. The howling of wild beasts alone broke the awful silence as they crept forth by moonlight on their way. But the news that a white man was traveling through their land spread, and he was surrounded by a party of horsemen who robbed him of nearly all his possessions. His attendant Johnson urged him to return, for certain death awaited him. But Park was not the man to turn back and he was soon rewarded by finding the king's nephew, who conducted him in safety to the banks of the Senegal River. Then he travelled on to the next king, who rejoiced in the name of Daisy Korrabari. Here Mungo learned, to his dismay, that war was going on in the province that lay between him and the Niger, and the king could not offer a protection. Still nothing deterred the resolute explorer, who took another route and continued his journey. Again he had to travel by night, for robbers haunted his path, which now lay among Mohammedans. He passed the very spot 
where Houghton had been left to die of starvation in the desert. As he advanced through these inhospitable regions, new difficulties met him. His attendants firmly refused to move farther. Mungo Park was now alone, in the great desert Negro land, between the Senegal and the Niger, as with magnificent resolution he continued his way. Suddenly a clear halloo rang out on the night air. It was his black boy who had followed him to share his fate. Onward they went together, hoping to get safely through the land where Mohammedans ruled over low-caste negroes. Suddenly a party of Moors surrounded him, bidding him come to Ali, the chief, who wished to see a white man and a Christian. Park now found himself the center of an admiring crowd. Men, women, and children crowded round him, pulling at his clothes and examining his waistcoat buttons, till he could hardly move. Arrived at Ali's tent, Mungo found an old man with a long white beard. The surrounding attendants, and especially the ladies, were most inquisitive. They asked a thousand questions, inspected every part of my clothes, searched my pockets, and obliged me to unbutton my waistcoat and display the whiteness of my skin. They even counted my toes and fingers, as if they doubted whether I was in truth a human being. He was lodged in a hut made of corn stalks, and a wild hog was tied to a stake as a suitable companion for the hated Christian. He was brutally ill-treated, closely watched, and insulted by the rudest savages on earth. The desert winds scorched him, the sand choked him, the heavens above were like brass, the earth beneath as the floor of an oven. Fear came on him, as he dreaded death with his work yet unfinished. At last he escaped from his this awful captivity amid the wilds of Africa. Early one morning at sunrise, he stepped over the sleeping negroes, seized his bundle, jumped on to his horse, and rode away as hard as he could. Looking back, he saw three moors in hot pursuit, whooping and brandishing their double-barreled guns. But he was beyond reach, and he breathed again. Now starvation stared him in the face. To the pangs of hunger were added the agony of thirst. The sun beat down pitilessly, and at last Mungo fell on the sand. Here, he thought, here, after a short but ineffectual struggle, I must end all my hopes of being useful in my day and generation. Here must the short span of my life come to an end. But happily a great storm came, and Mungo spread out his clothes to collect the drops of rain, and quenched his thirst by wringing them out and sucking them. After this refreshment he led his tired horse, directing his way by the compass, lit up at intervals by vivid flashes of lightning. It was not till the third week of his flight that his reward came. I was told I should see the Niger early next day, he wrote on 20th July, 1796. We were riding through some marshy ground when someone called out, See the water! And looking forwards, I saw with infinite pleasure the great object of my mission, the long sought for majestic Niger, glittering to the morning sun, as broad as the Thames at Westminster, and flowing slowly to the eastward. I hastened to the brink, and having drunk of the water, lifted up my fervent thanks in prayer to the great ruler of all things, for having thus far crowned my endeavors with success. The circumstance of the Niger's flowing towards the east did not excite my surprise, for although I had left Europe in great hesitation on this subject, I had received from Negroes clear assurances that its general course was towards the rising sun. He was now near Sigo, the capital of Bambara, on the Niger, a city of some thirty thousand inhabitants. The view of this extensive city, the numerous canoes upon the river, the crowded population, and the cultivated state of the surrounding country, formed altogether a prospect of civilization and magnificence, 
which I little expected to find in the bosom of Africa. The natives looked at the poor, thin, white stranger with astonishment and fear, and refused to allow him to cross the river. All day he sat without food, under the shade of a tree, and was proposing to climb the tree and rest among its branches, to find shelter from a coming storm, when a poor negro woman took pity on his deplorable condition. She took him to her hut, lit a lamp, spread a mat upon the floor, broiled him a fish, and allowed him to sleep. While he rested, she spun cotton with other women and sang. The winds roared and the rains fell. The poor white man, faint and weary, came and sat under our tree. He has no mother to bring him milk, no wife to grind his corn. And all joined in the chorus, Let us pity the white man, no mother has he. Mungo Park left in the morning, after presenting his landlady, with two of his last four brass buttons. But though he made another gallant effort to reach Timbuktu and the Niger, which he was told ran to the world's end, lions and mosquitoes made life impossible. His horse was too weak to carry him any farther, and on 29th July, 1796, he sadly turned back. Worn down by sickness, exhausted by hunger and fatigue, half-naked, and without any article of value by which I might get provisions, clothes, or lodging, I felt I should sacrifice my life to no purpose, for my discoveries would perish with me. Joining a caravan of slaves, he reached the coast after some nineteen hundred miles, and after an absence of two years and nine months, he found a suit of English clothes, disrobed his chin of venerable encumbrance, and sailed for home. He published an account of the journey in 1799, after which he married and settled in Scotland as a doctor. But his heart was in Africa, and a few years later he started off again to reach Timbuktu. He arrived at the Gambia early in April 1805. If all goes well, he wrote gaily, this day, six weeks, I expect to drink all your health in the water of the Niger. He started this time with forty-four Europeans, each with donkeys to carry baggage and food, but it was a deplorable little party that reached the great river on 19th August. Thirty men had died on the march, the donkeys had been stolen, the baggage lost, and the joy experienced by the explorer in reaching the waters of the Niger, rolling its immense stream along the plain, was marred by the reduction of his little party to seven. Leave to pass down the river to Timbuktu was obtained by the gift of two double-barreled guns to the king, and in their old canoes, patched together under the magnificent name of His Majesty's schooner the Joliba, Great Water, Mungo Park wrote his last letter home. I am far from desponding. I have changed a large canoe into a tolerably good schooner, on board of which I shall set sail to the east, with a fixed resolution to discover the termination of the Niger, or perish in the attempt. And though all the Europeans who are with me should die, and though I myself were half dead, I would still persevere, and if I could not succeed in the object of my journey, I would at least die on the Niger. It was in this spirit that the commander of the Joliba and the crew of nine set forth to glide down a great river toward the heart of savage Africa into the darkness of the unexplored. The rest is silence. End of chapter 48「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティナイン」「フォーティ
The English were busy opening up the great fur-trading country in North America. Although Captain Cook had taken possession of Nootka Sound, thinking it was part of the coast of New Albion, men from other nations had been there to establish with the natives a trade in furs. The Spaniards were specially vigorous in opening up communications on this bleak bit of western coast. Great Britain became alarmed and decided to send Captain Vancouver with an English ship to enforce her rights to this valuable port. Vancouver had already sailed with Cook on his second southern voyage. He had accompanied him on the discovery during his last voyage. He therefore knew something of the coast of northwest America. On the 15th of December, 1790, I had the honor of receiving my commission as commander of His Majesty's sloop, the Discovery, then lying at Deptford, where I joined her, says Vancouver, Lieutenant Brockton having been selected as a proper officer to command the Chatham. He was accordingly appointed. At day dawn, on Friday the 1st of April, we took a long farewell of our native shores. Having no particular route to the Pacific Ocean, pointed out in my instructions, I did not hesitate to prefer the passage by way of the Cape of Good Hope. In boisterous weather, Vancouver rounded the Cape, made some discoveries on the southern coast of New Holland, surveyed part of the New Zealand coast, discovered Catham Island, and on 17th April, 1792, he fell in with the coast of New Albion. It was blowing and raining hard when the coast, soon after to be part of the United States of America, was sighted by the captains and crews of the Discovery and Catham. Amid gales of wind and torrents of rain, they coasted along the rocky and precipitous shores, on which the surf broke with a dull roar. It was dangerous enough for coasting along this unsurveyed coast, full of sunken rocks on which the sea broke with great violence. Soon they were at Cape Blanco, discovered by Martin de Aguilar, and a few days later at Cape Fallweather, of Cook fame, close to the so-called straits discovered by the Greek pilot John de Fuca in 1592. Suddenly, relates Vancouver, a sail was discovered to the westward. This was a very great novelty, not having seen any vessel during the last eight months. She soon hoisted American colors and proved to be ship Columbia, commanded by Captain Gray, belonging to Boston. He had penetrated about fifty miles into the disputed strait. He spoke of the mouth of a river that was inaccessible owing to breakers. This was afterwards explored by Vancouver, and named the Columbia River, on which Washington now stands. Having examined two hundred and fifteen miles of coast, Vancouver and his two ships now entered the inlet, the Fuca Straits, now the boundary between the United States and British Columbia. All day they made their way up the strait, till night came, and Vancouver relates with pride that we had now advanced farther up this inlet than Mr. Gray or any other person from the civilized world. We are on the point of examining an entirely new region, he adds, and in the most delightful pleasant weather. Snowy ranges of hills, stately forest trees, vast spaces, and the tracks of deer reminded the explorers of old England. The crews were given holiday, and great joy prevailed. Natives soon brought them fish and venison for sale, and were keen to sell their children in exchange for knives, trinkets, and copper. As they advanced through the inlet, the fresh beauty of the country appealed to the English captain. To describe the beauties of this region will be a very grateful task to the pen of a skillful panegyrist. The serenity of the climate, the pleasing landscapes, and the abundant fertility that an assisted nature puts forth require only to be enriched by the industry of men with villages, mansions, and cottages to render it the most lovely country that can be imagined. A fortnight was spent among the islands of this inlet, which I have distinguished by the name of Admiralty Inlet, and on the 4th June, 1792, they drank the health of the king, George III, in a double allowance of grog, 
and on his fifty-fourth birthday took formal possession of the country, naming the wider part of the strait the Gulf of Georgia and the mainland New Georgia. The two ships then made their way through the narrow and intricate channels separating the island of Vancouver from the mainland of British Columbia, till at last, early in August, they emerged into an open channel, discovered by an Englishman four years before, and named Queen Charlotte Sound. Numerous rocky islets made navigation very difficult, and one day, in foggy weather, the discovery suddenly grounded on a bed of sunken rocks. The Catham was near at hand, and at the signal of distress lowered her boats for assistance. For some hours, says Vancouver, immediate and inevitable destruction presented itself. She grounded at four in the p.m., till two next morning all hands were working at throwing ballast overboard to lighten her, till, to our inexpressible joy, the return of the tide floated her once more. Having now satisfied himself that this was an island lying close to the mainland, Vancouver made for Nootka Sound, where he arrived at the end of August. At the entrance of the sound he was visited by a Spanish officer, with a pilot to lead them to a safe anchorage in Friendly Cove, where the Spanish ship, under one quadra, was riding at anchor. Civilities were interchanged with much harmony and festivity. As many officers as could be spared from the vessel, and myself dined with Senor Quadra, and were gratified with a repast we had lately been little accustomed to. A dinner of five courses, consisting of a superfluity of the best provisions, was served with great elegance. A royal salute was fired on drinking health to the sovereigns of England and Spain, and a salute of seventeen guns to the success of the service in which the Discovery and Catham were engaged. But when the true nature of Vancouver's mission was disclosed, there was some little difficulty, for the Spaniards had fortified Nootka, built houses, laid out gardens, and evidently intended to stay. Vancouver sent Captain Broughton home to report the conduct of the Spaniards, and spent his time serving the coast to the south. Finally all was arranged satisfactorily, and Vancouver sailed off to the Sandwich Islands. When he returned home in the autumn of 1794, he had completed the gigantic task of surveying 9,000 miles of unknown coast, chiefly in open boats, with only the loss of two men in both crews, a feat that almost rivaled that of Captain Cook. It has been said that Vancouver may proudly take his place with Drake, Cook, Baffin, Perry, and other British navigators, to whom England looks with pride and geographers with gratitude. End of chapter 49「Of a Book of Discovery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh Chapter 50 Mackenzie and His River Even while Vancouver was making discoveries on the western coast of North America, Alexander Mackenzie an enthusiastic young Scotsman, was making discoveries on behalf of the Northwestern Company, which was rivaling the old Hudson Bay Company in its work of expansion. His journey right across America from sea to sea is worthy of note, and it has well been said that by opening intercourse between Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and forming regular establishments through the interior and at both extremes, as well as along the coasts and islands, the entire command of the fur trade of North America might be obtained. To this may be added the fishing in both seas and the markets of the four quarters of the globe. Mackenzie had already explored the great river flowing through North America to the Arctic seas in 1789. He had brought back news of its great size, its width, its volume of water, only to be mistrusted till many years later it was found that every word was true, and tributes were paid, not only to his general accuracy, but to his general intelligence as an explorer. 
In 1792 he started off again, and this time he discovered the immense country that lay hidden behind the Rocky Mountains, known today as British Columbia. He ascended the Peace River, which flows from the Rocky Mountains, and in the spring of 1793, having made his way with much difficulty across this rugged chain, he embarked on a river running to the southwest. Through wild mountainous country on either side he paddled on. The cold was still intense, and the strong mountain currents nearly dashed the canoes to pieces. His Indian guides were obstinate, ignorant, and timid. Mackenzie relates some of his difficulties in graphic language. Throughout the whole of this day, the men had been in a state of extreme ill-humor, and as they did not choose to vent it openly upon me, they disputed and quarreled among themselves. About sunset, the canoe struck upon the stump of a tree, which broke a large hole in her bottom, a circumstance that gave them an opportunity to let loose their discontents without reserve. I left them as soon as we had landed, and ascended an elevated bank. It now remained for us to fix on a proper place for building another canoe, as the old one was become a complete wreck. At a very early hour of the morning, every man was employed in making preparations for building another canoe, and different parties went in search of wood and gum. While the boat was building, Mackenzie gave his crew a good lecture on their conduct. I assured them it was my fixed, unalterable determination to proceed, in spite of every difficulty and danger. The result was highly satisfactory. The conversation dropped, and the work went on. In five days the canoe was ready, and they were soon paddling happily onwards towards the sea, where the Indians told him he would find white men building houses. They reached the coast some three weeks later. The Salmon River, as it is called, flows through British Columbia and reaches the sea just north of Vancouver Island, which had been discovered by Vancouver the year before. Alexander Mackenzie had been successful. Let us hear the end of his tale. I now mixed up some vermilion in melted crease and inscribed in large characters on the southeast face of the rock on which we had slept the last night this brief memorial. Alexander Mackenzie, from Canada, by land, the 22nd of July, 1793. End of chapter 50Chapter 51 of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 51. Perry Discovers Lancaster Sound. The efforts of Arctic explorers of past years Frobisher, Davis, Buffin, Bering, and Cook, had all been more or less frustrated by the impenetrable barrier of ice, which seemed to stretch across the polar regions like a wall, putting an end to all further advance. Now, early in the nineteenth century, this impenetrable bar of ice had apparently moved and broken up into detached masses and icebergs. The news of a distinct change in the polar ice was brought home by various traders in the Greenland waters, and soon gave rise to a revival of these voyages for the discovery of the North Pole and a passage round the northern coast of America to the Pacific Ocean. For this coast was totally unknown at this time. Information was collected from casual travellers, whale fishers, and others, with the result that England equipped two ships for a voyage of discovery to the disputed regions. These were the Isabella, 885 tons, and the Alexander, 252 tons. Commander Ross being appointed to one, and Lieutenant Perry to the other. Perry had served on the coast of North America, and had written a little treatise on the stars in the northern hemisphere. He was thinking of offering his services for African discovery, when he caught a sight of a paragraph in a paper, 
about an expedition for the discovery of the Northwest Passage. He wrote at once that he was ready for hot or for cold, Africa or the polar regions. And he was at once appointed to the latter. The object of the voyage was clearly set forth. The young explorers were to discover a passage from Davis Strait along the northern coast of America, and through the Bering Strait into the Pacific Ocean. Besides this, charts and pictures were to be brought back, and the special artist was to accompany the expedition. Ross himself was an artist, and he has delightfully illustrated his own journals of the expedition. The ships were well supplied with books, and we find the journals of Mackenzie, Hearn, Vancouver, Cook, and other old travelling friends taken for reference. Thirty Bibles and sixty Testaments were distributed among the crews. For making friends with the natives, we find a supply of twenty-four brass kettles, one hundred and fifty butcher's knives, three hundred and fifty yards of colored flannel, one hundred pounds of snuff, one hundred and fifty pounds of soap, forty umbrellas, and much gin and brandy. The expedition left on 18th April, 1818, and I believe, says Ross, there was not a man who did not indulge after the fashion of a sailor in feeling that its issue was placed in his hands, whose power is most visible in the great deep. Before June had set in, the two ships were ploughing their way up the west coast of Greenland in heavy snowstorms. They sailed through Davis Strait, past the island of Disco, into Buffins and Defined Bay. Icebergs stood high out of the water on all sides, and navigation was very dangerous. Towards the end of July, a bay to which Ross gave the name of Melville Bay, after the first Lord of the Admiralty, was passed. Very high mountains of land and ice were seen to the north side of Melville Bay, forming an impassable barrier, the precipices next the sea being from one thousand to two thousand feet high. The ships were sailing slowly past the desolate shores, amid these high icebergs, when suddenly several natives appeared on the ice. Now Ross had brought an Eskimo with him, named Sahoes. "'Come on!' cried Sahoes to the astonished natives. "'No, no, go away!' they cried. "'Go away! We can kill you!' "'What great creatures are these?' they asked, pointing to the ships. Do they come from the sun or the moon? Do they give us light by night or by day? Pointing southwards, Sahoys told them that the strangers had come from a distant country. That cannot be. There is nothing but ice there, was the answer. Soon the Englishmen made friends with these people, whom they called Arctic Highlanders, giving the name of the Arctic Highlands to all the land in the northeast corner of Buffins Bay. Passing Cape York, they followed the almost perpendicular coast, even as Buffin had done. They passed Wolstenholm Sound and Whale Sound, they saw Smith Sound, and named the capes on either side Isabella and Alexander after their two ships. And then Ross gave up all further discovery, for the time being in this direction. Even if it be imagined that some narrow strait may exist through these mountains, it is evident that it must forever be unnavigable, he says decidedly, being thus satisfied that there could be no further inducement to continue longer in this place, I shaped my course for the next opening, which appeared in view to the westward. This was the sound, which was afterwards called Jones Sound. We ran nine miles among very heavy ice, until noon, when a very thick fog coming on, we were obliged to take shelter under a large iceberg. Sailing south, but some way from land, a wide opening appeared, which answered exactly to the Lancaster Sound of Baffin. Lieutenant Perry and many of his officers felt sure that this was a strait communicating with the open sea to westward, and were both astonished and dismayed, when Ross, declaring that he was perfectly satisfied that there was no passage in this direction, turned back. He brought his expedition back to England after a seven-month trip. But though he was certain enough on the subject, 
His officers did not agree with him entirely, and the subject of the Northwest Passage was still discussed in geographical circles. When young Lieutenant Perry, who had commanded the Alexander and Ross expedition, was consulted, he pressed for further exploration of the far north, and two expeditions were soon fitted out, one under Perry and one under Franklin, who had already served with Flinders in Australian exploration. Perry started off first with instructions to explore Lancaster Sound, failing to find a passage to explore Alderman Jones Sound, failing this again, Sir Thomas Smith's Sound. If he succeeded in getting through to the Bering Strait, he was to go to Kamchatka and on to the Sandwich Islands. You are to understand, ran the instructions, that the finding of a passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific is the main object of this expedition. On board the Hecla, a ship of 375 tons, with a 180-ton brig, the Gripper, accompanying, Perry sailed away early in May, 1819. The first week in July found him crossing the Arctic Circle, amid immense icebergs against which a heavy southerly swell was violently agitated, dashing the loose ice with tremendous force, sometimes raising a white spray over them to the height of more than a hundred feet, accompanied with a loud noise, exactly resembling the roar of distant thunder. The entrance to Lancaster Sound was reached on 31st July, and, says Perry, it is more easy to imagine than to describe the almost breathless anxiety which was now visible in every countenance, while, as the breeze increased to the fresh gale, we ran quickly up the sound. Officers and men crowded to the masthead as the ships ran on and on, till they reached Barrow Strait, so named by them after the Secretary of the Admiralty. We now began to flatter ourselves that we had fairly entered the polar sea, and some of the most sunken among us had even calculated the bearing and distance of Icy Cape as a matter of no very difficult accomplishment. Sailing westward, they found a large island, which they named Melville Island, after the first lord of the admiralty, and a bay which still bears the name of Hecla and Gripper Bay. Here, says Perry, the ensigns and pendants were hoisted, and it created in us no ordinary feelings of pleasure to see the British flag waving, for the first time, in those regions which had hitherto been considered beyond the limits of the habitable world. Winter was now quickly advancing, and it was with some difficulty that the ships were forced through the newly formed ice at the head of the bay of the Hecla and Gripper. Over two miles of ice, seven inches thick, had to be sawn through to make a canal for the ships. As soon as they were moored in Winter Harbor, the men gave three loud and hearty cheers as a preparation for eight or nine months of long and dreary winter. By the end of September all was ready. Plenty of grouse and deer remained as food through October, after which there were foxes and wolves. To amuse his men, Perry and his officers got up a play. Miss in her teens was performed on 5th November, the last day of sun for ninety-six days to come. He also started a paper, the North Georgian Gazette and Winter Chronicle, which was printed in England on their return. The New Year, 1890, found the winter growing gloomier. Scurvy had made its appearance, and Perry was using every device in his power to arrest it. Amongst other things, he grew mustard and cress in boxes of earth near the stovepipe of his cabin to make fresh vegetable food for the afflicted men. Though the sun was beginning to appear again, February was the coldest part of the year, and no one could be long out in the open without being frostbitten. It was not till the middle of April that a slight thaw began, and the thermometer rose to freezing point. On 1st August the ships were able to sail out of Winter Harbor and to struggle westward again, but they could not get beyond Melville Island for the ice, and after the ships had been knocked about by it, 
Perry decided to return to Lancaster Sound once more. Hugging the western shores of Baffin's Bay, the two ships were turned homewards, arriving in the Thames early in November 1820. And, says Perry, I had the happiness of seeing every officer and man on board both ships, ninety-three persons, return to their native country in as robust health as when they left it, after an absence of nearly eighteen months. Perry had done more than this. He not only showed the possibility of wintering in these icy regions in good health and good spirits, but he had certainly discovered straits communicating with the polar sea. End of chapter 51《ฉันเป็นผู้ที่ได้รับการสนับสนุนจากผู้ที่ได้รับการสนับสนุนจากผู้ที่ได้รับการสนับสนุนจากผู้ที่ได้รับการสนับสนุนจากผู้ที่
no less astonishing than agreeable. At the same time clouds of mosquitoes and stinging sand-flies made the nights horrible. On 18th July, the little party, in high glee, set forward in canoes rowed by Canadian boatmen, hoping to reach the Copper Mine River before winter set in. But the difficulties of the way were great. Provisions were scarce. The boatmen grew discontented. Ice appeared early, and Franklin had to satisfy himself with wintering at a point five hundred and fifty miles from Lake Atabasca, which he called Fort Enterprise. Here there was prospect of plenty, for large herds of reindeer were grazing along the shores of the lake, and from their flesh pemmican was made. But the winter was long and cheerless, and Franklin soon realized that there was not enough food to last through it. Though he dispatched the midshipman black, to Lake Atabasca for help. Beck's journey was truly splendid, and we cannot omit his simple summary. On the 17th of March, he says, at an early hour we arrived at Fort Enterprise, having travelled about eighteen miles a day. I had the pleasure of meeting my friends all in good health, after an absence of nearly five months, during which time I had travelled one thousand one hundred and four miles on snowshoes, and had no other covering at night than a blanket and deerskin, with the thermometer frequently at forty degrees below zero, and sometimes two or three days without tasting food. By his courage and endurance he saved the whole party at Fort Enterprise. By June the spring was sufficiently advanced to set out for the Copper Mine River, and on July they reached the mouth after a tedious journey of three hundred and thirty-four miles. The real work of exploration was now to begin, and the party embarked in two canoes to sail along the southern coast of the Polar Sea, with the possibility, always, of meeting the Perry expedition. But the poor Canadian boatmen were terrified at the sight of the sea, on which they had never yet sailed, and they were with difficulty persuaded to embark. Indeed, of the two crews, only the five Englishmen had ever been on the sea, and it has been well said that this voyage along the shores of the rock-bound coast of the Arctic Sea must always take rank as one of the most daring and hazardous exploits that have ever been accomplished in the interest of geographical research. The two canoes hugged the icy coast as they made their way eastward, and Franklin named the bays, headlands, and islands for a distance of five hundred and fifty-five miles, where a point he called Cape Turnagain marks his farthest limit east. Here is George the Fourth, Coronation Gulf, studded with islands, Hood's River, Back's River, Bathurst Inlet, named after the Secretary of State, and Perry Bay, after my friend Captain Perry, now employed in the interesting research for a northwest passage. The short season for exploration was now over. Rough weather and want of food turned them home, only half satisfied with their work. The worst part of their journey was yet to come. Perhaps never, even in the tragic history of Arctic exploration, had greater hardships been endured that Franklin and his handful of men were to endure on their homeward way. On 22nd August, the party left Point Turn again, hoping by means of their newly discovered Hood River to reach Fort Enterprise. The ground was already covered with snow, and their food was reduced to one meal a day when they left the shores of the Arctic Sea for their long inland tramp. Needless to say, the journey had to be performed on foot, and the way was stony and barren. For the first few days nothing was to be found, save lichen to eat, and the temperature was far below freezing point. An uncooked cow after six days of lichen infused spirit into our starving party, relates Franklin. But things grew no better, and as they proceeded sadly on their way, starvation stared them in face. One day we hear of the pangs of hunger being stilled by pieces of singed hide mixed with lichen. 
Another time the horns and bones of a dead deer were fried with some old shoes, and the putrid carcass of a deer that had died the previous spring was demolished by the starving men. At last things grew so bad that Franklin and the most vigorous of his party pushed on to forced enterprise, to get and send back food, if possible, to Richardson and Hood, who were now almost too weak and ill to get along at all. Bitter disappointment awaited them. At length, says Franklin, we reached Fort Enterprise, and to our infinite disappointment and grief found it a perfectly desolate habitation. There were no provisions, no Indians. It would be impossible for me to describe our sensations after entering this miserable abode and discovering how we had been neglected. The whole party shed tears, not so much for our own fate as for that of our friends in the rear, whose lives depended entirely on our sending immediate relief from this place. A few old bones and skins of reindeer were collected for supper, and the worn-out explorers sat round a fire, made by pulling up the flooring of the rooms. It is hardly a matter of surprise to find the following entry in Franklin's journal. When I arose the following morning, my body and limbs were so swollen that I was unable to walk more than a few yards. Before November arrived, another tragedy happened. Hood was murdered by one of the party, almost mad with hunger and misery. One after another now dropped down and died, and death seemed to be claiming Franklin, Richardson, Beck, and Hepburn, when three Indians made their appearance, with some dried deer and a few tongs. It was not a moment too soon. The Indians soon got game and fish for the starving men, until they were sufficiently restored to leave Fort Enterprise and make their way to Moose Deer Island, where, with the Hudson Bay officers, they spent the winter recovering their health and strength and spirits. When they returned to England in the summer of 1822, they had accomplished 5,550 miles. They had also endured hardships unsurpassed in the history of exploration. When Perry returned to England the following summer, and heard of Franklin's sufferings, he cried like a child. He must have realized better than anyone else what those sufferings really were, though he himself had fared better. While Franklin had been making his way to the Coppermine River, Perry, on board the Fury, accompanied by the Hecla, started for Hudson Strait, by which he was to penetrate to the Pacific if possible. Owing to bad weather, the expedition did not arrive amid the icebergs till the middle of June. Towering two hundred feet high, the explorers counted fifty-four at one time, before they arrived at Resolution Island at the mouth of Hudson Strait. There were already plenty of well-known landmarks in the region of Hudson's Bay, and Perry soon made his way to Southampton Island and Frozen Strait over which an angry discussion had taken place some hundred years before. He was rewarded by discovering a magnificent bay, to which he gave the name of Duke of York's Bay. The discovery, however, was one of little importance as there was no passage. The winter was fast advancing, the navigable season was nearly over, and the explorers seemed to be only at the beginning of their work. The voyage had been dangerous, harassing, unproductive. They had advanced towards Bering Strait. They had discovered two hundred leagues of North American coast, and they now prepared to spend the winter in these ice-bound regions. As usual, Perry arranged both for the health and amusement of his men during the long Arctic months, even producing a joint of English roast beef for Christmas dinner, preserved by rubbing the outside with salt and hanging it on deck covered with canvas. There were also Eskimos in the neighborhood, who proved a never-ceasing source of interest. One day in April, snow had been falling all night, news spread 
that the Eskimos had killed something on the ice. If the women, says Perry, were cheerful before, they were now absolutely frantic. A general shout of joy re-echoed through the village. They ran into each other's huts to communicate the welcome intelligence, and actually hugged one another in an ecstasy of delight. When the first burst of joy had at last subsided, the women crept one by one into the apartment where the seahorses had been conveyed. Here they obtained blubber enough to set all their lamps alight, besides a few scraps of meat for their children and themselves. Fresh cargoes were continually arriving, the principal part being brought in by the dogs, and the rest by the men, who tied a thong round their waist and dragged in a portion. Every lamp was now swimming with oil, the huts exhibited a blaze of light, and never was there a scene of more joyous festivity than while the cutting up of the walruses continued. For three solid hours the Eskimos appeared to be eating walrus flesh. Indeed, the quantity they continued to get rid of is almost beyond belief. It was not till early in July that the ship could be moved out of their winter's dock to renew their efforts toward a passage. They were not a little helped by Eskimo charts, but old ice blocked the way, and it was the middle of August before Perry discovered the strait he called, after his two ships, the Strait of the Fury and Hecla, between Melville Peninsula and Cockburn Island. Confident that the narrow channel led to the polar seas, Perry pushed on, till our progress was once more opposed by a barrier of the same impenetrable and hopeless ice as before. He organized land expeditions and reports. The opening of the strait into the polar sea was now so decided that I considered the principal object of my journey accomplished. September had come, and once more the ships were established in their winter quarters. A second month in among the ice must have been a severe trial to this little band of English explorers. But cheerfully enough, they built a wall of snow twelve feet high round the fury to keep out snowdrifts. The season was long and severe, and it was August before they could get free from ice. The prospect of a third winter in the ice could not be safely faced, and Perry resolved to get home. October found them at the Shetlands, all the bells of Lerwick being set ringing, and the town illuminated with joy, at the arrival of men, who had been away from all civilization for twenty-seven months. On 14th November, 1828, the expedition arrived home in England. Still the restless explorer was longing to be off again. He was still fascinated by the mysteries of the Arctic regions, but on his third voyage we need not follow him for the results were of no great importance. The fury was wrecked among the ice in Prince Regent's Island, and the whole party had to return on board the Hecla in 1825. End of chapter 52 Chapter 53 of A Book of Discovery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. V. Singh Chapter 53 Franklin's Land Journey to the North The northern shores of North America were not yet explored, and Franklin proposed another expedition to the mouth of the Mackenzie River, where the party was to divide half of them going to the east and half to the west. Nothing daunted by his recent sufferings, Franklin accepted the supreme command, and amid the foremost volunteers for service were his old friends, Back and Richardson. The officers of the expedition left England in February 1825, and traveling by way of New York and Canada, they reached Fort Cumberland the following June. A month later, they were at Fort Chippewan, on the shores of Lake Athabasca, and soon they had made their way to the banks of the Great Bear-like River, 
which flows out of that lake into the Mackenzie River, down which they were to descend to the sea. They decided to winter on the shores of the Bear Lake, but Franklin could never bear inaction, so he resolved to push on to the mouth of the Great River, with a small party in order to prospect for the coming expedition. So correct had been Mackenzie's survey of this great river, as it was called, that Franklin, in justice to his memory, named it the Mackenzie River, after its eminent discoverer, which name it has borne ever since. In a little English boat, with a fair wind and swift current, Franklin accomplished three hundred and twelve miles in about sixty hours. The saltness of the water, the sight of a boundless horizon, and the appearance of porpoises and whales were encouraging signs. They had reached the polar sea at last. The sea, in all its majesty, entirely free from ice, and without any visible obstruction to its navigation. On reaching the coast, a silken Union Jack, worked by Franklin's dying wife, was unfurled. She had died a few days after he left England, but she had insisted on her husband's departure in the service of his country, only begging him not to unfurl her flag till he arrived at the polar shores. As it fluttered in the breeze of these desolate shores, the little band of Englishmen cheered and drank to the health of the king. You can imagine, says Franklin, with what heartfelt emotion I first saw it unfurled, but in a short time I derived great pleasure in looking at it. It was too late to attempt navigation for this year, although the weather in August was inconveniently warm. So on 5th September, Franklin returned to winter quarters on the Great Bear Lake. During his absence, a comfortable little settlement had grown up to accommodate some fifty persons, including Canadian and Indian hunters with their wives and children. In honor of the commander, it had been called Fort Franklin, and here the party of explorers settled down for the long months of winter. As the day shortened, says Franklin, it was necessary to find employment during the long evenings for those resident at the house, and a school was established from seven to nine for the air instruction in reading, writing, and arithmetic, attended by most of the British party. Sunday was day of rest, and the whole party attended divine service morning and evening. If on other evenings the men felt the time tedious, the whole was at their service to play any game they might choose, at which they were joined by the officers. Thus the men became more attached to us, and the hearts and feelings of the whole party were united in one common desire to make the time pass as agreeably as possible to each other, until the return of spring should enable us to resume the great object of the expedition. April brought warmer weather, though the ground was still covered with snow, and much boat-building went on. In May, swans had appeared on the lake, then came geese, then ducks, then gulls and singing birds. By June the boats were afloat, and on the 24th the whole party embarked for the Mackenzie River, and were soon making their way to the mouth. Here the party divided. Franklin on board the Lion, with a crew of six, accompanied by Back on board the Reliance, started westwards, while Richardson's party was to go eastwards, and survey the coast between the mouths of the Mackenzie River and the Copper Mine. On 7th July, Franklin reached the sea, and with flags flying, the Lion and the Reliance sailed forth on the unknown seas, only to ground a mile from shore. Suddenly some three hundred canoes, full of Eskimos, crowded towards them. These people had never seen a white man before, but when it was explained to them that the English had come to find a channel for large ships to come and trade with them, they raised the most deafening shout of applause. They still crowded round the little English boats, till at last, like others of their race, they began to steal things from the boats. When detected, they grew furious and brandished knives. They tore the buttons of the men's coats, and for a time matters looked serious, till the English showed their firearms, 
when the canoes paddled away and the Eskimos hid themselves. With a fair wind, the boats now sailed along the coast westward, till stopped by ice, which drove them from the shore. Dense fogs, stormy winds, and heavy rain made this polar navigation very dangerous. But the explorers pushed on, till, on 27th July, they reached the mouth of a broad river, which, being the most westerly river in the British dominions on this coast, and near the line of demarcation between Great Britain and Russia, I named it the Clarence, says Franklin, in honor of His Royal Highness, the Lord High Admiral. A box containing a royal medal was deposited here, and the Union Jack was hoisted amid hearty cheers. Still fogs and storms continued. The farther west they advanced, the denser grew the fog, till by the middle of August winter seemed to have set in. The men had suffered much from the hard work of pulling and dragging the heavy boats. They also endured torments from countless swarms of mosquitoes. They were now some three hundred and seventy-four miles from the mouth of the Mackenzie River, and only half-way to Icy Cape. But Franklin, with all his courage and with all his enthusiasm, dared not risk the lives of his men farther. Return Reef marks his farthest point west, and it was not till long after that he learned that Captain Beechey, who had been sent in the Blossom by way of Bering Strait, had doubled Icy Cape, and was waiting for Franklin, one hundred and sixty miles away. On 21st September, Fort Franklin was reached after three months' absence. Dr. Richardson had already returned, after a successful coast voyage of some eight hundred miles. When he had left Franklin, he had, on board the Dolphin, accompanied by the Union, sailed along the unknown coast eastward. Like Franklin's party, his expedition had also suffered from fogs, gales, and mosquitoes, but they had made their way on, naming inlets, capes, and islands as they passed. Thus we find Russell Inlet, Point Bathurst, Franklin's Bay, Cape Perry, the Union and Dolphin Straits, named after the two little ships, where the dolphin was nearly wrecked between two masses of ice. They had reached Fort Franklin in safety, just before Franklin's party, and being too late to think of getting home this year, they were all doomed to another winter at the fort. They reached England on 26 September 1827, after an absence of two years and a half. Franklin had failed to find the Northwest Passage, but he and Richardson had discovered a thousand miles of North American coast, for which he was knighted and received the Paris Geographical Society's medal for the most important acquisition to geographical knowledge made during the year. It was a curious coincidence that the two Arctic explorers, Franklin and Perry, both arrived in England the same months from their various expeditions, and appeared at the Admiralty within ten minutes of one another. End of chapter 53 Chapter 54 of A Book of Discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh. Chapter 54. Perry's Polar Voyage. Perry had left England the preceding April in an attempt to reach the North Pole by means of sledges over the ice. To this end he had sailed to Spitsbergen in his old ship, the Hecla, many of his old shipmates sailing with him. They arrived off the coast of Spitsbergen about the middle of May, 1827. Two boats had been specially built in England, covered with waterproof canvas and lined with felt. The enterprise and endeavor had bamboo masts and paddles, and were constructed to go on sledges, drawn by reindeer, over the ice. Nothing, says Perry, can be more beautiful than the training of the Lapland reindeer. With a simple collar of skin round his neck, a single trace of the same material attached to the sledge, 
and passing between his legs, and one rein fastened like a halter round his neck, this intelligent and docile animal is perfectly under the command of an experienced driver, and performs astonishing journeys over the softest snow. Shaking the rein over his back is the only whip that is required. Leaving the Hecla in safe harbor on the Spitsbergen coast, Perry and James Ross, a nephew of John Ross, the explorer, with food for two months, started off in their two boat sledges for the north. They made a good start. The weather was calm and clear. The sea smooth as a mirror. Walruses lay in herds on the ice, and steering due north, they made good progress. Next day, however, they were stopped by ice. Instead of finding a smooth, level plain, over which the reindeer could draw their sledges with ease, they found broken, rugged, and even ice, which nothing but the keen enthusiasm of the explorer could have faced. The reindeer were out useless, and they had to be relinquished, it is always supposed that they were eaten, but history is silent on this point. The little party had to drag their own boats over the rough ice. They traveled by night to save snow blindness, also that they could enjoy greater warmth during the hours of sleep by day. Perry describes the laborious journey. Being rigged for traveling, he says, we breakfasted upon warm cocoa and biscuit and after stowing the things in the boats, we set off on our day's journey, and usually traveled about five and a half hours, then stopped an hour to dine, and again traveled five or six hours. After this we halted for the night, as we called it, though it was usually early in the morning. Selecting the largest surface of ice we happened to be near for hauling the boats on. The boats were placed close alongside each other, and the sails supported by bamboo masts placed over them as awnings. Every man then put on dry socks and fur boots and went to supper. Most of the officers and men then smoked their pipes, which served to dry the awnings. We then concluded our day with prayers, and having put on our fur dresses, lay down to sleep, alone in the great ice desert. Progress was slow and very tedious. One day it took them four hours to cover half a mile. On 1st July they were still laboring forward. A foot of soft snow on the ground made traveling very exhausting. Some of the hummocks of ice were as much as twenty-five feet above sea level. Nothing was to be seen but ice and sky, both often hidden by dense fog. Still the explorers pushed on, Perry and Ross leading the way, and the men dragging the boat sledges after. July the 12th was a brilliant day, with clear sky overhead, an absolute luxury. For another fortnight they persevered, and on 23rd July they reached their farthest point north. It was a warm, pleasant day, with the thermometer at 36 in the shade. They were 172 miles from Spitsbergen, where the Hecla lay at anchor. Our ensigns and pendants were displayed during the day, and severely as we regretted not having been able to hoist the British flag in the highest latitude to which we had aspired. We shall perhaps be excused in having felt some little pride in being the bearers of it to a parallel considerably beyond that mentioned in any other well-authenticated record. On 27th July they reluctantly turned to the south, and on 21st August they arrived on board the Hecla after an absence of 61 days, every one of the party being in a good health. Soon after they sailed for England, and by a strange coincidence arrived in London at the same time as Franklin. Many an attempt was yet to be made to reach the North Pole, till at last it was discovered by Peary, an American, in 1909. End of chapter 54。Chapter 55 of a book of discovery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. V. Singh. Chapter 55. The Search for Timbuktu. It is a relief to turn from the icy north to the tropical climate of Central Africa, where Mungo Park had disappeared in 1805. The mystery of Timbuktu and the Niger remained unsolved, though more than one expedition had left the coast of Africa for the mystic city laying deep in that line haunted an inland. Notwithstanding disaster, death, and defeat, a new expedition set forth from Tripoli to cross the great Sahara Desert. It was under Major Denham, Lieutenant Clapperton, and Dr. Oidney. They left Tripoli in March 1822. We were the first English travellers, says Denham, who had determined to travel in our real character as Britons and Christians, and to wear our English dress. The buttons on our waistcoats and our watches caused the greatest astonishment. It was the end of November before they were ready to leave the frontier on their great desert journey. The long enforced stay in this unhealthy border town had undermined their health. Fever had reduced Denham, Dr. Oidney, was suffering from cough and pains in his chest. Clapperton was shivering with ague, a state of health ill calculated for undertaking a long and tedious journey. A long escort of men and camels accompanied them into the merciless desert, with its burning heat and drifting sands. The Sea of Sahara, as the old cartographer to calls it. December found them still slowly advancing over the billowy sand, deeply impressed and horrified at the number of slave skeletons that lay about the wine-swept desert. The new year brought little relief. No wood, no water, occurs constantly in Denham's journal. Desert as yesterday, high sand-hills. Still they persevered, until, on 4th of February, 1823, they were rewarded by seeing a sheet of water. The great lake Chad, glowing with the golden rays of the sun in its strength. Was this, after all, the source of the Niger? Its low shores were surrounded with reedy marshes and clumps of white water lilies. There were flocks of wild ducks and geese. Birds with beautiful plumage were feeding on the margin of the lake. Pelicans, cranes, immense white spoonbills, yellow-legged plover, all were dwelling undisturbed in this peaceful spot. And this most remarkable lake lay eight hundred feet above the Atlantic, between the watersheds of Nile, Niger, and Congo. But Lake Chad was not their goal. They must push on over new country, where no European had been before. A fortnight later they reached Kukawa, the capital of Borno, once a great Mohammedan empire. We were about to become acquainted with a people who had never seen or scarcely heard of a European, says Denham, and to tread on ground, the knowledge and true situation of which had hitherto been wholly unknown. We advanced towards the town of Kuka, in a most interesting state of uncertainty, whether we should find its chief at the head of thousands, or be received by him under a tree, surrounded by a few naked slaves. Their doubts were soon set at rest by the sight of several thousand cavalry, drawn up in line. They were received by an Arab general, a negro of noble aspect, dressed in a figured silk robe, and mounted on a beautiful horse. They had passed from the region of hidden huts to one of great walled cities, from the naked pagan to the cultivated follower of Mohammed, from superstition to mosques and schools, from ignorance to knowledge. The sheikh, who received the travellers in a small room with armed negroes on either side, asked the reason of their long and painful journey across the desert. To see the country, answered the Englishman, and to give an account of its inhabitants, produce and appearance, as our sultan was desirous of knowing every part of the globe. The sheikh's hospitality was overwhelming. He had huts built for them, which, says Denham, were so crowded with visitors that we had not a moment's peace, and the heat was insufferable. 
He sent presents of bullocks, camel loads of wheat and rice, leather skins of butter, jars and honey. The market of Kuka was famous. It was attended by some fifteen thousand persons from all parts, and the produce sold there was astonishing. Here Clapperton and Dr. Oidney stayed all through the summer months, for both were ill, and Oidney was growing rapidly worse. Benham, meanwhile, went off on exploring expeditions in the neighborhood. On 14th December, Clapperton and Oidney left with a friendly shake and made their way to Canoe. But the rough traveling proved too much for Oidney. Each day found him weaker, but he valiantly journeyed on. On 12th January, he ordered the camels to be loaded as usual, and he was dressed by Clapperton, but he was too ill to be lifted on to his camel and a few hours later he died. Clapperton was now alone amid a strange people, in a land hitherto never trodden by European food, and very ill himself. But he reached Kano, the famous trading center of the Hausas, containing some forty thousand inhabitants. Here again the market impressed him deeply, so full was it of cosmopolitan articles from far distant lands. After a month's stay at Kano, now the capital of the northern province of Nigeria of that name, he set out for Sokoto, though very ill and weak at the time. He was assured by, of kind treatment by the sultan. He arrived on 16th March, and to impress them with my official importance, I arrayed myself in my lieutenant's coat, trimmed with gold lace, white trousers, and silk stockings, and to complete my finery, I wore Turkish slippers and a turban. Crowds collected on his arrival, and he was conducted to the sultan, who questioned him closely about Europe. I laid before him a present, in the name of his majesty, the king of England, consisting of two new blunderbusses, an embroidered jacket, some scarlet breeches, gloves and cinnamon, gunpowder, razors, looking-glasses, snuff-boxes and compasses. "'Everything is wonderful,' exclaimed the sultan. "'But you are the greatest curiosity of all. "'What can I give that is acceptable to the king of England?' "'Cooperate with his majesty in putting a stop to the slave trade,' was Clapperton's answer. "'What? Have you no slaves in England?' "'The Englishman replied, no.' "'To which the sultan answered, "'God is great. You are a beautiful people.' But when Clapperton asked for leave in order to solve the mystery of the Niger, the sultan refused, and he was obliged to return to Kuka, where he arrived on 8th July. A week later he was joined by Denham. It was nearly eight months since we had separated, says Denham, and I went immediately to the hut where he was lodged. But so satisfied was I that the sunburned, sickly person that lay extended on the floor rolled in a dark blue shirt, was not my companion, that I was about to leave the place, when he convinced me of my error by calling me by the name. Our meeting was a melancholy one, for he had buried his companion. Notwithstanding the state of weakness in which I found Captain Clapperton, he yet spoke of returning to Sudan after the rains. But this was not to be, and a month later we find the two explorers, turning homewards to Tripoli, where they arrived at the end of January. But with all his long travelling in Africa, Clapperton had not seen the Niger, and although the effects of his fever had not worn away, he spent but two months in England, before he was off again. This time he sailed to the Gulf of Guinea, and from a place on the coast near the modern Lagos, he started by a new and untried route, to reach the interior of the great dark continent. It was September 1825 when he left the coast with his companions. Before the month was over, the other Europeans had died from the pestilential climate of Nigeria, and Clapperton, alone with his faithful servant, Richard Lander, pushed on. At last he saw the great Niger near the spot where Mungo Park and his companions had perished. At Busa, they made out the tragic story of his end. They had descended the river from Timbuktu to Busa, 
when the boat struck upon some rocks. Natives from the banks shot at them with arrows. The white men then, seeing all was lost, jumped into the river and were drowned. The Niger claimed its explorer in the end, and the words of Mungo Park must have occurred to Clapperton as he stood and watched. Though I myself were half dead, I would still persevere, and if I could not succeed in the object of my journey, I would at least die on the Niger. From Busa, Clapperton made his way to Kano and Sokoto, but on 13th April, 1827, broken down by fever, he died in the arms of his faithful servant. With his master's papers and journal, Lander made his way home, thus establishing for the first time a direct connection between Benin and Tripoli, the west coast and the north. Still the mouth of the Niger had not been found. This discovery was reserved for this very Richard Lander and his brother John. Just a year after the death of Clapperton, a young Frenchman, René Canet, tempted by the offer of ten thousand francs offered by the French Geographical Society for the first traveller who should reach the mysterious city, entered Timbuktu, 20th April, 1829, after a year's journey from Sierra Leone. And from his pen we get the first direct account of the once important city. At length, he says, we arrived safely at Timbuktu, just as the sun was touching the horizon. I now saw this capital of the Sudan, to reach which had so long been the object of my wishes. To God alone did I confide my joy. I looked around and found that the sight before me did not answer my expectations. I had formed a totally different idea of the grandeur and wealth of it. The city presented nothing but a mass of ill-looking houses built of earth. Nothing was to be seen in all directions but immense plains of quicksand of a yellowish-white color. The sky was a pale red as far as the horizon. All nature wore a dreary aspect, and the most profound silence prevailed. Not even the warbling of the bird was to be heard. The heat was oppressive, not a breath of air freshened the atmosphere. This mysterious city, which has been the object of curiosity for many ages, and of whose civilization, population, and trade with the Sudan such exaggerated notions have prevailed, is situated in an immense plain of white sand, having no vegetation but stunted trees and shrubs, and has no other resources save its trade in salt. It is curious to note what the burst of interest was aroused in England at this time with regard to Timbuktu. Zachary wrote in 1829, in Africa, a quarter of the world, men's skins are black, their hair is crisp and curled, and somewhere there, unknown to public view, a mighty city lies called Timbuktu. While the same year Tennyson's poem on Timbuktu won for him the prize at Cambridge University for the best poem of the year. End of chapter 55《Chapter 56 of a Book of Discovery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Discovery by M. B. Singh — Chapter 56 — Richard and John Lander Discover the Mouth of the Niger Lander, the faithful attendant of the late Captain Clapperton, as he is called in his instructions, was burning to be off again to explore further the mysterious Niger. No pecuniary reward was to be his. He was a poor man, and just for the love of exploring the unknown he started off. He had inspired his brother with a desire to solve the great mystery. So on 22nd February, 1830, the two brothers arrived at Cape Coast Castle and made their way to Busa which place they entered on 18th of June. Sitting on a rock overlooking the spot where Mungo Park had perished, the brothers resolved 
to set at rest for ever the great question of the course and termination of the great Niger. It was 20th September before preparations were completed for the eventful voyage from Busa to the mouth of the Niger. For provisions they took three large bags of corn and one of beans, a couple of foals and two sheep to last a month while the king added rice, honey, onions, and one hundred pounds of vegetable butter. Then in two native canoes, the landers embarked on the great river, the dark water, as it was more often called, while the crowds who came down to the riverside to bid them farewell knelt with uplifted hands, imploring for the explorers the protection of Allah and their prophet. It was indeed a perilous undertaking, Sunken reefs were an ever-present danger, while the swift current ran them dangerously near many jagged rocks. For nearly a month they paddled onward with their native guides in anxiety and suspense, never knowing what an hour might bring forth. On 7th October a curious scene took place, when the king of the dark water came forth, in all his pomp and glory, to see the white strangers who were paddling down the great river. Waiting under the shade of a tree, for the morning was very hot, the landers observed a large canoe, paddled by twenty young black men, singing as they rowed. In the center of the boat a mat awning was erected, and the bows sat four little boys, clad with neatness and propriety, while in the stern sat musicians with drums and trumpets. Presently the king stepped forth, he was coal-black, dressed in an Arab cloak, hose trousers, and a cap of red cloth, while two pretty little boys, about ten years of age, acting as pages, followed him, each bearing a coal's tail in his hand, to brush away flies and other insects. Six wives, jet-black girls, in neat country caps, edged with red silk, accompanied him. To make some impression on this pompous king, Lander hoisted the Union flag. When unfurled and waving in the wind, it looked extremely pretty, and it made our hearts glow with pride and enthusiasm as we looked at the solitary little banner. I put on an old naval uniform coat, and my brother dressed himself in as grotesque and gaudy a manner as our resources would afford. Our eight attendants also put on new white Mohammedan robes, other canoes joined in the royal procession, and the little flotilla moved down the river. Never did the British flag lead so extraordinary a squadron, remarks Lander. As the king of the dark water stepped on shore, the Englishman fired a salute, which frightened him not a little till the honor was explained. Having now exchanged their two canoes for one of a larger size, they continued their journey down the river. On 25th October, they found the waters of the Niger were joined by another large river, known today as the Benu, the mother of waters, flowing in from the east. After this, the banks of the river seemed to grow hilly, and villages were few and far between. Our canoe passed smoothly along the Niger, and everything was silent and solitary. No sound could be distinguished, save our own voices, and the plashing of the paddles with their echoes. The song of birds was not heard, nor could any animal whatever be seen. The banks seemed to be entirely deserted, and the magnificent Niger to be slumbering in its own grandeur. One can imagine the feelings, says a modern writer, in such circumstances of the brothers, drifting they knew not whither, in intolerable silence and loneliness, on the bosom of a river, which had caused the death of so many men who had endeavored to wrest from it its secret. Two days later a large village appeared, and suddenly a cry rang through the air, Hello, you Englishmen, you come here. It came from a little squinting fellow, dressed in an English soldier's jacket, a messenger from the chief of Bonnie of the coast. "'buying slaves for his master. "'He had picked up a smattering of English "'from the Liverpool trading ships, "'which came to Bonny for palm oil from the river. 
there was no longer any doubt that the mouth of the Niger was not far off, and that the many mouth delta was well known to Europeans under the name of the oil rivers flowing into the Bight of Benin. Lander pushed on till he had paddled down the Brass River, as one of the many branches was called, and when he heard the welcome sound of the surf on the beach. The mystery of the Niger, after a lapse of two thousand five hundred years since its existence, had been recorded by Herodotus, was solved at last. End of chapter 56